Hmm. So, bad water. Bad water to me is like the the spiritual centerpiece of Team Fortress Two. It uh, it perfectly embodies the chaos and the order that makes TF2 a really good game. It's sort of like a, a Mobius strip dinner table, um, but the joy that it provides is an unending feast. There's something there's something very special going on when a map like Badwater is heralded as an undying classic by both newcomers and veterans, by both casual players and by competitive players. Because a lot of times maps age poorly as our TF2 intelligence increases and we learn more about the game, but Badwater holds really strong in this regard, through and through. It's, it stays important, just like the value of gold. And I'm going to go on to argue that Badwater is an extremely fun map. Uh, there's countless permutations of this Badwater-shaped euphoria uh, for each part of the map, for each class you can play, for each team you can be on. There is a specific set of pleasures that are available to you to experience on PL Badwater. It's hard for me to think of a better map that encapsulates the TF2 pub experience than Badwater. And it's hard for me to think of one that does so like Badwater without standing on like weak stilts of gimmicky iconicity. Because Badwater is helplessly classic, but it's also a deserved recipient of that praise. It's an expertly designed map from the golden age of the original TF2 development team, which is really cool. And it may very well be one of their best offerings in an attempt to create a map that is fun for all of the classes equally, and a map that feels quintessentially just. So while the perfect TF2 map may never exist, the more time that I do devote to studying Badwater, uh, the more I am under the impression that it is as close as we have reached. Because at this point, thousands of TF2 maps have been made. Like, there's over uh, 100 officially in the game. There's countless more circulating in community servers and competitive circles. And while there can be something really stimulating, uh, something very enjoyable about experiencing all that can be offered in TF2 by playing its large plethora of maps, what if all that TF2 has to offer can actually be experienced on one map? And I may seem like an extremist, but I will propose that there is value in spending time playing the best maps and spending less time playing those that don't fill you absolutely to the brim with happiness because your lifetime is limited. So please play Badwater while you still have time. Something that makes Badwater unique compared to other payload maps is that it actually only has one stage. On the flyer for the heavy update that announced Badwater, it explains that it's different from the previous uh, payload map, which was Gold Rush, because Gold Rush had three stages, and Badwater just had one stage, but they saw it as being, you know, a much bigger, larger, single-stage map. They also described Badwater as being more focused on open areas in contrast with Gold Rush. It seems like there was a criticism of Gold Rush of it being too choke point oriented and they really took that into consideration in designing Badwater. Which which can give you a, a new perspective that Gold Rush really was proto Badwater. And I'm sure most people will understand what I'm talking about even just from a ephemeral uh, imagined sense in that Gold Rush really carries that same spirit that Badwater does. Visually, of course. Uh, a similar desert environment. We won't talk about Hoodoo right now because I don't know how that fits into the equation, but it certainly is passing on a certain similar lineage that Badwater and Gold Rush are clearly set in the same creative universe, right? Whereas Barn Blitz feels like it might be on the East Coast, right? If, uh, if Badwater and Gold Rush are in the South or the Southwest part of the United States of America, hypothetically. And so Badwater... It does definitely have more focus on open areas, but I think I think the main thing it does is when there are choke points, you have alternative options, right? So when you think of the big choke from A to B, from the first to second point, uh, it is very choky. It is literally just this, there's a big concrete wall on one side and a little less complex wall 
sorry, a little more complex wall on the other side. But really, it's it's just a huge, giant hall, a huge, giant passage for the cart to travel where the rails are between the first and second point. But you have all these alternatives. You have what pro arguably one of the most complex flanks in all of Team Fortress 2, which is that very, very, very varied and uh, surprisingly large and spacious flank area. I don't even know what the correct, the politically correct term for that area would be, but the point behind roof, on B point, on the second point, you have all of these shipping crates, you have the famous Valen soldier roaming slash Mela Highlander 2012 soldier hangout spot by the medium health pack in that room off to the corner. Uh, you know which room I'm talking about that has the little, uh, slight little, uh, what would they call that? A, uh, a porch, a railless porch perhaps that is connected to it way back there behind the rooftop, behind that sort of junkyard area. It really does remind you of Trainyard MGE, or perhaps Trainyard MGE is reminiscent of this point behind roof on Badwater B. My point being is that this is such a complex flank area. There's so many places you can approach from. You don't have to go straight through that choke point on A to B. You can go up the stairs. Probably the most common alternative option if you just want to fight and go straight to the rooftop, you can just go up the stairs. You can alternatively, when, when you're at that, that garage door that opens up those, 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 uh, those crate, crate railing gates that open up after you capture the first point on offense, you have the option to go forward, right, or left. Right taking you up the staircase to fight on B, and then the forward option taking you uh, basically under the rooftop to an alternative staircase that connects to the staircase that they take up to get to the roof, which is interesting because it's almost like you could deny their access to the roof instead of even uh, having to confront them head on. Is okay, how do I stop them from getting up on the roof, right? How do I cut off their supply chain? Obviously, Demoman and Soldier still will be able to get up there, but you would be cutting off a crucial, a crucial point, right? And then I'll, finally, if you went left when you went through that door that that opens up after you capture the eight point, that garage shaped space, garage door shaped space, I should say, you can go left to the mailer room that we're talking about, where you have another staircase up to another high ground with a medium health pack that you can then you could take from there as a scout. You could you could go there and then you could jump on the crates and just start harassing from this weird parkour mirror's edge high ground that you have behind the B point. And I think, uh, I think that's exactly what they wanted to do, was that they saw that Gold Rush was, uh, you know, a cool map, a cool series of maps, we should say. It is super unusual that, oh yeah, some of the maps in uh, Team Fortress 2 have numerous stages. Like, they're literally just numerous maps, <laughs> whereas most of the other maps are just one map of fucking course they are, you know? And so they, they, they thought, well, let's, in, instead of trying to make you know, these very streamlined, choke-like payload maps. Let's make one very complex and large payload map. It's like taking all that gusto that you had from the three stages of Gold Rush and putting them into one stage, which became Badwater. And I would argue, it's, it's hard to say there's a place that executes it more perfectly than that second point. That being said, there are other really good areas on Badwater. We... I would have to mention the last point, which I know gets a lot of flack for being a difficult last to push, but you have an incredible amount of options of how you want to take it. You do have that very nasty choke point when you round the bend from the third capture point, and, you know, I, I don't like to spend a lot of time there, but sometimes you have to push through there. You have to push the cart through that point, right? It's a necessary choke. Uh, but you're not confined to that like so many places on Gold Rush where you, you might have a choke and one flank area. I mean, I'm thinking of one of the stages now on Gold Rush where you have literally just one choke. Uh, you know, once you cap a point, there's no alternative way to go through until that second capture. Um, on that last point, though, however, you do have map room, which is an excellent flank area, and then you have tires. And but tires is extra special because if, if you wrap around on the left through tires, you can get to uh, top, as it's called, the sort of um, Again, I'm, lo I'm looking for a word that I have not been able to find today that is sort of this uh, 
this uh, not a cascade, but a again a, a porch, a porch top that's uh, connected to that upper spawn defense room. Um, you can you can get to that area and get to the the little small pack in that sort of dark room by that corner corner bend um, from the third to the fourth point. But you can also, more importantly, if you're a soldier, if you're a scout, if you're a demo man, if you have capabilities to jump, you can get into that little uh, barricade staircase shaft way that takes you down uh, right to where engineers usually like to set up, right to their a door to their bottom spawn, pretty much. Um, you you have that as an option. I would argue too, if you have immense jumping capabilities, uh, you can. Or even just courage, I should say. You don't need to be any particular class. You can go from map room to their top right spawn. Um, usually, if there is a sentry below too, if you just jump out of that rightmost window from map room, it will uh, push you with the sentry's bullets into that top right spawn area, which is a great place to start causing causing chaos. You know, so really, if you think about it, all three of the spawn exits on that last point for defense are are, are places I say you really could be. Uh, causing chaos and disturbances. Ar arguably the top left spawn is the most difficult to keep good control over. I, I think if you can get up into that extra high ground area with the little small health pack that's looking right down on it, that's a good place to be. Um, you're just, you're always at risk from the the engineer setup area underneath map room giving you a lot of trouble. Um, and generally, you know, snipers are, are going to be an issue if you're if you're trying to hold in that spot. But I like that you do have all these different options in addition to the choke point. And I would say each of them are pretty important. You, you've probably heard it a million times that controlling map room is the most integral part about pushing bad water last or holding bad water last. You know, uh, tires too. I would say is a, is a crucial area. If you can have consistent control of tires, it it does give you a a sort of lingering sense of being able to push through in into that last point and and sort of overwhelm them any any flank control you can have really map room i would argue is is superior but um tires again can be an important point to start from if you can have two soldiers jump up into that that guarded railing that gets you down that shaft of staircases uh that will take you to that that under underneath top sentry area the the sentry area underneath top um Again, you have, you have the sentry area underneath map room, and then you have the sort of sentry room uh, just across from it on the left side if you were inside of it. Or, or again, if you left from the bottom spawn, it would be the, the closest little alcove covered bunker area near you that you could start pressuring as a soldier if you came down that shaft way of staircases. And so it's really about putting pressure on enough of those points at the same time, you know? If you can have someone coordinating spamming from map room down onto those sentries at the same time that someone's coming down that uh, s stairway, you you could have a, a very viable push, especially uh, if you take out a sentry and then you're able to have some space through choke. Again, if you can take out some snipers in that top right spawn area by someone you know going there from map room, a soldier jumping up, either within map room to that area that connects, or again jumping out the window, you know just being very courageous using sentry fire to propel you into that top right spawn area. Another point I would like to uh, point out, pardon my redundance in vocabulary, is the first point, which can seem, I think, rather uninspiring, but again, you have a few options of how you want to take this. They clearly evolved the their thinking and how they want players to move throughout the map compared to Gold Rush, right? They thought, well, even though there's a payload card that maybe will go through a choky area, uh, it doesn't mean that it has to be a choky gameplay experience, right? Because the, the the tunnel underneath, or I should say the, the tunnel leading its way to Badwater first is a very cool part of the map because I don't think there's really any other notable Team Fortress 2 area uh, that has such a long tunnel. And I know there is sort of the, the long tunnel on on dust bowl that goes underneath and kind of connects to that little valley underneath one of the last points but really not not a tunnel of this kind of size you know you, you can you can put a full team through this tunnel and the interesting thing about it is on one point yes it can be hell for certain classes you might not want to be in the tunnel depending on who you are 
But at the same time, there's a certain kind of uh, power that you have being in the tunnel, right? You're only at threat of people coming behind you or in front of you. It's absolutely, with 100% certainty, you only have to worry about those two places. The people in front of you, you can expect to some degree, because it's your opponents. Assuming once you know it's your friends in front of you, it, it's a totally safe tunnel to take, and, and probably you don't need to be taking it anymore. You're probably about to win that first point. And you're also pretty sure of what's going to come from behind you. It would be very rare for someone to flank you from behind in the tunnel unless the other play was kind of... The, the, the other team was overextending and dropping down. Maybe a, maybe a rare flank soldier or scout will decide to do that. But again, depending on who you are, if I'm a soldier, you know, or a demo man, I'm going to love to hang out in that choke. If I'm a sniper, I'm going to really enjoy that tunnel. But at the same time, it doesn't make it a hellish experience for everyone, right? If I am a scout, it's kind of on me to be careful about going into the tunnel, right? I should expect that, hey, if I go in here, I'm really screwed if I see a soldier or a demo man. Or even a pyro could be quite a problem in this sort of small, close quarters environments, right? Or if I see a sniper on the, on the other edge of it. And that's fine, because you can always go up cliff on the left side. You can also go up the, uh, the sort of ramp area on the right. That, that big, slow, leading, positive incline, that uphill on the right side. And even amongst cliff, you do have a good amount of space where you're kind of covered from where they usually have a sentry. So you at least have some area to poke around if you are a weaker class who doesn't want to deal with chokes or sentries. And so I, I like that they focused on creating a place with options that also didn't feel like it had too much dead space, per se. I would say... Battlewater First is a particularly excellent job of making all three of those different routes useful and arguably necessary to win that first point. You really do need to control Cliff, but at the same time, uh, without some kind of distraction, without some sort of nuisance coming from that ramp area, coming from the uh, opposite side, sort of the right side of the map, if we're thinking that the Cliff sentry area is on the left side of the map, it really helps to have some sort of presence over there spanning at the sentry so that it, you're not just taking it head on from that left cliff area because it, if the sentry was being camped very hard with a pyro and an, a medic and an engineer and a heavy, it would, be, it would be pretty difficult to make your way into it. Even with even uber pushes, it might not be totally worth it. And at the same time, you need people in the tunnel kind of keeping cap time going. And... In a, in a Highlander situation, of course, you need to be very vigilant about the cap time. But even in a, in a public match situation, which I would say is the the ideal game mode for Badwater, you want to be aware of how, how much time you're getting on that cart. Because I'm sure we've all witnessed some painful defeats on that first point of not being able to push it through. And you could make the argument, and you can always make the argument, that you if you were just very diligent about playing cap in a pub environment, you can win. You know, they, they can objectively have a better setup, um, but there's plenty of times where you can creep that sentry past, e even if there's a, or sorry, creep that cart past the sentry that is probably peeking over cliff. Either there isn't a sentry there, which gives you some time to just sneak it on by, you know, using Sticky Jumper Pain Train Demo Man, or uncloaking a spy on the cart, or just running back to it over and over, and over again as scout, right? Or as soldier with the Pain Train, you know, T taking big jumps in or, or just creeping through there, you know, using that tunnel that you know is an advantageous spot for you as soldier and then getting to that cart and uh, using your pain train to just keep that cap time going. It, it It's something that really can matter. I, I've played quite a lot of Badwater where I literally just play Sticky Jumper, Demo Man, and, and Sack on the cart with, with the pain train because it's so difficult, you know? And, and the thing is, I would only do that in a situation where me trying my very hardest, you know, on one of my best classes, like Soldier, isn't cutting it. And the funny thing is, though, is that that does progress the game significantly enough, because Badwater has some very crucial capture points that you want to hit. And it's funny because I think, to some people, these are, a, these are an issue with the map. They're a point of contention, the fact that... Uh, Badwater Pro, for instance, the edited version of this map, uh, you know, allegedly making the map better. I'll let you decide. It includes new spawn points for the offensive team so that 
really the uh, capturing the third point is not quite as integral. And in my opinion, I've grown to accept the way that Valve designed the map. And I think, I think, yes, there is a point that's harder to push and is more important. And I think that's okay because everyone knows that. That's fair game, you know? Because I always know when I play Badwater, I'm going to try, if I'm on defense, I'm going to try hard to deny that third capture point. I do not want them getting that third capture point. I know how important it is because even if you just keep them there for 10 minutes struggling to get that third point, the distance they have to travel, you know, they, they or, or take teleporters is very, very, uh, it, it causes trouble for them. It's very inconveniencing for them to have to have that long distance to walk or depend on teleporters. And I would say teleporters can be easily taken down, camped, and even when they are there successfully, there might not be enough available for the team, you know? And it, and it might even positionally uh, sort of handicap the team too because now they're only spawning where the teleporter puts them, which might not always be an advantageous spot for them in terms of pushing, right? If, if, if the teleporter is in boiler room and you have all these people trying to push out through boiler room, um, it might be causing a net issue for the team, you know, even if it's 15% uh, worse than it would have been if they if they had a teleporter somewhere else. It, uh, you could make an argument that uh, teleporter placement is actually hurting the team's push. That being said, that, that could be a, a discussion for another portion in this video, but on that third point, again, it's so important because it, it puts that offense spawn from all the way back at the first spawn up to the second and only spawn. There's only two spawns you have on offense on Badwater. And you could argue, was it lazy map making? Did they think about this? Did they think, hey, why don't we use that little uh, bunker area by first point to create a second spawn for them after they've after they've captured this the second point? Like, did they think of that? Um, or did they, is it really just laziness that they didn't come up with that and that was implemented in Badwater Pro? And, it, even if it was, can we forgive them of that? Because maybe it is better the way it is, you know? I know that I, if I'm pushing on blue team, I know how integral getting that third point is, right? There's something to be said for knowing, in, in, a, pub, in a pub environment especially, when exactly to, to put all of your effort into capping the point, right? Because there's certain areas where uh, it's not as, as important, right? I don't get so much from capturing the second point if I don't have roof, as, as, a, as a blue player, right? It doesn't really matter to me at all. That's not true though, because I do deny the red spawn. So it, that makes me think that there is some sort of uh, intelligent design to the way that Badwater was created and that with each capture point, you do obtain something. The map changes in some way every time you cap. Every point matters somehow. You capture the first point, it opens up that 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 access to, to the stairs up to rooftop and that sort of all those crazy back flank areas we were talking about earlier. You capture that second point, it denies the red spawn. They they have to take a much longer route, right? And I get that third point, I have to take a much less, you know, a, a shorter route as the blue team. And, and if I were on the red team, I would want to hold them at that third point for as long as possible. So in that way, I, it is clear that the developers did know what they were doing with this map. And I appreciate their ingenuity perhaps to m make it simple but still good right there's you have the same defensive spawn the entire time on Badwater on the red team yes there is that variation of whether you can random chance spawn below I don't even totally understand the math behind that um, obviously it's always possible to spawn from that top room but what does change is just that pathway right when the first two points aren't capped, you can go straight through. You don't have to take that extremely long route around that third to fourth point rail line, right? A as a defensive player. And so it's, it it's, it's quite remarkable that they could use that same space and, and say, hey, let's not, you know, we don't need to create new spawn areas, but let's instead create... Uh, new pathways. Let's control the flow of movement throughout the same map in different directions, right? M you know, Avatar Last Airbender, he's taking out the the spools of little 
clumped up uh, grass mud or whatever and, and, and making new pathways that the water can flow through down the river, down these little uh, choke points of, of, that the rocks create where the water has to pass through, right? When, when some open up, it gives you new options, and when others are closed, it forces you to adapt and play differently. And if you compare that to 5CP maps, right, where it's, it's quite the opposite approach. The map does not change. There is no, oh, now this gate is open. Now I can't get through this area for the most part. Again, from my off-the-dome knowledge, but instead they rely more on moving the spawns around, right? The map, you don't have to change the way you play around the map so much. It's, it's, it's more about where. It's more about distance and speed and time, which is funny because you would think that would be more important in payload just based on this concept of playing on a stopwatch and how much time we have left on the clock, which is another interesting point I want to talk about, which is that bad water and, you know, payload in general as a concept has this perfect pub design in that it is competitive to some degree. It is engaging. There's, there's a very clear objective. Yet... You don't need to be so on on it. You don't need to be so on the objective. And I think this makes for the ideal fun pub game mode, and I'll try to explain why. Because you have a sense that the timer is ticking down the whole time. You see that, okay, I need to get this next point in a certain amount of time. And I think if you didn't have that incentive, we know that the points would not be capped as quick as they are, right? If you gave people eight minutes to capture the first two points versus giving them four minutes to capture the first point and four minutes to capture the second point, I would think you're going to see a quicker capture time on the one with those two checkpoints than the one with, okay, you have eight minutes to do both. Because there, there is the classic pub push experience, and I would say even in, in competitive, this is going to be a factor, is that people are going to focus more on the objective when the clock's low and they're going to focus more on positional advantages and frags and making moves against the other team when the clock is high you know when they don't have to worry about okay i need to cap this point soon and i know even in a highlander environment you're supposed to have a scout and ng always on that cart giving it love and attention but i would still argue when push comes to shove in tough tricky areas everyone's going to be thinking about the cart when they really need to when there's 15 seconds on that clock left to hit that that time that you need to tie the other team, to beat the other team, whatever it is. In a stop on your environment, you really will care about that. Even if you're not a traditional cart pushing class. And so the funny thing is, even though in a pub you do not have a stopwatch config, right? So you don't compare the team's times. The only way that you win is if you completely deny them from pushing all the way to the last point, right? And if you're on offense, the only way you win is if you completely capture to that last point. There's still a sense that the time matters, right? And even though you're not trying to do better than the other team, you still want to win. You, and you still often might lose. And I think the way Badwater and Gold Rush, maybe a lot of these early payload maps were designed, is they do have tricky last points. They are last points that can be bolstered with a lot of engineers. They are last points that, in a 32-player server environment, which I know is uncommon, but basically I'm saying, with the more players in the server, it's going to be harder to push through. Right? And what's good about that is that it's kind of the only point that matters for the win. Right? It doesn't matter how fast you capture first through third point. What matters is if you ever get completely held down. Right? And so a realistic scenario we could say in a balanced game is that you're gonna make it through all the points but you might not push the last point on a payload map in a pub environment and i think that's why the the last points are deliberately a little tricky is because that is how you win in a pub environment is if you can stop that last point and obviously you're gonna stop the point before it if your team is way better than them, we've all had plenty of roles where you hold them down at first point, you know, complete suppression and denial of the other team's will and spirit. But sometimes the most balanced games are going to be that fight for the last point. And I think there's something resolute and climactic about that, that you, 
You, you have symbolically in 5 CP maps, yes, I'm capturing this last point, but it's not quite as integral, right? If you capture that last point, it's one of numerous points, right? You, you may need to reach five points to win, and I think even in very old school Valve pubs, uh, it's just going to keep repeating the map until the map time runs out, right? So there's not as much weight to it. And yes, you do have a similar experience potentially in Bad Water, right? Where you, you you could just be playing the map until the map time runs out. Again, this is thinking old pre-meet your match, the way pub server worked. The way pub servers worked. But there's there's a lot more meaning to the victory or the loss on a payload map, right? On bad water. Because you have all that setup time you have to sit through. You, you win the map, you lose the map, and then now we've got a minute, a minute and a half to reflect on what just happened. Obviously, if you're an engineer, you don't really have time to reflect. Um, but that's the uh, that's the role you signed up for. That's the job you signed up for. You you play the game to go to work, and I respect that. But for the rest of us, we have to sit on those choices that we made and think about how well we did, how well we didn't do, what we could have done better. And even if not being analytical about our own gameplay in a constructive sense, we are facing the feeling the aftermath, the emotional aftermath of what we've given in that last round. And so there is this sort of big climax of, you know when the, when the map's gonna end. Sorry, not the map, but you know when the round's gonna end in Badwater. You know when a game's gonna end in Payload, right? Because you have that timer. Pe like 5 CP, which I would argue is the one of the, you know, other very core TF2 game modes you don't really know when it's going to end. Obviously, if it stalemates and you're uh, waiting for the clock to run down, maybe that is the case. But in most cases, it's a surprise, really. And I think there's something uh, that can be very frustrating about that, particularly in a pub environment where there's not a lot of coordination going on, is that you can be trying your absolute hardest, and then all of a sudden the map's been stolen from you because someone backcapped. And you can't afford to constantly just be sitting and watching that last point you know you have to push up at some point and you have to have have some faith and trust in your team but that that faith and trust in your team is so cost you know so 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 costly so expensive at that point whereas on a payload map everyone knows there's there's a sense of that ending coming you're you you can strategize around that right it's a, it's it's like being told, you know, how long you have to live. You, you can plan around it. There's a sense of purpose, and you can prioritize what you want to do. Versus in that, that 5 CP chaotic game, where it's like you never know when you're just going to get hit by a bus and get taken out of it all and have to wonder if you were living your best life and if you regret where you were and you weren't thinking about what you were spending your time on enough and, and you weren't reflecting upon where you want to be, you know, in life, in this bad water match. Where, where do you literally want to be and what do you want to achieve and and what pressure do you want to put in certain areas and, and what are you, you know, all of these kind of questions that I think a, a payload map is more more likely to accurate, more likely to ask of us. And that being said, there's quite a different feeling for all of these different capture points and how it can feel to be defeated or to have a victory on each of them. I would say it's quite unusual from my point of view to have victories or defeats that don't go to that final point. I think that is I think that is essentially indicative of, of unbalanced teams or perhaps 32 players, perhaps too many players on the server. But even then I think I think you can expect to see things play out to the last point. And this is made very evident by when Badwater is played in a 9v9 competitive format. You always see the teams cap all the points. If they don't cap all the points, it basically means they're going to lose catastrophically, right? It seems like what you'd expect is a you know, 6 to 10 minute cap time of the whole map, and it's just about which person does, the, does that, which team does that whole cap quicker. Because you, you're going to expect that with that level of coordination, you can roll through the map. And even in that circumstance, I think it is very fun when there is a roll in Badwater, which might make it different than other maps. 
in in the way that they roll, which is like, again, due to this the the format of payload versus five CP. A five CP roll is very quick and evident. You know, a, a first to five can be over in seven minutes or eight minutes because they're just going to roll through the points. You're not really going to have a lot of time to play to try to put pressure on certain areas. You basically have to hold, and if if you can't hold, you're just going to get steamrolled through and killed. There's a limit to that pace in payload, which is interesting. If, if you're pushing, there's a literal limit to that pace, which which is quite different from in 5CP, because I know there is a limit to the pace you have in 5CP, right? Only as fast as however many players you have can capture that middle point, and then that second point, even if you're doing a roll. But I would say it is quite fast. And I would say it is a lot quicker in, in the sense of pace than it is a payload map, right? You're capped out at times three right on the cart. And it takes a very long time to go from that, that you know, from your base to that first point, and then from that first point to that second point, and then that second point to that third point. That definitely takes probably the, the longest time. It's probably the biggest stretch on Badwater. And you're, you're able to at least enjoy and try to do something that matters in that time. Whereas I feel like it, it's almost impossible to do that if you're getting rolled on 5 CP, right? If you're on offense on Badwater and you're completely getting annihilated, you still have four minutes to give your best showing and maybe take the sentry down and, and maybe take the cart to a reasonably close distance from that first point. And with that being said, if you're, if you're committing a role on defense on Badwater, I think you still get to have a lot of fun. Uh, as, depending on how much a, a role it is, of course, there there's something about that first point that tends to lend itself to uh, players, you know, because of that the openness of that side ramp area and just the multiple routes you can take. I think it's very easy for the offensive team to sort of continue flooding players to the point and uh, and sacking, sort of pushing forward to some extent, even if they're doing terribly. It's very rare that you see a a full bad water spawn camp at the first point that really gets held there i i very rarely if ever seen that there's moments of course when you do maybe you have some good ubers and you know they're they're having quite an embarrassing game or it's very unbalanced but even then i it's almost never that you're going to be there for all four minutes just holding them in and i i think bad water is also one of the most satisfying maps to like not really care whether you won or lost i think part of the appeal of this in a pub game obviously is that you can really you can really get lost in bad water playing the objective and not playing the objective which is something i think is different from almost all the other game modes in terms of a pub gameplay experience and and other game modes and i'd say maybe other maps as well uh, because i really don't think a map like Gold Rush is anywhere near as fun to not be thinking about the objective. I think, again, because of this very, that choke point based nature of Gold Rush, it's hard to forget about the objective. The cart's always what you're trying to push through. There's always sentries you're, you're getting stuck with. And Battle Order gives you a lot of areas where you, you can get away from that, you know? You can be in that, in that back, you know, train yard-esque crate area behind rooftop second point and you know you can have your own little adventures there fighting anyone else who's also happened to make it over there which, which cer certainly happens a lot of times and you're not really encumbered by sentries and capture points and I think that's very freeing y you know you're still in a place that can contribute to that core game but you're not so locked into uh, to going, oh, if we can't push this cart, then I'm not able to have fun. Which I would say is more connected to the experience on other payload maps. Now, something I would like to see is I would like to see Badwater converted into other maps. And so we've seen this in other cases with Sawmill, for instance. Sawmill having a, a King of the Hill version, a CTF version, and a Arena version. We've seen this uh, in Badlands having... Arena Badlands, Koth Badlands, CP Badlands. The, there's a number of maps like this. Well, I should mention. CP Well, CTF Well, Arena Well. How come we only have PL Badwater? I think Badwater is easily one of the most beloved maps. And 
of course, I understand the best argument you can make against this, which is that why taint the best map in the game uh, by perverting it and changing its its disposition by making it something else that it shouldn't be, which I understand, but I will I would take a a less good version of Badwater just to have another version of Badwater because a less good version of Badwater is certainly better than the best version of many other maps in the game. And I think a lot of people can agree with me. A CTF map? Are you kidding me? I would I would play CTF Badwater before I play half those other CTF maps. And and we can argue about that configuration. Do we want to have one intel room is blue spawn and the other intel room is red spawn. I like that, even though that may not be fair. It, is that unfair? I don't know. It could be unfair because it's not a mirrored version of the map. And maybe they'd have to cut the map in half at some point and mirror it. Kind of like Gorge, Five Gorge type of thing. Um, but I think that would be great because, again, what Badwater excels at it is it has all of these really fun this sort of veiny information where you have these different offshoots of energy, you know, different different choke points in different places you can push through. You know, if we're thinking about second to third point, you can go through boiler room, you can go through that upper bridge room, you can go underneath. And I think having multiple routes like that is what you'd want from a capture the flag map anyway. I think when we see maps like uh, CTF Double Cross and CTF Sawmill, I would say, if anything, something that you lose from the map is it's a bit too open. It's a bit too unfocused that you're supposed to go and get that intel. It's very easy on CTF uh, Sawmill to keep just spawning and going back to that center saw area and, and suiciding and fighting people in random places across the map. Because it's not very streamlined. You can tell, and maybe this is wrong, fact check me, but that it it really optimally is designed as a King of the Hill map. And I would say King of the Hill maps are not going to transfer over to CTF as well because, you know, a King of the Hill is going to be much more cake-shaped, right? Whereas, like, a payload map is going to be shaped more like a, a string of spaghetti that's, uh, you know, winding and, and raveling around in, in, in different directions, but ultimately is, is very thin and river-like, right? Whereas a, a Koth map is going to be more like an ocean, all sort of centering around this one area of focus and so you know with that being said maybe uh maybe a better king of the hill map to make a ctf map out out of could be uh you know viaduct and and then don't hold me to that because this video is about bad water but bad water as a ctf map could be very intriguing because i think it would feel like quite an epic odyssey to have to go through such a long portion of space to reach that intelligence and that being said, I will say that the quality of the game possibly has gone down since Valve removed the capability of the Sticky Jumper and Rocket Jumper to be something that you use while you capture the intelligence on CTF. I would like to see an alternate reality where we're still able to use the Sticky Jumper and Rocket Jumper on Capture the Flag maps, and we will play Capture the Flag Badwater with those items. I think seeing people Sticky Jump across the entire map trying to get the intel would be quite good. And I know amendments would have to be made Right? If you imagine just sticking in, uh, intelligence in the blue spawn, it's like, how the hell are you going to get in there when they just put an engineer who sets up there? But I think we can, we, again, the, it could be adjusted, it could be rebalanced in the way that other Capture the Flag adaptations of existing maps have done. But moving on, I would also like to see Badwater made as a King of the Hill map. Um, Badwater as a King of the Hill map probably is quite confusing, but it would... Once you once you understand it in terms of a mirror format, you see how it can be quite easy. Uh, we would just have to pick a very certain part of the map. For instance, imagine we take the part of Badwater from uh, the the blue base to first point, and we 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 double it up, we mirror it over, and we make it some sort of uh, cough point on the center, sort of uh, near this medium health pack by cliff or perhaps near the other medium health pack on the right side of the map with, with the big sort of rocky area. Um, I, I think, you know, with that King of the Hill point on the upper hill part of Badwater could be quite interesting. And I think fans would just like to play Badwater more. So again, make it a cough map. I don't think anyone's going to complain, Valve. I think you've done a lot worse things. I think we've seen uh, game modes that nobody asked for that, that um, could be considered offensive. We've seen 
Um, you remove the entire arena game mode from the map, which, you know, tragically I won't be able to make a compelling case for Arena Badwater in this video because Arena is no longer a game mode. That being said, Arena is still played on community servers, so it is possible that there could be an adaptation of Badwater, Arena underscore Badwater, that would be played uh, in small obscure communities and uh, the remaining remnants of Arena servers that do happen to exist in the year 2021. Consider Badwater, it, it would be, I'm, I'm imagining an arena map that, you know how I described the King of the Hill map as being the, the first point of the map kind of uh, connected to itself twice and mirrored, right? Now I'm imagining a arena map that is actually, uh, if we think of Badwater like a big long snake, we're going to fold the snake four, four to five times on its seams and then crunch it together to make this sort of more square shape, more circular, less thin-shaped map where the, the different areas of battle are connected in a very surprising and incoherent way. And I understand maybe this is game-breaking because Valve doesn't like to make this, these kind of changes because um, it seems like, well, what's the lore here, you know? Why does one version of the map look different from another version? And I would say fair play, Valve, but you, you removed Arena from the game, so now it's the player's choice. Now it's about the players, you know? The players get to decide what Arena Badwater is really going to be like. Another obvious option would be a payload race map for Badwater. So you could have, again, this would be breaking convention, but I think it's something that I would like to experiment with. I think other people might be interested in it. And it could be rectified too by having the team switch sides with the fact that it's not a totally symmetrical map. And again, maybe this could be balanced out. We could see uh, if it really is fair, but I like the idea of having uh, two payload carts either going on that same sort of track in opposite directions, right? Where one, one payload cart is starting from the red spawn and going all the way to blue, and then one starting from the blue spawn and going all the way to the red. And in the case of that map, we would need to have different spawns, so I would want the possibility for red team and blue team to kind of spawn more in the center of the map, so they're more likely to kill each other, and maybe some sort of added connection um, from that red spawn to the blue spawn. I think that would be very helpful. You know how that map is kind of in this big right turn circular motion? Uh, I do think it would be cool to have, when you leave blue spawn, um, that whole right side area, that whole right wall of that long wall with that little fence on top, if, if, if a big part of that could be cut open and connected to the last point of bad water, um, I think it could make the payload, payload race map in this variation viable. I know, I know you're thinking it doesn't make sense yet, but I think with that crucial change, there could be good potential. Now, for payload race bad water version 2, I would like to see both payload race tracks start in the same place, or a relatively same place. Both start in the blue spawn area. One of the tracks would be the existing Badwater payload track that we've all come to know and love, but the second track would actually be starting from another point in the spawn. Perhaps, think, think you're in the blue spawn in the, the leftmost door, which you can wrap your way around up to cliff. It would start there. Maybe the payload cart would even go up that track to cliff, or it would cross over, it, it would leave the spawn and cross where the other track goes into the tunnel, and then it would go up the ramp instead. It would go up that big incline on the right side instead. And this sort of pattern of uh, crossing each other and going in different directions would continue throughout the map. So consider too how cool it would be to have one of the payload race carts go through um, that, that garage-shaped door that opens up when you capture the A-point and perhaps goes through that flankier part of the map. I think that would be very interesting. Again, Valve, if you're listening to this, I think you should, you should give some credence to making bad water available in different, in different versions. And I know you might feel like you're desecrating a classic, um, but I would say it would do more good than harm, uh, especially considering some of the other choices you've made like desecrating the art style um, with many of the cosmetics that have been added. So I think it's fair game now. And as long as you as long as long you don't make it tremendously bad, which I think is maybe even impossible, even if it is bad, I think people would still enjoy uh, PLR Badwater for the meme. Again, could just be me, but I'm going to have to put it out there that I think it's a good idea. Is Badwater the best map in the game? It's hard for me to argue otherwise. And the reason I say that is because of its multiplicity, its, its usefulness in a variety of situations, and perhaps just its overall iconic 
classic, timeless pub online hop in and play friendly, family, fun attitude that it has. And I know it's not the most competitively viable game, but you know, com competitively viable map. Highlander does exist, but I, I, I do think, and Highlander players probably confirm this in the comments for me, please, pub bad water can be just as fun, maybe is always more fun than a competitive version of it. And this is probably why it is a great map, okay? Process, Gully Wash, Snake Water, I love these maps, okay? But these fundamentally are probably not the best TF2 maps. They might be the best competitive TF2 maps. They might be the best sixes TF2 maps, but they are not the best TF2 maps because there are nine classes in Team Fortress 2. And I know as much as you may hate some of them, they can be fun. You know, you need the right map to enjoy some of these classes. I don't think you can really enjoy Spy on 5CP. You can, but Payload is much better. I don't think you can enjoy Engineer on 5CP. <laughs> Payload is much better, and I know, I know Engineer is hated, but if you're going to set up your Sentry, if you're going to set up your Dispenser, if you're going to be responsible for holding a point, for controlling a choke, you want to do that on Payload. You want to do that on Badwater. And I know, I know there's, I could be playing Engineer on Gold Rush, which has more choke points, and maybe that would be more fun for me as an Engineer. Just like, hey, isn't it more fun to play uh, Domain and Soldier, you know, on uh, Peel Gold Rush because it's more choky than Badwater? False. Because you have to play against Soldiers and Demoman and Engineers on Gold Rush, right? So even if I am an engineer, and it might not be as cruel and menacing and advantageous for me to play on Badwater as it is to play on Gold Rush, I probably will have a more enjoyable experience and feel that my choices had more merit to them and that whatever successes I had on Badwater were things that I truly earned, right? Setting up a, a sentry in a, in a Gold Rush choke point is definitely not as satisfying as all of the strategic places you can put it on Badwater. If you think of Badwater first point, Yes, you can put it on the cliff, but you can also put it in that little bunker by the first point or by one of the medium health packs. Or you can be more aggressive and, and put it somewhere in that middle area um, above the tunnel or even in the tunnel or even by the spawn. There's a lot of experimentation and fun you can have as an engineer, especially knowing there might be multiple engineers in a typical Badwater pub match. You can expect one of them to put it in a more conservative place while you put it in a more fun, experimental and surprising and shocking place. I would say on second is one of the most fun places to play defensive engineer. Engineers fight me, but holding roof is very satisfying and fun because it's not guaranteed. It's not a given. It's a very exciting place to hold. You you have potentially easy bait on the payload cart, right? Who are going to have a hard time, but you're going to have people coming at you from all directions. You have people coming from you up the stairwell. You have people coming from you behind in that again crazy train yard flank area you have people coming up from the stairs from from your stairway right people might go underneath rooftop and and wrap around up that stairway and try to give you hell people might somehow you know there might be a spy or something by your 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 spawn door that you come out of that that uh cuts right through that point in between the second and third point that little door that opens up and can't be opened up after the second point's been capped. There might be a spawn in that area shooting at your sentry. It's a very fun and dynamic place to hold as engineer. And as soldier and demo man, don't even get me started. I think, I think this is a this is the best case for why Badwater is, you know, the best payload map, one of the best maps in the game, is that you have so many places you can be, and that is the fun. At least of Soldier, I can say. I don't play Demo Man quite as scrutinously and seriously and thoroughly and consistently as I do Soldier, but Soldier is can be very fun to be taking Ubers, using the shotgun, pushing through chokes, delivering high DPM against heavies and sentries, but it can also be very fun to be roaming around and playing these awesome flanks that Badwater has. Badwater being an extremely fun map to jump around. I can't say that about Gold Rush, and I'm sure... Look, I, I will jump around in Gold Rush, but it's just not as fun as on Badwater. And I think you can make that case for a lot of other payload maps. There are other good payload maps, don't get me wrong. Upward is good. Upward is kind of classic, probably on that same level of Badwater. But I'm telling you, Upward is just 
there's so many places that are not as fun for all of the classes, okay? And, and I want you to really think about that, internalize it. Again, upward, what do we think of? Very fun map, maybe for sniper, maybe for soldier, maybe for engineer, maybe for scout, maybe for scout. There's a lot of classes that are going to be punishing to play when you have such a sniper heavy map, right? Such an engineer heavy map. And I think Bywater has that perfect balance where, yes, you can play sniper. It is a good sniper map, but it's also a good heavy map. It's a good pyro map. It's a good engineer map. It's a good medic map. It's a very fun medic map, I would say. And you might be saying that I am I casual. I'm just fallaciously listing off all the classes and insisting that this is a good map for them. But I would encourage you to do your own investigation. And I think if you're having a hard time playing one of these classes on Badwater, uh, I think it has more to do with your playstyle and where you're playing than Badwater itself. Because I think Badwater is a very, uh, you know, work work with what we give you and make it your own type of map. It's a very uh, pay and play and reconfigure and edit and remix and sell to the free market kind of map. And so I think, I think if you start to realize the, the, the amount of choices that Badwater lets you embody, it'll be very easy to see an optimal game for all the classes on Badwater, okay? I've had great games, certainly on this map, as all the classes that, than I have on any other map. And I think, I think there's a, there's something about Badwater that is digestible in almost every area for a multitude of classes. And I know there's situations where it drastically is different between offense and defense, right? So I know as a scout, I'm going to be having a lot more fun in Badwater on defense than I am on offense. It's just the fact. I'm not going to be worrying about sentries as much. I'm going to be, you know, putting just able to to play around people because because they're going to be distracted with our sentries and our our heavies and our big pushes and I'm going to be able to play around in that open space and do what I want right as a scout, um, which which is going to be tougher on, on offense. But I think. It's, it's still not unplayable as scout on offense. It just means you might have to play with your team, know when to play certain areas more, right? And it can be a little boring to, to sort of relegate yourself to one side of the map and say, okay, look, I'm a scout. It would be awesome for me to really just kick it in tires, you know? Because you want to kind of feel like you have some impact and maybe you, you want to go through the choke, you want to go through map room, but really... Where are you going to slam dunk? You will slam dunk in tires, a scout. I'm telling you. I'm telling you, bro. There's no way you won't slam dunk in tires, a scout. But you just might not be drawn to that. And maybe that is a fair critique of Badwater. Because while I have been setting this up to seem that Badwater is perfect, I am open to uh, suggestions for ways that Badwater can be improved. And maybe not even that, because the map's done. We're not going to change the map. Badwater Pro... Per, perhaps as a perversion um, I am open to accepting the ways in which it is imperfect because even the best TF2 map is imperfect even the best TF2 map will have certain things that are not as fun as other things you know there's there, there's just going to be certain stuff that's that's better and you know you can't expect it to be the hero in every single circumstance but that being said I'm, I'm I think it's important to, to stay focused on the positive aspects of Badwater because it is arguably our best map. I think I think there's utility in being loyal to it and talking up its favorable attributes rather than bringing it down. It's right. It may be very sort of um, cogent and uh, autistically accurate of me to pinpoint all of its, um, you know, its negative traits and its shortcomings for the sake of being totally thorough and addressing every aspect of it and being completely completely holistic in my analysis um but i am uh i am not as cold and computer like as you may wish i was and um i'm a i'm a living breathing human being with a, with a heartbeat who needs the will to continue living as much as anyone else does and so i think it's important for me to continue projecting the things that are life affirming in this situation rather than not uh, because I am an organism after all and um, 
I wouldn't be playing the game very well if I wasn't affirming life. And and that's a maybe a heavy conversation for another day, but uh, I don't need to argue with you right now, even though I would like to, because I've because <laughs> I've been, I've walked in your shoes, partner. But Badwater, I think, is an easy map to love, which maybe is its advantage because we can see imperfections and shortcomings in all of the maps, and I think rightly so, even in Badwater. But there's something to be said for the fact that loving bad water is quite easy. It's it's quite effortless. I don't have to rise up to the occasion like I might, let's say, to love Dust Bowl, right? There's a spirit, a, a warrior spirit that, that really echoes throughout Dust Bowl and that calls me and that beckons me to rise to the occasion of Dust Bowl. But bad water is not so much an occasion I must rise to, but rather a a a welcoming source of pleasure that I can return to without asking, right? And without it asking very much of me. Sometimes just, just even the, the ambiance, the environment of being on Badwater is a very welcoming and friendly place. And, and maybe this is the true witchcraft, the true um, magic, right? The, the, the sorcery of, of the power of a place like Badwater is it's not even really something that we can appropriately articulate why it's so good it's it's is it because there's just it's just laid out really well physically and i have a good sense of where to put my body on bad water and it gives me lots of options so i can just i can just show up in the game and sort of close my eyes and just spam wasta in the space bar and move my mouse around and it feels fun even without shooting any op opponents because there's 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 so many nice areas to go to and it all is connected in such a nice streamlined way, and it just had that level of connection and and physical orientation coherence that was slightly better than every other map. Is that why it's so good and so convincing and has some sort of special energy to it that I'm obsessed with? Or was it something else completely entirely subtle that I'm missing, right? And I can't detect because when something is so good, your judgment is clouded. It's difficult. You know the feeling. But to under but to create thoughts, to to create rationalizations for the feeling is very difficult. And and perhaps sometimes unnecessary. Right? Love is a very intoxicating feeling. But to explain love can can sometimes be impossible. Many players might find themselves asking, what part of the world slash country is bad water in? And for those of you who do know where Badwater is, please reserve your conclusions about that for a moment here while I entertain some possibilities for those who may not know where Badwater is, if it is anywhere at all. You see, Badwater appears to be in a very uh, stereotypical desert environment, something that is evocative of the kind of imagery you would think of in a Clint Eastwood Western film. It makes you think of saloons and cacti and cowboys riding on horseback, and bar fights, and lassoes, and sandstorms, and tumbleweeds, and I would say most of these elements are not on bad water, but some of them are, such as cacti. You do see numerous cacti, and I would say numerously cleverly placed cacti. If you look at the area above the blue spawn on the the base you know before the first point you you see some really really on point placed uh foliage and bonus sort of environmental objects and i think you can really tell that this map came out in 2008 when there was a lot of love going into tf2 and an, an excited development team in the golden age wanting to make impressive maps you know that would impress the community and not only be a, not only be good maps but but best the maps that they had already released there was probably still a sense of trying to to make cutting edge technology and cutting edge maps you know it wasn't even 2009 yet so there's there's still this sense of valve being a company that makes games and trying to push the limit of what they can do with making those games and in the case of Badwater, that meant uh, creative placement of cacti above that first point and it's interesting not the first point the the spawn base of blue it is interesting because there are some really nice areas you can sort of screw around with and try to hang on to those those rocks and and that sort of 
cliffsidey, rocky face uh, that covers all of the exterior walls of the blue spawn at the beginning of that map. And there's one notably kind of in that center jetting out point of the blue spawn where on the exterior wall of that you can actually sort of hide up top if you rocket jump up there on, the, on a little sort of clipping bit of an edge. And I think these touches are nice. That It feels like a map with a very dynamic rocky environment that you can you can experiment with. There's an interesting place too on top of uh, I guess the cliff, the highest point where there's usually sentries on that first point where that ammo box is, you can uh, kind of jump inside the cliff a little bit if you're clever with how the jump and briefly maintain some higher ev elevation, as well as if you fall down that cliff to the side where the tunnel ends and where the small health pack is, uh, you can really sort of surf down that side of the rock, which is a great way to negate fall damage in extreme situations. And it's also just sort of a cool, cheeky area that you can actually hide in some rare circumstances and certainly move yourself to confuse an, op a, an opponent if you are dueling someone in that particular area. And I really like that element of sort of dynamic walls with, a, you know, they're not so simple as just a straight surface and sometimes you do have the ability to jump on them and you, you have the sense of, oh, maybe I could negate fall damage with this or I could sort of carefully hop around this this slippery little wall or this slippery little surface and I I really appreciate that there's even some good spots to jump up unrelated to this type of architecture I'm talking about where you can jump up onto that tunnel as pretty much any class which is very cool but where is this tunnel is an important question most hardcore diehard fans of Badwater should be and will be asking we know it's in some sort of Again, archetypally classic desert environment with cacti and such. But what desert is it in? Could it be in the Sahara? It would seem probably not. Because most of the sub-Saharan, you know, African re desert action that I've seen is just a whole lot of sand with a capital S. And I don't see a lot of sand on Badwater. That being said, it's hard to tell if the ground texture is some sort of sand or solidified more more more, uh, more compact sedimentary uh, surface you know and uh, I can't blame the game developers for that but I'm gonna take the liberty to assume it's not a very sandy map because um, I also don't see I don't remember there being many tumbleweeds rolling throughout the map but maybe that has to do with the wind because there are sparse plants I do believe that being said the sand that would be on bad water, if we assume that it could have been coded into the game at the time, you know, windy sand going across the screen, not too dissimilar to rain and snow particles falling from the sky on maps like Sawmill and Vida, we would then assume that it could be in a new myriad of locations. There are deserts in many continents on Earth. It could be perhaps in Australia. And especially when we consider the lore involving the sniper being Australian, it does make me wonder certain things about the location of Bad Water. Having considered that, however, I do believe much of the core lore of Team Fortress 2 does imply a location within the United States of America. Here, we must think, is there really a desert with such a geographically diverse environment, perhaps somewhere in Arizona or New Mexico? Could this be true? But then again, maybe it's a place I've never seen before. It could be could be near Egypt or Sudan. Or it could be near the uh, the deserts of Mongolia. Hmm? Ever thought of that? Or, or of, uh, of of southwest China, right? Who knows? It could be in the Middle East, in, in, uh, in uh, Qatar, one of the greatest countries on Earth. It could be in the United Arab Emirates. I'm not sure exactly where. It could be because there's a lot of places I haven't seen what their geographical characteristics are like. Now, I will spoil it for you, however. Bad Water is in Ohio. Ohio, of course, being a acronym for O, oh, I almost tricked you because it's really in Bad Water Basin, Death Valley, which is the lowest point in the United States of America, and it is in California in the national park known as Death Valley. 
quite appropriately named given the fact that Badwater Basin became a Team Fortress 2 map, which would become a sort of digital haven for an incredible amount of symbolic death. The health packs on Badwater are placed in a number of appropriate locations. I think it would be foolish to complain about where the health packs are on Badwater and that they're not doing a good job. I'm going to talk about some of my favorite health packs. <laughs> Oh, I love health packs. The big the big health pack at the very end of the map in that perfect little room. Oh, that is such a scrumptious room to be a black box soldier in and just camp that pack and wait for measly little scouts and snipers and engineers and whoever, maybe even soldiers using the, the rocket launcher or, or any item that's not the black box to, to stumble into and just get two shot by you as you as you barely survive an excellent place to put a big health pack because you do have all of that cover. I would say a great room as well for a spy to recuperate after he's ran out of his cloak meter. A, a useful location. I'm, I'm disappointed and surprised we don't see more of these little, you know, full-on nooks. These full-on little isolated small box capsule hotel rooms where there's just a small or big health pack and some great, you know, cover some great place to really hide you could go in there and hide the whole game maybe depending on the game and not be discovered and i think it's 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 a fun element because if you can use this big health pack at the end of badwater sneakily badwater's giving you a nice reward for being a sneaky player but it's not really punishing anyone else in an extremely cruel way you know it is fair game that like okay if i'm going to this little big health pack room I, I should be wary of if someone's in there because it can be a place where someone's in there without me knowing. And even when we do consider that, you should generally know that if you are going into that small room with the big health pack on Badwater Last, that you can probably take down whoever's in there because it's actually quite likely they are waiting for the big health pack and are hurt. Because this is a, a very classic place to go if you are very hurt on Badwater Last. Of course, there is that medium health pack underneath the terrace on sort of the right side if I'm of the point of view of looking out from the red spawn. Um, sorry, that's not even a medium. I believe that's a small health pack. Uh, so really, of course I would go for the mega health pack in, in the small closet room if I were hurt. And that can be used to someone else's gameplay to take me out and increase their frags and increase their KDA and increase their DPM on bad water. Another good health pack that I like is I like the small, sorry, medium health pack. I've been, you know, a little, got to brush up on my health pack theory here. In the, the behind area, behind the second point, near where one of those sort of vertical rock little extensions of the earth is coming out. Behind the roof on the second point, way back in that far corner, because it's a nice, appropriate reward for someone who's hurt, just survived a strange fight, and is sort of finding themselves in this strange, bewildering no man's land. Is that the term, no man's land? I would, I would think that's an appropriate term because no man should be there in a, you know, a a, a true, honest game. It's a bit of a a strange place to be if I were to say so if we were all really focusing on this objective here to push the cart push that payload to the final capture point or defend it I should say unless of course you were on the red team and you had someone coming from the blue team attempting to cause chaos and perhaps destroy centuries often utilizing that health pack that I've been mentioning in that far behind corner then I suppose it would be quite ethical and focused of you to go take out that enemy regardless this is a good pack for rewarding this kind of vagrant playstyle, which I think is fun, you know? If they didn't have that health pack there, which would be totally fine, it would kind of say they don't want you to be back there, but because it's there, it's like, it's throwing you, the player, a little bit of a bone that, hey, you know what, you might be dicking around, but we like that you're dicking around here and this spot behind the, the rooftop of second point on Badwater, which is why there's also a health pack in that Valen slash Mela classic Highlander roaming soldier room that you would enter if you took a left turn out of the garage shaped door that opens up after you capture the first point on offense and it has that nice sort of high ground elevation where you have that 
decently uh, that that big ammo box and that big uh, sorry medium health and medium ammo if I remember correctly potentially big ammo and medium health um, and I, I think it's nice to have these bonus health packs because it it says hey flank players we're gonna let you do some things here that matter you know it's worth taking fights in those areas because you can replenish your health quickly with these health packs that we have placed you see you can have a great map but with the wrong health pack placement, what, what what are the developers really even saying to the player, right? If we think of a map like Dust Bowl, which has a very surprisingly low amount of, of health packs, and then all of a sudden you have like this one little weird house, uh, you know, in front of their spawn that has two big health packs, and then another one by the point that has one big health pack, and it's like, wow, I guess you really want me to hang out here. And there's a whole lot of other points you you don't want me to hang out, you know. Where do you want me to be on CP? Well, there's there's not enough health packs around here, in my opinion. Um, and of course, sometimes it is forgiven, you know. We we do see less health packs in general, I would say, on five CP maps. But of course, we still manage to find a way. And perhaps you can argue that that amount of health packs is optimal for those kind of maps. So Badwater didn't get the optimal health pack treatment it deserved, did it get the correct ones? It's hard to argue because we can always speculate infinitely about how things could have been differently, but it seems to me that it makes sense. My favorite part about the health pack locations on Badwater is that they tend to be in a sort of protected area. They tend to be covered. If you think about the medium health packs around the first point, they are almost all in these areas that are covered from certain sides, you know? You have some sense of protection. You might need, you might be vulnerable from above you, you might be vulnerable from one side, but you certainly have, have certain sides that you are safe from, and you're probably safe from anything below you, you know? And I think these kind of health packs are very rewarding to play off of because you, you can play off of them strategically and reliably without ever feeling like the, if someone kills you there, it was unfair. Because typically someone has to go pretty far out of their way to kill you when you are waiting for a health pack, let's say. Right? And I, I think this is a, a good way to make health packs seem more fair and also to make the game seem more fair and to not put you in situations where you are feeling... Like, the game has been cruel and unjust to you, and that someone else has got away with something that they probably shouldn't have. I, th I think there's a lot of safeguarding in the way that the the science and the chemistry of how players will play in Badwater has been carefully put together so that you can have some sort of semblance of faith that people will not be allowed to abuse and get away with much more than they really are warranted to get away with. Whereas, I think this is p possible much more on other maps, right? Because on one on one hand, when we think of how those medium health packs on the first point are not just out in the open and they are covered in a lot of ways and sort of hiding in these little corners, it gives you some insurance as someone who's defending and, you know, re retreating back to a health pack, but it also gives the offending player some insurance of if I just did a lot of damage to someone and, and now they're going for a health pack, it gives you a lot of options to put a uh, physical space between you, right? If I know they're dropping down to one of those two medium health packs on the on the top area of Badwater First Point, I know I have a lot of places I can be to put a big rock between us, you know? And, and I think that's a lot more fair than having health packs that you can really take advantage of as a defensive player and continue to, uh, you know, the, the cost of going to get the health pack w in a bad position, like a, a health pack that's kind of put there unfairly, would would make it so that you're not really uh, punished in your offensive abilities, right? But there's a sense of, okay, I'm going for this health pack here on bad water, and because I'm doing that, I, I'm guaranteed a little insurance and protection from them, but I'm also uh, denying myself a little bit of uh, open access, open travel uh, sight lines to kill them, right? It's, it, it's, it's, there's somewhat of a, a sense of a trade rather than if the health pack weren't a very open area, 
it could feel quite unfair that, oh, okay, they just won the fight because they stood on the health pack, you know? And all you have to do is be the one who's lucky enough to touch it, and then, of course, you're going to be able to kill the other one because there's tons of wide open area, right? And even when we think about this in terms of other placements of health packs on bad water, obviously some follow this rule like that big health pack on the last point that I've talked about, but if we consider some of the more open health packs, perhaps this uh, the mysterious corner backwoods no man's land health pack that is behind the second point rooftop of bad water, all the way back behind those crates, behind those shipping crates in that corner, it is quite open, but there is still a, a big defensive rock on one side of you, and there's something to be said for it so far out in the open that it's very easy to detect if anyone are, is in that area with you and is gunning for the health pack, and their predictable movement can help you take them, take them out. And so I, I think these are good placements for health packs. Consider, I think a bad placement for a health pack would be uh, on top of one of those shipping crates. I think that would have been a, a terrible place for Valve to have put a, a health pack on PL Badwater, and unfortunately they did not put it in that place. And I even think there's some places where there are ammo packs, and rightly so, no health packs. If we think about the uh, large ammo on the cliff, on that sort of high point on the left, around the first point where engineers usually set up, there is a big ammo pack, but not a big health pack, and I think that is appropriate because a big health pack being there would be a bit too much of an advantage for anyone holding that high ground because the way they've set it up is you actually have to move down. You have to drop down to that medium health pack if you want to get it. You have to get rid of some positional advantage, right? And I think that's a reasonable trade to make because a health pack in some ways is quite unfair that you are getting something for free, right? And we can say you've earned this position except in the case that you were waiting in that position from when the round started, right? And so the blue team is at a complete positional disadvantage. They're having to move into that unknown territory, whereas you can be already playing around those health packs on battle water first as soon as the round begins because you've had time to prepare and it's just the format of payload and where they've put the health packs on bad water. I would say that bad water could be used appropriately as a filter for human goodness. And what I mean specifically about this is that I think if you find a person who does not appreciate bad water despite generally appreciating TF2, you found someone who's very different in some way from the, the general TF2 populace. Now, I, I of course will forgive anyone's personal stipulations with bad water in certain cases, right? If someone does not like playing a certain class on bad water, let's say, or maybe there's a certain part of the map that's not their favorite. The, these sort of uh, opinions and stipulations are forgiven, but generally speaking, the idea that someone could outright not be interested in bad water, let's say, in, in the same vein that I might be, uh, it's hard to think of a, a, a Valve map that I don't like, but let's say um, in the same vein that I am not interested in playing uh, CTF Sawmill, right? Which is probably not very true. It would be disturbing to me because I think there are maps we forgive people of not liking, you know? And then there are maps that we, we can't really understand why someone would not like them, right? If you if you hate Gold Rush because it's too choky and, you know, you're a scout main, I'm going to say, of, of course, you know, I, I get it. I do understand. But to hate bad water, I think, is uh, a sign of, of something deeper and something very wrong, especially if you have a player who's, let's say, a soldier main, you know, a heavy main, a spy main. Uh, any an engineer main any sort of class that I would say is extra fantastic on bad water and, and extra fun to play in bad water I would be very concerned about this person and I would use it as a serious kind of filter for uh, you know reevaluating what kind of person this is and and how they are actually approaching the game of Team Fortress 2 because it would imply to me if someone were to be vigorously disinterested in bad water that they are this, despite us playing the, the same game, we actually don't have very much in common, you know? It would be it would be quite disturbing to me to discover, for instance, that a, a, a close friend or a teammate that I've played, you know, let's say a lot of competitive TF2 with, would all of a sudden tell me that they think Badwater is a trash pub map. I, I would, um... 
I would question what's really going on, you know? I, I understand to some degree the sense of thinking, oh, Badwater might be overrated. Okay, I understand that. Maybe they're more of a fan of another famous payload map, let's say. Or maybe another famous TF2 non-payload map, a 5CP map, or a cough map may be their favorite. Uh, I would still be shocked. I would still be alarmed. And I think that's for good reason. I, I, You have a moral conscience. You have a gut feeling, right? You have a sense of when something doesn't sit well with you and your rational mind will try to rationalize what's going on and try to give you reasons why you shouldn't give credence to what your gut's saying. Um, but I think a lot of times, overwhelmingly, listen to your gut. There's something going on there. There's there's a reason that you are are feeling hesitancy about something or someone, right? If something comes up, it, it's potentially for good reason. And it, it may not be as conspicuous to you as, as, it, as it seems, right? It, if someone signals to me that they're not interested in bad water in a, in a very intense way, the, the signaling of myself to feel sort of disgusted or rejected or confused by this might not be, the, the lesson to learn from that might not be that the problem is, is that this person doesn't like bad water, but maybe there's a, there's a underlying cause, there's an underlying root there's a p certain pathology that is uh, alive in this person that has allowed them to take the stance of uh, shitting on bad water, which is something that will affect other portions of life, and I should be concerned and aware of in other avenues, in other facets of, of being in any sort of interpersonal relationship with them. So do listen to your gut, listen to your your conscience and uh, I would say the same thing too to people who uh, let's say hypothetically vehemently hate bad water and are, are disgusted by what I'm saying or are just disgusted with bad water itself I would encourage them to listen to that feeling and try to understand what's really going on because they, they might find that their disgust goes much deeper than bad water hmm yes I would think about that and of course for the rest of us, we can all safely rely on the fact that Badwater is a tool of unity. And especially in these sort of trying, divisive times, this divisive uh, social political climate that we've all endured over the last five to ten years, I mean, certainly this last five years, and uh, this increasing sense of conflict within our culture, at least I can say in my culture, I don't know where you live, right? But I think something like bad water is an important tool that could heal those wounds, especially paralleling the quote-unquote real world. I, I've seen a similar divide and conflict in a number of ways in the TF2 scene. Um, at, at the least, you can mention this sort of impasse between the developers and the players of the game. And even we can consider it just a frustration that uh, what they gave us, what they tried, was probably not what we wanted. It was not enough. You know, we, we can give them some credit for doing something, but we can also say that that was not what we needed or what we wanted. You know, there was a moment of collaboration, but there still is some sort of deep hurt and frustration and a divide between the people who, who make this game, who profit off of this game, and the people who still remarkably actively play it. Steam stats still showing that TF2 is one of the top 10 games month after month after month as we continue on into this glorious future. And so, I, I, using Badwater as a symbolic tool of reunification, if, if I were working for Valve or if I were to give Valve a, a clue, I think this would be an important tool to bring us back to a path of unity. Uh, perhaps there, there is no resolve for the, uh, the meet your match update and the attempt at bridging that gap between competitive and casual players and the competitive scene and the game, the stock game that you download, you know, having any, any sort of connection to that, that may not, never be resolved, but I think we still have hope. And, and I would say it's, it's morally just for Valve to continue to attempt to resolve any of these wounds between even just the casual player base, the casual fans of Team Fortress 2 and the developers themselves, because we're, we're looking at a considerable amount of time since their last real content update. 
And I think even from that, we can all spell that there's been a quite a disappointment with the content that they've added, especially when we consider that there is a wealth of fantastic uh, community-made maps, hats, weapons, concepts, ideas, brainstorm, power, playtesting, resources, tools that are available for them uh, that ha aren't being taken advantage of every, every time a year goes by and we only get a Halloween and a Christmas update. And so I think Badwater, I, th I think there's a way to rebrand and to re-celebrate bad water I, I i know it's not quite ceremonial as it's been 13 years since bad water has been added to this game but there is certainly potential for a bad water themed tf2 update in my opinion and I, th I think just simply based on the on the simple essence of celebrating bad water would be an appropriate attitude to have there's a number of things that could be done with this. Of course, different types of reskin maps, a, a Halloween version of Badwater, a rainy version of Badwater, a snowy version, any sort of reskin or modification. Again, perhaps those different versions of the map that I was talking about, transferring it to a different game mode, a man versus machine version of Badwater. Hmm? Wouldn't this be interesting? I, th I think it could be, you see? Um, only for the sake of them s showing us and, and looking at us and saying, hey, you know, we, we may have made some mistakes and we may have uh, become estranged. We may, we may need to, you know, this will be a process in rebuilding our relationship and, and finding common ground again. But I, we're, we want to do this to show you that we, we do acknowledge and understand some of your common ground, which is bad water. And, and we're going to, to use that as, a, as a, something that we can both hold on to and share and and remember what we do have in common and and try to understand what we did right from that to learn from bad water and to try to do better there could be for instance some sort of uh map contest to make bad water 2 I, I think this would be very compelling if, if valve hosted an official map contest i think there's a very strong mapping community and people uh could absolutely deliver a, a grade a level map into the game and, of course, if they couldn't, that'd be fine, because they just wouldn't do anything just like they wouldn't do anything with the promised heavy update that hasn't come out for three years. So, I, I think that would be a very exciting aspect to this, would be to ask the community to make their best Badwater-inspired map with the promise of adding it into the game as sort of this this big celebration of, of what, what Valve knows they did really well and the community has, has always loved and appreciated, and, and try to look back and take that same spirit and and they don't even have to to maybe worry about it too but there there is some kind of trust there as well in saying look we know it's been a tough transition away from us being the sole providers of this game being the sole content providers to ultimately depending on the community for a lot of the contributions to the game uh when badwater came out in the heavy update it was a, a time where there, there was no other contributor to the game than, than Valve. Maybe there was some very early custom mapping going on, but it, it was, you, you play the game and you hope that Valve's going to do something exciting. And so, I think using, using Badwater and that energy around it could be a very positive thing to create good, positive, new energy between the developers and the community. And I think give us something that wouldn't take the developers a lot of energy, but that we would appreciate a lot. You could have uh, Badwater-themed items, perhaps some sort of collectible memorabilia to say that you were part of the 2021 Badwater update, right? I, I think there's something to be said for in, in the traditional humor of Valve, uh, you know, to, 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 to be more personable and friendly and casual in their update posts, in their news announcements, to sort of, you know have a laugh at themselves for the fact that yep you know we're we're gonna name an update after a map that's already in the game it's it's the bad water update we're re-releasing bad water and you know they can add some some gimmick to it maybe i don't know yeah, hopefully hopefully nothing too terrible this is where i gotta really hold my tongue not to suggest they add skeletons to the map and and call it an event uh even though i probably mentioned that earlier but this could be a building a building point. I, I am not the most intelligent person on earth. I am not, uh, I don't have the, the power or, or energy or soul of a large group of people that would, could work together to really brainstorm a competent uh, media package, a competent press kit, a competent delivery, a competent 
concept of this Bad Water update that would be fully engrossed and an immersive multimedia experience for the fans to dive into and really be reminded of good times and enjoy. But you could certainly make that happen and give me enough time, I suppose I, I could as well. But I, I would just like to put a, a pin on that that I don't think you could do that with many other maps. I think I think you could do that with Dust Bowl. I think you could do that with Two Fort. But I think in both those cases, people would be upset. I think, I think, I think Two Fort and Dust Bowl absolutely have the, the most meme high quality of any maps. Very popular, very frequently played, but not good maps, okay? There's, there's something to be said for going back to Two Fort for the nostalgia, for playing it just for the hell of it because it is Two Fort and it's so freaking classic. But we, we can't argue that Two Fort is, is the most fun on every class compared to a map like Badwater. We can't, we can't argue with that with Dust Bowl. And Dust Bowl is very fun, but there's, you don't want to play Scout on, on Dust Bowl <laughs> probably anywhere. I mean, certainly on offense. There, there's a lot of things you, you, you probably shouldn't do or, or can't do on Dust Bowl. And granted, both those maps were ported from a Quake mod made 25 years ago or, or whatever. So it makes sense that those those maps would be an imperfect revival centerpiece for a cool new Valve update. Even though they do have that classic imagery, I, I think the Badwater update is really what we need as a community. And I think they need it maybe even more than we do to remind us that they care and they understand what we care about, which is Badwater. And, and Badwater is a place, like many maps on Team Fortress 2, where you can you have a lot of free choices to do what you want across the map. You can you can be a an angel or you can be a devil on Badwater. You can be a an arbiter of good or a uh, a decider, a doer of misfortune onto others. Right? Uh, this can happen with random crits. This can also happen uh, with spawn camping. And spawn camping is a, a extremely viable tool. And I would say it is. It is n probably no best than on payload maps because you have a consistent spawn point and you have enough time to make it happen, right? You, you, you could do it on a King of the Hill map, but it's a little further away. It's a little away from the centerpiece to spawn camp and it's probably going to be harder to stay there for a while because you're constantly being uh, passed by players coming from their spawn, right? When we, th when we think of spawn camping on a map like Badwater, if I, if I am to be on the blue team, and as soon as the round starts, I, I sticky jump or I rocket jump all the way back to their spawn, there's a significant portion of that route between that second and third point, between that third and last point, that I have to take where I'm not seeing any people. And it's quite desolate during those first two points. And so it gives me a lot of space to do this spawn camping. And then even once I get there, I have that, that big health pack by the final bomb site uh, to replenish my resources. And, and a lot, a lot, of, and a lot, of, a lot of, area, of area to escape to. If I'm a soldier or a scout, I can easily sort of run back up the rocket jump back up to tires. And it's a great place to spawn camp because there, there's a number of places you can hide right next to the spawn. There's these little walls on each side immediately out of the spawn. There's another room after you sort of pass through that open area that's a, a sniper sight lane when you're holding last. And, and there's a barrel you can hide on and, and another sort of hidden little behind the wall, hugging the wall edges where you could wait for someone from the blue team, so, excuse me, from the red team to come out of their spawn and to spawn camp them. I really like that and I really like that it's... it's uh, there's a sense of commitment. It's a little punishing if you want to get there because you cannot reopen that uh, door that they will be passing through if they're leaving their spawn. The door that sort of cuts through that huge portion of the map, right, is not available to you. And I, th I think that's a, a good way to ma make the spawn camping as well uh, more more of something that you have to hard commit to. But I do I do appreciate maps that have this sort of high level spawn camping capability because. It is fair in the way that it's spawn camped. You can always leave from another door if you realize you are being spawn camped uh, on the defensive team. It's it's something that you can always have the option to do as a blue player. And honestly, it gives you a real potential advantage in the game. If you can take out their teleporters, and you know even if you die, if that takes one minute of your time, 
that could be extremely valuable in taking down the red team over time. And I think having maps with meaningful spawn camping like this because there's a dependency on teleporters is a, is a great game feature, right? And it's just not as easily uh, set up as in many other payload maps, you know? It's, it's, uh, you, can, you can do it to some extent on, on Gold Rush and, and on Upward and on other maps where you can jump all the way behind them backs that are spawn. But I think it's very easy on this map because you do have that really long sort of dead portion in those first two points when they're defending where you can have some space and sort of figure out your game plan before you head into their spawn, which you don't have on a map like Gold Rush, you know? I'm thinking of a lot of points on Gold Rush where it's very hard to get in the spawn without a ton, a ton of attention on you. And even if you do, it's probably not crazy beneficial. Another good point to spawn camp would be the uh, the second spawn that you have on offense, which is the spawn you have once you've captured the third point. And the, the thing I like about spawn camping this is that if I'm a red player, I can hang out on roof. Uh, by second point, I can hang out on roof, lob some rockets down there, lob some pills down there. I could hang out with another player as a medic and uh, encourage them to do their lobbing and spamming down there. Um, even as a pyro, pyro is always great to spawn camp because you can just cause chaos. You don't even really need to kill people. You just catch everyone on fire and everyone panics and has to go to resup and w wants to deal with you because the pesky levels are off the rails. As spy, anywhere is great to spawn camp, but it's especially useful because it's not that far behind enemy lines, but behind where you might be anyway. As spy, it's it's a good place. Then you can you can go and sap the teleporters ruin the engineer's life and one of the the most fun things you can do on bad water as engineer and with both these spawns that i've just mentioned is to uh, set up a level three sentry behind their lines and if you can get a level three sentry on that roof looking down over them oh that can be so fun especially if you have this assistance of a soldier or maybe one other class to kind of prod them from that other side that they're going to be wanting to go to, oh, it can just be a, a beautiful recipe. And even if it lasts, doesn't very long, it's super enjoyable. And having maps with fun places to spawn camp is more valuable than you think, right? If we think of being spawn camped on uh, Koth Sawmill or any sawmill, which, by the way, doesn't happen often, but has happened before in my personally hosted Engineer 4v4 CTF Sawmill Pugs, where we did quite brutally punish them and spawn camp them in with sentries. Uh, it's not a very fun map to be spawn camped on um, or to really do the spawn camping. It's fun only in that it is incredibly difficult and rewarding once you set it up. But it doesn't feel clever so much as it feels to be the result of sheer brute force, right? When we think of spawn camping on Dust Bowl, it's not clever, you know? It's it's fun. I won't, I won't, I won't dispute that part of it. There's a, a brutish aggression that is always fun to spawn camping. But I would say, in addition to that inherent brutish aggression of spawn camping, of, of hacking the system, of being someone committing malarkey, it's very nice to feel that there was a, a sense of competency that came with your spawn camping, right? To know that it was not easy to get there. A again, if you are defending now, and we're on this last point of bad water, forgive me, if, if, you, are a, if you are offending, if you are pushing into this last point, and you go for map room and you make that little jump out up to that top right spawn. That is such a great place to spawn camp and cause problems because you can easily retreat back into map room. Retreat back into that little map room connector room uh, that they get into map room from. Where you can just bank off of that high ground. Hang on those barrels in the same room. You, you can hug the door as close as possible and w wait for one of them to come out and kill them from behind. And... It is very difficult for you to get there, and the other team will probably be punishing you to try to do so. If they don't, that's on them. If they do, it's very rewarding that you did get there. I do like that there's good spawn camping on bad water. None of it feels too lazy, and also none of it is, uh, for the most part, something that you can't deal with entirely. The, the points where you could get uh, completely held in in spawn camp, which really is just the the second spawn of the blue team that's the only the only spawn that has only one door and you could get stuck in is super difficult to hold as as the red team to to actually keep people in there and chances are if you are keeping some people in there 
there's other blue players running amok who are about to cap. So it's really not a a super feasible place to hard spawn camp. And, and I, I think that's just a sense of good balance because all the places that you can spawn in camp, you can mitigate it, you can leave from another door for the most part. And a, a great way to get to spawn camping on Badwater, of course, is to be using a jumper item. Or just be doing traditional rocket jumping or sticky jumping with the stock weapons. Regardless of how you do it, it is incredibly fun. And I know for sure that Badwater is one of the most fun maps to just freely jump around on, right? As, as the developers said in their statement about Badwater during the heavy update, they said that this was a map that was going to focus more on open spaces. And wow, is that true? There is not a lot of fun rocket jumping going on on Dust Bowl. I will tell you that much for sure. And it, it turns out that a lot of the fun in the game does come out from having open spaces. Soldiers, demo men, scouts, they all benefit so much from having more space they can move around, jump around in the air. And even other classes, I think, find a way to have a lot of fun. You can do some... Some Wrangler jumping as Engineer, there was a great spot on Badwater between the first and second point that was technically an exploit where you could get up on that, if, again, if you're looking at blue spawn from their second spawn between second and first point, on that left side of the wall, there's like a little roof and, and on the, the backmost edge of that roof, you could actually Wrangler sentry jump up there and put a dispenser and a teleporter and a sentry gun until it was patched, there was a good period of time where people were doing that. We can argue about whether that should have been patched or not. It is egregious to some extent, but... I can't say it was completely game-breaking, or that it was completely unwarranted, right? Because it did, it did require some degree of ingenuity for people to figure out. And just to actively get up there, even if they did know how to do it, it did take some, some level of technique and skill to get to that position as an engineer. And it's just a good example of how flexible the options are, even as classes that you wouldn't think of as traditionally depending on that vertical freedom and vertical mobility. There's a lot of cool places that the engineer can set up. If you think about on the last point of Badwater, above the bomb site, you have that, that little, uh, little <laughs> two by two feet uh, pillar with the little guardrails in the corner, sort of high up between where p people come out of the top left spawn and top right spawn. It's just this weird spot. You you can put a gun there. You can you can be a demo man who sticky jumps up there. You, you can be all sorts of things if you can manage to get there. And it's just nice that they put these little fun areas that say, hey, you know what? If you do really like playing around with vertical mobility, we'll give you this spot. It's not overpowered. It's not unfair, but you can have it. You can have options on this map with where you go, right? Even as Pyro, there's a lot of cool options now. You you can be detonator jumping, you can reflect jump with a rocket. And there's so many cool things you can do with that thanks to Badwater that you really couldn't do with a less vertically inclined, less open area map. And so I think when we think of general metrics of what makes a map fun, even though Soldier and Demo Man are just two of the classes in the game, maps that do have a lot of fun Soldier jumping, demo man jumping, tends to be metrics for an overall good map. There's a reason that CP Junction is not a fan favorite. And I can give you plenty of reasons why CP Junction is pretty cool, but this is a really tough component that even if you make the best freaking map in existence, if there's no fun soldier and rocket, <laughs> soldier and demo man jumping, rocket jumping, sticky jumping, it, it just, it can't be f that fun. It can't be that fun. It, it really can't. And, but Badwater can be that fun because you know there's a ton of great jumps to do on it. You've seen classic Tears in the Rain 2012 jump frag compilation movies by the best jump uh, congregates that I can't even remember the name of their establishment. But you've seen the great editing from jump communities and and cool videos where well, they're doing freestyle jumps across Badwater. I'm sure you've seen it. It's a very nice place to do these types of things. You've seen Star do his his four rocket jump pogo on Badwater at some point in 2014, right? It is a fun map 
for those classes, for those reasons, for, for rocket jumping, which ironically is going to make it a very fun class, a, a very fun map for the other classes too, because the thing you have to consider is that TF2 is a mobility game. It is a space game. If you put everyone in, in tight hallways and small rooms, it takes away the fun. And why is that? It's it's, it's not just about rocket jumping and, and uh, sticky jumping. It's not about that at all, really. It's about movement. It's about the fact that there's strafing in this game. It's about the fact that if you get hit by damage, it propels you. And you can actually maneuver around in the air strategically to your advantage. If you get hit by a projectile, you can surf that damage. And even if you don't mean to surf that damage, you're going to be surfing damage if you play Team Fortress 2. It's just inevitable. You're going to be flying around somewhere from getting hit by a rocket or, or a crit or whatever it is and so having places you can go having places you can surf to being able to take advantage of those circumstances that have been put on you having space quite literally space is very important and is that essence of bad water because we know it was written into the code they were trying to make bad water a map that took advantage of space of freedom of potential of letting you move around freely of not putting you in a little box because this isn't counter-strike this this is a this is a game about getting blown across the map and and being air blasted and and being shot by rockets and reflecting rockets and and you know e even as spy that i can think of so many reasons why badwater is a, a fun map most obviously we could say for all of the cool corner and stair stab potentials but also just all the great places that you can surf damage from you can you can kill an engineer get shot by a sentry and cloak and maybe surf all the way uh, to a different spot in that map you know when we think of that that f whole first point there's so much vertical area and you you never hit the skybox you know it's it's a very generous first point and they balance it out well later on with, with areas that are partially covered, partially roofed. Uh, but they never box you in too much. Even if you think of that sort of uh, catwalky, roofy uh, area between now, let's imagine, third and last point. How you have uh, directly behind the third point, you have that staircase that leads up to this, this room on the right side with a small health pack. And then to the left, you can go into that little room where engineers like to put their teleporter and that sort of... Uh, recessed below ground level area and then there's that big hallway on the right side which has a good amount of open space you, if if two soldiers connected to each other from opposite sides of that space you could still do rocket jumping at each other you could still you could still take advantage of all that area in a cool way and the the mystical magical perfectness of bad water is that there is all this space and it's not uh, abuse it's not it's not too generous to snipers. It's not too generous, I would say, to soldiers. I would say, I would say, a map like Dust Bowl is much more much more generous to projectile classes, right? But the funny thing is, even though you'll probably get higher damage as soldier or demo man on Dust Bowl, I would say Battlewater is going to be more fun. You you have more places to be, more movement options, more. Uh, strategic options rather than just staring down a choke and pressing mouse one right you can you can create your own gameplay characteristics your own personal identity on badwater by spending the time where you do by making this such a big map there is a lot of player expression which i think the lesson of badwater and gold rush is that that is actually quite important to making a good map Another good example of this is all of the different options you can have as engineer and, and being sneaky. We all, we know the obvious positions to be in as engineer, to be in defensive spots on the rooftop, on this upper cliffside of the first point, underneath the terrace, on the last point, right? But you can actually play engineer offensively with level three sentry on bad water which is its own interesting fun experience right you could be you could be slowly pushing up with your team and there's enough uh there's enough positional uh resonant points where there's enough damage shielded from you and you are able to uh still have a, a good offensive foothold and, and keep the momentum forward for your team in addition to supplying 
dispensers and teleporters where it actually is viable to have an engineer on that stock wrench the whole time and keep in mind this was a map that was designed when the engineer only had the stock wrench so there was a time when people played this game and you would more regularly see level three engineers pushing forward offensively and i think that kind of area denial classic play of engineer which can be very frustrating to people should not be frustrating at, at least on this map it, if we accept the fact that yes Team Fortress 2 is a game with nine classes, and, and that is the way that it was made. We have to forgive Engineer and, and Level 3 Sentries for existing in some cases, right? Because when when a Level 3 Sentry is not fun is on a Gold Rush choke, where there's only one spot to go through, and there's a Sentry watching it. That's not fun, because half the classes, what do you do? You have to wait. You don't have really a means to deal with it. It's doesn't feel smart, doesn't feel intelligent. On Badwater, it really comes down to the way that you want to play, you know, and, and being smart and reading the opponent, right? If, if you do have a, a, a sentry offensively on Badwater, a level 3 sentry, there's still always ways to deal with it because there's almost always at least two, potentially three ways to get from point A to B, to get across Badwater, right? And so I think that makes it that... The, an engineer A is being strategic in where he places his sentry because it's, okay, where do I want to deny area? Where do I want to control the map? Because I probably can't control anywhere. And if I, if I try to do that, someone is still going to get through, right? Or be able to shoot at me from another area. So I have to be, I have to be thoughtful about where I put this. Very good map design. And other people d do have the ability to go around me. You know, if they're smart about where I am, they should be able to handle it, right? And even in those areas where it is a, cho a, a bit of a choke and there is no obvious way to maneuver past the sentry, in those areas, like I'm thinking of the third point, there's enough cover in the environment, in the architecture, that you can hide behind certain walls or, or have little nooks that you hang out in. They're easy enough to just peek from and do damage to that sentry. Badwater is, in my opinion, the optimal first map to play TF2 on, and I know I've been very aggrandizing and uh, a little too romantic with my portrayal of Badwater so far, and we can split the difference here. I, I, I'm okay to accept some of its imperfections. I've just said that I don't want to fixate on that very much, but I think Badwater it would be a great first TF2 map to play, even though the fact that it is quite chaotic and there is a lot of map to discover. Here's here's my pitch for it, okay? Initially, I thought Gold Rush was actually a better TF2 map to play first, and I know what you're thinking. Why why does Payload have to be the optimal first game mode to show someone TF2 with? It's the optimal first game mode because it's, it's very freaking easy to understand. If you have a sense of where the card is, you can follow it the whole time, and that's the difference, right? You see new players constantly getting lost on 5CP maps. They know there's a control point, they don't know how to get to it. On pretty much any payload map, it's going to be very hard to not see the, tr the the rails on the ground, to not find the payload cart, and not to get, oh, that I'm pushing it. You know, I get health back from it. it it's very re a rewarding experience. So I think in that essence, payload really is the first game mode because if a, a new player should experience because if you're really, really bad at this game, it's the only thing that gives you a shot to feel like you're really contributing to helping the team, contributing to the objective without getting completely trashed on because I, I think the effort involved in trying to find a capture point and trying to find trying to stand on a king of the hill point without getting trashed is, is tough because in most other game modes you have to stick your neck out to achieve the objective whereas there's a lot of time in gold rush and bad water where you can push the cart and you, you don't have to worry about the enemy yet right there's a handful of times where you're pushing the cart and there's gonna be people from the enemy team shooting at you but there's also a lot of times where your team will have already pushed up past where you are with the cart, giving you space to keep pushing it, focus on the objective, learn what's going on. Again, I'm thinking of, you know, the most basic bottom of the barrel gamer, someone who doesn't have a lot of experience with FPS games, with games at all for that matter. I'm thinking about the, the most basic thing to digest that we can all agree should still be fun and engaging for an experienced player because many experienced players find tremendous joy in bad water. Now the difference though, between Badwater and Gold Rush, 
is tricky because I would say Gold Rush is a good first optimal map because it is so choke pointy. It is a, a much more concentrated map, and there's usually only two capture points on each map, so it's it's easier to comprehend in that way. It's a little smaller scale, less places to get lost, absolutely, but the big drawback of it is that there's different stages every time, right? So if you play on bad water, it is a little larger, yes, but you have the same stage every time, which I think is is necessary and in not overwhelming the new player, and I think makes for the most beneficial experience. Badwater has a number of great variants. We've seen Badwater Rainy, which is an ironic map, uh, because there is no water normally on Badwater, despite it being named Badwater, which has grown frustrating for many people, of course, if they do not understand the true history of the name, which I probably do not understand completely as well. But the fact that a, a map like Badwater Rainy, which is in large part bad because of how much of the map you have to swim through has become so successful is just indicative of the fact that people really do love and cherish bad water. I don't think Junction Rainy would have been as successful without a doubt. And if you don't know what bad water Rainy is, it's a great custom map that the entire the entirety of bad water is completely covered in in rain and water and it's flooded in some areas. And it's the only thing you could really get away with. Again, if I'm thinking of this this perfect Valve Badwater update, you you can perverse the map, and it can be sort of cheeky and fun and, and imperfect, and it doesn't need to, to best Badwater. That's what we saved the, the mapping contest of, of making Badwater 2 by Valve during the Badwater update. That's what that would be for. But it just needs to give people a new way to experience bad water because people love bad water you know give it to me rainy give it to me snowy give it to me with green textures you know like it's barn blitz pro like i would love all of those things because really the 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 amount of bad water that we get is frankly it could it could almost always be higher you know i i think uh i think the fact that it's on not quite on even grounds with maps like turbine or two fort or dust bowl is a little disturbing to me right there are plenty of Skyle Turbine servers, Skyle Two Fort servers, but where? How come there's not a lot of Skyle uh, Badwater 24/7 servers? I don't want to play Skyle Payload. I want to play Badwater, you know. And maybe it's just it hasn't been echoed enough. Maybe it's the it's really the fault that there are so many good classic Payload maps, right? That also would want to be played with Badwater, would be seen as brothers to Badwater, would be seen as contemporaries in that same pool. Whereas when we look at something like, let's say. Dust Bowl, it's like, well, who else, who wants to play Gravel Pit in Egypt right after this? Not as many people, and I think Gravel Pit's cool, but sure as hell, you're not going to find a lot of people wanting to play Gravel Pit in pubs. It just does not happen. And the same can be said of Two Fort. Who wants to play, you know, Double Cross and uh, Landfall, and I don't, I don't even know what, you know, CTF Lost Game Mode, right? Who wants to play CTF well as frequently as Two Fort? No one. No one on Earth, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your perspective. But it would be good to see Skyle Badwater 24-7. So maybe I'm just putting it out there. If we can get enough energy behind it, if the Badwater update comes out, I think we can really get the buzz needed to play it more. But the beautiful luxury you have too of a map like Badwater is it is almost always available to you. If you just want to queue for casual and only queue for Badwater, you're pretty much always going to get a map. It's one of the most frequently played maps. If you want to queue, uh, sorry, not queue, if you want to manually connect to a server with the community servers tab, of course, classic, like we used to do before most of the community servers were killed. You can very frequently find people playing on Badwater, even with as, as rare as community servers are nowadays. So this is a, a big plus for the map is its availability, right? If we think about a product that is perhaps very desirable, but is very unavailable to us, we would perceive it in high value. But the thing is, there's there's a limit to this, this system, right? If something is extremely high value, but extremely... Uh, unavailable to us, it's also possible that it will not yield a great reward or profit, right? It, there needs to be the sweet spot of it It needs to be of substantial value enough, right? It can't be, e even if it's really available, if it's if it's shitty, if it's kind of cheap, if it's a plasticky bad product, it's not gonna, you know, it's, it's not gonna be something you're gonna want to buy again and again and again and again because, you know, it's gonna break, it's gonna, it's gonna have its flaws, but at the same time if it's too unattainable, if it's too perfect, 
it, it's, it's too much of a hole in your pocket, and you have to go through a lot more effort to get it. There's something about the right median level of availability, right? A map like, let's say, PL Barn Blitz, which I think is a fantastic map, is more or less, you know, a little brother to Badwater. It's not going to be as available to Badwater, and I think that does hurt its overall power ranking. Unfortunately, it's just the truth. Because could, could you imagine a Team Fortress 2 without bad water and that is a that is something i think that would be very hard to argue and of course you can see it so can i i have an imagination we can see team fortress 2 without bad water they never had that map we only have gold rush and hoodoo to have that beautiful southwest desert charm in our beloved team fortress 2 payload selection but I definitely think it's like taking a good 20-25% cut out of the game. Most of the other payload maps, they're good, but I don't crave them, right? I'm a veteran player. I've played a damn lot of the game. I've played a lot of competitive. I'm, I, I've gotten a lot of the fun out of my system, right? I've, I've scratched a lot of itches that needed to be scratched. I've played on Hydro, which is, you know, a, a rare experience. I've... I've done all sorts of perverse formats, you know, any sort of thing you can imagine I've, I've probably experienced as a TF2 player. And so it's not many of those things that you want to just sort of do again and again mindlessly. There is a limit to how much you can do, right? But for something to be so classic, it, it yearns and, and asks you for more, I think is a very good sign and something that's essential for a game's longevity, right? Maybe not without bad water alone, but if, if we assume that we took out Badwater, Dust Bowl, Two Fort, a lot of these extremely classic maps, you would be at risk of seriously hurting the game. And and maybe this is what I could argue, uh, maybe uh, budding games that never really quite make it uh, are struggling to have, right? They need a DE underscore Dust. They need something super iconic that it's so lovable, it's so familiar. And of course there's a part of it that says, well, this map has become so familiar because people play it so much. And I get that, especially with maps like Two Fort, even with Two Fort, but especially with Battle we have to say there's a reason. There's a reason this map has risen to the top. There's a reason that if you pull every TF2 player, I'm telling you, it's gonna be it's gonna be one of the most popular maps. And it's not just because of its availability, it's there's something intrinsic to it that is superior, that is special. And, and that's the key word, really. Badwater is quite special. It, it, is a, it is a map of a special variety. It has a lot of specialness in it that you can experience and feel, just like the feeling of a hot cocoa on Christmas morning with snow outside. It's not, it's not, it's not really that great, but it's the, it's, there's a specific combination of things that become special. It's like, oh, you have, um, you have tea... Uh, while it's snowing outside, while you're listening to John Lennon, that's not a thing. It's not special. It could be special. Everything can be special when you're when we're focusing on it in the right way. But there are some things that are like special formulas that are just going to be special, you know. And there's something about that perfect mix of things that is bad water that has that essence to it, and that TF2 would be lacking in some way without it. I don't think the game would be too hurt that it could not go on. Absolutely not. Maybe not even that significant of a damage, but I do think when we think of the pubbing appeal of Team Fortress 2, and when I think of the pubbing appeal of, of Payload, um, we can also consider that Badwater's contribution is more than just itself, right? Badwater was, if, if I'm correct, the second Payload map added to the game after Gold Rush. Gold Rush, to me, especially compared to Badwater, is not a very inspiring map. It's, it's not, it doesn't, it's good. I like Gold Rush, it was the first map I ever played, it has a nice essence, but Badwater has more of that, wow. We could spend a lot of time here. This is, this is really special. At least this is my, my opinion about it. And so if we think about all the maps that came after Badwater, good, that were good payload maps, right? Barn Blitz, Upward, um, Swift Water even. It has water in the name, you know? I think a lot of these maps were inspired by Badwater. Badwater was the first open payload map, right? Swiftwater, again, a very open payload map. Has water in the name. We can see these parallels. 
Barn Blitz as well. They learned their lesson from Gold Rush to some extent, I think, in trying to make a more complex, more open, more multi-channeled map with lots of places to go into. And it's tough to say how TF2 would have been differently if Badwater was never made. Did it contribute greatly to the initial buzz of the game? It's possible. I don't know. I don't know how much is too far to say, even if all of this is just, okay, a 5%, right? We take bad water out, we lose 10%, we lose 5% of the, of, the, of the game's power, of the game's effect on the world. It's something. And it's probably probably a lot more than, than, than a lot of the other maps, I'll say that. Badwater is a map that I've experienced a plethora of memories on. Or better put, I've experienced a plethora of things on Badwater which have crystallized into memories and serve as a constant reminder that Badwater has been a fertile ground for many important experiences that created the TF2 player that I would ultimately become. On Badwater, I do remember watching Highlander on Badwater when I was very initially getting into the game I remember watching Dave Plus an engineer main and his uh, point of view from match on Badwater he was on the team called the Syndicate probably between season six and nine or something like this in UGC Highlander and one of the cool things that you were able to do on PL Badwater back then is that you could build a sentry in the spawn as a blue engineer. There was these little spots where if you clipped kind of where the gates would open up, you could place a sentry. You could also place a teleporter. And so for a long time until it was patched in, I don't know, 2014 or something, you could preemptively build level three sentries in your spawn and then take them out, bring them up that left side of the cliff. You could also just preemptively build teleporters, which would then remain in that position for your team to use throughout the duration of the round. And even though we all knew this was an exploit, this was an aspect of Badwater that we really enjoyed and appreciated. Just like the rooftop example I mentioned earlier about the rooftop engineer exploit in between points one and two, where you have that flat wall on the other side, and on the other side there's the, the roof exploit where an engineer could get up and set up some of his buildings. Even though these were exploits, and technically the, the creators of the game, Valve, did not want us to do this on PL Badwater, we, the players, took it into our own power to be able to do it on the map, and it probably enhanced our experience, because even though it, it was not something they intended us to do, it was something that gave us options, it gave us more purpose, it gave us things to do that felt mischievous, that felt like we were exploiting the system, and that not everybody knew about, right? Not everyone did know about this exploit as a blue engineer where you could build a sentry in your own base. And so that made it feel special if you could execute it. It made you feel of your your proud a proud teammate. You would feel proud of your fellow engineer if you saw them executing this kind of move while you were in spawn, knowing that you did have a competent engineer because they were aware of this exploit on PL Badwater. And thinking about that initial blue spawn area on Badwater, it reminds me of the glass in, in that initial spawn room and how you can actually shoot some rockets back there uh, if you line up your, your crosshair correctly. There is some sort of low-level interactability to that, that sort of extra subroom behind you in that first spawn area that is blocked off by glass. It is reminiscent of... Uh, a, a similar area, I believe, in SD Doomsday, or, or or maybe many of the other maps where you have some part of the spawn area that you can look back into, and sometimes you can place a teleporter. I can't remember if that was on PL Badwater that used to be able to place a teleporter in that behind the spawn area and get back there. But nonetheless, even if that is just a fantasy, it's nice to have these ephemeral out of reach areas there's there's a similar one on the red spawn that if you look behind you there's this uh sort of long tall chamber with a bomb at the bottom uh which which was excavated out to some degree and expanded upon perhaps depending on your definition of expanded upon in pl badwater pro where the top defense spawn and the bottom defense spawn are actually connected and pl badwater pro is an interesting thing because 
Not everyone will agree with the changes that were made, but we all can agree that it is a testament to Badwater's cohesive design initially as a map that there are so few changes. Something I do find interesting is this contention about uh, this area right by the second point on the ground where you have this little cement divider on, on the ground in the, in the original map. And then there was a version of the pro map that had a huge sort of rafter there, a huge sort of uh, fence wall type thing that extended up above that slab of concrete that sort of denied that long, uh, that long space from being a good sniper sightline. And this was something I, I understand, and, and it seems reasonable to me that they did this in Badwater Pro, but I also don't know how necessary it is. I, we, we do know that that is a sightline in Badwater, that sort of long area between first and second, and that snipers do have some good range there. But at the same time, if you're not a sniper, why would you really need to be hanging out there, you know? I, I think it's a, it is a sightline, but it's a fair game sightline, right? You know what to expect when you cross over it. And sure, this can lead to some sort of unfortunate, maybe seemingly unfair circumstances where, let's say I've just spawned and now I'm crossing, trying to get past this sight line as someone who just spawned on the defensive team. And I'm at risk now of being shot by a sniper. But that also depends on how much of a hold your team has, right? Because if, if it is a... If you are at high risk of getting shot there, it probably means that your sniper's not putting pressure on them. Uh, you don't have uh, scouts or normal teammates causing chaos in that choke, distracting them. Your team in general hasn't pushed up enough against them. You don't have the capabilities to spam out the choke a little to distract the sniper with explosions and pyro flames. So I do think it is a, a fair game choke point, a fair game sniper sightline. And it's uh, part of my thinking in this is that it's very interesting and correct me if I'm wrong here that it seems that there was a version of Pro Badwater that had this rafter and then it seems that there was a later version that removed it and and maybe this is screwed up in my mind and there are new servers that just happen to be p playing an old version of PL Badwater Pro but assuming that this is the newest version I'm seeing in rotation it does seem that they have added that rafter and then removed it which really makes you think huh I guess it wasn't as uh, important as we thought it might have been. We also see in PL Badwater Pro that connecting of those defensive spawns that we talked about. I think this is a totally fair, um, no, uh, you know, no flack on that decision on, on making the defensive spawns connect on Badwater, because at the least, I believe y you would have still been able to change classes or do a, a Bany resupply bind to switch spawns if you if you spawned in an unfavorable one so i don't think it's unreasonable for them to also give you a, a physical way to move between them i think it's very difficult to argue that that makes uh that gives the defensive team an unfair advantage in any way i don't think that's that's reasonable to argue or conclude we also think about the blue team having a, a additional offensive spawn point on pl badwater pro and that spawn, of course, is right by the first point, um, which I believe is accessed when they capture the second point on PL Badwater Pro. And this is one of those things that I understand why it's there. I think it, I think it saves walking time, and, and in that way, it does enhance gameplay. But what I would ask if it is necessary. And one of the most fun things you can do as a spy on Badwater is kind of exploit the length of these really long walks either by creating this this walk to exploit by destroying the enemy blue engineers teleporters which is always a great thing to do as spy when you really get behind the lines on bad water and because of that big slope that they would have to walk up to leaving their base as as a blue player on bad water there's a lot of cool places that you can be watching from the high ground as spy cloaked and and picking off targets one by one potentially as they leave the spawn. I do think uh, particularly in, in, in pub TF2 and even in competitive TF2 this is a, a cool aspect of it that you can appreciate a lot especially when you're playing spy. That there is something for you to do when 
the other classes, it might seem they're just mundanely walking to the, the front line, walking to the battlements from their base. And that does remind me of the height addendum spy videos by Subtle Art, famously uh, on, on PL Badwater. I, I do believe there are some sparse clips from other maps, but the main maps you see played by, by Subtle Art in these classic spy videos that have to be from, what, 2009? You can, whatever upload you can find was probably a re-upload too, so I, I think it really was very old, you know, potentially from the time of the heavy update, this footage. If you don't know who Subtle Art was, they were one of the oldest uh, spy TF2 YouTubers, um, arguably inventing the stair stab and, and showing a number of uh, sort of annotated spy videos explaining the mindset of how you could create illusions and confuse people using the invisible watch. Again before there was any spy unlocks and Badwater you saw a lot of his clips on the map because it, it was a perfect map for height advantage and for playing spy e even before uh, when there were no additional ammo packs that would give you cloak because there was a period of time where your cloak uh, would not regen using ammo packs or, or weapons um, you did have to depend on that high ground and being very smart positionally and because of that open space in Valor, I think it was a lot easier to actually play Spy strategically. Again comparing this to the first payload map, Gold Rush, where I don't think there was a lot of room to play Spy uh, very st strategically because you didn't have space to kind of get away from the enemy. And you need that negative space when you're, when you're playing that traditional role of Spy being very sneaky and trying to buy time to, to recuperate, to regenerate cloak back in those days, and to uh, ass assess the enemy and make a new plan. And al also, it's always viable to a spy just to be causing paranoia and, you know, uncloaking and shooting at them, recloaking, and, and just creating this sense of uh, insanity with the other team, you know, long before this sort of over-exuberant dead ringer play style of spy that became very popular in the 2010s. When, when Badwater came out, when the heavy update come, came out, there was a, a different way of, of really how you had to play Spy that was a lot less flashy and a lot, a lot more based on subtlety and creating paranoia and be, literally being sneaky, right, rather than uh, exploiting, uh, exploiting hitboxes and... Uh, getting right up in people's faces, which can be good too, but it's just, it's interesting to think about that Badwater was potentially designed for a better spy experience, among other things. So PL Badwater was announced on the third day of the heavy update, the heavy update being released on August 19th, 2008. And so you see, being born between July 23rd and August 22nd would situate you on the astrological sign of a Leo. Leo, of course, being illustrated by the symbol of a lion. And the, the astrological life path number for all who are born on August 19th, 2008, is actually the number one, which I think is quite telling because uh, it does seem that my case so far has been to argue that PL Badwater is map number one, perhaps the greatest TF2 map of all time. And it is also uh, elementally a fire uh, astrological thing. So it has a, a fiery essence if we think about the uh, the Fire Nation and Avatar The Last Airbender. They are the domineering, conquering nation when the uh, story begins and for the majority of the story. And so I, I, I can also see a parallel there with P.L. Badwater being a very domineering map, perhaps uh, overwhelming and suppressing the likes of other maps like uh, the weak Aaron Nomads would be wiped out. Uh, PL Hoodoo, perhaps, being uh, wiped out by this astrological lion, Leo, August 19th, 2008, known as PL Badwater. The kind of uh, characteristics of a native born under this modality would be having great willpower, disliking almost every change, and preferring clear paths, rules, and procedures, uh, which which is interesting because I suppose a a map uh, would be something that dislikes almost every change, meaning that the map does not want to be changed. Right? We we don't want a lot of patch notes and bug fixes where they change 
significant parts of the map. We know a map like Gully Wash, right, or CP Process had some significant changes, but I'd have to check their astrological signs to make sense of that, because here I can see that it makes sense that Peel Badwater would be a map that would be hardly touched at all by the developers after its release. And um, even in that case that it was it was changed in Peel Badwater Pro where they added that rafter on the second point above that little horizontal wedge of concrete to block the sniper sight line, that change on Peel Badwater Pro is eventually redacted, um, potentially honoring or submitting to the will of P.L. Badwater's Leo the Lion energy, which dislikes change in general. So I, I think that's quite interesting. Something else of note here regarding uh, being born on August 19th, 2008, is that it is the, the Chinese astrological year uh, symbolized by the rat. It is the year of the rat. And some, some characteristics we can draw from this, from, the, from its Chinese zodiac, is that P.L. Badwater is a very persuasive person, a very full of ambition person, a very sociable person, and a very shrewd person. Uh, we can also understand that their behavior and love would be devoted, sometimes impulsive, but also capable of intense affection and giving of care. Which I, I think we can all easily imagine that P.L. Badwater would be like that in a romantic situation. Something else to understand is that uh, in terms of being born under the year of the rat, some other famous figures that we can compare P.L. Badwater to also born under the year of the rat are uh, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, the famous composer, Eminem, um, rap god, and Katy Perry, pop star. Um, I can definitely see some similarities there with Eminem in that this map is fast, it is a an escape from Detroit, it is very different from Detroit, it is an escape from a Detroit Eminem having to rise up out of his uh, his difficult childhood and circumstances in the, uh, the, the, the very poor Detroit neighborhoods to make his way to fame, to play on PL Badwater. And Wolfgang Mozart obviously just being a uh, creative genius, which I think we could like in similar terms around the inception of P.L. Badwater. Payload Badwater certainly being an act of creative genius. Something else to note is that uh, this map did come out on the heavy update on August 19th, 2008, which was a Tuesday. And so I guess I can speculate that like most uh, TF2 updates, it probably was not released till a little later on in the afternoon. So I, we can imagine some people playing P.L. Badwater for the first time uh, on a Tuesday night. Um, I was not one of those people, unfortunately. But I would like to also imagine that seeing this would have been um, the, the Tuesday that's either uh, one or two or three weeks before most schools start in North America. Uh, I would like to think there was a lot of eager high school students, middle school students, college students who were playing TF2 at the time and this was their some of their last weeks before summer break. You have that feeling that school is coming soon when all of a sudden on a Tuesday the heavy update drops and you get to play PL Badwater. And I think Tuesdays are kind of a, a lost day in terms of their identity. It's, it's easy to understand Wednesday, we call it hump day. Monday is the day people hate because they start working for the first time after Saturday and Sunday. And then Thursday is like, well, it's almost Friday. And Friday is like, hey, this it's the last day of traditional work and school schedules. And you know how Saturday and Sunday are, the Sabbath and day of Saturn and all that. But it's a, a Tuesday that is hard to pinpoint. What does a Tuesday mean? There's not much identity to it and so I do wonder what Valve was thinking when they thought well when do we want to drop PL Badwater when do we want to drop the heavy update we know Badwater is going to be a bombshell let's give it to him Tuesday and I think maybe part of their thinking here is that Tuesday is sort of this open day without much identity very archetypally f feminine waiting to be um, led and uh uh, sculpted in in the, by the uh, the persuasion and and masculine energy of P.L. Badwater, right? Um, I I do find that interesting, certainly, and uh, I I I will have to consider 
what what the birth date of P.L. Badwater, if this had other effects long term that I may not have been able to see, right? Um, I, I am not a astrological expert, so I can't tell you what it means that the sun was in Leo at 26 degrees and 23 seconds on August 19th, 2008, when P.O. Badwater was born. But I can tell you that it is probably very important information that we should be uh, considering and looking more deeply into when it comes to understanding the true nature of Badwater. It's important to look to the origin story to understand exactly what the path laid out for Badwater will be and what, what the ultimate fate of Badwater will be. Will we see a Team Fortress 3 ever? Will there be a Team Fortress Pro mod? Will there be a game inspired by Team Fortress 2? What can we expect 10 years from now? And is Badwater still in that equation? Just as we saw the spiritual identity of Dust Bowl and Two Fort preserved from its predecessor game into Team Fortress 2, can we expect, should we expect, will we deserve, will we get PL Badwater in the next Team Fortress game? I would like to call in Tyler McVicker um, from Valve News Network to have his opinion on this, but uh, the budget here at Casualty of 2 is not high enough yet. I do need your support on Patreon so we can get Tyler McVicker to tell us his thoughts on PL Badwater being in a new Team Fortress related game in this next decade. As an amendment to something I mentioned earlier, where, uh, as you will see, I am a fallible human whose memory has deteriorated greatly since my, uh, my spry, hyper-intelligent ferocity of being a kid, that I did not note earlier that a Halloween reskin of Badwater already exists, and I have even played it, being called P.L. Bloodwater. I think it's important that we uh, take a moment to to analyze P.L. Bloodwater and remember that it was added to the game. It is uh, a, a wise decision, as I very much so argued for them, to continue shilling and continue reaping the benefits of such a powerful piece of symbolic imagery in the Team Fortress 2 universe as Payload Badwater. So it was really wise of them to add in that Scream Fortress 2020 update a community-made Halloween-themed version of Badwater Basin. I, I think that was a, a, an important move. Um, that being said, uh, it was still a community-made version uh, by Ryan Chill Foy from France. It was made by a French player, which is uh, something interesting to note. Um, Badwater big here in America with Casual TF2. Badwater also big in France with the developer of Bloodwater hailing from that region. Also shout out to Iron, another developer from Argentina who worked on Bloodwater. Quite an interesting collaboration there. Seeing South America and Europe work together for the sake of propagating the, uh, the imagery, the experience, the spirit, the essence of Badwater into a new form during Halloween. Uh, I would not say that the Halloween mode is uh, the best that TF2 has to offer, but if you were to play the Halloween mode, I would want to be playing PL Blood Water. I, I think that part is very intuitive to me to be playing a good map on a imperfect mode. That's a fun mode for having fun and being silly on Halloween, if anything. A holiday uh, devoted to uh, horror and uh, traumatizing people, which that's interesting in its own way. Uh, there are quite a few hazards on PL Bloodwater. Uh, so there's a interesting uh, hidden sort of lava room you can fall into underneath the B point, underneath the the up top high ground roof area on B, which is interesting. They've also added a clock tower to PL Bloodwater, which I think is a very nice touch. Uh, it, it's something that even I think could be cool perhaps in a different version of Badwater. I do like that there there is a clock tower. It's not too too far off from the potential theme of PL Badwater. Does Badwater elicit more fun on offense or defense? This is a question I've thought about a lot and can't say I've come to many promising conclusions because to put it bluntly, 
Blood, Badwater has typically been equally as fun for me on offense and defense. I would say the main stipulation here between offense and defense has to do with two things. It has to do with what class you're playing, and it has to do with how balanced the match is. So first, because it's a bit easier to tackle, let's talk about how the difference b between a unbalanced game and a balanced game is going to affect the amount of fun that you have on Badwater, depending on whether you are on blue or red team. So you see, on, on a very balanced Badwater server, where the game is, is very fair, uh, the differences between blue and red are a little harder to tell because it can be equally satisfying to hold as it is to push, right? Um, if it's a very close game and you just barely hold it and win, that's satisfying. And likely, uh, in the same vein, if you have a very slow and difficult, strenuous push that finally is successful, that can be a very rewarding feeling on PL Badwater. Now, imagine instead that the teams are actually quite unfairly balanced, and that this push is actually painstakingly difficult. This is where we get into the high-risk, high-reward category of public gaming, public match Team Fortress 2 because if, if those pushes that are just barely made are impossible, oh man, you're, you're in for one. You're, you're in for some, some pain. It's only just barely fun if you do just barely push, but if you spend seven minutes trying to push the third point and fail, it's very un, unsatisfying and unrewarding because you don't even get to play the last part of the map. And I would say, this is what makes uh, Payload unique in the way that a role can play out compared to other game modes like 5CP, or King of the Hill, or even Capture the Flag, or even Arena, or Special Delivery, or Payload Race. Because in the case, well I guess Payload Race maybe is more like it, but with Payload Race there isn't checkpoints either, and so on Badwater, if you don't capture that third point, you don't even get to play the last point, you know, as an offense player or defense player, and I think that's less fun for everyone. I think a lot of the fun of a payload map is that it's kind of like you're, you're, you're quickly digesting between numerous different maps. You have some time to focus on the first point, both on offense and defense. You get to spend, you know, three to five minutes there, really hanging out and absorbing that environment. You know, it's, it, is, it is a stage of the map in a certain way. And then you go on and you, you work on contesting that second point and you're kind of dealing with a new setting and continuing onwards and onwards as you progress through the points. It, the, the setting is, is more dynamic than a 5CP map where you may be jumping back and forth between the same capture points very frequently. And of course, it's impossible for the game to end on 5CP if you don't visit all of those locations. Again, the map usually being a mirror, there's nothing different about pushing the enemy team's last as there is, at least in terms of the ambiance of holding last, because it's, it's really the same last that's been mirrored. It, it is different uh, in terms of the way that you play the game, whether you are going to be holding or defending, but the visual ambiance, the the sense of being in, in a different place will not uh, be as strong as it is on a payload map. So I would consider this uh, one of the less fun parts about Badwater is if there is a role, because you'll not be able to play the other parts of the map, uh, which even even though it's it's probably most unsatisfying to be held held down and and punished into submission and made to suffer by the the blades of the enemy team on blue team, you know, to, to suffer to red as a blue player, because, you know, you're the one trying to make the play and you've been shut down by the defense. It is really a loss for both teams, I believe, when you're not able to completely play a full round of bad water and experience all that bad water has to offer from start to finish. Uh, something else to consider with the difference between offense and defense and a role is that uh, as I was sort of alluding to there, I do believe it is much more fun in the case of a role to be on defense than offense. Um, there is something slightly satisfying 
and, uh, you know, TF2 medic Germany schadenfreude about holding the enemy team back at a point. Because really, in a pub environment, especially in a competitive environment, you expect them to cap all the points. You, you expect them to maybe struggle with the last point, but getting stuck on the first point definitely seems like, wow, that team has been getting their ass kicked. They have been held back because really in most cases you should be able to cap that first point. Now moving on, I did mention that Badwater's amount of fun, depending on offense or defense, is also closely correlated to the class that you are playing. And so to go through that, we can start by talking about scout and the difference between scout on Badwater on offense compared to scout on Badwater on defense. So scout on Badwater on offense is going to be inherently a little less interesting simply because you're guaranteed to have to deal with sentries, something that you are not very well equipped to handle as a scout is level 3 sentries. Um, again, even if you are on red and you have level, level 1 little baby mini sentries to deal with from blue engineers, it's not that much of a problem. You can kind of quickly take those out with the scatter gun. Uh, but a fully set up level 3 engi engineer with some space between you is going to be quite a hassle playing scout on bad water. Another aspect of this is that typically as an offensive scout, you're expected to be spending a lot of time on the cart. This is sort of colloquial in, uh, in pubs. I don't think it's super strictly expected and enforced, but it is inherent to the game's design because you are going to push the... the the payload cart twice as fast as any other class um, just by default everyone using stock items on bad water which does give you a bit of a clue of like ah I probably should be maybe spending a little more time doing this than anyone else because for, you know it's gonna take two bodies on the cart otherwise and uh, I can do I can do two jobs at once I'm a very efficient worker you know as, as scout on offense on bad water you're the reason why uh, corporate companies will, you know, they will fire half of their employees because they have a new brand of super employees they've hired from the third world who charge half as much or work twice as fast, right? Um, some sort of super geek freak employee race that is able to, to get the job done twice as efficient, meaning, great, we can cut half our expenses by cutting half of our employees. It's just good business, for better or worse. So you do have that nice advantage that you could really uh, home wreck an existing corporation as the scout on offense on bad water. But besides the cart, we have to think about the gameplay experience of scout more than anything. Because even if a scout is being very diligent on the cart, making sure it's tapped and the 20 seconds don't go down so it starts rolling back. And let's imagine a hypothetical as well where the whole team is being very diligent on the cart. So it's not quite as dependent on only the scout to handle moving forward and progressing throughout the map. We could then see lots of new opportunities for scout on offense on Badwater. We could we could see them playing flanks and taking out key opponents on the enemy team. A scout of course is going to be very good for taking out snipers which you might find in occasionally vulnerable areas on Badwater if you think about that first point on bad water, it's, it's very common to have the engineer holding the red engineer on that cliff and snipers on the opposite side of the map where you have all those, those little rocky cliff uh, uh, extensions of the earth right by the medium health pack and large ammo pack. Um, you get snipers kind of crawling up there and trying to snipe all the way, uh, all the way from that what would be the rightmost spawn if you were spawning up on blue team, making you vulnerable there. And that's a place where the scout could sneak through the tunnel and, and wrap around and, and sneak up behind a sniper and kill them, you know? I think as a scout, because of your speed on that first point, you actually do have quite a bit of viability to go in for sneaky picks and catch the enemy team unprepared. You can get through the tunnel very fast, even though it is risky. Um, and it's also very easy to quickly one to kill most opponents in the game and then get out of there you can also uh use use the large space and the large size of bad water to your advantage as a scout in that you can uh 
quickly get away from your opponents and have space to get away too, which I think is important. Because in tighter, chokier maps, you might not have as many places that are, are this map negative space where you can go and literally just bank on your, your faster movement speed and double, double jump to get away from the opponents like you can on bad water. And so, as an offensive scout moves through the map, I would say their trickiest parts are going to be the, the chokier sections of the map. I think the first point is a nice area for scout. I think the second point can be a good area, granted that the scout is spending a lot of time in the flanks and in that sort of backyard area behind everything. I think it's a little, probably not as fun and a little riskier for them to be trying to push the cart to be peeking that choke where you know there's going to be sentries and snipers watching them from a distance that is unfavorable to a scout on that part of Badwater. Pushing pushing roof as well is, is probably not, not the most fun as there, you know, there are sentries and you can get caught in that little doorway which is not good for you as scout. You want some space to be able to karate jump around your enemies and discombobulate them. So second, a little less room for fun potentially pushing on bad water as a scout. And when we get to that second to third area, I do think boiler room is a nice area for scout. I think there's a lot of nice props you can jump off of and on of. And I think you, you could very easily confuse someone in boiler room if you take advantage of the environment. It is a little uh, choky on the entrances and exits. Not a great place to be, but I think once you're inside it, you could pretty safely win most 1v1s as a scout. Um, assuming you're not dealing with a, a projectile airshot master. That's my perspective there. I think the, the, the bridge room uh, with that medium health pack and big ammo pack before the third point that usually the, the blue team will take advantage of, again, is probably not a great place for a scout. It's a little too confined. You could do a little parkour if you knew somebody was coming in there and uh and jump over them a bit probably not a not a great spot i do like however that in this third point there's, it's very easy for a scout to jump between these different levels of scaffolding these different levels these different terraces these different parts of the high ground right um, which it's much harder for a normal class to jump between uh but a scout can actually kind of quickly jump in and out of all these windows if you think of all the the upper battlements to the left side of the third point that the red team will usually be trying to hold the scout can pretty easily jump in and, out, in and out of them, even though being trapped too much in them is probably a bad choky position to be in, where again, you're vulnerable to lots of, you know, classes that are going to take advantage of the fact that you're not going to be able to jump around, you're going to be a more predictable target, you're not going to be able to move super quickly and confuse them. Uh, and going into last, again, I think this is a fun area, I'm going to say it, I think pushing Badwater last as scout is fun, and... Okay, it's not fun if you're being forced by your team to just sit on the cart. I get that. That is not fun. Um, but tires. Tires is so fun as scout. I've talked about this before. Really, as a scout in tires, you should just be able to dominate. I mean, granted, it would be it would be tricky if a you know a full heavy med combo came around that corner to face you in tires. But even then, I think if you have competency that they don't have, if you've got mad milk, maybe. Um, and you just know to focus the med first. I, there's so much open space, I think you really could confuse um, your average heavy medic combo just by taking advantage of that scout class on tires on bad water. Tires is a great place to be. I like that you can you can sneak through map room and you, the, the, the only place you don't want to be caught is that little choke to map room where you have that, there's sort of two rooms. There's the map room, then there's the room before it uh, where like an engineer might like to p put a teleporter on that sort of high deck area. In general, as a scout, I think you have lots of space in that first room to sort of jump around and, and win a 1v1 and take advantage of that high ground and be very annoying. Um, it's just getting caught in that choke that will be tricky for you. And again, probably hanging out in the map room, not very beneficial, but it's a good place to jump out of and get to that the front of red spawn, which is a, a great place to exploit and cause harassment, do spawn camping, a great thing that you can and definitely should do as scout on offense on payload bad water. But now if we want to compare that and think about how scout is to play on the red team, how is scout on bad water on defense? 
is it as fun as playing offense? And the better question might be, is it more fun than playing offense? And I think your answer just has to be yes. It is more fun to play scout on defense. You don't have to deal with sentries. The chokes that people are going to be coming through, it's easier for you to kind of hang around them and cause problems for them because they're going to be apprehensively nudging their head, nudging their nose into choke points, right? Because they're worried about all the oncoming defensive spam, the oncoming defensive sentry fire, oncoming defensive uh, sniper sight lines. There's a lot of things they're kind of sticking out their neck, assuming your, your team isn't wiped on red team, uh, for them to push through as an offensive team on bad water. And so as scout, you can you absolutely can take advantage of that. You know, if, if you have a sentry up in this choke and someone's trying to trying to peek it and, and lob rockets at it or lob pills at it or, or shoot at it as heavy, it's a perfect chance for you to just be pelting damage into them as a scout. And honestly, we could say it's unfair. We could say it's unjust, but I would say that that's some of the most fun that you can have because it's just padding your DPM, you know? You're going to have lots of 1v1s where people are actually engaging you, but then you're also going to have all these other 1v1s where they're distracted with uh, trying to clear those uh, big assailants that are holding the choke, you know? They're not going to be... No one's prioritizing, okay, we got to kill this scout as we push through this this choke on bad water, you know? No, 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 no. They're thinking about the sentry. They're thinking about maybe a heavy med combo. They're thinking about soldiers. They're thinking about demo man who've put traps on the choke. And so... In that way, you are a really low target on defense. You are a low target as well on, on offense, but the difference is is that when you are on offense, you're a little more of an equal target with everyone because the the defensive team's MO really, like in a, in a brainless pub environment, is just to kill anyone, and to kill anyone especially on the cart. And you're someone who's probably going to spend a little more time on the cart than anyone else, so... It could even be argued that you have a higher target on your head just just by the nature of the fact that you're going to be around the cart more on bad water than anyone else. So defensively, I think you have a huge advantage in that way in that people really aren't going to be thinking about, you know, focusing the scout. It's probably one of the least important picks pushing on, as, a, as a blue team on bad water. So, th so that's the part that I think is universally just better about Scout on Badwater. In, in terms of the different points, I think I think the areas that are fun um, on offense are typically fun on defense as Scout. I would say the first point is especially fun on defense because you get to start with that high ground. There's so many nice rocks to hop between. Um, in general, there's just lots of nice areas to hop between on that first point where you can constantly keep vigilant of where the other team is but then also kind of choose when you want to drop down and take a pick and maybe not even drop down you know from from both sides you can really pick at people going into the tunnel and be totally safe as the scout kept on your high ground getting really nice mid-range meat shots on these people doing you know 50 70 damage um while keeping yourself totally protected and they're left trying to shoot above them which is going to be very difficult um, in general, that first point in defense is kind of built around having high ground over the enemy. And as, as it's assumed that when the enemy does get high ground, that they uh, they start to win over you. So until that does happen, you you are doing quite well. You do have things in your favor as scout on bad water on defense. And I think that's one of the you know most fun parts of, uh, of playing scout on bad water is that first point. Now, the second point... A little less fun, only because, again, there's, there's, there's some more chokes. There's some more areas where it's really easy for you to get caught, you know, going down that stairwell that connects roof to the first point. It's, it's just a risky stairwell for you as a scout. You know, a 1v1 with a soldier, they don't have to aim so well. There's so many walls, so many places to splash against you. Again, still some you know, little railings and things you could jump around, maybe. But nowhere near as open as that first point. And I will say it is it, it is fun. It is probably more fun than being on offense on blue. I think I think that second point, uh, you, you have some really nice uh, p 
opportunities in that main choke. Um, you really, your only big threat to worry about, I think, is uh, is snipers. If you see them in that in that main choke between first and second point, as scout on bad water, because again, you have these great opportunities where people are going to be distracted, trying to take out the sentry, trying to crane their necks left around that corner to look up onto the rooftop. Gives you plenty of time to mess with them. People desperately trying to, you know, you've seen it a million times, desperately trying to nudge this cart forward around that corner, worried about people above them, you know, not really ready to be worrying about a scout, jumping around, taking advantage of that little concrete wedge that you can jump on and off of, jumping on and off the cart if it's made it that far. Um, this is a good spot for scout. Again, barring snipers, which, which will be a pain in your ass and will try to body shot you from 100 miles away. But barring that, I think this is a good spot. You don't want to overcommit too deep into the choke unless unless you're kind of at the end of a little skirmish in this choke and you know that people are retreating and then maybe you do have a good chance to sort of chase down a medic that's trying to leave or a sniper uh, that's back towards the rocks on that left side. You now have a good chance they sort of quickly run in and then run back. Um, that's a great spot. And I do like, too, that even during this, this second point, if you're able to sort of you know, when a, when a dramatic skirmish ends, get behind the enemy team, or I should say, get, just get behind the line that they should have been holding that they've now lost, and spend more time around that first point. You can utilize that high ground very annoyingly as a scout, and just hugging that, that uh, right wall, that right side of that cliff around that first point. Um, you can use it to go and wrap through tunnels and then catch someone leaving spawn and kill them, which, is, which can be very fun. We, we like spawn camping. You can also, of course, uh, take the variety of routes to get into that flank area behind the second roof and uh, that sort of train yard-esque area with the shipping crates and all the connected rooms. Probably not as good for you in all these connected rooms. It might be good for you to wait in that, that room that has the, the big high ground with the medium health pack and the large ammo pack. Like that, that would be a good place to, uh, to sort of camp and, and, you know, use that high ground when people come through. But I really like the, the open area the most for defensive scout on the second point on Badwater behind the rooftop. Because there's all those crates that you can really easily jump between and you can, you can kind of quickly navigate between, okay, do I want to be on roof? Do I want to be shooting down and, and scanning what's going on on the cart? Uh, or do I want to be maybe peeking the stairs down to see if, if any uh, people are coming up? Again, just because you are a scout, if you could surprise someone coming up the stairs, you could probably get one good meat shot in them before you run away. And, you know, which is good chip damage, makes makes their heroic journey up to the uh, up to that rooftop a lot more difficult. It's gonna it's gonna cause them problems, undoubtedly. And I I think uh, obviously that big flank area is really nice for you to hang out. So again, already looking way better for Scout on defense on Badwater than it is on offense, which would mean that you would be having more fun, depending on which class you are, depending on which, uh, which team you're on as well, which is, you know, it, it's not all fair. Badwater is not a perfect map. I will, we will admit that it has some areas where it shines more than others, right? So we're going to move on now to the third point. And so the, the third point on PL Badwater as scout on on defense is uh ag again there's this correlation between you know is it fun on offense it's probably going to be proportionately as fun on defense which means it'll be more fun but not crazily more fun than another point in my opinion and so holding that th <laughs> holding that third point defensively as scout uh is fun you you do have that sort of high ground you can take advantage of but it's it's very it's really not spacious high ground it's uh you know it's it's encumbered with a lot of small little sheds uh and things that you you don't want to get caught in and at the same time what alternative do you have you can go through boiler room which has that choke that you really don't want to go through you can go through the the bridge room which is super choky to go in and out of you don't want to do um very high risk and then your final option is to travel through the low ground which is really not preferable, but in a fucked up way, sometimes is going to be better than going through those two other rooms. Just because you have space. It is low ground, and that's very shitty. Um, but 
you you can be cautious about how you're doing it if you are wise and, and make that transition and again this is this is a point that is now even harder to get behind their line of where they should be pushing from but if you can if you can get behind their what will become their next spawn when they capture the third point if you can get back to the roof um you, you can do some really good harassing a scout and, and and there there is possibility too to kind of have a little cycle between boiler room and then flanking people in their bridge room um and sort of rinse and repeating that if you if you do have a good sort of authoritative foothold over the opponent i think that's uh something that could work quite nicely um, but in general, just not as fun as some of the other points as Scout, I think. The fourth point, the last point now, again, I think is going to be more fun than the third point. I think I think it's fun on offense, and so I'm going to say it is fun on defense as well. Um, but probably more fun than on offense. You don't have to worry about the cart. You have sentries on your side, giving people things to be distracted with. Lots of pushes coming in where people are going to be very distracted thinking about the cart about the sentries thinking about big high dpm classes that you know are projectile spam based heavies things like this um and while they're thinking about that you can be easily picking people off which is really great while they're all distracted i like tires again as a defensive scout you want to be denying their team in tires um it's just a it's just a great place to be as scout you have a lot of a lot of space to jump around to confuse them there's enough sort of nearby walls and rooms that you can you can bait time and get out even even that um the highest most room connected to tires uh where there's that small health pack and that little window where you can shoot through a sniper that's a great building um and that there are some sneaky places that you can hide a scout and that you could jump run into and they would not expect you to be hiding and you know in that upper rightmost area when you enter it upper rightmost behind area right so they someone could be going in for a small health pack and you could just quickly you know mutilate them which is is, is a very nice feature 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 of tires again map room probably not my favorite i do like that map rooms you can kind of hang out by that terrace you know that 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 uh that second level of scaffolding that you have control of by default defensively in map room on bad water but probably not my favorite area for scout and again it's it's big enough that you kind of can spend some area in that low ground flat area by the bomb site but probably not a great area to spend a lot of time because you, you are vulnerable to spam maybe to snipers and it's just rare that there's going to be people there for you to uh take advantage of and pick off there are circumstances of course where uh you will have that opportunity um when they're finally like really making a big glory push at the end and then you can do a lot there but until then, not not a very useful place. I do like as well that on defense scout on Badwater on that last point, you could push through tires and flank them as they push through choke if you know it's safe. That's that can be very nice as scout. Again, you just want to be getting those big meat shots while they're on on the cart. And you bet, you know, even if they're they realize you're on them, if they're on the cart, their their eyes are going to be pronged and and focused forward. You know, uh, unless your team is wiped, in which case you got other problems. You know. I do like that you can wrap around that way through tires. I also like that you can use those uh, those those cinder blocks, those cement tubes, um, on that right side as you leave tires, uh, going towards the blue spawn. As a red scout, you can kind of jump on those if you need to, jump over them. Gives you some semblance of a a little bit of elevation. Not always super useful, but again, if you can get through this choke, if you can get through their line of defense. There's some fun areas where you can harass a bit, but probably not as good as any of the other areas you can harass in spawn camp, because basically if you do that, you're back to the third point, and we've already talked about why. The third point is not really that great for defense scout on bad water. So I'm going to move on now to, uh, to soldier offense on bad water. Soldier offense and defense. Again, this, this is... There are differences you can find between offense and defense, but I, I also said it was class contingent, whether those differences matter, and, and that is going to come to light. You're going to see that in play here as I talk about the soldier, because I'm, I'm just going to spoil it for you. I really think they're equally as fun, and 
I understand people can make arguments that even if you're playing soldier, they just don't want to deal with sentries. It's not as fun. And uh, there's not as much roaming potential, and I get that. But what you are deprived of as soldier on red team is the satisfaction of that push, of the satisfaction of taking out sentry nests, um, which can be very satisfying as soldier to, to destroy a, 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 a shit ton of buildings. So let's talk about that first point as soldier. I think undeniably it, it's going to be more fun on, on defense. You have the high ground in your favor, which is really great. Um, and there's just so many places you can just bomb in and then return, get out, get health packs, get dispenser heals. It, it's a really nice place even just to be jumping between those high ground rocks and sort of lobbing rockets down at people. You know, guarding that right cliff, that big wall, giving you a nice splash on anyone that tries to come up. It's a nice area, for sure. It's a really nice place to be soldier. You can, you know, at any point come to your end of the tunnel, you know, probably not best to, to enter it from their end, but, but from your defensive end of the tunnel and start, you know, shooting them down or even just drop down. And the chances are that you're going to, you're, you're going to win most 1v1s there against people on the cart, you know, because you just, you just have so much place to splash and, uh, you're basically guaranteed to do, you know, 300 damage to them in, uh, in all four of your rockets. Which is enough, really, you know, if they're right in front of you, and it's a heavy. And so, the thing is, I am giving a better pitch, I am giving a better case for uh, defense as soldier on battle order on this first point, but you gotta know, you know, offense can be just as fun. I really do like that you can do a sort of uh, a triple uh, rocket jump, a, a double pogo, I don't know what the technical nomenclature would be that is accurate, but you can leave that rightmost spawn, do a do one rocket jump, and then you pogo off that wall, and then you maybe pogo off that wall again. You can get way behind them, or you can just get that medium health pack by the rocks, and you're probably out of range of the sentry, and you can start causing them problems. You can take out the sniper if he was hanging out in that area. And the thing is, too, it it, it is very nice um, as an offensive soldier as well. It's just, it's just usually a matter of taking advantage of the high ground. And, 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 and the thing is, the the things that I talked about being nice about being a defensive soldier on this first point are honestly the same things that are nice about being an offensive soldier on this point. I mean, yes, by default, you know, you're starting in different positions in the game on defense and offense, but you know, if you're if you're playing soldier smart on offense, you're gonna be doing those same things. You're gonna be taking off easy picks and the tunnel, which is super satisfying. You're gonna be climbing up that left side up the cliff. And you're going to be taking advantage of the high ground. Maybe you're not going to be peeking over to where the sentry is yet. Um, but even so, you've got a great angle to peek that sentry. Just peeking that, that corner to the right. Shooting rockets, going back so it doesn't hit you. Um, it, it is a really good place to be as soldier. You know, they're, Unless they have a, a very strong defense, you can definitely, as a competent soldier, take it out and sort of ruin their day. And, and reclaim that high ground for yourself. Because once you have that high ground... You know, at the worst, someone else has equal ground with you, uh, which is a fight worth taking. And you can, you know, they, they're going to have longer respawn timers. You can always kind of quickly jet back to spawn if you need to with one rocket jump, which they don't have that ability to. Um, they're limited to their, their, you know, their medics and their health packs and their dispensers. So, yeah, so battle at our first point, I would say really fun, both offense and defense. I, I think... Uh, I think for obvious reasons, we can say defense is a little more fun because if you roll on defense, that's more fun. Um, as a soldier on the first point, it's not as fun to roll or to be rolled on the first point as a as soldier. But you can maybe inverse this argument as well that if blue team is rolling, it's not as fun to be a defense soldier on that first point. Um, even though we don't see that very often, it can happen. And it would be fun to be the, the soldier rolling, you know, more fun than the one who's being rolled on that first point as soldier. But now let's move on. Let's talk about the really fun, you know, one of the most fun parts of Badwater here as soldier, which is the second point. So the way that I talked about it as with Scout, we can almost, we can transfer a lot of those concepts to soldier because soldier also takes good advantage of um, having space, having areas he can rocket jump between. But the funny thing is that uh, 
even though he also does well in flanks, he also does well in chokes, right? So those areas that were danger spots for the scout that I talked about, uh, going up the stairwell, right? Or that main choke um, where your scatter gun, you know, is not any stronger in that area than it is in a wide open area. Um, as a soldier, you, you are stronger in that area. You're, you're doing splash damage in, in all kinds of ways. That stairwell, oh, you know how scrumptious that stairwell is as soldier. Love that stairwell. Um, you know, uh, whether you're shooting up it or down it, it's uh, it's a good time. And, and I would maybe maybe I should say especially shooting down it and shooting into that big open garage door. That's that's a just a, a great place to be as soldier on bad water. And we love all the flank areas because the thing is, even when you're in those sort of boxy rooms and the, the connecting rooms that take you to the other rooms in that flank. You're a soldier, man. Just shoot the ground. Just shoot the walls. Just shoot them. They're going to take 110 damage. It's excellent. And we love all of those crates, all of those areas that we can jump between. If there was ever an area that's very gunboats friendly, very rocket jumping friendly, it is holding the second point on Badwater because you can, you can really just hopscotch between these health packs really quickly. You can go to the one that's that's in that room that you would go to if you were on the blue team and you, you went through the door that opens up when the first point is captured and you went straight to your left and you went up those stairs to that sort of high slab of concrete where there's that medium health pack. You can use that pack in conjunction with the, uh, the hidden pack which is over by the, the corner of that sort of uh, that flank train yard area. You can be hopscotching back and forth between those two packs. There's a small pack in the room that would that would be if you went straight forward through that door that we just talked about um there's two small health packs up top and almost always some dispensers uh which which will be great to take advantage of so it, it's nice that you have those big health packs there and that it sort of rewards you for controlling that flank um because it, the thing is if if you are taking advantage of that high ground if we think of that that one that is on that sort of high slab of concrete looking down at that connector that goes towards the towards where where blue players would come in that is such a great place to take control of because as they continue to feed in you are constantly rewarded with another 100 health every 10 seconds or whatever it is and they aren't you know um so you can keep fighting 1v1s for a long time just by yourself and they're going to keep coming in with with a, a new guy totally full health right and they're still going to lose the 1v1s. It's, it's an awesome spot positionally to take advantage of as soldier on bad water. And uh, that's as a defensive player. And again, we, you might find that the lines are kind of crumbling here between offense and defense soldier on bad water because what should you be doing as a soldier on blue? Um, take advantage of those same things, right? It's sort of like, you know, be between two soldiers on blue and red, you just want to be domineering the other soldier, doing what they're supposed to be doing, you know? You're both going to kick ass on the high ground. You're both going to kick ass spamming stairwell and, and spamming chokes. You just want to be the one doing it more than they are. You want to be shutting them down because you are it's bound to happen you're going to meet them in a lot of these common areas. And I think, I think soldier duels are very common on Badwater for this reason, is that you're going you're gonna to wind up in a lot of the same places, you know? Um, because if it's good for one soldier, it's good for the other one, regardless of whose team you're on. And so, in that way, you can say that Badwater is really a, a perfect map, because even though Blue and Red have very different roles and have very different experiences, you kind of have the same experience <laughs> as soldier on both teams, in a certain way. There, there is, of course, a real difference, and I, I can account for that, and I know what that is, and, and the minutiae of having the advantages of starting on the defensive high ground versus starting from the offensive low ground, et, et cetera, et cetera, pushing against more level 3 centuries versus not. But you have great potential to be a, a powerful combo player. I think you can take awesome ubers as a soldier against sentries, against combos, against players. And you can also take... Uh, awesome awesome paths and awesome experiences as a roaming player you know it's it's i would i would think it's probably more fun as as a roaming player and i'm saying that as someone who is more of a a pocket stick to the choke go for high dpm kind of role player um 
but I probably, you know, spent my early days on Badwater as a soldier more doing that uh, roaming gunboats play style, controlling flanks, causing chaos. Um, and, you know, again, just like I said, as scout, you can, on that second point, you can get to those those big health packs, or I should say medium health packs. They have on that first point, be feeding off of those, sitting on the high ground, living on that cliff, making people's lives hell as they leave spawn, even just harassing them if you can't kill them, and then, you know, secluding back to a place that's safe to you. You can bait them to the tunnel, a fight that they don't want to take. You can bait them into those flank areas, uh, any, any of the three that we mentioned, or even uh, bait them into coming up the stairs with you, coming up to, up to rooftop, which is bad for them because now you're, you're, uh, you're shooting down on them with a, a, a very choky area where you're bound to do damage. So we, we really like second point. Let's talk now about third point. Uh, third point, I think, is, is a bit more fun, especially compared to scout, because you do have all these chokes. It, it is a, a much better area to spam, and I think, I think the, the redeeming part, because you do lose a little, uh, you, you don't have as many wide open areas and big flanks to jump between, which I think is actually more fun as soldier. Um, but what you do have is you have that low ground. And, and I think the way that it's designed is very nice because the payload cart, as it progresses from that second point, it actually dips down and then dips back up. So from both teams' perspectives, the cart dips down and then dips back up. So what does that mean? There is a low ground to shoot down to for both teams, right? It's kind of bad uh, for anyone to get caught in that lowest point right because if you're on offense i'm going to shoot down on them if i'm on defense i'm going to shoot down on them right and obviously the the low ground is slightly worse if you're on offense right because the high it, it it does become slightly higher um but in both cases uh you know the that part of the map functions sort of in an equal way depending on which side you are and it's a great uh spot to punish as as soldier and you know, don't get me wrong, it, it is fun to hang out in Boiler Room. It is, you know, choky, it is fun to hang out in the Bridge Room especially. I would think that's more fun to hang out with, hang out in as Soldier. Uh, because I think people are just sort of tempted to not fully commit to that room. Um, because it usually will take one person who's going to suicide in to, to take out a Soldier who's just camping that pack in the Bridge Room. Um... And especially if you're using something like the black box, if they're just going to keep peeking in bit by bit and being afraid to fully commit, or just sending one player into sack, you're just going to keep living. You're going to keep getting free picks because it's just so spammy. You can be, you can be blind shooting that corner that they're going to come through, getting free splash damage constantly, and they never see you. And the same can be said for that first, that that other entrance, or, or would be the exit, right, where you would go into it as a defensive player. That's also a great point to spam and not even have to see the enemy and, and those sort of those cornery choke points are really nice to take advantage of as soldier on either team on that third point so i don't think it strikes me maybe as fun but i i do see it as a important chapter in the story of bad water when you're playing as a soldier that that third point third point is an integral piece um so i'm i'm hesitant to just say outright it's not as fun because i i don't really ever recall uh, playing a, a full map of Badwater as Soldier and, and being disappointed that now I'm on the third point. Um, and I would say uh, uh, this is an area where it is actually more fun on offense than defense. Haha, -ha, we finally found it. Which is when you do actually cap that third point, or maybe even when you're approaching it, all of those high ground second floor battlements are so fun to take take advantage of as soldier. It's very easy for you to rocket jump up there to that those those terraces and to uh, to you know kill you know engineers that are trying to build teleporters in there. And then that big long room, um, that that final room as as you round the bend, sort of between the third and fourth fourth point. That first straightaway after you capture the third point, where the 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 rails are parallel with this this room that's higher up and to the left side if we were looking from the perspective of the offensive blue team that big room there's so much great stuff you can do as soldier and uh i, I love that you can actually sort of there's enough space to rocket jump in it you, you could 
sort of offensively fling yourself at the enemy, but you can also just peek the corners. And again, this the same thing that we were talking about before on, on other parts of that third point. It's such a nice area to just take advantage of that space of any time there's a choke, I can just I can shoot rockets at that from any distance. I can be as far away as I want, still doing damage to them, and they might not even be able to see me. So that's a, that's an excellent place to be as well. We gotta mention now between third and fourth point, there is that nice little rooftop you can jump up to as soldier, I suppose, as well as demo man or as engineer. Um, but you most commonly see it as soldier, the one that is right above the entrance to map room for the blue team. A great place to lob rockets, and then a, a really great place, too, to jump across and into that big hallway we just talked about. Um, it's, a, it's an awesome escape that you don't just have to, to fall down and sort of awkwardly retreat, which is bad, because now you're on the low ground. It's very easy for them to sort of round the corner or trying to retreat in the map room. Now they have that advantage over you that we talked about where they can just spam the choke. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter how far away they are, you know, you're going to be caught in this little awkward corner and you're going to eat up a bunch of splash to any of their explosive damage classes. But it is perfect. You can, you can jump across. There, there's, it's a, there's like a little connecting uh, piece of building that you, you don't actually interact with. You can't go inside or anything. Um, but that it almost sort of like blocks where they would be able to do damage to you as you make that leap across, and I think that's very nice, very luxurious to have a soldier. A very fun part of the map, and now getting to an even more fun part of the map, there's so many fun parts of the map as soldier. Now, holding this last point, tires, a great place to hold. I know I said scouts are better, I, and I do think technically a scout should be a soldier and a 1v1 here, granted that they take advantage of the tires, take advantage of jumping. Um, I think a soldier can take down anyone, as well in tires granted it's not a scout who has good positioning or maybe you, you get there first so you have better positioning a heavy with a medic can be a little tricky to take down as well you may not be able to take down a, a full combo um, but there's enough open space too that you could just sort of bomb and, and focus a medic if a combo did come into tires I like that there's lots of uh, nice places to retreat to you have that high ground room that we've talked about uh, where you can get the small pack and then lob rockets down the staircase and really nobody wants to follow a soldier into that room even if you've got 20 health so that's that's an awesome room to have a hold of that sort of connecting room that connects tires to uh the blue choke area uh is very nice as soldier you have a little bit of high ground you have that little wall that you can hide behind and even see through which is great to, uh, to, to just spam people around blindly that corner and then you can even get up close to that corner and shoot rockets around the right side of it because there's almost definitely going to be people in that choke somewhere. If you get scared, if they start shooting at you, you just retreat up those stairs. You have a little bit of high ground and a small health pack. They're, they're going to be at a disadvantage trying to push up to you. Awesome point. Undoubtedly awesome point. Now, uh, map room. Map room is a is a tricky thing because both those little connecting chokes, those little connecting chokes are, are good um, for for you when someone else is in them and bad for you when when you're in them. Um, the be the best places for you to be are in that first part of map room where you have all that all those decks, those those that wooden architecture that gives you a lot of high ground. Um, and, and even those, uh, those props on the left side that you can sort of jump on top of. It, it's a high ceiling room. You could jump if you had to. Um, I, I just like having these kind of options as soldiers so that you're not restricted only to a splash damage fight, right? If you, if you see an engineer, you're, you're pretty much fine to take that splash damage heavy fight. Just, you know, try to hit them, shoot the, shoot the walls, shoot the ground, right? But if you see a... <coughs> Excuse me. If you see a soldier, right, or a demo man, or even a heavy, I actually want the advantage now to kind of be able to quickly move, to quickly jump over them, to quickly reposition to a high ground. I like having those options in map room, and I, I like in the in, in the real part of map room that that second room that you would go through if you were on the offensive team, that there is that uh, that terrace, that balcony, that you can uh, absolutely take advantage of. As a defensive soldier, shooting down on people, great spot. And even if you're on either team, if you're approaching map room, you're 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 seeing a 1v1 there, 
what I would do if someone's right in my face, you shoot the ground, you, you know, you do 100 damage to them, but you, you actually make it a rocket jump, and you rocket jump with that same rocket up to that balcony. And now you have high ground where you can shoot down on them for your second rocket. And if it's another soldier, even if um, they might have some splash potential, you you actually have the opportunity now that you could like you could shoot them with that first rocket, rocket jump up to the railing on that balcony, shoot another rocket. They shoot their rocket. It probably misses because they can't air shot right. And and now you're jumping towards them, shooting your third rocket down onto them, and their second rocket doesn't hit you because it would have been a smash against the wall or something, and you're already jumping down away from the wall. Super awesome to be able to to take advantage of props and stuff like that. And of course. The best part about jumping up to that balcony is it's a safe, non-complicated way uh, to get to that sort of that area right where they leave spawn. Where now you can shoot rockets down at their sentries in their low ground. You can deny people who are spawning. You're not really at risk of of snipers anymore unless someone turns around. You're probably going to be able to pick off some extra snipers. Um, the thing that can be tricky is if some an engineer is set up in map room, um, or 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 what I should say, probably the best spot is if they're set up. In that door that leads to map room from their spawn right on that level of the balcony because it's going to make it very hard for you to push through that choke even even said as a soldier you still could be very smart and strategic about how you peek that door and shoot rockets while you're peeking and take no damage and potentially take the sentry out if the engineer is distracted if there's someone else helping you etc etc if they're away from the building for a moment um but you have options as a soldier. You can go through the choke. And you can use two rockets, an expensive rocket jump, but I would say worth it to get to that same spot we were talking about, to get to that uh, that area that you would leave defensive spawn on the left side, up top. To get there, and then now be killing that sentry from behind it, which is very easy to do. Granted, you do just have to be aware of anyone spawning, anyone coming to get you from the stairs um, who saw you jump. They're coming up the stairs. You have a big advantage. You're only really at risk at a soldier now trying to counter you, which is going to happen. Um, you know, I, I, if I'm playing soldier and I see a, a soldier do some crazy jump somewhere on this last point, sure as hell I'm going to rocket jump over them and say, hey, buddy, no, you don't. You know, this is my area. This You're doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And uh, maybe this is just what's so cool about soldier is that uh, you do have these sort of interchangeable roles on, on blue and red with the enemy where really you should be doing a similar thing um, it's just a matter of who's better who's more domineering um, and and the fun part of being an offensive soldier as well on, on this last point because I think we can all think of the defensive reasons it's fun again they're a little distracted you can be uh, you know annoying them at the flanks you can be going way behind them taking out teleporters I think I think the most viable class to go deep uh, with a spawn camp here on Battlewater Last is going to be Spy. It's going to be Engineer, if you can pull that shit off, put a level 3 on the roof. But probably even better than both those, Soldier. Because if you can get back to that roof, and now you're connected to that huge flank area that's so good for you as Soldier, you can just be lobbing rockets down to them, you can leave for your medium health packs, you can you can leave, and, and they're going to have no idea where you are because what do they, what do they have to do? Unless they have a, a soldier or demo man who can jump up to you. Again, demo man jumping up to you is already very hurt. You win that 1v1. A soldier jumping up to you, you probably win that 1v1 as well. It's like you're on Badlands Spire. You, you air shot them down or you just take advantage of their diminished health from having to jump, right? Um, and in any other case, they're sending up a scout. They're sending up a pyro. They're sending up, you know, a, a heavy... A sniper, but hopefully not. Anyone that's sitting up has to go up that staircase, and you—they're <laughs> trashed. They're trashed if if you just shoot shoot in that little choke. Them trying to wrap around, the, you know, go up that staircase. That's so such a terrible place to be when you're fighting a soldier. So it's super advantageous for you. Lots of places to get out from. A super nice area to spawn camp on defense. So I cut myself off there. Let's return now to offense. Okay, offense on this last point. The be one of the most fun parts is you do have all this high ground. As your team starts to dominate, as you start to have control of map room, of their upper right spawn area, of um, it's very hard and I rarely do it, but their their upper left sort of balcony area, 
um, ab above where they usually put sentries, right? Again, not a, not an easy area. I don't really like holding there. I don't. I don't think there's. It's generally not good unless you're about to win. But if you can hold there, and when you are, it's awesome. And the choke as well. Um, you are all shooting down onto low ground, and, and in fact, you're probably shooting down into these cubby holes where the engineers are, where there's just tons of splash damage to be had. You can be shooting the sentries, and if not, you're hurting a dispenser, you're hurting them, you're hurting a medic, trying to heal by a dispenser, you're, 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 there's lots of people to hurt, you know, they like to clutter up in these areas, and you're up in the safe high ground from one of these many places, and you can just shoot down into it, and that is so great so fun as soldier really i mean as as a soldier i guess we have to give badwater a five star review i think i think it maybe loses a, a tiny tiny bit of its charm on that third point just only because those other points are so fun so freaking god dang fun to be on the first second and fourth point of badwater um third point still fun part of the story it's sort of a, it's sort of necessary you can consider too maybe in the balance of the game that there is an area that's kind of bad for a soldier you know traveling between that sort of second area and fourth area in, in general you're going to be a little there's some chokes you got to travel through that are a little uncomfortable as a soldier and that's fair because that's stuff that the enemy can take advantage of and that's stuff that you know you just have to deal with you know you're going to have areas you like more than others that's just playing the game. So now let's move on to Pyro. Pyro on bad water. Pyro is a tricky class because we there there there's kind of a a couple ways that they are usually played. So in a Highlander situation, you are really part of the combo. You are spy checking, you are reflecting rockets, hanging out by the medic, hanging out by the engineer. A lot okay um, that's a big part of your duty especially on defense on this map it's it's different you have more privilege you have more freedom on blue you're probably still gonna be wanting hanging out by the combo spy checking um, air blasting their combo away if they uber in right but you don't have to piggyback on the engineer anymore on blue which is nice and I would say that gives it a point for blue pyro because I mean, I don't know. I, I, I probably don't play Pyro very typically. I, I, I never really enjoyed... I mean, maybe that's not totally true, but Pyro Highlander is not my number one calling when I think of things to play in Highlander. Whereas I do really enjoy Pyro in pubs. I tend to enjoy more of a flank play style. I tend to enjoy, enjoy more of a one-on-one one -on -one play style. And I tend to enjoy, you know... Yeah, being, being confident on my own, not really being a defensive tool to protect the sentry, to spawn, to uh, protect the combo. It's it's just not, you know, if I see a spy, I'm going to take him down, but it's not the uh, the priority in a pub in the way that I play. I don't I don't find a lot of satisfaction from Pybro, you know? If I, wanna, if I want the spirit of Pybro on Badwater, I'm just going to play Engineer, you know? You see what I mean? One is, is like a simulacrum of the other. And uh, there's something to that. Pyro on offense in a pub, let's say, though. On this first point, um, you, you kind of end up taking similar routes that a scout might. You don't have the same jump capabilities, but as a sort of roaming, potentially flank player, you're going to take advantage of, you know, you can go through the tunnel. If there's no sentry, that's... You know, preventing you from, from getting around that last little corner and wrapping around behind them. It's a great place to backburn people. Very, very good place to backburn people, I would say. You can also sort of softly push up any of these surfaces because if you think about it, an apt pyro capable of reflecting um, and just air blasting away opponents, air blasting opponents off of high ground, their biggest concern should be snipers. It should be... Uh, scouts, it should be competent hit scan players on the enemy team, okay? Um, snipers probably especially, because a scout still needs to be relatively close to you to kill you. A sniper can be extremely far away. Um, because you take on a soldier, a demo man, you've got reflex for that, you know? Uh, you see anyone on high ground, you see a heavy med combo, 
you can probably air blast them away, maybe even air blast them off the high ground in a significantly frustrating way for them. So it, Pyro does have that nice asset that they can really take advantage of and, and sort of uh, what would be the, the romantic term for it. They can, um, I'm, I'm struggling to find the word, Merovingian is not the word I'm thinking of. Has to do with when, uh, you know, all right, we'll, for, we'll forget that. When uh, when rich people take over poor neighborhoods or something like this, you, you get what I'm saying, and you know the word because you're sharper than I am. The first point as a defensive pyro, um, it's funny because I would actually say it might be a little, little less fun than on offense, um, only because... There's something about the nature of Pyro that is a little more on bad water and that first point. You, you want to kind of help your team preserve what they have just instinctually. You want to be air blasting people off the high ground. You don't really have as much freedom as you do on, on, on blue um, because you do have such a good power to be preventing people from taking down the sentry with reflecting it or, or, or hurting spies, you know, and um, pushing people off of the high ground who are trying to push. And I think even if you don't want to do that, even if you're like, I want to be a roaming player, it's going to be kind of hard to avoid because if you're a smart player, you're all going to be hanging around the high ground anyway. And it's just going to kind of be intuitive when you see projectiles being shot at your sentry and spies trying to backstab your medic to, to kill them, you know, and handle that. It's just going to kind of be in your face by merit of you being in a strategically good position as Pyro. So I would say I, I tend to enjoy blue Pyro a little more on this first point. Just because you do have more freedom, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a pub environment, it, it feels that way to me at least. I do like the option of going through the tunnel and going all the way to spawn as pyro and spawn camping. Um, I do like the idea of, of, of taking those flanks with the back burner, let's say, and getting individual picks. Um, and then I do like, you know, softly pushing up the, the upper right area, this big sort of rolling hill, um, or up the left cliff. I think is an excellent place to be because you can really handle most 1v1s if you're competent air, air blast people off the high ground. So in that way, the fact that there is so much high ground is very balanced towards pyro. I do, I do wonder what this map would have been like before they added air blast to pyro because if I remember correctly, when Badwater was added to the map, pyro did not have air blast. And so I actually think that would make, you know, as, as much as people may resent Air Blast, it definitely probably was not as fun as Pyro on on a map like Badwater, or even just playing the game in general. So, because really a lot of Pyro's best assets here are going to be related to the fact that they can Air Blast, they can reflect, they can push people away. It helps them co-opt and take over and gentrify, that's the word I was looking for earlier, gentrify that high ground. But if we move on to the second point, um, this is an area actually, I actually, I'm already feeling like is more fun for Pyro, interestingly, because I like the flank options, and, and there's actually flank options that I'm seeing here that I wouldn't really take as easily as other classes, right? Because if I'm a blue Pyro, I can go up the stairwell, I can go up to map room, that sounds nice. I, I don't see it very appealing to go to the leftmost room with that upper high ground health pack, there's, you know... Not, a, not an easy room for me to control necessarily. It's a little bit too big and open. And again, I don't, I don't, I don't have much advantage on the high ground as Pyro. I have the ability to take people off of the high ground um, if it's a sort of precarious high ground. But in a place like that, not really, right? Because if I come up the stairs, where am I going to air blast them? Just further back in the room. I'm not going to air blast them down anywhere unless I'm somehow coming from them from the opposite angle, which would be exceedingly unlikely right but the, the 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 route that i really like is that that door opens up after you capture the first point you go through it you go straight through it and you take that connecting staircase in the back that connects to their staircase that they have to take to get up to the roof on bad water second and i just cause hell you can control that little choky room annoying as shit to have a pyro in there um pyro just ruining your vision you can air blast people and shotgun them and flare them and melee them um you know these little chokes are really good for pyro 
and even if, if, if you don't want to do that, if there's not much action going on in the stairs, denying that point can be very useful. But if you're not doing that, you can go check out what's going on on the roof. And chances are the sentry will not be at a, a spot that it's going to hit you right away. It's going to be in front of that big uh, air conditioning unit. And you can use that as uh, strategic protection. You can just sort of peek around it and just get everyone on fire. You can probably destroy a dispenser. There's probably random players running around. You can just catch them on fire. It will cause a lot of chaos. Opening things up for anyone on your team running up that stairwell and, and onto uh, trying to push the roof. Uh, you're going to help them. You're going to give them a distraction. You're going to help anyone pushing from the choke, trying to shoot rockets up there, um, take down the engineer, the sentry. It's a really nice place to push from as Pyro on, on blue offense. And the choke, I would say, is, is nice as well um, to, to mess around in. It's pretty much just contingent on snipers. Again, that's your probably your number one threat, really, as a Pyro, especially in that point of the map, blue or red. Uh, I, I, I would say, in general, uh, red is going to have more advantages because they're... You can really hang out on that roof, for instance. You can harass people trying to come up it from either of the places that we mentioned, the place where I suggested, or if someone does the straight, obvious route up the staircase, you know, to root, to uh, to the roof. The nice thing is you can air blast anyone off, and that is really going to fuck their push. If somebody, uh, you know, goes up the traditional staircase, a heavy and, and medic, and you just air blast them off down to the low ground where the cart is, the push is over. They can't get, you know, it's, it's, the push is over. Even if they can get the sentry, they're not going to get any frags. And uh, that is devastating as a, def as a defensive pyro. And it's a lot harder to do that as an offensive pyro to air blast people off without, like, an uber. Because you are going to be dealing with that, uh, that enemy sentry. So, huge advantage there as a, as a red pyro on that second point. And, uh, and probably equally so in sort of peaking the choke because, you know, Similar notes to what I said about Scout, you're going to have people worrying about uh, taking out the sentry, about snipers, about projectile classes. They're going to be, they have things to focus on in that choke. And um, the, I mean, really, the classes that would be peaking up that aggressively are going to be projectile classes trying to take out the sentry. And you can reflect all that. So, you know, for a, for a pyro who knows how to reflect, you really have a lot of options. Makes me think I should work on my reflecting. Ah, the, the cost of uh, hardly playing Pyro ah, anymore. But yeah, that's, uh, that's what I think of the second point of Pyro on Badwater. Now let's talk about that second to third point area. Uh, we have boiler room. We have that bridge room. We have that low ground. Um, certainly don't want to get caught in that low ground. That's a, a good place for you to get picked off, even if you have good reflect capabilities. Just wouldn't want to spend much time there. Um, that being said... It is kind of nice around that medium health pack. People are going to be running to that when they're hurt. You can cause a lot of chaos. You can air blast people away from that pack. That's something that's I've certainly done a number of times. I think just, just by the nature of you being pyro and having these very annoying fiery projectiles um, that are going to hurt people's vision, you have, a, you have good chances between that and air blasting them around in the boiler room for sure. Uh, you can reflect anything that might come through a choke. Uh, one of those little tight corners, those entrances and exits to boiler room or bridge room. And you can do the same in bridge room. You can air blast people from getting inside. Uh, on, on, you know, regardless of what team you're on. And, uh, and control that health pack and, and set people on fire. And you know, anywhere you know there's going to be people in a really dense area as great as Pyro. You could use a detonator. Uh, you could be using Flog and uh, quickly charge your meter or just eviscerate all of them knowing they're all going to be in this small little room bunched up together. It, it's a good spot. I would definitely say it's it's much more uh, s suitable to Pyro than like Soldier. You know, like third point, I would say probably not, not the best for Soldier. Pretty cool for Pyro, actually. You know, not great for Scout. Pretty cool for Pyro again. And uh, the actual third point itself, I would say... Uh, it's, it's sort of a mixed bag for Pyro. Uh, you, you have lots of areas that as a defensive Pyro, you could be hanging around your combo and, uh, you know, just keeping that shit on lock, defending your engineer, keeping his shit on lock. Um, I do like all of the, uh, the upper scaffolding areas. It's, it's funny because 
I feel like the the play style of a you know especially roaming or on the blue team in a pub as pyro there's a lot of overlap with scout um, but the the funny difference is, is that you know scout has his advantages movement um, mainly and the pyro has a big edge over the scout's disadvantages a lot of the areas where it's bad for scout you know, like Scout, you don't want to be in those small rooms. You don't want to be in those those cubbies and those little corridors uh, up top above the third point. And as Soldier, um, you do want to be up there. You take advantage of that. But as Pyro, um, even though you're very similar to Scout, you now can sort of reflect the odds in your favor, if I were to say so in a punny manner. Um, it All of those things that would be a problem for you normally... Are not a problem for you because you have air blast. If you if you're dealing with a hit scan character, it's going to be a night for nightmare for them because you're spraying flames all over their screen and you can air blast them and control their momentum in this tight space, pin them in corners. Very annoying, very useful as pyro. And if you're dealing with a projectile class, you theoretically have the competence to reflect all of their projectiles and uh, and take them out. So, you know, I I uh, I do like. All, all of those sort of tight nook and cranny upper areas where you could, you know, clear out a soldier and uh, in interfere with their their domain, interestingly. Uh, now, if we move on as Pyro to this, uh, you know, the third to last point area and the last point specifically, <laughs> I would say this is now again, we're getting to a little, a little generally less fun area. Um, but it still can be quite fun. Um, but the areas, I think, that really you don't want to be hanging around much on defense. You don't want to be hanging around too much on the low ground. Yes, it is helpful to the engineers to be spy checking in that area. You're not going to get any picks really hanging out there until the end of the game when people are sacking, f running down there, trying to push. Uh, you don't want to be hanging out in a lot of these open areas where a sniper is probably hanging out, um, where all you have is a long sight line to the enemy. Um, and, and equally so, you don't want to be hanging out in chokes where snipers have access to that sightline. Um, mainly on blue. It's it's easier for you as a red player to be peeking the choke. But on blue especially, you're at a big disadvantage from snipers kind of controlling these long open areas. But map room is a is an okay place to be as pyro. Uh, you're going to... You're going to, you know, similarly, as I said before, you have the capability to beat soldiers and 1v1s here. Um, you have the option to run out of that top right window and to, to get onto their spawn, which can be very nice. Uh, you, you have uh, the options to, to, you know, just do all these things we've talked about before. Throwing flames in the face, reflecting them, uh, air blasting them around, really juggling them. But I would say the best area to be as Pyro, and it's funny, right? It's funny. Pyro's kind of like Scout in a lot of ways, is tires. I, I love hanging out in tires. Not Maybe not so much directly on tires. This is where Scout and Pyro different are different because the Scout is kind of banking off of medium range damage and uh, keeping space between them, and they're kind of wanting to, to stay literally on the tires and watch people coming in from those chokes, you know? Um, and, and those other rooms, but a a pyro actually uh, doesn't want that. They don't want that kind of distance between them. They want to be actually spending as little time actually on the, the tires as possible, but kind of rotating between the entrances and exits to tires, right? That connecting room uh, that you would typically take as a blue team into tires has two little choky entrances that you can definitely shut down as pyro. Uh, you have good high ground, Again, a, a lot of things we've mentioned before that are advantageous about the spot uh, defensively to control. Um, you have lots of small health packs to keep you alive, but mostly it's just these these nice little corners that you can catch people on fire. And the thing is, if, if the fight is no longer advantageous to you, you can just air blast them back a decent way and retreat to one of these sort of innermost areas, one of those small health packs, maybe up to that highest health pack in that sniper's building. It is it is a nice place to be. I, I would say it would be cool as well uh, if you have the detonator to jump up there or if you're on Badwater Pro to take advantage of that little stairwell that connects to their, their red spawn that goes all the way down, that, that big, long, tall stairwell that you can usually only get onto 
um, on offense as a soldier or, you know, a, a big jumping class, uh, assuming it's not Badwater Pro. That would be a great place uh, to get up to if you could as Pyro, you know. Uh, detonator jump, maybe go on someone's dispenser, that seems quite unlikely. Uh, reflect jump. You know, th there are ways you, you can get up there um, because this is a super choky area. Um, and I, I think that's a very fun place to kind of fuck with people and just keep peeking, catching people on fire. And then they've got to... It's awkward going into that thing when somebody is holding there defensively. It, it makes it quite difficult. Uh, you're, you know, you're shooting up. That's the biggest issue right away. And uh, so that's a great place, too, I would say, to, uh, you know, as a defensive pyro, you can go up there, cause problems for anyone who's in there. You do have air blast, awesome asset. And it connects you right to tires. And you can go back in if tire seems unsafe. Otherwise, it's a good entrance that connects you to it. You can start causing problems. Um, there is great choke potential as well. I know I've been talking about pyro in a very flanky way on blue and red, but I think there is great choke potential. Um, I'm going to make the final verdict, uh, which is, you know, possibly controversial to say in a pub environment, I think it's more fun to play blue pyro. Um, the reason I think that is is because although, sure, you do have sentries potentially to deal with, you can reflect the rockets, which can be quite deadly. Um, I think you're a, you're a great component, you're a, a, sorry, a great candidate for a pub push, a pub uber push on blue team. I think, I think a, 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 a pyro uber can be awesome against a sentry. Um, maybe one of the best things you can use against a sentry in a, in a combo, and a lot of people just hold down left click, really fantastic. But I think it's less so about the fact that um, this, you know, there's this negative aspect of you have to deal with sentries on blue, but I think it's more about the fact that red pyro, just by default, your, your, your role is so good at helping your team not worry about certain things, not worry about spies, uh, keep spam away from your sentries. That it's gonna, you're gonna just find yourself in a lot of situations where you're hanging around there because it's a good place to be positionally. And you'll think, well, I might as well do a little spy checking and reflect some stuff for the sentry. Um, because it's a little, uh, you know, a as a blue player, no matter where you go, you're never gonna, wa you're never gonna go anywhere that you're in a spot where you go, oh, well, now I better defend my sentry now that I'm here, you know, just for a little bit. It's like, no, you're gonna, that's only gonna happen to you on red. You know, level three sentries generally are not very meta on blue on bad water in uh, 2021. So, Something interesting to think about that I do think uh, Pyro takes the cake in that regard on the blue team. That being said, not a huge difference, not a huge disparity. I would say it's not as not as different as it can be as Scout. I think I think you know, hands down, dealing with sentries on blue is so much more of a problem as Scout than it is as Pyro. Um, you you don't really have an obligation to defend anything as Scout on defense. If anything, you're just there to to go nuts and, and shred the flank up and get sick frags. Can't really say the same as Pyro. It doesn't feel like like the uh, what you are naturally called to do as much. You know, hate to say it, as much as we as much as, much as I want to support, you know, flank pyros causing chaos and, and malevolence. It's just the way it is. So now I, I do want to move on and look at Demo Man and how his fun compares on the blue and red team, offense and defense respectively on P low. Payload, PL, Pele, Badwater. A fantastic, uh, fantastic map that I'm happy to be speaking about with you today here. Please, uh, please like the video if you've not already liked the video at this point for PL Badwater. Really would appreciate any support we can get. And I think, I think the uh, the amount of support this video gets is symbolic directly of Payload Badwater support because if anything, this is just a sort of brainchild, an experiment, perhaps uh, inspired and. Uh, demanded by the spiritual essence of PL Badwater in the hit game Team Fortress 2 released in 2007 by Valve. So thank you for that. Demo Man on that first point, obviously, is going to, you know, you, your mind, at least at least mine automatically goes to say, hey, defense, defense Demo Man, defense Demo Man. Because in general, you got, you got traps. You got place to put traps as a defensive Demo Man on PL Badwater. You have set up time to place traps. And you don't really have that as Blue Demo Man, I'm just sorry. You can put them on the on the little gates that open up, not going to be very effective, okay? 
And I think maybe they even patched something too where they disappear now when the gates open up. I can't remember. It's been a long time. It's been a long time we've been playing this game, okay? But lots of great traps to put as demo man. You can hide some in like lights and stuff along the right side on the cliff. Again, hope that's not patched. Hope hope I'm up to date, bros. But uh, some very nice sneaky uh, demo man sticky spots. You can put them in, in, the, in the bush sort of... Uh, closest to their spawn if you know what i'm talking about and the sort of center area right right uh you know right next to their spawn where the cart sort of quickly turns left into there's a bush right there it's a great place to put uh to put sticky bombs for sure and uh you know the the one thing i can say in advantage of the blue demo man on this first point of bad water is you do have the capability to be a kamikaze pilot and jump and so our classic move here on Highlander, uh, back in the day, you know, before the caber was nerfed, was to uh, to to jump the medic. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe this didn't happen in uh, the the Premier League divisions, but on uh, you know, certainly in enough of the the median level divisions, you saw people uh, on offense, on blue, on demo man, on bad water, using the sticky jumper and the caber to quickly chaotically jump in to that cliff area before the sentry could even hit them. And, uh, you know, potentially dropping the medic, if not just causing chaos. I think this is a great spot, too, just to jump in and lob pipes at the sentry. Potentially take it down if you're quick enough. It's unexpected. It's violent. It's intense. And uh, I would say something I love to do, one of my favorite things to do as demo men, is to sticky jump uh, immediately all the way back to their spawn. Um, as, a, as a blue player, I go back to the red spawn. And I, I use pipes to take down the teleporters, potentially get a few picks for free. Because we know just taking down those teleporters on defense red is is it's so useful to crippling the, the defense. Uh, it makes them walk a lot longer way. It, it's just it's just a, a quick step to start getting things in your favor. All it costs is one player sacking for a minute. Very, very low cost in my opinion, for if you can now know okay consistently we, we wanted the teleporters down because you know that engineer wants to stay up they want to stay up to keep their their sentry up they can't afford to go back they can't afford to die to rebuild it really uh really nice move to make and let's say though that you are playing a more traditional demo man role here on the first point of bad water on the blue team if you are pushing in um you could go in with an uber on the left side on cliff seems like it would be quite common um you, you could, again, take advantage of this tunnel being a very advantageous spot for projectile classes. And it's, uh, you know, you, you, you could contribute some nice cap time and, and, and get some easy picks there, potentially using your stickies as well to deny anyone from coming too close to you and sort of controlling that nearby area um, so that if, if anyone drops down into it, they're just immediately killed. Uh, probably, probably not a fantastic area for the domain on that right hill just because it, it does take your your uh you know your projectiles are wild to reach people and uh, compared to soldier especially it's they're more unpredictable in their tra trajectory and uh you you could take good 1v1 fights on that sort of upper ramp right area that we've mentioned numerous times but probably not the most intuitive place to go as a demo man so it, it does really seem in my mind that the the fun to be had here on this first point uh defensively is with good sticky traps and just loving that high ground chilling on that high ground piping people were trying to jump up denying people coming from cliff with good sticky traps you know people are going to be coming up that cliff trying to take out the sentry and they're just they're just there to take tons of damage good meat shields to boost your stats and on the other hand as a sort of a chaotic troll play style on the blue offensive team for you to go back and uh jump all the way behind them. It, it, I would say this is one of the most common maps that you do see a, uh, a uh, sticky jumper demo play. Um, it, it's kind of overwhelmingly common, I feel like, considering how esoteric a play it is to see, uh, you know, I'm, I'm playing uh, on red team on Badwater and all of a sudden I see a, a blue demo man jumping a million miles an hour all the way back to what would be the second spawn of, uh, of the blue team. And then, you know, making their way quickly to... Uh, to our spawn and it's just one of those things that it's because of the city jumper it's it's just so fast it's it and and, and it, it is such a good uh open jumping map which is something we talked about before with soldier and i think you can say the same for delman there's a lot of really great jumps that you can do 
on this map, you know, both both defense and offense when it comes to rolling out. Probably more fun, however, for offense to get way behind the enemy lines. Uh, so in that, say, I, I, in that way, I think we have an even matchup here where I would say that your, your fun on this first point does depend a, a little bit on your playstyle as a demo man. I think, uh, I think for the more traditional, classic, uh, vanilla, tried, tested, and proven players, it will be uh, more rewarding, perhaps, and more fun to be on red, to have the opportunity to place a lot of strategic tri sticky traps and, and do lots of area denial. Uh, you know, the, some of the, the roles Demo Man is most famous for, whereas I think the chaotic players might enjoy uh, jumping, you know, and, and uh, causing chaos in the flanks and, and taking advantage of the sticky jumper like I have on that first point to spawn camp, try to take out sentries from really far away, just get yourself in really favorable positions where now you can lob projectiles at the enemy. Though, I, I suppose it is fair as well to mention Demo Knight. Um, uniquely, Demo Man being one of the only classes to really have different play styles and, and almost two classes within the same character. Uh, and, and, and Demo Knight, to be fair, I do think would be more fun on red, uh, which m maybe does even things out for the trolley players. They would probably prefer to play it on red here. Just because you're coming from high ground, uh, you have that solace of wherever I return, it's going to be hard for them to shoot me because I will be on high ground and they'll be on low ground. Uh, whereas as a, as a blue demo knight, you're a little more constantly at risk because you're kind of mostly on the low ground. Uh, and, and people are going to be keeping their distance, especially at first. A lot of, a lot of the success of holding bad water first is about kind of keeping appropriate distance and not letting the blue pushes get too close to the sniper, to the sentry, to the combo, um, and keeping it alive because it is a lot harder for them to push at a, uh, or, to, or to make significant d uh, damages to the red hold um, at a distance, right? At a close range, it's very easy to take out a sentry, right? From far away, maybe not, not so much, right? So, so yeah, so the Demo Knight, uh, I, I can see it being a lot a lot more favorable on the red team here than the blue side though it would be cool as well you can go through the tunnel and then use your charge to kind of round that edge get to that long uh choke between first and second and make your way back to their spawn cause chaos in that way that would be really great uh let's talk now about the the second point as demo man uh in that first to second area the the rooftop the flank the choke the train yard area with the crates, um, all, all the different staircases we can take to that rooftop. So similarly to Soldier, we have some really nice chokes. I would say that big main choke where the cart runs is, is has got to be most exploitable by demo men. You can put some nice traps in, in, in some places where people will round the edge uh, they might not be ready for. You can put them under or by the cart. The cart in general is just a fantastic place for traps because people love to ignore them and, and keep pushing and sacking and trying to, to run the time down and just sort of thinking, hey, I'll be lucky. Who cares, right? There's only one sticky here. So it's a good uh, a good place to constantly be putting sticks and, and sort of pad your stats as a defensive demo man, which is quite nice. And uh, lobbing pills throughout that... That choke is excellent as well because quite different to soldier you do have rollers right so you have the you have the direct damage of the projectile but you do have this potential of rollers as well and these sort of big long chokes are just designed for rollers because it uh you know it it, it makes it really not matter if you hit anyone directly you know it you, you can just expect that you're kind of constantly denying the area around where you expect people to be without having to get very close to them which is an excellent thing to do and the thing is, this kind of works in a similar favor, too, as a blue demo man. I, I think there's lots of great spots here to spam pipes. You can spam pipes down that main choke. Again, you might worry about a sniper, but I would say as well, you could, depending on how close the sniper is, you could really start to bother them um, as a demo man in that choke. Again, assuming they're not too uh, not too wise, not too intelligent with their, their deathmatch abilities, right? 
pushing through that uh, that staircase up to the rooftop can be difficult. It's obviously going to be easier to do to be sorry easier to be a, uh, a defensive demo man in that situation than an offensive demo man if we imagine a one v one, two players on either side of it. Um, but it's a, it's a choke. It's a really uh, tight little corridor. It's going to be great for both of them in some way. Um, I would say it's a little easier for a soldier pushing up that than it is a demo man, uh, just because of the the kind of how how quick projectiles go off, right? So uh, a soldier, they're going to have the splash damage immediately. A pipe, you'll have to wait for a roller if it misses. Sticky Bomb has a arm up time. It takes some time to do the damage, so you can't really just, you know, round the corner, guns blazing, and then know that you can sort of dip out for a sec because you did a little damage. Like, it, you know, you might be dead by then. Um, but defensively, of course, an awesome place to hold. In general, this whole area is awesome to hold defensively. Uh, there's so many doors and shutters that open up on bad water, especially on that second point. So many little corridors people can go through that you can trap and really just camp and wait. And, you know, especially like that uh, that passage up, up to roof or just that whole gate when it does open up um, from the first point is a great, uh, great big wide door to sticky trap. So there's, there's lots of good trap potential, which I would say is just in general going to be favored for red because... Even though there are good traps on blue, you're only going to kill very aggressive players. That's it. You're only going to kill very aggressive players who are potentially overextending, right? Whereas, as a red demo man, with your well-placed sticky traps, you do have the potential to kill all kinds of players. A, a myriad of players who will come through because they all have to go through. They all have to push forward or they lose the game. It's integral that they try to take that roof. It's integral. So, big advantage in that way for red demo man. I think a sticky jumper demo man, a flank demo man, um, using pipes, will have an awesome time again here on the, uh, the this big flank area behind the rooftop, on top of the crates. Um, there's so much jumping room between these areas. You could really get to that back little room with the medium health pack. And then get out to that uh, that sort of patio it has, and uh, you know that that with that railless patio and spam pipes over to where the engineer is, uh, which which is a a really nice n cumbersome no not cumbersome yeah it's causing problems for them I'll remember the word later. I like that you could uh, also in that same room that I said it would be nice to go to a, a pyro to take advantage of, and probably a soldier as well. Again, classes that do well with with short range maybe this would be even better as demo man if you take that area the staircase that the blue team has to take to get up to the rooftop really nice to have control of as demo man because you can hang out in sort of that middle area have both sides sticked i mean if you were a thousand percent prepared you'd be on scottish resistance for this so you can keep some sticks up at all time that's probably a little psychotic but uh you know you, you, it's probably more important to have those sticks ready for people coming from the high ground. But then again, it's it's quite rare unless they know that you're there that they're going to go back down that staircase. It's more exceedingly common that people are going to come up, which is great for traps. There's all sorts of places you can put those that they won't see. Or you can just be constantly p spamming pipes down, down that way around the corners. Um, rollers are going to be really good in this staircase. Any Anytime there's a chance for, uh, you know... A, a big long staircase that even has a little flat part of it halfway really good for rollers so I, I i love that spot as an offensive demo man not so good as a defensive demo man because you wouldn't expect people coming up there but as the defensive demo man you have that other staircase to watch which you can expect people coming up from um so overall uh, for this first to second point area i'm gonna say it's a really great uh spot for demo man. I, I think this is uh maybe even more fun than the first point because the first point definitely takes advantage of open ground a lot more and the second place the, the second point is much chokier uh, you have more flank options you have more tight corridors where people will be coming through tight staircases tight chokes to, to spam um, places you know sentries are going to be that you can peek much I would say potentially safer um, and you can do damage to them in different ways than you probably can on the first point so really demo man on the second point I would say I would say equally as fun on offense and defense. I would say so far the the power rating between offense and defense 
on Bad Water for Demoman is very even, mostly having to do with your play style as a Demoman. I think if you are an ambidextrous Demoman, if you tolerate the many disciplines, if you like playing Sticky Jumper sometimes, if you like playing Demo Knight sometimes, I think there's always going to be something fun for you on Bad Water in any of these points. If you're more of a conservative, traditionalist, uh, Demo Man player, probably going to be having more fun on defense. I, I think that's uh, that's hard to dispute so far. Uh, now let's move on to this second to third point area of Bad Water and compare how much fun it really is for Demo Man, whether you're on the offensive blue team or on the defensive red team. So the the obvious comes to mind again that you you do have a positional advantage. As the Red Demo Man, you have a lot of corridors, a lot of doors, a lot of chokes. People will be, should be coming through that you can guard. You can expect people to come through and you can put chokes, or sorry, you can put sticky traps there on those chokes and sort of reliably use those as ways to get kills, um, which you can't really say for the same, is the same for the Blue Demo Man. That being said, there are nice uh, sort of neutral zone rooms that you, you can control in that way. I would not consider the boiler room a neutral room, I would consider that sort of by default to be controlled by blue and on red to infiltrate. And honestly, just not much of a room in general where it makes sense to spend a lot of time in. Um, there's only a small health pack, right? It's rare that you'll see a, a combo or some really powerful uh, heavyweight classes hanging out and camping in there because a, a small health pack's not a lot to replenish. Um, and it's just not as obvious as a choke as that bridge room which does have a medium health pack, which is much more worth defending, much more worth fighting for, and much more contested. It's much more of a neutral zone. You can see, and we yeah, I'm sure everyone has seen, uh, I've seen blue engineers set up in there with a level 3, and I've also seen red engineers set up in there with a level 3. It's an interesting neutral room. And something to note is that with that in mind, I think... This is one of the few places where you could be a blue demo man and you could uh, be using a lot of sticky traps in this room. You could just be holding this room and trapping the door a lot because you know people are going to come in from red. It's a, it's a room people really do like to poke at and push. Um, though we do have to remember, I, I have been sort of not giving enough credit to the fact that there are a lot of good building destruction opportunities as a blue demo man that you probably won't have as a red demo man throughout this map on bad water i do like that pushing this third point um there the sentry spot it's it's harder to get it very overpowered i i think the best sentry spot is in that little window right above the third point if i'm looking dead on it from the blue team's perspective that's a very annoying sentry spot I think anywhere else a sentry is, it's going to be very easy for a demo man to deal with. And you do often see the, the mediocre sentry spots, the other sentry spots, in a pub environment. It's ra very rare that I see that quote-unquote best location being utilized in a pub. Um, the, the under area, again, similar to how Soldier will deal with it. You don't... Uh, want to get caught down there if you're not a projectile class and even if you're a projectile class I wouldn't want to spend much time down there it's a great spot to uh, to catch people out um, you know again rollers are gonna explode somewhere down there if they miss someone uh, it, it, I definitely just think this is a good place to, to catch people out um, it's better though on on the red team but probably good on both sides to just be spamming that lower ground area in case anyone is foolish enough to kind of dilly dally around there when they really shouldn't be uh again the, these upper rooms are really nice um on defense the the upper upper rooms uh all this wooden architecture around the third point directly around it uh good high ground to take advantage of as a dome end to keep spamming down on people and, and nice, too, that you can put traps in, in lots of different areas in this corridor so that if you get jumped, if a scout comes to try and rush you in that area, you can potentially deny them, right? And I would say that this is a, uh, you know, a more fun as a vanilla demo man area to defend than, than uh, push offensively. 
But if you are playing a sort of sticky jumper setup, it's funny. I would think this is actually going to be more fun and easy to deal with on defense as well. Um, I think this is a hard hard point to sort of push behind as a blue player trying to quote unquote spawn camp. I think it's almost impossible if red's doing their job. Because um, even if you can get through that little, uh, all those upper areas, right? All those little upper little corridors and buildings as a, as a soldier or, or a demo man or something, there's almost always going to be a sentry on you in, in some place, you know? And then even if you get out of it, you've probably got more people to deal with. You could sneak, if you do make it all the way through that, maybe you can sneak through tires. It's difficult, harder than the other points on the map, that would be my argument, to sneak past. Um, but funnily enough, I think as a red player, this would be a fun time as Doman to sticky jump way back behind where blue is spawning, or just get to the roof and kind of harass blue from there. I think, uh, yeah, I think, I think them having that really long walk until they capture the third point just makes this a great place as a red player to go back and harass. And, and we can say this of most of the classes of scout, of soldier, um, maybe as pyro, probably not because you, you do benefit on, like, we know third point is good for pyro because all that close range area on defense. Um, as spy, you know, classes that, that, that have really high damage in, um, uh, maybe maybe I didn't like where that sentence was going, but the 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 point is that this this is something that I would like to do as Doman on the red team. If I'm not having the sort of traditionalist role, it would be nice to go really far behind them. Maybe even sneak through boiler room um, if you could control it. Um, potentially could be beneficial as Doman. Again, I sort of question in general if it's ever worth the risk to try to hold boiler room for a long time. Um, I would say it's easier to hold as soldier than as demoman, um, and maybe as pyro in some situations. You're just a, you're just at that risk where if your traps don't work, um, it's it's going to be a tough fight. You know, if you can constantly hold it down with good traps, that's good. You, you shouldn't have any problems holding boiler room. But I like the idea of getting behind them, being on that roof, being able to lob stuff down on them. Maybe going, you know, setting up traps very sneakily. If you, if you were somehow not on sticky jumper demo and you did get behind them. So that places that they walk by, uh, <laughs> as they spawn, they explode and their body uh, gibs everywhere. That would be really nice. But let's now think about the last point on Badwater as a demo man, okay? And I know I sort of glossed over demo night perhaps in these last two points, um, but you can likely theorize to yourself uh, how you know how how things would go. You're always at risk as as demo knight on Battlewater going against the red team. They're gonna have sentries. Um, again, they don't have the red team doesn't have to be forced to go t forward. They can always hang back by their sentries, hang back by their combos, which makes it harder as a melee only character, right? Um, and whereas on the red team, they have to push through you. So there's lots of places you can catch them, lots of little chokes. Uh, that you can get heads off of them or, or some other kind of kill depending on what sword you are using as a demo man defensively on payload bad water. But if we think about this uh, this last point as a demo man, again, uh, we keep saying it, great for defense for choke. Pretty much throughout this whole map, there's a lot of really nice chokes. I, I would say I would say the first point actually is lacking the most in chokes. It it has. The tunnel, yes, which can be nice, but really it's it's very, very open in the place that you want to be holding generally, which is that up top area, you know, because you can't hold in tunnel. You're going to, you're going to, they're going to take high ground and then you're going to be fucked. So I think as demo, you know, the chokes are really good for you. There's big long choke in second and third point. There's a lot of chokes. And of course, in the last point, there's that one very nice tight choke, which is very fun to spam. And at, at the same token, as long as you just don't fuck around much in the flanks, you'll probably be good, you know? You can you can spam people coming in from tires, and that's going to be annoying because it's this little tiny walkway they have to go through. Um, you could spam into map room, not even be really dealing with map room, but just shoot into the windows and occasionally... Uh, make it annoying for them. I certainly know as an offensive player, pushing into map room, I am very annoyed if all of a sudden rollers are coming in because you only have a small health pack. It's not a really gratuitous place to be. 
Um, snipers can cause you trouble. Uh, you know, map room is excellent to take control of when you are allowed to take control of it or when you take out their fighting classes. But if they're really pressuring map room, if you're lobbing stuff up there as a demo man, it's going to make their life harder. And it's nice too as a demo man because you don't have to actually go into map room to do that. There are those big windows that make it easier. So, uh, defensively, we like all of those aspects of it. I, I think there is a potential too for you to even hang out a little bit in tires and just be guarding those two chokes that they have to enter tires through. Um, you know, not wanting to take big, huge fights in the open area. Don't let them get too far in, but if you can control those chokes and maybe have a sort of really tight, aggressive hold um, of the entrance to tires, that would be really good as a demo man, uh, especially if you have multiple demo men on your team. Um, I mean, you could always peek into that choke. I like, too, that that main choke as a defensive demo man you can constantly be peeking from that ramp um, and then if you need to you can push in a little further because now it's basically just the third point choke which is also pretty good as a demo man um, you have the potential too to get sneaky and wrap around in map room through the choke and flank anyone's there if, if you know that it's applicable and maybe catch them out it, it's a risky move but you do have that option which I like um, as, as a blue demo man here, uh, it, like soldier, you have the advantage of shooting down onto this hot, onto the low ground, right? Um, f from that sort of terrace that, that tires comes out of, from the choke point, if you've pushed up enough, you are at big risk of sniper there, however, but, uh, same with map room, similar deal, you are at risk of sniper. And you could do the same move I always talk about, jump out of the right window in map room, and just strafe jump, strafe hard right. Either you'll hit the staircase, and you'll you'll walk up to the uh, to the red spawn, or you will be propelled by a sentry, and you will immediately make it to the red spawn. Don't even have to worry about the staircase. Um, it gets you there faster. You will take a bit of damage from the sentry, but it's almost always something that you can get away with, from my experience. And uh, once you're there, you can spawn camp. Spawn camping is a demo man. It's particularly ruthless. Uh, much more than a soldier, I would say. And to have that entire right gate controlled could be very awesome. you doing that with your sticks while you're lobbing pills down um, to the uh, to the sentries, to all the people on the lower ground. Really nice strat to have there if it, if it works in your favor. Um, probably not much to get out of tires besides trying, you know, offensively, besides trying to take it from anyone who's holding it. Um, but again, not a great place really to to hang out too long it's just that big open tires area is a, is a bit messy for you and um you know there's no point in holding the entrance to tires because you know nobody's gonna you can't do that <laughs> you can hold the entrance to tires if you're on defense not on offense it doesn't work that way uh but yeah i i like i like demo man too um as you're able to play defensively on these, not defensively, but I should say more on the back of the herd, letting your team support you by being the real front of the push, being very aggressive with their ubers, and and flooding in through the choke, flooding in through the low ground, because on, on the sort of the finale of Badwater, pushing in that those last you know couple meters on the railway, it's uh it's really nice to you know support your team with spam and not have so much attention on you as demo man i think that's where you're really going to thrive in the end you you want your other other characters you know heavies and medics and soldiers and pyros kind of having the brute force front end of that push while you're just you know lobbing out consistent damage from the back taking advantage of that distance between you and the other team while they're not focused on you that's that can work very well so uh, and, and demo knight obviously is going to be uh, you know will work for you a bit playing in the flanks here um, on, on the blue team gonna be tough for you in a lot of areas with the amount of sentries and snipers that there are in this sort of main choke open area um, as red team you do have more potential because you can kind of get in and out of map room very easily uh, to get single picks uh, potentially you, you know you, you can you can peek the choke you can pe peek people who are overextending from tires who are overextending from choke and, and, and get some free picks and potentially also uh, try to go behind them, um, but probably not the not the best point uh, for Demo Knight from my uh, my sense of it. Just because there's not uh, 
the, a lot of the flank areas that there are have a lot of openness to them, right? If you think about map room, um, the the place you don't want to get caught is in those little connecting doors between the two rooms in map room with a demo knight. That would be di difficult, but you know, if you're in that rest of the area, you could maneuver around them, you could air blast them away, you could rocket jump to, to get space from them, which would all put the demo knight at a disadvantage. Whereas, I think around that second point, you have a lot better sort of choky flank areas you can you can control and uh but i don't know maybe, maybe demo knight's all right on that on that last point too uh i would say in general you can play demo knight on uh bad water but it's kind of it does beg the question slightly of why because there are so many great chokes and it, there are so many great places to spam and just deal a lot of damage and take out sentries uh kind of like playing demo knight on dust bowl you you can do it i suppose um but it's not not super intuitive to me but maybe i have to uh really counter uh examine my own demo knight theory to to make sense of whether my philosophy about him is well-rounded enough to make a fair judgment of how demo, demo knight works on uh pl bad water payload bad water this map that we are talking about, Payload Badwater. And uh, so in, in conclusion for Demo Man and how he compares on offense and defense on Badwater, I would say that uh, overall, it's, it's, it's very good. I, I would say um, there's a big advantage to being a, a vanilla Demo Man player on red, um, but there's things to look forward to on blue as well. On blue, you do have all the sentries to destroy to look forward to. Um, you do have some nice neutral sort of zones where like that uh, bridge room I talked about between second and third where you can control and you, you do have some chances to use good area denial and traps. Um, but it can just be fun too if you are more of an aggressive player on Demo Man, even using the stock sticky bomb launcher versus, uh, you know, you don't necessarily have to be an aggressive sticky jumper player, right? An, an aggressive, crazy kamikaze bombing player um, to still have a lot of fun on blue on bad water. But I think, I think the diversity of options you have here is quite nice compared to some of the other classes. I think there are really nice places, like I said, those the spawn camping opportunities if you're on blue. Um, and just the number of places you, you can hold. Um, Badwater definitely gives you some nice choices. Where I think of the second point too in particular, where whether on blue or red, there's a lot of different places you can be delivering firepower that are all pretty good. And... Uh, I think even having numerous of them lets you kind of cycle between them and it keeps it exciting rather than just sort of hanging out in that same area the whole time. Like you might on a map like Dust Bowl or Gold Rush where there just is one choke. There is there there aren't two chokes and there you know there aren't uh, there aren't two flank routes and all all these types of things that Badwater does have which makes it a very fantastic map to play as demo men. More more uh, more options, less less brain dead. But you still have good spam, good chokes, good stuff that you do want for that primal, the primal desires you have in killing people on Demo Man. Those would be satisfied on PL Badwater as well. Moving on, we'll next be discussing the heavy, the heavy weapons guy, and how the heavy weapons guy fares on Badwater. He, of course, having an experience on the blue team as an offensive player, and on the red team as a defensive player, defending the payload on Badwater and pushing the payload cart on Badwater. I guess I guess a more appropriate vernacular would be that he is defending the bomb site, de defending the payload from reaching the bomb site. Hashtag Counter-Strike bomb site. Um, defending the payload cart from being pushed into the uh, the bomb at the end. That's what seems to be going on to me. Uh, now, how different is the heavy's experience between offense and defense? Well, to give you a bit of a uh, personal anecdote, uh, or really, uh, I'm borrowing it, a phrase, an anecdote from someone else. A long time ago, I played with a heavy player known as Polk. And Polk was, uh, was very good. Polk was, uh, he was on that same team that I mentioned earlier that Dave Plus was on. He won UDC Highlander many times back in the old days. Uh... I think so. 
Someone has to fact check me. He at least won once or twice. Anyhow, he uh, was a heavy main and had like 15k hours in the game in 2013, which should tell you something. Uh, and his whole mantra to heavy, if you asked him, and even if you didn't ask him, it's that heavy's all about positioning, man. That's all it is. It's, uh, heavy is about positioning. You would say that. It's, people think heavy's about aim, but it's not. It's about positioning. Having good aim is essential. You will be punished heavily if your aim is not appropriate and on point on heavy. However, you must understand that heavy is about positioning, especially on PL Badwater. And so, with that in mind, you can already imagine some inherent differences between offense and defense. And that your positions will be quite different. So, what makes sense strategically to me as a heavy uh, is certainly playing around high ground, playing around medics, playing around dispensers, and playing around sentries, right? on defense and on defense all of these things are generally going to be clustered in similar areas right on the first point they'll be clustered up above on the highest highest area you can get on the first point on that 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 mesa above the tunnel and on the second point all of those things are going to cluster by the air conditioning unit on roof right by the second point um, on the third point, things get a little different. Um, it's not so obvious that it's right on the high ground that you would be, because I can see, I can see yourself as a heavy actually wanting to spend a lot of time by. It still is high ground in a way. The entrance to the bridge room, not necessarily going in the bridge room, but watching the entrance to the bridge room, being up that small half flight of stairs. So you have some high ground over ground level. Anyone shooting, you know, rockets or grenades are shooting up to you, not shooting down on you, which is good. Uh, and then if we think about the last point, uh, it gets a little dicier, I suppose, because, yes, you do still want to be clumped up a bit with where your medic, your dispenser, your sentry might be, but these less often are high ground, because the meta sentry positions on last tend to be actually the low ground underneath map room and underneath the uh the platform on the left side uh you know you know the other garage area that i'm talking about underneath heavy in general uh is is nice however in that he will have a similar experience generally on offense and defense you see because defending as heavy is uh is really only different in that you have generally the high ground in your advantage. You have a sentry on your side. Something, the sentry really is quite, the level three sentry is most similar probably to heavy in terms of who's on the battlefield for the defensive team. So you're gonna wanna uh, kind of work together in a, in a way if possible to make sure that the, the damage you are taking is sort of distributed between you and the sentry. I'm trying to keep both of you alive, you know? Um, but taking advantage of that, that you do have two very large tank-like entities on your team, the level 3 sentry and the heavy weapons guy. Blue team, of course, you are pushing against sentries, but I would say heavy, an excellent class to uber in with, will will shred down sentries on close range. Uh, a particularly good spot to uber up to as heavy is going up that staircase up to the rooftop uh, by second. A great place to heavy uber in. Um, and not much you can do about it if you think about it, two heavy ubers against each other on the rooftop, uh, there's nothing going to stop the first heavy uber from destroying a sentry. You can't uber a sentry gun, which is a nice, uh, it's good for the heavy, I should say. Not so good for the engineer, but good for the heavy. Um, we, we talked a lot about the previous classes about kind of balancing your time between chokes and flanks, and you know, in some cases, like the, the scout, you really want to be spending as much of your time in the flanks as you can, with the exception being going to the choke to push the, the cart to get some times two cap time going. And uh, heavy is kind of the opposite of this, where they actually really, it doesn't make much sense for the heavy to be spending a lot of time in the flanks. It makes the most sense for them to be 
in chokes, in places where there's a high volume of bodies, um, and places where they can bear the high amount of damage that is incoming that other classes might not be able to bear, you know? They can afford to stand in rooms, in hallways, in little passages around corners that will get spammed a lot because they have 300 health. And, you know, a, a soldier or a pyro does not have as much health to, to bear that kind of damage, right? And as a heavy especially, you're likely going to get heals from medics. It, it's much more common in a pub environment. Uh, health packs are going to give you a lot more bang for your buck per health pack you pick up. Um, you know, if, if you pick up a medium health pack, that's, you know, basically the average health of most of the classes in the game right there that you just picked up. Um, which is going to give you a huge benefit in, in battling anyone. So, it, with that in mind, great to play around health packs. Um, if we think about the the first point, holding and pushing as a heavy, uh, there's two medium health packs, which are nice to be around. One of them, I think, makes a bit more sense because it's by the dispenser. It's by, uh, by where the sentry's probably going to be, by probably where a combo of some kind, a medic is going to want to hang out. Um, and it gives you that easy access to sort of peek over the edge and, uh, you know, prevent people from jumping up, prevent people from coming from cliff. Depending on how aggressive you are, you can hang out right by the walkway up to cliff on the right side before the round starts. Just punish anyone who comes up. Uh, or you can be more conservative, hanging back by where the sentry usually is. Uh, and a as an offensive heavy, I would... I would again kind of be going the path of the most resistance you know doesn't make that much sense to me to be spending a lot of time in tunnel to be trying to push up on the right side it's far too open snipers have too much access to you uh and now you're at the mercy of, of fighting where most of their threats are going to be from a very long range so it really makes sense offense or defense to want to spend time on that high ground on that left side of the map from the point of view of blue pushing out on the right side of the map from the perspective of red team defending that upper high ground cliff area all that place above tunnel okay it's gonna be a, a good spot for you as heavy and so similarly perhaps to soldier we can say that um the the roles of the blue and red heavy are kind of interchangeable in that uh, the re where, where the red heavy should be is really where the blue heavy should be, you know, and they should be contesting each other in that space. And uh, if, it's, if it's a good idea for the red heavy to be hanging out in that area, to be holding that high ground up there, or to be holding roof, it's probably a good idea for the blue heavy to try to do that and knock the other heavy off of his, uh, off of his uh, tower of, uh, of defensive pride, right? to knock him off and assert himself as the new claim to that throne. Uh, the second point, I, I love all the flank areas, but I think only one really is, is super applicable to heavy, because again, the, I don't think it makes much sense to be trying to take 1v1s all the way back in that junkyard, or to be, you know, by that medium health pack that you would, that room with the high concrete slab that you would enter if you walked through the first gate that opens after the blue team captures the first point and just headed straight left that room i don't think there's much of a utility being there as a heavy um you're too slow you really have to hug the pack um and if anything your, your slowness might punish you because it's easy for other people to just keep peeking you and doing damage uh whereas you know you want to cut down space between them force them to uh to face you head on which is always a good situation for U.S. Heavy. Going up uh, the right side, the right stairs, straight up to the top area by the second point, of course, is a great move. Um, and a move that I like is when that gate opens up after you capture the first point on offense, go straight through and, uh, and take that little staircase in the back that takes you up to the red team staircase, the one that they would use to reach the rooftop by the second point, and... Uh, it's a great place to camp and control, um, but I would argue really probably the better move because uh, because you're so slow, you, you can get caught out in there if people from above start lobbing projectiles down at you. Um, it is really just a good move to go straight up to the roof from that side. You have the air conditioning unit now probably blocking the sentry. You're able to slowly pick away at opponents without them really being able to do much. Um, there's almost always going to be an engineer, maybe a medic up there. 
uh, really weak classes you can take out pretty quick at that close range. Potentially a soldier or a demo man, which you'd prioritize right before killing those lighter classes. And because uh, they're, they're definitely more of a threat to you in that situation. And then it's possible that you can pick off the sentry with some strategic angles too. Once everyone else is dead. If not, maybe your team will have gotten to it by that point. Assuming you did get the engineer down. Uh, also, you know, a reasonable spot to peek the choke and bug people who are on cart if you can afford it. Again, snipers are a big problem in this map. Or sorry, not this map, but that, you know, that long choke. And it's really the number one reason why you wouldn't want to be hanging out in there as a heavy. Uh, you also, you know, if anything, you want to be hanging around by that corner where it finally curves to the left towards the cap. Because uh, that gives you a nice wall that you can continually hug and sort of hide behind but still jump out and do damage to anyone brave enough to trying to, uh, to really push that cap into that final portion of the map. Final portion of that, uh, that first to second railway line, I mean to say. So... Moving on to the second and uh, the, the area between the second and third point here on Badwater. Thinking about Heavy Weapons Guy and how he plays on this portion of the map. Uh, again, uh, I mentioned it briefly before, or maybe I implied it. The bridge room. Uh, the, the bridge room is excellent, which has the medium health pack. Again, if you can control that medium health pack is heavy, that is fantastic. That's going to give you a lot of health. Just watch those corners, watch those tight chokes. People are going to have to go into the room to fight you. Um, your biggest threat here is like a soldier or a demo man who knows how to keep peeking the angle and doing damage without taking much damage. In which case, you just want to be smart about exposing yourself enough so that they can't really escape, you know? Because if you're going to take the damage, you might as well take the damage and do a lot to them. Then just be, you know, if you're too conservatively hidden behind, they're going to be able to do a lot of, of damage to you. They're going to be able to punish you, uh, a soldier or a demo man. Other than that, anyone else you can handle. For sure uh, in that room that's a great place to hold as a defensive team as a heavy it's a great place to hold as an offensive team as a heavy just peeking those chokes letting people come into you because it can be a little diff uh, difficult if you are uh, now a blue heavy leaving that bridge room pushing forward to the third point because now you're dealing with a lot of uh, long distance threats likely not going to be anyone super close to you there might be a, a combo or some players who were flirting with the bridge room that you'll be able to kill right away but uh besides that you're, you're going to have all of a sudden a ton of long distance threats opens to you which is not what you want at all as heavy boiler room could be an interesting place uh to tamper with but there's really not uh there's really not a lot of gain from holding boiler room um at least as d a defensive heavy i can see some value in holding it for a moment as you're backing out um, it, it is a room that you you will have good control over uh, But especially as a offensive heavy, I don't see why you should be spending any time in boiler room because As soon as you leave as soon as you push forward the exit to to, to boiler room towards the third point is just a huge sight line and now you, you have the same problem of as when you leave the bridge room the advantage being of the bridge room that you can at least hug that right wall and um, you can shoot down on some people to your left, below you. Uh, whereas leaving straight from boiler room leaves you very exposed. It's difficult to get to a spot where you can shoot down on people below you. And uh, yours, yours, the angle's a lot wider. Angle's a lot wider. It, it gives a lot more a lot more space where, where you are in people's crosshairs. Uh, I, I would like some of those high ground areas. Um, I, th I think... I think just to take advantage of the high ground, um, for instance, the the sort of second floor level building um, right by the third point, there's a small health pack, which is uh, kind of the closest to where the blue team is coming from. If you think of that area and that has a little big open window that you can look out, you can see the bridge room entrance from the red perspective. You can see the boiler room entrance from red's perspective. You can see a little bit below you. I think this is a good spot to hold and hang out for heavy as long as you can afford it. You just have to be really careful about snipers peeking boiler room. That's going to ruin your day. Um, anyone else peeking boiler room, you can probably uh, negotiate with. You know, you have enough time to sort of dodge some rockets if a soldier is, is there and shooting at you. Um, you know, in any any hit scan classes, again besides sniper, you can you can pester them enough to go. Hey, it's probably not worth leaving right there. 
with that big heavy, uh, you know, high ground above me shooting down on me, let alone anyone else on the red team. But a, a good spot to punish anyone trying to leave from bridge room, which is, is bound to happen a lot, and anyone below you can just easily get picked off. If you need to drop down for some reason to go below, um, to, you know, to make some sort of urgent play, help a teammate out, there's a couple picks down there that look like you could get. You do have that big medium health pack that you can, you can pick up, which is... Again, going to give you a ton of health, and uh, you don't want to spend too long down there again because this is the, the sort of low ground bunker area where everyone's going to shoot down from, from both sides high ground, you know, whether on the blue or red side. So not a great place to hang out very long, but because of your superior health, you can drop down occasionally if you need to grab that health pack before you leave again and, and reposition to a, a high ground hold either in the place I was just mentioning or... Uh, right above that little tiny half set of staircase on the left side that connects to uh, to bridge room. Uh, those, those are some really good positions to be holding defensively. Now if we get to the, the third to fourth point area and the final point in general, uh, we, can, we can analyze all the different spaces there. So uh, it's interesting because the, the, the strategic positions here now do have some crossover with pyro um but in general heavy is going to have a lot more choke viability than pyro will just due to the amount of health that they can tank right um it d does depend which team you're on because i think similar to pyro or whoever else we mentioned this for uh if you are peaking that main choke as heavy on offense you have huge sight lines pretty much everywhere that the snipers should be. will have eyes on you. They're going to be watching that choke a lot. Not a great place to peek um, unless you know snipers are down. You have some sort of advantage. Uh, you know, there, there's another reason. You know, maybe you're getting uber charged or something. Um, but just definitely not a great area to hang out a lot peek. It, you can hang out right behind that corner and kind of catch people from the red team who are peeking and who are flirting with that choke, but uh, for your sake, it's probably best to be wary of that on blue team. Red team, red engineer, or sorry, red heavy on, on payload bad water, it's a much different story. You, you definitely are able to afford peaking that spot, looking down the rails. Um, you can expect, you know, a sniper somewhere, maybe, um, maybe one sniper, but the sniper on the blue team is going to be kind of forced to work with different areas at this point. They're going to have to be you know, trying to sneak into map room to get some shots. They're going to have to be shooting from that high sniper tower uh, that's connected to tires, which is a spot, but really not a great angle. Um, missing a lot of points that it can't cover. Can't really watch that main choke well at all, actually. And, uh, and maybe, again, peeking through tires on that left side, which has an angle on choke, but is pretty punishable. And a sniper should really not be allowed to be there for long, assuming your team is, you know has players in in that flank because a sniper would be a very easy pick to find in tires so as an offensive heavy uh like i said like i was kind of implying that it's there's some crossover with pyro in terms of positioning strategy uh on on blue uh it would make sense to kind of try to clear tires and, and work on those angles but really i think uh tires is going to shine as red holding it defensively as heavy. Um, again, you just don't want to be sat literally on those tires, and even if you do, not too bad, depending on which class you're facing, because I, I think you do have much more DPS from a long range than uh, than Pyro, or this would be a medium range, right? Problem is, as Pyro on those tires, you could be caught with literally, you know, no DPS, um, no damage from, from where you are, uh, you know, at most... Uh, a flare gun or a shotgun, a, you know, something that can be dodged, and if it does hit, will do very little damage. Whereas as, as a heavy, if you're using those tires kind of strategically, uh, and they're not, a, they're not a very long-range apt class as well, which is basically everyone except for, I would say, in this situation, uh, a demo or a, a sniper, um, you, you can pick them off. And um, y even though it is better, rather than holding on those tires, to hold closer to those corners where you have high ground, um, where people will be entering from, where you have small health packs you can pick up. Again, that's going to give you a lot of health as a heavy compared to everyone else. Um, 
can be good as an offensive heavy to to clear tires and gain control there because uh, I would think generally the defensive heavy is going to be hanging out on that ramp by choke um, and probably not fucking around with tires very much I, I think it's a good place to to retract a defense to but it's also not necessary you might be more suited as a defensive heavy hanging out in the choke which would kind of give you some space as a blue heavy to take 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 your uh take your energy and your presence to tires because th there would be no one to fight with nearly as much health as you right and considering it's all small to medium range combat you you have a fair shot of, of clearing it out especially if numbers are even etc etc uh, you know, forgetting any un unusual, especially strange situations that could appear here on tires on PL Badwater as the as the blue heavy choke. We've we've already talked a little bit about it's uh, a good place to be as a red heavy um, peaking, kind of chilling on that ramp area um, because you're you're at risk from no damage from people peeking map room. Um, you're really only at risk of damage from people peeking choke, which we've explained is very dangerous on the blue team and people peeking through tires which uh it, it is a place that really you should be able to shut down people peeking through there so, so it's a very strong hold on that ramp as a red heavy um but one of the last areas that we haven't really talked about is uh map room and and what map room is going to be like for heavy so this this can get pretty tricky because it it doesn't make a ton of sense to spend uh, a lot of time in map room I, to overcommit to map room, and so this depends on what team you're on. So as a red heavy, I wouldn't really suggest that you you know you spawn up top, you you go at the left gate, and you go in that little connecting room up the stairs to that balcony that looks over map room. I would try to stay on the balcony. Um, if you're in map room, I wouldn't, I wouldn't try toying with it at all and spending time actually on the low ground in map room. A soldier, uh, a demo man, just due to the angles and uh, the fact that there are those little choky connectors between those two rooms, map room and whatever that pre-map room room is, uh, not, a, not a great place to be on even ground against a projectile class. Uh, even... Even non-projectile classes, I wouldn't want to 1v1 a scout as heavy in map room. It's just, it's just not ideal. Um, you can probably win, but maybe against a very good scout, it, it's not great. And, you know, the difference is if you stay on that balcony fighting from that high ground, they're really not going to want to come in and push you. That's, that's an uncomfortable way to come into map room when somebody has that high ground on the balcony over you, especially a, a big heavy. So, so, so that's what I mean. On defense, you, you don't want to overcommit to the map room as heavy. Uh, but on offense, similarly so, you just don't want to spend too much time sort of waiting around in map room. If, if there's a couple free picks you can get in map room, you can help some of your flank classes, do it. It's right by the choke, you know? Uh, and it also makes a lot of sense to go with your medic and uber through map room, jumping out the window and falling down. It can get you down to the sentries faster. You just have to be very coordinated with your medic. Sometimes this can go poorly. Um, if you don't know where the snipers are, if, you, if you're not coordinated with your medic, if upon falling down, the uh, the sentry is, is shooting you while Ubered and, and sort of flies you into a, an area of the map that you weren't expecting, maybe disconnecting you and your medic. Um, so probably not the most, uh, the safest Uber. Uh, but it has its times. It, it, if, if done correctly, it can be better than Ubering through choke or when you know you can't Uber through choke because there's too much pressure. Um, but really, that's one of the only times I should you should see yourself in, in that map room as blue heavy. And if you're going to... like, Definitely don't hang out in the actual map room with the windows. If you're going to hang out in that room before that, it makes sense as a blue heavy to be hanging out in the, the sort of upper... Uh, staircase wooded area that's sort of elevated plat those elevated wooden platforms that's a good a good place to hang out and really as red heavy you just shouldn't be hanging out uh, in that area you, you know it makes sense hang out there maybe bait a couple picks I get that but you but eventually get out you know it's it's just not you can only roam quote-unquote as heavy you know on defense or offense so long so I uh, I think map room is is a, a special use situation for heavy. 
So we've, we've talked a lot about all the different areas Heavy has. I, I think I should mention also the, the stairwell. Stairwell is probably not a great area to ascend on defense, to go up. Um, it's just, if you're, if you're fighting a, a soldier or a demo man, even a scout, they're just so much faster than you. It might not be a, a great fight. Um, and by the time you get to the top, you have got a third of your health, and now you have to deal with whoever's there in tires, right? And, and at what gain, what do you really benefit? Uh, again, why, why, why have a heavy as a, as a flank class? But uh, if for some insane reason or you're playing Badwater Pro, it would be good to descend the stairwell as heavy. I, I think that would be reasonable. I think uh, I think you could definitely do some good things with that. Um, you just got to be careful because you are pretty slow. So again, probably not, probably not an area you're going to see very often. So... I think compared to other classes, you have a lot of parts of the map that you really don't have any place being. And that's just, you could say that's the map, but really that's just the nature of heavy. Um, and it is better that there is this kind of map, which is has flanks as well as chokes, right? If we compare it to Gold Rush, the Badwater actually has a lot more varied movement options, um, varied ways to move through the map. Um, varied places to hold, to decide, to decide to put presence, to push through from, and I think that uh, knowing that you have those options, or, or just having these options in general, is going to serve you a lot better and make for a more fun, heavy experience on Bower than it might on, let's say, Gold Rush, where, yes, you, you're always going to be by the choke, just by the nature of the map, but there's a lot of places where it's, uh, you, you also pay the cost if there's only one choke on the map, right? Because all the fire is coming through there and you're the slowest moving class, you're the biggest class, you're the biggest meat shield that's going to soak up all of that damage. So it might not actually work out super well for you in that way. And it's nice to have, yeah, a choke and a couple flanks. Or even better yet, a choke that is, you know, highly contested and going to be guarded by snipers, which makes it easy for you to, uh... To have a little a steam off of you, you know, a, a little uh, less heat on your ass, so that you can, um, yeah, not not be the center of attention as heavy, because that's that's important to fun heavy gameplay. You don't really want to be the center of the, the enemy team's attention. You want to be one of the things they're focused on. But if it's the only thing, it's not going to be fun for you at all, because you're a huge walking target. So, I would say, uh, just by default. Defensive heavy is going to be a little more fun on bad water than offensive heavy. Um, I don't think it's because of the sentries. I think uh, I think generally taking on sentries on offense can be really fun, and y you typically know where they are. You're typically you typically have the deal the the tools to deal with them. Heavies will uber you, you know, especially in pub environments. And uh, yeah, you're you're slow enough that it's kind of rare that you would overextend so far into a sentry without uber that you go oh shit i'm gonna die you know and if, if you do that's probably a choice you made that you accept is your fault but i think the the difference and why i'm i am gonna make the statement that defense heavy is more fun on bad water than offense heavy it it just comes down to the fact that you there are more fun places to hold than there are to push um heavy by its nature is is a slower class and so it, it kind of does well to, to slow the pace of the game and to punish people who are running into him, right? And doesn't do so well to speed up the pace of the game and to push forward into people. A heavy can be very aggressive with, you know, with a good uber charge and, you know, enough courage and, uh, and ballsiness to kind of overextend. And I, I encourage and enjoy that type of gameplay, but it's more rare. It's 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 more against the nature of the class. So, just by 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 all these things I mentioned, I, I will have to make that verdict that defensive heavy is more fun than offensive heavy on PL Badwater. Now, moving on, we've covered five of the nine classes and how their fun experience compares on offense, the blue team, and defense, the red team. So, I would now like to talk about the engineer and how the engineer's gameplay fares on PL Badwater, our beloved payload map 
from start to finish. So the engineer uh, is most famous on payload maps for the level three century gameplay. And it's of course of note that when this map came out as part of the heavy update in 2008, there was no mini century for engineer. The engineer only had the big century. And we can consider this to some extent, but it's really only fair to what the core Badwater experience has become, has became, because the, the majority of the years that Badwater has been a map in Team Fortress 2, the Gunslinger did exist, and the Engineer was able to build level 1 uh, mini sentries. So, which is the typical choice to make on offense. And we'll discuss how this affects things, as well as the options of using a level 3 sentry on offense as part of your engineer gameplay on PL Badwater. So, the first point, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about defensive holds. There is a, you know, a very classic spot. You're gonna put a sentry on Badwater as engineer. However, I will like to add that it's not the only spot. It is the meta spot that you, uh, really, I think most engineers will wisely place their sentry um, it's not the only one and there are some that are even considered bad but can be quite useful in a pub environment where you don't really expect these things as much so the the classic position would be above the tunnel on, on the highest high ground on that right side on this cliff somewhere um, the big distinction here is you can put the sentry kind of closer to the blue team kind of closer to that corner, or you can put it closer, uh, uh, you know, away from the, the blue spawn, closer to the edge of the cliff, um, giving it a vantage point, a view over the cart once it comes out of the tunnel, okay? So, there, there's a few advantages and disadvantages to these two different locations. Um, putting it in the more forward position does make it less threatened by snipers. Snipers are going to push up on that right side, that, that big long sight line that you have. And uh, if your sentry is back watching over the, the tunnel, uh, a sniper will be, it'll be very easy for them to try to pick you off as the engineer or to pick your sentry off. It's, it's very exposed to long range damage from that sight line, right? Soldiers shooting at it from over there as well. Um, whereas it might be harder for them to, to shoot at your sentry if it is closer hugging that wall nearer to the large ammo pack. And so, obviously the advantage of it being there is that it looks over the cart. And maybe even more important than it killing people who are on the cart, it prevents people from flanking. So, anyone who goes through the tunnel, if there is a sentry in that position, it's, there's a chance it's going to kill you. If not, it's going to do a lot of damage to you. It's going to alert the engineer of where you are, which could alert the rest of the team of where you are. Um, even without comms, even in a non-competitive environment, people will see, oh, why is the why is the sentry shooting down there? Hmm, let's, let's go pick off an easy target in the low ground who is trying to wrap around, right? So, and I think that is a very useful thing to do because when it's not there, when it's not watching over that that bend that the cart would take once it leaves the tunnel, it really does permit a lot of people to uh, go behind the red team lines through the tunnel and muck around, cause some cause some mischief. So, uh, I honestly, it's it, it's a tough um, a tough choice between the two. I think you have to sort of address what you think your your biggest concerns are going to be beforehand. I think a safe bet, as always, is to have it not watch over the cliff, put it more tucked in and, and have it be something that's harder to deal with for people pushing up the cliff side it is one nice aspect of it um, and that it's just more covered from long distance uh, fire long distance threats like snipers um, it's also typically a good place to uh, have a dispenser up there um, but let's first there's a lot of locations we can talk about but let's in terms of dispensers and teleporters on defense Let's first address um, other sentry locations. So, the ones I've mentioned, and I kind of consider it one, it's the same sentry spot more or less, and two, 
in two different flavors uh, is the most common that you'll see. Another sentry spot that you will probably see very often in pubs, I've done it a, a number of times when I was a, a newer player to the game, aspiring to try out Engineer, uh, is you will actually see Engineer's bunker up in that little shed underneath where the, uh, where the cart passes by, where it captures the first point. There's that little, that little bunker that slants down into the earth um, right where the first cap is. And you'll often see Engineer set up in there. Um, and put their sentries there. The thing with this spot is it it can be surprisingly effective in that when, let's say, people do go through the tunnel on the offensive team and they do sneak past, um, A, they're going to be immediately met with a sentry there, which will give them trouble, potentially kill them before they go any further, which is cool. Um, you also see this spot being weirdly useful when the blue team is like, at the edge of their seat with no time left trying to desperately cap that first point because it's right there watching the cart which puts them in an uncomfortable position having to sort of be behind the cart or hiding behind the cart so that the sentry doesn't kill them which makes them very easy to kill for anyone else even the engineer could jump out and start shooting at them from the other side um the 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 natural situation in which this sentry position falls flat is that the the enemy team has sufficiently overwhelmed the high ground, has taken out any sentries they had in that classic spot I was talking about, um, has no in, nothing encumbering them and, and, and discouraging them from hanging out in the main high ground area all around the first point, or I should say all around this sort of between area, between the spawn and the first capture point. Because if they have the high ground, if they're standing above this little bunker thing, it's so easy for a soldier to just spam down or spam the corners and do a ton of damage to whatever's in there and, and take it all out very easily. Also can be extremely easy for an ubered heavy, an ubered pyro, any kind of uber to take it out. So it's not very well guarded, um, but I think it's uh, I think it's an under-considered position. I think especially when you do have multiple engineers, and, and I think especially when the blue team is already struggling, I think this is actually a, a kind of good spot that uh, for whatever reason, you do see engineers doing a lot of work with this spot when it's kind of down to the 11th hour and people are just sacking the point, desperately throwing their body on that. It, it definitely makes it inconveniencing, right? Because um, I would say if I'm a blue player desperately trying to cap the point because we're losing so bad, a sticky jumper demo man with pain train, let's say, if I keep jumping to the cart, even if they have a sentry up in that top area I was talking about, I can kind of hide behind the cart and not have to worry about that and potentially cap it all the way in. But if they have a sentry there and an engineer kind of prodding me off the cart or, or you know, if I'm hiding behind the cart, they're going to start fucking with me. It's very annoying. It's very hard to deal with. Especially, you know, if I'm a scout as well, there's all sorts of circumstances in which this would cause me problems. So an interesting spot. Um, I know generally the, the sort of bunkery hide in the hole spots um, seem smart but can be very easily countered and, and uh, are often forgotten by experienced players, but I do think they have their place and there's something about that, that brutish nature to them that uh, can actually work out pretty well. So a, a few other spots I would like to mention. Sometimes you see um, by the medium health pack on the left side where you have those, uh, those rock formations. Um, you do see engineers sometimes putting a sentry there just so it's enough out of view from people coming up the hill, but that if they are to progress too far forward, it will kill them. Um, this is a great spot, I would say, again, when you have multiple engineers. If you already have an engineer set up on top of the hill, I think this is a great spot because um, if, if somebody... Um, in, under normal circumstances, if there's just that one sentry up on top of that cliff area... It's, it's easy for a soldier, a scout, a spy, um, a demo man, anyone to jump over into that little area where that medium health pack is and start shooting that sentry um, because they will be out of its range. But if, if there's another engineer there, that's obviously going to cause them problems. If a, a soldier or demo man tries jumping way over, it's going to do some damage to them, which is good. And I think the best use it has is that kind of it works in conjunction with that other sentry that would be in the, the very typical spot that we talked about first, and that it would cross out, uh, it, it, would, it would fully cover the horizontal area of, of the map right there, 
and that anyone trying to come through um, and even people who are trying to, let's say, uh, uh, do long range damage to the sentry that's up top on that traditional area, um, it would be easy for, for an engineer now to start, you know, baiting them with their shotgun and then of course they, they are kind of stuck at that slight low ground where they can't progress any further and, and they're denied that health pack because if they do go forward they're just going to get killed by that sentry. It also very appropriately shuts down uh, the area sometimes known as middle, which is this sort of middle ledge between the <coughs> excuse me between the highest leftmost cliff area that you go up, um, and then uh, between that and the sort of uphill ramp area on the right side from the blue team's perspective, leaving spawn, that sort of middle area, um, that that can be a great place to start gaining ad advance and gaining space as the blue team. It shuts down that area very nicely. Um, a, f a few other spots we should mention. There's a very... Uh, you, you can hold quite aggressively actually by putting your sentry kind of towards middle, um, as I was talking about. You can either put it as close up on that, up on that area as you can so that the second somebody walks a little bit forward on that right side, they're immediately punished by that sentry sort of high up and to their left if they're leaving from the right spawn area and just going straight on the blue team. I think that position is cool but is usually a little too aggressive. Um, and it's easy for a, a soldier to kind of get on top of the rocks and shoot down on it and kill it or something like this. Um, I, I like the more experimental hold of that same position, kind of middle in terms of vertical energy, but pulling it back um, a couple meters so that it, it's, um, it, it's still, there's some more distance between and it's still shooting at people that would be jumping on those rocks, for instance. So now it's not so easy for a soldier to just jump ab above it and shoot it down. Um, it is at that risk if a soldier takes the high ground from that real up top area that they have to get to from that cliffside. Um, but again, if you have another engineer, this could be a, a, you know, another engineer using the traditional spot. This could be a good second sentry spot to have. And it really uh, shuts down people trying to push up that flank, trying to push up that big right slow uphill ramp area and can be a huge pain because who's going to be trying to pushing up that uh, it's going to be light classes you know scouts engineers snipers um maybe, maybe no i mean really those classes and then they're going to get picked off very easily by a level three sentry in that spot another spot that i think is worth noting that is uh quite strange um but i have seen work and be very frustrating actually is um I believe there's a sign right by the first capture point. Maybe it says A or something like this. Um, and it's part of this big concrete building, the building that you go into to get to roof. Um, and if we're looking from the blue team's perspective, we're leaving the blue spawn, we're approaching the first point, just going up that right ramp area. This sentry would be placed a little bit to the right side of the point while still being uh, hugging that wall, that back wall. And this, this, this uh, position can be quite annoying. Um, a, for people trying to jump to the cart and suddenly get on it. It's annoying in that it does cover some of this, um, some of this upper area that usually might not be covered by a sentry. Sort of by the medium health pack, by this sort of big no man's land where you have a lot of space between the cliff and the medium health pack. Um, it's, I think, I think... There's, you can probably name a lot of other spots like this that I, I won't know. But the, the reason that it is a great spot is because it's unexpected. Um, and it works well in conjunction with another engineer spot. And that it's just, it's just a real why is that there kind of position. Um, maybe an honorable mention to the more aggressive holds. Uh, if we think about the spawn area. If I'm on blue team leaving that rightmost spawn door. There are some rocks directly in front of me on that right side. Uh, that you can kind of hide behind, or people on their team can hide behind. Um, if you think about being on that blue team, leaving that spawn, imagine a sentry being right behind those rocks. That That is a fun place to put a level 3 sentry. It's very aggressive. Doesn't work if um, a lot of powerful classes catch catch a hint of it. Um, but if you are if you have a strong flank, and you have other strong players with you in that area, or just it's just occasionally weak uh, classes coming by, trying to go up that ramp area, they will all be, you know, 
given a hard time or just straight up killed by that sentry. It's a it's a nice hyper aggressive spot. Um, there's I'm sure there's some other hyper aggressive spots you could put it like in the bush. If you were just being crazy and you were really really pummeling the the blue team on Badwater and spawn camping them, which can happen here and there. That would be a good spot. But I, th I think it's necessary now to move on to the second point. And really, the second point is very simple. It's all about the roof. And it's a shame because I think about how exciting the flank area is. I think about how exciting the area behind the second rooftop is. All, you know, all those... Uh, all, all that fun stuff you have out there. But the, the, the problem is putting, putting sentries anywhere there... Is just too much effort. Like if you put sentries on those, on those that big stack of crates and that sort of no man's land behind the second point's rooftop, it would be fun for a kill or two. A soldier catches a hint of it, and it's just very easy for them to spam rockets at it and shoot it out because there's a lot of distance between it and, and other areas. You know, um, not to mention it's so high up, and on top of that, that anyone sort of directly below it is is. Uh, is covered, right? It's really just doing anti-air to an extent. So, uh, you, there's probably some sneaky spots you can you can have set up. Um, I, th I think uh, if you were to put it anywhere in that flank area, a, a clever place to put a level 3 sentry, assuming we're on like a 32 player server, we have you know, lots of engineers, lots of resources to, uh, to spread out. You already have some engineers on the roof. Could be quite good to put one in that room with the medium health pack, the room that you would enter if when that gate opens after capturing the first point on blue, you immediately went left. That sort of room that has that nice staircase up and that big square slab of concrete very high up. And that would be a great place to put a sentry. It would really deny people you have high ground looking down at, from, looking down at where anyone will enter it. You just got to worry about people coming in from that other entrance, um, like a soldier, uh, jumping up and then just peeking. Um, but hopefully, you know, you, you have the means to deal with that. If, if you are there, maybe you can block it with this dispenser. There's lots of ways you could handle this, in theory. Interesting idea. But what takes the cake for sentry spots as an engineer on Badwater, on the red team, on the second point, is rooftop. You know, you, you will see sentries sometimes below, um, like right in front of rooftop, kind of by the second point, hiding in that little corner. It's okay, it's still covering the cart, it's nowhere near as annoying as the rooftop. Uh, it's such a struggle, A, to be rounding that corner as an offensive team member, having to shoot up to sentries. You don't, you don't know, you never know exactly where it's going to be, where exactly you have to aim shooting up. Even if you do, um, it's just one rocket or whatever it is that you're going to shoot at. It's hard to continue peeking that because there's probably a ton of other people watching that choke because it's such an obvious choke to watch anyway. So it's a, it's a great spot to have up top where it's watching over the cart, um, but still has access to punish people who come in through that staircase um, that connects to the roof. And uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really just the best place to put it. I guess it depends to you how close you want to put it um, close to that staircase, how close you want to put it um, away from that staircase, right? Um, you know, how close you want to pull it towards the red side generally or, or push it towards the blue side generally but you always want it to be overlooking the cart um probably you know it, it, it's just a good spot in general you have that air conditioning unit which protects you from people um behind in the flank and train yard or, or you know that whole area back there which is very nice um i guess i guess we got to move on from second defense it's just so obvious what's going on there now, there's something interesting, perhaps, that you could say here about this little area right past second, um, where you could have a sentry, and, and you do see sentries from time to time, near where the, um, the door is, the garage door that opens um, for the red team only during the first two capture points, right? So it's the door that suddenly gets shut off and you can no longer uh, go through as, as a red player after the... Um, after that second point has been capped. If you think of just a little bit in front of there, you have this big slab of concrete wall on your left side before you reach that main choke point. Somewhere in that area can be an interesting place to put a sentry spot in that um, it, it can 
punish people trying to sneak through, who are trying to sneak past the main sentry that you have on roof. It can punish people who, who do sneak through. Maybe they, they hug the bottom wall or they've come around the back of the flank and now they took the they took the staircase that you would usually take as the red team to make it to that sort of um, that interim room underneath the rooftop and they're causing chaos from there. It covers them where they are there. Um, and I think it's 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 a nice spot after you've lo lost roof where you actually can maintain momentum and um, or I should say maintain your hold, prevent them from getting momentum too quickly. Uh, this would never be a place you'd want to set up if you don't have a roof hold, if you don't have multiple engineers, but it's it's nice briefly to have a setup there in conjunction with a roof hold, or I would just say um, after you've lost your roof hold, if you can quickly set up there or something something like this, it's a nice way to sort of ease things in so that they don't rush through that whole area too quick. That being said, it's not too important to hold that sort of purgatory area. Um, it's more important to hold third itself, which we've talked about before because of the spawn, uh, the walk from spawn that they have to take until they've captured that third point. Their, their high dependency on teleporters, um, the, you know, the blue team has, has a long way to go during this part of this map. Capturing that third point activates their second spawn, which greatly uh, lowers the amount of time they need to get to the front lines, making it easier for them to win. So, uh, good places to put level 3 sentries on defense. Now, thinking between the second and third point, uh, definitely in, in the bridge room with the medium health pack. Um, this can be a great place to hold if you can manage it. It's kind of aggressive. You are at risk of Ubers coming through um, and quickly shredding it. But if you can really gang up with your teammate, if you can really have you know, a combo with you, a pyro with you, a pyro is so useful to have with you if you've set up in this room. They can be you know, spy checking, air blasting anyone out, like air blasting an Uber that tries to come in, reflecting projectiles that people try to lob in to shoot at your sentry. Uh, you know, a heavy medic combo, a pyro, and a level three engineer in there can be awesome. Um, yeah, it can be a very powerful setup. And so, uh, having, uh, having mentioned that, the bridge room, boiler room, I, I, I hardly see reason for a red engineer to be in there. Um, it can be nice. Um, I, I think it can be a good hold if you actually put the, put the sentry close to where that small health pack is and just have it closely watching the door so anyone who comes in has to sort of shoot up into it, right? Anytime you have people forcing them to shoot up onto high ground to a sentry is, is way more inconveniencing for them. They can't splash on the ground. Um, it might be hard for them. They might not even be able to splash on a wall. They have to rely on directly hitting your gun. The only thing I, I don't like about this is that it's it's uh, it's like at what expense are you, are you having this hold? If you have a ton of engineers, maybe a 32 player server, this would be a cool spot if you could hold it. Uh, the, the problem is that if they finally do bully through um, the bridge room, they can just easily wrap behind you in boiler and give you problems. Um, and I would say it it's, might not be as good as some of these other spots you can put a sentry. So uh, another, I think, common sentry spot we see on the, the classic vanilla version of Badwater is by this small health pack where you have this little pile of wood on the ground and some some little railings a little balcony um on on the second this like second floor area by the uh third capture point so it's the area that if you think about right by the third capture point there are these stairs that lead up to this sort of second floor building and then you go up those stairs and you take a right turn and this is the area closest to where the enemy would be right there's a little small health pack in there and there's a little open area that watches the bridge room and the boiler room and has a little bit of a vantage point of what's going on underneath it. You can have some really nice sentry spots here because people have to peek to fight it. They have to peek um, bridge room. They have to peek boiler room where people should already be putting some pressure on them for trying to peek. And uh, it's very punishing in that if they do like very quickly walk through not knowing there's a sentry, they will probably die to the sentry. And that, that's a that's a very nice aspect of that. Um, the advantage here, it probably doesn't have as thorough low ground coverage. This is definitely focusing more on the high ground, but 
there's something to be said for um, not really needing as much low ground coverage on this third point because, come on, it's, uh, you know, it, it should be on the rest of the team to punish people who fall down to that really low ground area, you know? It, it, it is easy puni easily punishable in theory. Um, I think this is a good sort of forward hold aggressive place to put your sentry when you know things are going well for your team. Uh, I, I want to talk now about some other sentry positions. I would say the one that is the most meta, I, I, I don't know if this is totally true, but it strikes me really as the smartest place to put your sentry. In the same upper building area that we, we were just talking about with the last gun. But if we imagine, again, by the third point, you're walking up the staircase. Instead of, once you've made it up the staircase, instead of turning right and putting your sentry in that room, you turn left, there's a room with a little alcove where there's a recessed area where the ground goes in deep and people like to put their teleporter there. And there's also a window that has a sort of view of the third point and a long view of the entrance from bridge room. So the, this is a really nice spot to have. It can be great in conjunction with the Wrangler in that it, it watches that room where people are leaving from the bridge room. And it doesn't watch boiler room unnecessarily, and it actually puts a lot of space between boiler room and the sentry, so it kind of forces people uh, to peek and, and walk from boiler room towards bridge room to have any advantage against that sentry, um, which would be uh, put, put, putting them in the harm's way of the sentry. Um, it has way better coverage of what's going on on the point of what's going on below, um, of, of the low ground in general, and it's a very defensive position. It's it's uh, I'll, I'll talk about its one exploit and the way that it can be hurt, but uh, it it is very defensive in that it puts a lot of space between the the blue team pushing out and it. Right? If you think about the other places that I mentioned. They both, once you peek the corner, you're about, you know, 10 feet away or something. You're, you're not that far away from the uh, the, the sentry gun. Uh, you know, if you push through with an Uber, it, it should be easy to take down pretty quick. If you leave bridge room, you're already getting pinned by this sentry position. You have to somehow push forward into it if you want to get close to it. Really, your only hope maybe is uh, rockets and demo man projectiles. Um, if you if you push from bridge room or if you push from boiler room or if you push from under um, Pushing from under maybe potentially if you can afford it if you can sneak down there quick enough could even be a better push than from bridge room But it's a very punishing good defensive spot where it's hard to push through especially if as a red engineer Your team is playing off of you. You have pyros um, air blasting back that uber pinning them back um, be Because they will be so distracted with the sentry the only flaw with this place is that someone can jump from boiler room into that previous sentry that we talked about, that previous sentry spot, that area with the small health pack. Someone can jump up there and now have um, some protection, A, not being in the sight line of the sentry, and a soldier or something could very easily start spamming in that direction, take down you as the engineer, um, start putting pressure on the sentry, maybe even potentially take down the sentry. Um, so in order to very effectively hold that spot, you, you really need somebody holding that area, holding that spot, watching boiler room and bridge room, um, making sure nobody takes that position, which is fairly doable, I would say. So I, I think that's really one of the smartest places to hold. Um, but because of the lack of coordination in pubs, you don't, I feel like you don't see it used as often or as effectively. Um, but again, in a large scale pub, if you have one sentry there, maybe one sentry in that forward hold up top position watching bridge room and map room. It's a very deadly combo. And and something you unfortunately see more often than not um, is you do see beginner engineers putting a sentry um, by that little small bunkery area, by the staircase, by that third point, um, and sort of hiding it back in there so, it, so it's like it's only going to shoot people if they get if they stick their head out all the way to the third point, um, it's a bad spot, it's easily spammable, and, and because it's such a sharp angle, it, it's just once you know it's there, it's super easy to take down. It seems like it, it would be a cozy spot, yeah, but not a great spot in my opinion as a red engineer. Sometimes as well you see people just place it kind of randomly a little behind the third point, more, 
more towards the the left, more hugging hugging the wall that connects with the bridge room. Um, this spot is better than the previously mentioned spot, and it's definitely just sort of like a good neutral space. I think the problem is uh, because it is on the low ground compared to the bridge room, it's easy to come through from bridge room with a push with an uber, even just with competent soldier and demo men, um, you know, spamming maybe all the way from boiler room to might be able to kill it. So not super well defended, but an okay spot. I feel like when I see engineers use this spot, it tends to get taken down pretty quickly. Um, I like that there all, are all these options, uh, and I feel like I do see them often. I feel like compared to the first point where it's extremely meta, or the second point where it's, it, it of course, there's going to be sentries on the roof, I don't always feel like I see sentries in the best places that they should be on this third point. Alas, let's move on to the third to fourth point. Um, and, and thinking only about defensive sentry spots right now. Um, sometimes you, you very occasionally see a level 3 sentry on that little high up rooftop before, before the cart bends around to that main choke point that goes downhill. On, on this little rooftop above the entrance to map room, sometimes engineers will wrangler jump up there start causing chaos it's a, a a scary spot it's a spot that um if there is a level three sentry there it, it is you know going to be disturbing it is going to cause problems for the enemy team um but i i don't know how how much of a lifespan it has or tends to have if you have you know a soldier or demon on the other team who are on that sort of across across the way up top um door that big open window on the second floor um, that they can get up to by taking the stairs up from the third point and going all the way down that sort of big hallway that would be on their left side your right side once they start peeking that door they can just shoot at your sentry again and again potentially taking it down pretty easily i feel like uh it it would be an amazing sentry spot if it weren't for that big block of uh building that sort of cuts off a lot of its sight line um, right, because it only sort of has sight lane right below it, and it's it's uh, it would have more of a sight lane if that big chunk of building wasn't blocking that sort of back area around the third point. Um, so I think this is cool just for like a ballsy flex spot, but really not a, a viable long term spot for holding last. Um, probably useful when you know you're already styling on the other team. Uh, so now when it comes to now getting closer to last, I do want to talk about map room because um, there are some cool map room sentry spots that I have seen used quite effectively. Um, and a map room hold is very important. You hear it a lot that holding map room, holding map room is kind of the make or break for winning bad water in a lot of cases. And there's two places I, th I think that make the most sense as an engineer, uh, a defensive engineer, placing down your level three sentry on PL bad water. On one hand, I could see you putting it um, in this first room when, when you when you enter either on the way to map room. Or I, don't, I don't know if this is considered map room. Um, th there's a, a quick little wooden staircase, and then there's like a first little platform there. I would I would put a sentry there. I know you can put a sentry a little higher up. I like that spot because it covers both directions of map room, which is a little anal and obsessive, probably yes. Because um, you're thinking, well, I'm on defense. Why would somebody come from behind me in map room? You never know. A, a competent soldier could do it. Um, the point is, is that it does it cover it well in the case that that does happen. Um, and I, th I think it's better to have it be almost a little close uh, to people peeking around that corner. Because you kind of want to do the maximum damage um, and, and really hurt them. And also just the... the the shock of rounding the corner and there's a level 3 sentry right in front of you. There's less time for the rockets to travel. Um, it works well because this is more of a shock position. Um, this is a position that can be kind of quickly exploited by uh, two offensive soldiers, uh, you know, offensive soldier and a demo man, offensive demo man, even maybe just one of them. Um, so it works best if you have other players there with you. Maybe you have a teleporter set up there. You can have a dispenser that makes it cozy for someone else to hang out with you. A soldier or a heavy or a pyro have it be a good place that people want to be and hang out as an engineer and, and you'll be able to hold on to it for a longer time um, 
it, it can become a bit boring too if your team is actually doing well and holding the choke where you might find people aren't actually coming through very often depending on how good your hold already is. It can be a good spot. The, the spot that I would say is better and is more conservative and uh, harder to push through, honestly, is uh, putting it kind of... If you, if you imagine leaving the top left spawn defensively of bad water you go straight through as, as if you're walking towards the gate that usually opens when the map starts but it's now closed you walk up to the right up the staircase and now you're on the balcony overlooking map room you set it up right on that door that connects to this balcony overlooking map room and and you you make sure it has a vantage point over the door that's watching map room and it, it's a very annoying sentry to have to push through as any class except for uh you know soldier or demo man um and that's the great thing about it. it it denies snipers even if it is taking some damage from blue team pushing through um it's a very defensive spot where you can be hiding behind it hiding to the the side of it rescue rangering it and really taking zero damage unless somebody makes a huge flank around to get you um this is a great spot i think if you already have an engineer below uh, somewhere this is a this is a really good spot to hold as well because people are going to be trying to sneak through map room It's just a matter of the fact Which does make you wonder well, what about a tire sentry position and you know Maybe this is just one of those things that has untapped potential Or isn't really supposed to work, but it's very rare that I've seen a a good level 3 sentry position in tires and and I think the honest reason why is that the problem with it is that you can just ignore it, you know? You can just push choke, you can push map room, and you can literally ignore it. And there's no reason that as the blue team, you'll have a sentry and tires is going to be a problem for you unless you go up towards it. So, really a niche location, probably only useful to put a sentry there. If you already have sentries in numerous other locations, if you know... Um, I mean, I mean, that's really the only circumstance. If you're having a very tight hold, where people are, you know, there's other sentries they don't want to deal with, it could be quite useful, right? In an ideal world, maybe we could have a sentry in map room in a location I recommended somewhere in tires, maybe on the tires. Um, I don't know if that actually works, or maybe in the 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 sniper room up top of tires. That can be quite interesting at times. But again, I, I think I think most of these are are just too easy to uh, to take down, unfortunately. A spot I have seen occasionally that can be fun, but again has a very hard time staying up because there's just too much, too much safe area to return to, is uh, putting a sentry at the exit of the stairwell that connects r red, sp red underneath spawn to tires. I'm putting it in that little doorway. The thing I like about this is it does cover tires, but as an engineer you have some more defense. You can be keeping your sentry alive without really worried about taking any of the damage that might come to it. It's going to do a great job of shredding uh, scouts or pyros or whatever flank class kind of ha happens its way through tires, um, which is it's, it's a good place to have control. Depending on where you position it, it can also be watching part of the choke, um, which can be cool. Um, probably the best place to have a, a sentry if you're concerned about keeping tires under control. I like that it's very easy for you to leave and stay alive and then set up in the standard meta spot underneath in one of these big bunkers, which we will now talk about. So the the, the two spots you see a million times um, are by where those, uh, those ammo boxes are underneath on that lowest ground level on Badwater Last. You, you see it a lot on the area that's adjacent to the ramp and... Uh, has a nice covering from the ramp, so you have to go all the way down to the ramp to start doing damage to it. It is exposed to map room, that that specific area underneath. Um, but it's a great place to put a sentry because of that, because the only place people can shoot it from is map room. They have to, uh, they have to get to map room, and then they can start spamming it. Your team can help you out with that, hopefully. Or they have to drop all the way down to be facing it face to face, which means they can really only fuck with the sentry with an Uber, which is always a risk. Um, but the nice thing here, too, is they have to round that whole choke point to push through with an Uber, or they have to drop down um, from above it, which is bad, because they'll probably go flying due to the momentum of being shot by the sentry gun. Um, so it, it's just a classic safe position. 
I would say it's not invulnerable. It, um, it, it, it is nice in that it can cover a lot of the, the ground area of people trying to push the cart, but um, if there isn't a lot of defensive pressure on the choke or the ramp area, if snipers are down, it's very easy for a soldier to just keep rounding that corner and lobbing rockets into that spot. Or even from map room, it can be quite easy. So if your team's crumbling, this is a, a tough position. Um, but still, probably one of the safest positions you can have. Um, I'll, have to, I'll have to meditate on it a bit more, because I, I don't know exactly how I stand and how it compares to the other underneath position, which is underneath the map room. Um, one obvious disadvantage is underneath the other location, you have a small health pack, whereas underneath map room, you only have that ammo access. Um, a small downside, but something nonetheless. I, I think one of the, the big issues of this spot is it can be pretty... Uh, pretty easy for it to not be an issue until uh until it, quite frankly it's too late until it's we're reaching that last last little couple yards of the map because you can take the sentry all the way down the ramp and a, and a good distance towards it without the sentry actually becoming a problem um and then if you are successfully pushing from ramp it's very easy to uh similar to to putting the sentry right by that third point in that little bunker spot it's very easy to just say okay uh, I'm going to do a little damage to it and then move back to the right and I'll be completely out of the way from it. Um, it is nice in that it gets people looking in the opposite direction of where the defensive team is spawning and it works very nicely in conjunction with that other sentry spot and that they're covering both angles. Um, I, I do like that it is protected by an overhang and, uh, and, and re it's really sort of a good last bit of insurance to, for watching the cart. Um, but it's, it, it is unique in the way that Badwater is balanced that I think those two underneath sentry positions are, are very necessary, very normal, but they're also not strong, really. I mean, if you get a lot of engineers placing a lot of sentries, yes, it can be very annoying. And if their team's protecting them, helping them, supporting them, it's very annoying. But it's not the sentry positions intrinsically. I would argue there's it's much more annoying if we think of an equally supported engineer or an equal amount of engineers with level 3 sentries on the second point, on rooftop for instance, than it is on this last point, because really those best sentry positions are on low ground. You you should have some kind of uh, advantage going into the fight versus always looking up trying to shoot them, which is uh, way harder. So, um, I it's, it's funny because I think the way that bad water last is balanced is less to do with that main choke area and more to do with the fact that there are the flanks um, there are map room and tires because I think if you remove map room and tires from bad water uh, the only threat really to pushing is snipers um, watching watching that really long choke but once you uber through kill the snipers um, you know have your spies backstab them or whatever way you can do it it would be very easy to just uber through and now you're jumping down to the low ground and, and killing all the sentries and stuff and all, all of your team can you know even stick around on that high ground and continue to spam below it's just it's just uh, snipers really that would ma make it an issue for you um, yes so that will be the conclusion of the red defensive engineer discussion for building sentries um, so before I make a fair comparison of whether it's more fun to be on offense or defense as engineer I would like to address um, playing engineer offensively now and the sentry positions that you can use pushing offensively so consider in this list that I probably will not um, mention mini sentry positions very much because compared to level 3 sentries where there is a strong sense of investment and uh, you want to be a, a bit more strategic with where you place it uh, and it has the capability of doing much higher damage and having much better area control many centuries uh, are very disposable very expendable very short term not needing to do an incredible you know amount of work not needing to be the workhorse that defends the team and really locks down an area um, and they're typically uh, used more in a a frustrating way just that there's more damage being put out on the field so I won't be talking about mini sentry positions because really a mini sentry position in most cases here on Badwater is just going to be wherever you put a sentry 
wherever you're going, you're going to plop one down and, and help you uh, control an area. Basically, anywhere there's lots of, of open space is going to be a good place to, to put it. Um, you know, mini sentries and, and tight corridors and small little uh, rooms, probably not very useful. But there are some interesting uh, offensive level 3 engineer sentry placements on Payload Badwater. So, uh, one, one thing that I mentioned before that was very cool, Dave Plus, in the early days of Highlander, he would use the exploit to build a sentry in the spawn, and then he would take it out of spawn and try getting it uh, up, up somewhere near cliff, not all the way to where they usually have their sentry set up, but a little bit before that, or he would have it guarding tunnel or just or just guarding their area in general. Um, a level three sentry on blue is pretty unexpected, so it is a, a powerful tool to have on your side. I would say really on this first point, the, the best place to have a level three sentry um, is going to be uh, towards the end of tunnel, watching the exit of tunnel. Um, because if it's, a, if it's recessed enough back into the tunnel where it still has range on people who or dropping down and watching that end of the tunnel, but um, not so much distance uh, where you know it can't hit them, but also not too close that it's going to be really vulnerable. It can just be very uh, annoying because you're going to have a lot of weak flank classes coming down to the the exit of, of the tunnel, thinking they can get free picks, now being killed by a engineer with a level 2 or level 3 sentry. Very annoying. Um, and, and it gives their team some uh, some nice protection. Uh, the blue team that is uh, probably the best position however for having a level 3 sentry on blue team on PL Badwater on the first point is going to be right above that uh, bunker right by the first point um, or somewhere in that general vicinity just as a nice place to withhold your ground once you've captured the first point it's really an excellent spot and then it denies players from the red team from getting through that door right by the first capture point um, because that's a very uh if you deny that, you're you're literally denying the whole flank, right? The flank becomes very complex, but that is the that is the choke where all things must travel to get into it or to get out, right? So um, it, it prevents the red team from overextending into you, um, from destroying teleporters. From it, it makes life harder for them in a lot of ways. Um, when there is a sentry in that position, it's hard because um, like the other great sentry positions on this map. Um, if I'm on the red team and I'm peeking through this door and I see the sentry up on that slab of concrete, it's uh, it's something I have to look up to to shoot, which is very difficult. And um, there's there's no splash damage. I have to rely on hitting it directly. It's it's not easy. It's uh, it's it's annoying. And especially if I am looking at it to shoot it and peeking it, chances are someone else is going. Oh, hey, look at this free pick. Soldiers distracted trying to shoot the sentry. Let me let me get this guy down, right? So that's, that's a great spot um, to have it. Uh, I suppose you could have a few sneaky flank spots um, if, if you were just engineering and wanting to really mess around in, in the back part of the map. Um, if you could get it up on those double shipping crates on blue offense while they're set up on the roof, that would be, I think that could be very hilarious and cool and annoying, even if it doesn't last very long. Um, you know, overtaking them on roof, if at any point possible, and putting a level 3 sentry there on blue would be very powerful. Um, very nice to have. It, it would still be vulnerable from a long range uh, to snipers, but it would, it would certainly guarantee the second capture point being yours. Um, as we push forward through that second point, a nice spot would be by the second blue offensive spawn, um, which we, you, you would not have yet, but it, it has a nice watch over this sort of back area where it's watching the entrance, hopefully, to Boiler Room. It's watching the entrance to the bridge room. It's watching people coming from underneath. Or again, like that first spot, it just does some good area denial of holding your line up. If any uh, roaming players are trying to go really deep behind you and start causing problems or, or someone's trying to wrap around from boiler room into bridge room and, and do a huge flank, it's going to deny them. And that could be a, a very helpful play to, de to deny that type of thing and uh, punish the red team for coming too deep into you. Uh... We've, we mentioned a little bit before that the uh, there's a nice neutral space that you can kind of interchange who holds it, whether it's blue or red. It's, it can be useful for both teams to hold it in a pub environment to hold that bridge room with the medium health pack as a blue engineer. 
um, because red team is, is definitely going to be a little too curious to keep poking in there and seeing if they can control it because it is sort of this uh, you know fair game who's going to have it type room and uh, putting a level 3 sentry there gives you a lot of space it's very annoying to peek into pretty much only can be dealt with by ubers or uh, a competent soldier peeking which can be negated if you have at least one other player in there with you um, uh, which 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 is fairly uh, expectable to happen in the rapid fast paced uh, busy economy that is the action of Badwater second to third point you could have an offensive sentry uh, somewhere in boiler room a level 3 sentry this would be an interesting spot just again to cut off any flanks I think uh, an excellent spot that would just be frustrating uh, in general is, is to put a sentry somewhere near, uh, somewhere before the track dips down and before it rises up again, somewhere before it dips down, looking down into that low ground area, punishing anyone who comes there, potentially punishing people who are in that sort of area um, just before the, uh, the exit of boiler room if you're on the blue team or the entrance, I guess you would consider it if you're on red team. Um, kind of up there on that high ground, punishing anyone who's peeking there, maybe a bit unexpected. It's okay if it doesn't reach them, you could hide it a little further back so that they, you can't be shot from there, but it's nice to just to have it to pick people down in that low ground because it makes it a little more um, balanced where it gives your team some security that they can go down there and take a fight without knowing um, you know, knowing actually that they have an advantage and they have some space that is theirs now, technically. Uh, as we move forward through this uh, this third point, there, there's a lot of places you could put a level 3 sentry. Um, the problem, like, let's say you put it right above the third point and that nearest balcony. Um, the problem with it being there as, as a blue engineer... Uh, it just doesn't have a great sight lane. A lot of the the area denial, the air denial, it could do is blocked by that big chunk of building that we talked about before, connecting sort of where the map room is and where that big long left flank room is. Uh, for some reason, a lot of engineers do like to set up in that big left long flank room, and there is a, a an open window by there where you can put a level three sentry. Uh, this is an okay spot. I like that this covers choke. Um, and I like that it covers tires, but I, there's something about it I feel like it's very hard to keep in that position. Um, if you can hold it there, that's great. I don't know what it is. I just never see them last very long. I guess it can be picked somewhat easily from tires. Uh, somewhat easily from choke, because you know where it is, and the second choke's chill for a minute. You can just spam it, peeking that corner, just occasionally here and there, so you don't take any damage, but you take the sentry out. And I think a part of it, too, is that there are better forward holds to have. I think tires would be an okay place to hold more forward with a, with a blue sentry gun. Um, because if, if you put it, um, you know, past where the tires are, more close to now where it's watching their, uh, their exit from that stairwell and um, the little passageway which connects back to the main choke area, watching those two areas is really great because it actually denies them completely access to tires. Um, you know, this does have the exception of it if they come back around and they, uh, they use the, uh, your entrance to tires, right? So they, they go through the choke point, but hopefully you have that part unlocked. And even if they do go through it, they're dealing with your sentry just now from a different direction, right? That's a nice spot. Um, map room, of course, being a great spot. Um, I, I would put it in that first part of map room where you have that upper wooden deck area. In the same spot I recommended for a red engineer in that spot, where now it's watching both entrances, it's watching both those little connectors, one the connector to the choke and the, the connector to the map room. Um, it gives your team a lot of space, you can set up teleporters there, dispensers there, you can build a little base, which is very nice. Um, I would say map room is probably more important to hold because you can get a nice teleporter there, but it can be very nice if you can successfully hold that tires area I'm talking about too, it is good. It's just, again, the problem with tires is it is kind of auxiliary to the rest of the map. Um, that being said, if you if you do control tires and you do start to push through, what's nice from that tires sentry spot I mentioned, you can pick up your sentry and put it, if you're really aggressive, on that little balcony. At, like, as soon as you walk through on that left side, 
that's above where people have sentries usually below it. Um, and that is a deadly, that is a game-winning sentry if you can set it up. It's going to be watching that left spawn. It's going to be watching everyone below it. Um, might even be, it, it, it would just be, it's a very good spot. And I'm sure we've all seen heroic NG pushes in this way. I, I think I've seen engineers putting their level 3 sentries in the windows of map room offensively as they push. I don't know how well this works. I, I think it can work okay. Um, especially with a Wrangler, perhaps. I don't know how perfect its vantage point is looking down. Um, it can also be really good to just jump down with it and put it on that ground area when your team is making that final last push. Because basically, you know, if you ever do see a, a blue team pushing that last point, all of a sudden an engineer plops down a level 3 sentry, that's, uh, that's definitely game over. That's definitely a game one for the blue team, as, as far as I'm concerned, in, in most situations. So now that we've compared that a little bit, I, I will give a statement on what, which side I, I think might be more fun, but I also want to talk about engineer gameplay in general um, on, on blue and red team. Um, I haven't mentioned teleporters on Badwater. I haven't mentioned dispensers on Badwater. I haven't mentioned uh, simply playing as engineer on Badwater for forgetting what buildings are like. Um, so I will say this, talking about the difference between offense and defense in terms of being an engineer, having a big sentry, um, there's something to be said for the necessity and utility of playing defense on engineer with a sentry. It's pretty easy to get set up. It's pretty easy to know your sentry is going to get some action. Um, comparing it to blue team, I think running a level 3 sentry is sort of high risk, high reward. Um... And it can be, uh, you know, cumbersome and tying you down to playing mini sentry engineer on offense, where you now are kind of restricted to uh, trying to set up nests again. And if it doesn't work out, you've just lost a lot of time, and it can be quite painful. And you do have to depend on the support of your team. Um, if it does work out, you're going to really greatly help out your team, but it's a bit more risky, and it's a bit less potentially, uh, you know, mandatory. I, I think. I think playing engineer, uh, playing big century engineer on defense is extremely mandatory to the payload experience, to the bad water experience. You know, if your team doesn't have level three centuries on defense, it's, I mean, whoa, whoa, you're not gonna, you're not gonna hold. I mean, that's half the game out of the window. So, I think for people that the, the engineer experience, the level three engineer experience calls to, defense is definitely just going to be more fun. It's where the action is. Um, it's where you really get to p have fun playing with your buildings and um, having them work for you and having them work for your team as well. I think uh, I think there's so much to do on a payload map for an engineer that you don't really have on, on the rest of the maps because our mind does easily go to the uh, extreme importance of sentry guns on a map like Badwater, specifically in terms of defending it, but... We, we often less think about uh, teleporters and how crucial an aspect of Badwater and payload maps at large that is, right? Um, a defensive teleporter is ex uh, extremely important on the red team. When you are first spawning, you absolutely want to have teleporters set up so that they aren't taking that very long walk and they're, they're actually teleporting right to where you are, assumed to be on the cliff side. Um, there's another good, more conservative teleporter position, putting it sort of behind the the rock formation with the middle health pack, um, basically in the sight line of that first to second choke, um, that's a that's a good safe place to put a teleporter. You can also put it in that little bunker right by the first point. That one's a little more obvious, but sometimes it can also be totally hidden. Spies are pretty good at checking there. Um, and then obviously the safest bet might just be having it with you by your sentry, as you can unsap it if needed, etc. You, you have people coming right by you to protect your sentry when they spawn in, to protect your dispenser. Um, and this continues to be the case even as you rescind in, in points, as you, uh, you fall back throughout the defense experience, right? I would say it's less important to have a teleporter on, uh, on holding second because it doesn't take too long for people to around the corner and they're pretty much there. Um, definitely an advantage to have it than not to have it which speaks to the power and importance of teleporters and being clever in where you put your teleporter, keeping your teleporter alive, keeping, you know, having good metal management, keeping it to level three. Um, you know, you hear Quake pros talking about ammo management, but how often do you hear uh, TF2 pros talking about uh, engineer ammo management, you know? 
you do have to do a good amount of that. You, you hear Uncle Dane talking about it, that's for sure. Uh, shout out there. And so, it's, it's important as you, as you fall back to the third point, to some extent, if you can have a teleporter rather than having people take that long walk, but it is kind of forgiven on that third point um, because the spawns get a little mixed up for you on the red team. I think people can now start spawning from below. Um, and part of what makes it okay is that it's actually now on the blue team to not fuck up their teleporters because they have a very long walk from their spawn to the third point. Unless, of course, they have teleporters, which, which speaks now to the importance of teleporters for the blue team. Slightly important for blue engineers to have teleporters set up when you're pushing the second point. It can, can reduce time, probably not so necessary. But by the time you're pushing the third point, it is very important. And, uh, you know, as much as I talk about sentry placements, you could probably also talk about a long time uh, teleporter placements, you know, especially on blue team, because you want it to be as close up as possible without it being uh, in a highly vulnerable situation, you know? You want it to be somewhere that it can be used and, uh, you know, will be used in, to, to the utmost degree, but you don't want it to be so good that it's right in front of the enemy team and they go, oh, hey, that was easy to find that. Let's kill this and shut down their entire uh, operation, their entire economy of motion, you know? And, uh, and finally as well, pushing that uh, last point, you do want a teleporter from your spawn on blue team as close to the last point as you can. It's nice to have a teleporter that goes in the map room. It's nice to have a teleporter that just goes to somewhere near the third point. It can be nice to have a teleporter that leads you to tires. But all in all, it's necessary. Um, I think engineer, the real engineer experience uh, and part of the reason the engineer experience doesn't translate so well to 5CP maps, you know, the official game mode of uh, competitive TF2, of 6v6 TF2, is that uh, you don't have a whole lot to do with your buildings anymore. You don't have time. You, you, you only have time to set up, uh, you know, teleporters. Maybe if you're pushing last consistently. Um, maybe you have time to set up a sentry if you're holding last. But for a you know a pretty brief period, and you definitely don't have time to put up other buildings if you're suddenly holding last and putting up a sentry, at, you know, in, in a six v six format, putting uh, pl playing engineer. But what's cool about Highlander, what's cool about Pub TF two, playing as engineer, what's cool about playing Payload on TF two, you know, maybe if they played sixes on Payload, and we'll, we'll talk about that later, um, a, an engineer off class would be seen as necessary. Uh, because the, the teleporters are so fucking useful, eh? And the sentries are useful. And I think dispensers get a bunch of playtime as well because it, the map plays in this very slow, like, progressively pushing through the map versus this, this sort of fast pace, really, you know, constantly moving through the map back and forth thing that you have in 5CP, right? And so uh, dispensers matter too, you know? Ha having a good dispenser location... Um, as an offensive or defensive engineer. I, I think generally the defensive engineer uh, dispenser position will be a little easier. There'll be less strategy behind it because you kind of want a sentry position or a, a dispenser position near your level 3 sentry, right? To keep replenishing your health and your ammo. And it also rewards people for playing around your sentry um, because they want some ammo and health from it too. But on offense, you have a bit more uh, strategy in where you want to put it, right? You, you often see when pushing second, a lot of blue dispensers placed uh, right by that first point, by that concrete wall. I think that's an excellent location. Um, it, it's a great place to sort of fall back to. You, you have great cover from almost all angles. Only if someone really super overextends will it become a problem, you know? If, if you're a blue engineer and you, you have a, uh, a level three sentry above that little bunker right by first point and then a dispenser, right in front of you against that wall hiding that you know that's a that's a pretty solid one two setup you got a sentry covering your dispenser if anyone tries to fuck with it um and then it's a good dispenser position for people to to go back and heal and they know that they're protected by the sentry um it's it's like a very very high level of insurance to have which affords your players some kind of um freedom and knowing that they can kind of stick their necks out take risky fights you know, risk risk coming out of it with low health, clutching 1v1s um, to return to that and quickly replenish and take another, right? Um, so yeah, so 
the the dispenser positions um, can be extremely important on bad water. I, I think there, there's there, there's certain ones. Excuse me if that sound was loud. There's certain ones that you see all the time, um, and and I think for very good reason because they're just naturally emergent um, as good a, as useful. You know, you see them a lot. You see you see a dispenser. You know, maybe when you're pushing last or you just pushed third. Um, right by that third point, hugging that sort of right wall. You know, you, you see that sentry, you see that dispenser spot all the time, and I think that is a useful dispenser spot. Um, it, it's one of those things where I think, to, absolutely compared to other game modes, engineers are make or break in how the game is played. They are make or break in what happens. Um, they are make or break in, in their team winning. You know, if you if you don't get teleporters down the whole time offensively you're, you're just probably not going to win you know and the same can be said defensively if you're losing a bunch of time walking to the fight that's that's the advantage that the other team gets to push on so i think i've talked a sufficient amount about the buildings and i i have made my point that i do think defensive engineer is going to be more fun at large um than offensive engineer um at least in regards to sort of a, a heavy sentry play style I want to talk now about the role of engineer. Um, but this is probably more offense focused, but the role of the engineer now, sort of thinking not about the buildings, right? So imagine that you're you're pushing the last point. You have a good uh, dispenser set up. You have a good teleporter set up. They're safe. You're placing mini sentries anywhere you go and, and sort of causing nuisances with that using them to sort of control areas, maybe you put one in tires, you, you put them in choke occasionally, wherever you can afford to put them, right? Well, now, what is the rest of the engineer experience like? And um, engineer, particularly in Highlander, kind of gets grouped up on offense with the scout, right? The, the sort of classic Highlander meta is you have scout and engineer push the cart while everybody else does important stuff, right? Or... <laughs> Or, or wins the game or, or, or makes the pushes necessary to keep allowing them to push the cart forward. Um, it, you know, part of this is probably due to their, their light nature um, and in their light nature facing sentry guns. They both have 125 NG to 150 health. Um, but they're, they're, they're both not really designed um, to take on a sentry gun. Um, just due to their super low health, it's, they can't really afford to peak it. Um, a, a big level 3 sentry gun, even with an uber, they, they could have a good shot, um, but a, a shotgun or a scatter gun is really not as well designed for taking it down as a projectile item, um, or even a, a heavy's minigun, or a pyro slams because it adds that element of chaos and you don't really need to aim so much, right? You could miss a shot on, on the sentry, which is, which is crucial if you got ubered as NG for some strange reason, right? Um, but as engineer, you, you have a particularly strange um, role here on offense, kind of not thinking much about our buildings, because you have a certain duty, like scout, to the choke, to the cart, to giving dispensers to your team where they might need it, you know, where the choke, chokey classes might need dispensers. And uh, putting teleporters that get them close to somewhere, you know, somewhere, somewhere where they have access to, to both choke and... A flank route but you are, are kind of generally going to be more optimal as a flank class like scout you know um, tapping the cart when you can but really playing those flank areas playing um, playing those spaces where you can win a 1v1 with a shotgun and a pistol um, or just a shotgun if you're using wrangler for that matter so if we think to kind of pushing the third and fourth point as engineer um, you, you do want to play a bit off of your guns. Um, I, I think having having a, a mini sentry does become part of the playstyle offensively because uh, you, you honestly do need some help in a lot of the fights. You are such a weak character, and compared to Scout, you don't have the movement ability he has, which is what makes, what kind of justifies uh, and, and counteracts him being so weak as a character. And you don't have that. You're very slow and easy to hit. So, as an offensive engineer, it works well to kind of be putting lots of mini sentries down so that people have to destroy them while you can start shooting, you know, and, uh, and denying areas before they get there. 
So, uh, I got one. yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I, 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 maybe I need to talk to more engineer mains. It's been a long time since I mained engineer, so I, I'm, I'm drawing partially from my own experience, but, uh, I know I don't have a fully holistic view of, of what engineer can be like on offense. Um, but yeah, my verdict, uh, conclusively is definitely that defense engineer is the spirit of bad water, even though offense engineer can be very fun. And so it goes to show and continues my larger thesis that the amount of fun you have on bad water can have a lot to do with what team you're on, um, blue or red, as well as what class you're playing. So it is, it is a quite of a, a varied experience depending on those variables. Now, it's about time we talk about class number seven, specifically in regards with how it feels to play class number seven, which is the medic from Team Fortress 2's smash hit, Team Fortress 2, by Valve. PL Badwater, medic, what's it like, okay? Medic on Badwater is an interesting experience because I would say it's it's more similar to the, the, the type of experiences that like Soldier has or Heavy has where it's not too different whether you're on offense or defense, right? You will be pushing into sentries way more on blue, that's, that's no doubt, but it's not necessarily really uh, something that's like game changing or, or, or it doesn't impact the way that you play in, in, in how much fun you have because really as a medic you should never be getting caught out by a sentry anyway, uh, you know, you, you should be pushing into a sentry if you have an uber perhaps um, but you should never really be dying to sentries as a medic it, it's it's uh it, it doesn't make sense it's bad medic play so even though there is that that critical difference um i i think it's 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 fair to talk about medic sort of in a universal way when we play it on bad water because um there are certain places that are good positions to hold that you want to control and support your team good places that you want to push through and these these places tend to be the same on blue or red that you you, you do want to put um, you know there's there's certain obvious choke points that whether on blue or red you're going to be wanting to uber through with it you know into if you have an uber charge or a crit screen for that matter and we can talk about the the difference is between an uber charge and a Kritzkrieg on payload Badwater eventually, but um, for the most part, the, the way that you play medic isn't going to change too much on Badwater, whether you're on blue or red. Um, it, it also depends with what degree of severity and with what degree of competitiveness and uh, team coordination you are working with um, in, in a Highlander situation is probably the the most serious medic gameplay you're going to have on PL Badwater, um, and it, it, there there are a lot of freedoms you are granted in 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 terms of the sort of wild chaos element of a pub, um, in the fact that there's going to be numerous medics potentially, um, and the fact that there's just uh, you know n not as much of a chance that people will be protecting you very well. There's there's this random element that lets you play a little less strategically just in that you don't have to be worried so much about uber difference um do we have uber if they don't you don't really think so much about these things in pubs whereas you're definitely gonna be thinking of it in highlander um where you know in highlander like in any competitive format in tf2 you're going to be sort of engaging in this basic um back and forth awareness with the other team where you know if we're on even uber uh you want to waste their uber you don't want to drop if when they uber in. Um, if you do have an even exchange, you want to be the second one to use uber. Hopefully, without you know dropping. You know, if you drop all your players and you're the second one to use it, it's not very useful. But um, you know, to to a degree, that is a good thing to do so that your ubers end second, so that you can kill their medic, right, and sustain an uber advantage. And then once you have this uber advantage, right, it depends if you need to be offensive or not right if you if you have an uber advantage and you you need to be offensive then you push into the other team with your uber advantage and you kill them because you can become invincible and they can't um 
if you don't need to be defensive with an uber advantage, what do you do? And you're, you're like, let's say you're on king of the hill and you're just trying to bait time. You're trying to keep the point for as long as you can. Or you're on halo defense and you're just trying to prevent them from capping for as long as you can. What do you do then if you have uber advantage? Um, you can use your uber to kill their medic again if you have the opportunity. If it seems like, okay, I have an opportunity to kill their medic if I uber right now, always worth it. Because what does this do? It just delays the time. You have more time that you have an uber advantage. Um, on the other hand, uh, if you never see an opportunity to kill their medic, what do you do? You just you make sure that the medic is protected. You just make sure that you stay alive and aren't forced giving them an uber advantage. You make sure that it's an, an even exchange going in um, if, if you have no chance to kill the medic beforehand. Because what you're doing, you're burning through time, which is the objective. And then you hope in that, that, that next exchange, you can do the same thing where they have a worse uber. You can kill them afterwards or, or, or something like this, right? Always trying to sustain an advantage. Because if your goal is just to burn time, like I'm on defense, on payload, on bad water, in a competitive situation, the big thing I care about is I just don't want to give them a good uber. I don't want to give them a good push. I don't want to give them an advantage. And I'm going to do anything I can in my power to do that, right? The point of ubering in to kill their medic is so that they can't. I'm further delaying the possibility of them having an advantage. That's the whole point. And uh, th that sort of play style will, um, sh you know, be omnipresent and will just sort of shift around depending on where you are on the map. But that that aspect of the game is sort of fixed if you're playing a competitive game mode. If you're playing Payload, Badwater, uh, Highlander mode. Um, now, if you're playing in a pub, you have this luxury of not needing to worry about that so much. Um, a, because you're not really communicating with your teammate, there might be an uber going on somewhere else on the map that you're not aware of. Uh, so it's not always, you know, how are you supposed to know when they have uber charge or not? Um, sometimes you can just get very randomly dropped because pubs are chaotic. Um, or the other medic could get dropped. So, so it's all a bit more up in the air and sort of the goal essentially of, of pub pushes um, is to get a lot of frags or to advance the objective right and so on on defense it's really just get a lot of frags be, and, and 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 by way that is advancing the objective because if they if nobody is alive they can't push the cart right on blue team it's a little different because um a lot of frags are good because with that same sort of philosophy if i'm playing bad water and i kill everyone on the red team there's no one left to defend the cart and we just roll through, which is great for achieving the objective. However, um, there are going to be a lot of cases where even if you get a couple frags, it might not be uh, very important if you kill four people with an uber because what if their sentry's still up, right? Um, and, and so there are certain things that you are playing against as a blue medic um, that you need to be wary of and kind of hopefully working with your teammate to target and to, uh, to, to be removing from the picture, such as sentry guns and and you know uh, in, in a successful blue push in in on a pub on bad water as medic with an uber getting a sentry is kind of a high priority move um because it, it gives your team the space then to actually push the cart because usually what is preventing them from pushing the cart very often it is not actually players so much as it is sentries and this can be proven if you try to play bad water without sentries because um even with perfect DM, it's just, you know, like, from the enemy team, you're still going to be nudging the cart forward bit by bit, because if you think about it, they touch the cart for a moment, all it does is stop the cart. If you touch the cart for a, a nanosecond, it pushes it forward. So if it's just a matter of time, you know, that with both of you touching the cart little bit, little bit, even if you your team is dying more overall, you will inevitably be pushing the cart forward, right? Uh, sentries make that a bit different because um, it gets to a point where you might not even be able to push the cart because you're just going to immediately get killed by the sentry. It's washing right where the part the cart would push forward, you know, um, which is the advantage. That's the nice thing that sentries do in, in in being able to defend on maps like Bad Water. So, as a medic in a pub, those are kind of your two priorities. Can I get a lot of frags? Can I do something that helps with the objective? Um, and so typically that means, you know, as a medic, whether on blue or red, you're going to be, uh, 
I should also add there's another circumstance where you might actually be using using an Uber to save people. Um, and this probably makes more sense to me on the red team than it does on the blue team. Um, for instance, you know, keeping your engineer alive might be crucial. There might be situations where Ubering your engineer actually helps save the game. Or, um, you know, Ubering heavies or other people that are about to die that are kind of integral to your hold. Uh, I don't see this happening as much on, on, on blue as a blue medic on battler. It does seem like uh, it would be okay to let some of my players go down if it means that, you know, in 10 seconds I could have a, a, a positive, aggressive push with them and try to take out some of the enemy red players or take out enemy red sentries. That would be more more valuable, more worth it to me. Um, and this this can also be made more tricky when we have the, the possibility of Kritzkrieg's um, critical hit Ubers. And, and, and what those are going to do is they're really only going to work towards that first thing that we talked about, which is uh, defensive. Um, sorry, not, not defensive. They're, they're good to use on the defensive team. But what they're going to be working towards is killing lots of people. That objective. They might not... They'll be related to the main objective in that they are killing lots of people. And so... Uh, it is very rare. I don't. I can't even recall ever having seen a crits Krieg on the blue team on Badwater because the problem with crits is that they don't do critical damage to sentries. Um, if they did, you might actually see the crits Krieg being used a lot on offensive pushes against sentries. But that is not how they work, and perhaps crits Krieg would be too powerful if that was how they were balanced. But alas, that is not how it is balanced. So you you really mainly see the uber charge being used on on payload bad water and um uh you could consider this a a critique of the way that um the mediguns are balanced perhaps that you really are only going to see the medigun to be fair you there's really no reason you, you can't use the crits krieg on defense because you don't theoretically have those big level three sentries to worry about on bad water you can be just worrying about having crazy kill streaks the only problem of course being that an uber charge will counter uh, your crit streak uh, unless you're somehow able to drop the medic with your crit streak first, which is, you know, not something you can necessarily rely on um, or or know how to plan. So the quick fix and the vaccinator being the remaining two many guns. The the problem we have consistently with, with the quick fix on this kind of map is, is it does go do good net healing and. Um, I, I do think uh, if you have multiple medics in your team, a quick fix could be appropriate. But the, the problem with the quick fix is how it works in pushing against a sentry gun. Even though a quick fix uber does a bunch of healing, it does not make you invulnerable. Um, which oftentimes you need to be when facing a sentry and a lot of opponents. Because um, typically you, you're going to be taking a lot of damage when you stick your neck out to go right in front of a sentry and try to take it down. So a quick fix uber not super viable on the blue team in general on Badwater. It could be viable on the red team for sure. Um, and then the vaccinator is a tricky one in that uh, it it ha it could have its place on the red team. It, it could be um, something that could be used a lot. The 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 big problem with the vaccinator. Um, it, it has a problem on offense on payload, and it has a problem on defense on payload. The problem with it offensively is still the, the primary sort of uber threat that we want to deal with on bad water. Um, and that is, you know, a good thing to worry about and deal with and pave the way to success for your team is sentry guns, taking down level 3 sentry guns. And the problem with the level 3 sentry gun is it shoots both bullets and rockets, right? So... You, you can only counter one type of damage with the vaccinator charge at a time. Um, and so this is not even considering any additional sources of damage that may be coming at you when you uber in with a vax, which um, I feel like in many of these contentious uh, holes, these contentious points um, where people push in from, where people try to defend, rooftop of second, um, the cliff up top on first, uh, let me think. Um, the, the lower areas underneath on, on the last point underneath the the map room and underneath that left side of the map people also put sentries when when you uber into these locations it's very often that you're not only going to be dealing with the engineer so while it could be possible to 
Vax charge into the red team and use the bullet resistance. I don't know if that would be more efficient than the rocket resistance. I, somebody will have to have to check me on that. I, I for some reason intuitively in my mind thinks the bullet resistance would be a better one to use because after you sh you get shot by those initial rockets, I think the the amount of damage that comes out from the bullets before the sentry gun shoots its next set of next set of rockets is quite a lot. You could uh you could use it um in that way, but it, it's uh. It's possible that from the other sources of damage and other players doing damage to you, you would go down. So not, and if you just compare it to an uber charge, an uber charge is the best medi gun for taking down sentry guns. Um, now, when we think about the issues with the vaccinator defensively on bad water, um, it's not so much about the issues of it so much as it's, uh, is it really offering enough compared to the other medi guns? Um, there's not a clear issue with it like we have on the blue team where, hey, it's not doing a good job at taking out sentries, potentially. Um, the the issue that we face with the vaccinator on the red team is that it, its main sort of role will be defensive play, saving people from dying by using certain bullet resistances, um, w which isn't really game winning, right? You, you can't... Um, if you put a bullet resistance on an engineer, it's it's not going to save them. You could you could potentially quick fix Uber a red engineer and, and help save them and, and save their sentry gun in an important make or break make or break play. Um, it it's just questionable, you know. Again, I could see a medic working with a heavy or a soldier or a pyro, and just winning lots of one v ones or two v twos or, or whatever you have because they're smartly using the bullet resistances, but. In, in, in a lot of the chokes, too, where a medic is going to want to hang out and assist a player, there's often multiple types of damage uh, going on. I mean, there's certainly going to be explosives in these chokes, p potentially fire, and potentially bullets as well. So it's it's a little uh, a little tricky that you you can use it, but I don't I don't know if it's truly advantageous in any way over a, a medi gun or a quick fix, or a crits creek, right? Uh, so the vaccinator's viability um, is questionable on Badwater, and I don't know if we should um, attribute that to the medigun itself, or Badwater, or payload at large as a game mode, but that, that is part of my analysis of playing medic on uh, PL Badwater. Of course, the, the melee that we're using is not really gonna affect things on Badwater as a medic very much, um, there, and it would be very cool if there was some kind of secret stat on bad water where organ harvesting with the vita saw was more efficient i would like to see that as part of the bad water update um released by valve in 2021 that would be a cool sort of um, crazy charm hey we're crazy game developers and we do what we want move i i would like that a lot but i don't expect it but i would like to see it right i'm uh i'm 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 not having expectations right because expectations lead to disappointment but i am i am i am being hopeful right i'm hoping for the best that the world can give me without expecting it to right those are two different things and it's it's important to keep both of those in check when we talk about ideas like the bad water update when we talk about ideas like the vita saw having a more efficient organ harvesting rate only on pl bad water some sort of passive buff um some sort of connection between the map and the weapon i, th I think that would be cool um, and, and I and I hope I, th I think we can make it happen with the power of manifestation over time. But let's uh, continue to to go on in this analysis and dissection of PL Badwater and how it is played by the medic by thinking about the um, the the weapons in the the slot number one for medic. Hey, you could call it the primary slot, though it does feel quite strange considering the secondary slot is more like a primary slot for medic. Um, we have the the usual options between the needle guns and the Crusader's crossbow. Um, the Crusader's crossbow in general is quite a, a, a meta weapon, and um, I, I think there's there's so many long chokes here where it makes sense to use the crossbow, um, both as offensive capabilities and um, w with the abilities to save your teammates strategically to heal them with the Crusader's crossbow, because if we think back to the way that Valve described um, PL Badwater in the heavy update on, on day three, I believe it was, in the way that they described it, it's that they 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 really reflected on what they did with Payload Gold Rush, and they thought, how can we improve this? How can we do things differently and and learn from our mistakes on Gold Rush? Even though I would not say Gold Rush was a catastrophic failure, but 
I, I would say it is nowhere near as good a map as Badwater. Um, and they thought about it and they said instead of focusing on, you know, these tight choke points, I should add a lot of the core TF2 maps that were, that were shipped with launch can also be quite choky. Dust Bowl 2 Fort, right? Um, they said, let's focus more on open spaces. Let's let's see what we can do with that. And I, and I think, too, they, they focus more on complex open spaces because if you think about, uh, if we're comparing PL Badwater to CP Well or CTF Well, there's a lot of open space on Well, but it's not very interesting open space. It's, 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 uh, it's like real-life open space. There's just a big, flat, open area. If you think about the lasts on Well, it's this huge... Uh, you know, warehouse, basically. And there's just a ton of vertical space and a big, fat, wide floor. Not a lot of interesting props to jump ar around. I mean, there, there is this nice scaffolding and, and multi-level thing kind of surrounding this last point atrium, you know, cavity area. But the main area, despite being so spacious, is, is not so interesting um, for most of the classes. And uh, we can think of this the same on CP well with the, the two sort of areas in between second and the midpoint. It's extremely open, but I don't know uh, if that makes it very good. And uh, the openness on Badwater, contrastingly, is very good. And we, we certainly can appreciate what the developers have done with that on Badwater. And so I, I brought this all up because I think the Crusader's crossbow on Badwater makes a lot of sense. And I'm saying this even as a a medic player who is quite devout to the way of syringes, to using the needle gun. Um, I understand the overdose and Blutzager for those who are into that. I don't, I don't think the Blutzager is a wise choice. I think I think the medic's health regen is, is, so, is so powerful and useful that you should really always be taking advantage of that. You don't want to hurt, hurt your odds in regards to that because, you know, when I'm playing my best at medic, I'm not having to use my other weapons at all. I'm just constantly healing, constantly using the medic gun, or, or Kritzkrieg, or perhaps one of those more alternative medic guns. Um, I shouldn't have to be pulling out my syringes or crossbow. I shouldn't have to be pulling out my saws. Um, but, you know, to, to each their own, I suppose. Uh, I, I, I don't see medic being a particularly uh, viable as a, as a battle medic playstyle on PL Badwater. Um, and I would say I don't think this is uh, I don't think this is an issue with the map. I think I think uh, battle medic shouldn't be balanced on any map. I think if there is a map where battle medic is viable, it's a sign that the map's not serious. Um, for instance, like uh, like the Groot keep, um, the Groot keep though I, I think should be judged perhaps on on different grounds on uh, as it as it is made on, on quite a different premise removed from the stock game. Um, but yeah, Badwater, probably not a great um, battle medic map, uh, as much as I would like to see that. Um, if it was possible without breaking the game or breaking medic or, or breaking Badwater, I think that would be cool. Just just in the way that I think it would be cool if the Vitasaw had a passive higher rate of organ harvesting on Badwater. I think, I think that would be nice. I don't know uh, how we could practically logistically have that happen in a fair way. But I, if we could have that happen, I would like that. That would be a good thing. Um, in terms of medic positioning on Badwater, uh, I, I would say in general, you do have an advantage on medic on Badwater in that you have this, this second highest, and maybe it's no longer second highest, I forget that they did buff Spy's movement speed a bit, but I, I believe it is still the second highest movement speed in the game as medic, as fast as scouts if you are healing them, so, you know, definitely net faster than Spy, uh, I, I think, and... What that allows you to do is is sort of quickly get between a lot of these different channels, you know? You're going to be have people... You know, if, if you think about leaving this first spawn point on blue on Badwater, you're going to have people going through the tunnel. You're going to have people trying to go up this flank, up this big right side area. You're going to have people going up the cliff trying to take on the sentry. And as always with Medic, you're, you're going to be really balancing where where your heals are most useful, I would say. Generally, sticking around in tunnel is bad. I don't think the people on the cart need heals. The cart does heal people, um, which should be a, some sort of divine sign about where healing really should come from. Um, I can only see it being a good move to go into the tunnel if you have a full uber charge and for some reason you want to wrap around and use it back closer to them for some reason. Maybe they only have a sentry 
in a strange spot like that little bunker and you want to wrap around in the tunnel i get that still doesn't seem very wise uh because there is a, a very long sniper sight line in that tunnel where you could be uh easily taken out even if you had full uber charge just by one sniper luckily jumping down and hitting one shot it's a very scary kind of odds to have i'm um, traveling through that tunnel i i do i do think the best position um for medic in general is going to be probably something similar to what the best position for heavy is and maybe this this does speak slightly to their uh dynamism as a uh as a uh you know a spiritual duo in team fortress 2 in, in the public servers in pl badwater I, I think going up that cliff on the right side using an uber trying to take out that sentry right away in any way you can is, is a good move I think there's lots of different players you can work with on on Badwater um, as a medic. Um, I think I think Ubering soldiers, Ubering pyros, Ubering demomen, Ubering heavies can all be very viable. Even I said before, defensively Ubering an engineer perhaps to save his nest. I think these are all interesting uh, and, and good options. I, I think there's a lot of different ways to take out a sentry. I've I've seen sentries being taken out with a, a variety of different classes at the front of the uber um because it's only part of the push i think uh, you know every successful push has the team hopefully working around with it um taking advantage of it and uh but but generally yeah the, the medic's gonna do well um also sort of vicariously in positions where um the class that it's healing does well right so um if i'm with a, a heavy or a soldier um, going up to the the second point rooftop through the through that staircase I would feel pretty good with the, the heavier soldier going through that staircase whereas going through that staircase with a scout I would be a little I would be a little nervous because it's just not a great positional position to be going uphill um, up up a staircase as a, as a scout it's very choky you're, you're gonna lose to a soldier to a demo man to a heavy to a pyro there's a lot of classes that you don't want to face um, even another scout you don't want to face on the other end because they have the high ground and they have a better place to retreat to, right? So, uh, in that way, Medic will kind of model the character that they're healing on Badwater, where if that position is good for, for that class, then it could also be quite good for the Medic. Obviously, some positions we're going to exclude from this, right? Uh, as Sniper. If I'm on bad water as medic and I'm healing a sniper, watching the choke, that big long sight line between first and second point, I, I could be doing this as long as I'm not also watching the choke like the sniper. It, it's a very, I want to spend as little time as possible in that big long sight line as a medic on either team. It's not a good place to be as a medic, as a priority number one kill target for both team snipers. It's just not good. Um, you are going to have to be pretty vigilant in general on bad water against spies as medic because uh medic in particular is going to be a, a high priority target for spies engineers and medics both are going to be a high priority target for spies on bad water and bad water is a map with a lot of options for spy um a lot of places to be coming from it can be very chaotic in certain ways it can be difficult to, to tell a disguised player from other players in, in the midst of a very complicated fight, specifically in a pub where there is no communication and you have no expectations of how many of a certain class you should have on your team, right? It's one thing to be playing Highlander and know that your demo's down and now there's someone disguised as a demo with you a little too quick, right? You can, you can pick up on that maybe, but in the heat and chaos and primordial energy of a public server bad water match you can't pick up on that quite as much so you you just have to depend on uh, on your own wits on, on being sharp on being vigilant on turning around a lot um i would say in general just turning around a lot as medic is a lifesaver because you don't have to be looking forward you, you have to be looking forward a little bit to know what's going on but you absolutely don't have to be looking forward 100 percent of the time because uh your medigun will keep healing, and there the, the the person that you're healing is the one that has to worry about aiming. You don't have to worry very much about aiming at all. Um, so so really, being willing to sacrifice a lot of your looking forward as medic to look behind you um, is going to save you so much overall on a map like Badwater, where 
Spies have a lot of options, and spies want you dead, frankly. Continuing on in appropriate order, we now must address Sniper on Bad Water. How Sniper plays on Bad Water. And so, uh, the, there's this unique sort of reflective nature, this complementary nature of the two snipers on Bad Water, where really, in general, in, in, in all these different points on the map, there's a sight line that's good to be watching. Regardless of what team you're on, and uh, there's going to be a sniper duel going on. I, th I think you can parallel what I talked about with Badwater uh, soldiers and how Badwater soldiers are going to wind up in a lot of 1v1s because they really ought to be in similar places on this map, you know? And I think you can make the same case for Sniper, that although not physically in a very close place, they will be in the same channel of energy. They will be in the same long sight line, able to do damage to each other. So, thinking about this, um, there, there, are, there are a few areas where um, you might see the, the channel, this, this sight line, diverge and be different where the blue and red sniper can have two different snipe, sight lines because there are some places in the map where there are numerous sight lines you know, at, at, that can be going on at the same time, um, which just makes it tri trickier that they need to know where the other sniper is, really to take them out to open up all that space to them. So do expect sniper v sniper action on payload bad water. If we think about this first point here, um, you know, really sniper is cool because anywhere you see an enemy, you can kill them. It doesn't have to be one of these sight lines that I'm talking about, but I will be focusing on the sight lines because um, they highlight where a sniper's strength is, where weakness is for the rest of the characters. Um, and, and, and really the, the nice thing about a sight line um, compared to an area that let's say let's say it's not really a sight line, but you're still able to get a lot of kills just by having perfect aim, right? Is that having perfect aim is great, but when you are domineering a sight line, what's cool about it is that it denies the other team, it makes the other play team play different, right? If you know that there's a sniper watching the tunnel, a defensive sniper watching the tunnel, it makes it a lot scarier to go through for any class. On the blue team versus if you're just somewhere else in the map and and you are you know getting kills you're you're not domineering you're not um denying an entire area of the map right but if you are as a sniper watching the tunnel you have very high potential to be entirely shutting down that area of the map by you know it, it's it really is pretty easy for you to kill anyone who tries to come through the tunnel you will have to worry about a counter sniper at some point but for the most part You've got a big long tunnel where unless they're a sniper, they have nowhere near the long range capability you do, and you can just sh gun them down. Um, another big sightline, nowhere near as obvious as that tunnel, is going to be sort of the entire, uh, imagine now you're from the perspective of the blue team leaving spawn, that entire sort of right side of the map going all the way through to the first and second choke point. So this is blocked a bit by those rocks on that right side. Um, where the medium health pack is, but something you see a lot of times is you do see a sniper hiding up in those rocks, up on the top of those rock formations, looking down to that left spawn area um, where the blue team is leaving. And this is a similar place where a, a sniper will peek out from their right hand spawn area and, and be watching that whole area in general too, that whole area up the ramp watching for anyone up in the rocks to counter snipe and then moving their way up that ramp to try to get some shots on that upper cliff area um, where people are on the sentry. It, it, there's a big sort of long distance energy um, that they're able to take care of. It doesn't make very much sense for a sniper to be pushing up that cliff side on the left um, and trying to go for shots there. They can, um, but it, it, it can seem a little unnecessary when there's so much space in these other really long channels that you have on this first point on Badwater. That being said, we move on to the second point. The super obvious choke should go without saying, and really, y y there's no reason you should really even have to fuck around with any of the flanks. Sniper, uh, pretty simple. <laughs> pretty simple on this map in that regard. You can you can be a sneaky little, uh, n you know, ninja near little ninja sniper and, and try to go around to the flank and hang out in that train yard area and maybe try to headshot the engineer from behind him on the roof. 
Um, and but the problem again is is this this sight lines meta that we're talking about, where if you abandon the mainstream lamestream sight line on this part of the map to do something cool and hipster somewhere else and go for flashy weirdo frags and whoa, why is the sniper there? You are giving that flashy, sorry, not flashy, that lame stream, mainstream choke point sightline to the other sniper, which lets them entirely deny that area. Nobody wants to F with first to second uh, that big long choke when there's a sniper watching it. It's just not fun. It's, if they're any level of competent, it's not worth the risk. And now basically you just can't play in that part of the map. It's a huge level of denial. So to give that up to the other sniper is bad gameplay. You got to be watching that sight line, uh, no matter which team you're on, if you're on bad water, um, especially if you're the only sniper, it helps if you have multiple snipers because the sniper fight is so you know, important and extreme in these long sight lines, especially in these first two points. Um, in Highlander, it's, you know, completely on you. So, of course, you got to be watching the sideline. And, and you'll probably play with your medic to get tanked and all these kinds of things. It's important. It's important to have that part down. Because you're not worried about getting headshot going up the stairs to the to the top room on second. You're not worried about that. You're, getting, you're worried about being headshot, pushing the cart from first to second. It's a, it's a, it's a very long sideline. It's a strong sniper area. Um... So, uh, considering that lo sort of long sight line, um, it's it's nice for both the snipers in that area that there are a lot of sort of walls and rocks they can keep peeking behind at their own discretion. Um, it, I don't know if that's a fun thing. I, I probably have the least experience on sniper uh, of any class, I feel like. Um, I, I don't know if my hours quite reflect that exactly. It, it certainly feels like it. But... Um, that, that is the way that the duel would go down. There is sniper v sniper is very important. If you live for that on sniper, um, I mean, I don't know if any sniper lives for that, but really, you, you gotta live for it a little because if you do win the sniper v sniper, you can just go to town on the sideline. You can just take out everyone. Um, no, nobody really threatening your dominance, which is uh, a great thing to have as a sniper watching these big sidelines on payload PL bad water. A great map added to the game in 2008, as I have mentioned, and will continue to remind you so that you can think about the significance, the astrological significance of Halo Valor being added to the map pool, being added to Team Fortress 2 when it was, right? There's something to that. It's history. It resounds in the future. Uh-huh. Like ripples of a wave continuing year by year by year by year by year by year. It's pattern repeating endlessly into the future. Payload bad water, a part of our fate forever. For now, and for some time in the future. How long? I will not know. But it does seem like forever right now. If we move on to the second and third point, um, in between, like, in the sort of first half between the second and third point, you have another big, long sort of open area where offensively, or even defensively if you sneak up there, um, being on the roof, watching this whole area as sniper is a really good spot to be. Being on the ground by the second point, watching this whole area, you, you, have, a, you have a pretty nice area to look through. You can uh, potentially kill anyone who's peeking through um, bridge room. You can peek any, you can kill anyone um, who's in this whole under area, underneath bridge room, right? Um, you, you also have the ability to peek from boiler room, which gives you uh, somewhat of a long sight line. Um, into, you know, all the way where their third point is, likely where a, a medic and combo are chilling, potentially where some engineers are in different places. Um, none of these sightlines are quite as obvious and advantageous as that last one, meaning there are going to be more people threatening uh, your staying power there. But nonetheless, if, if you do have some moments to, to put some shots off there, it can be very good. Um, a riskier move uh, is going under, um, particularly not as a defensive sniper, but I would say as an offensive sniper, you do have some potential um, going under and, uh, and and peeking just slightly for some, some nice body shots or some nice head shots. You're just at risk again where if someone does catch you, you're this big vulnerable, you know, 125 health target that's going to be easy as hell to win in a close range 1v1 against. 
but sometimes it might be the only option you have if uh, all of the other flank options are you know super well controlled. So it's uh, it is an option, but in general the third point is is probably uh, a less sniper focused area. It's interesting the way this works that it seems that in general if if, if it's good for a class on the first and second point um, and fourth point it might not be as good on the third point. I, I think I talked about soldier being a little weaker on the third point. Um, Maybe not weaker, but less fun. I, but uh, and perhaps this needs some sort of revision. Whereas I would say, uh, you know, scout, for instance, uh, might see more of a difference there between the second and the third point um, compared to other classes. So when we move on now, we're we're approaching through this third point. Um, we've captured it. There there is that nice window where you can have an engineer sentry spot right above the third point. If I'm looking dead on it from the blue team's perspective. There's a good spot to have a sniper. You have all these windows in that sort of upstairs area where a sniper can be watching with a little distance behind them, some nice natural cover from splash damage and such, um, and, and able to, to look on pretty straight on the path of the rails, the path of the cart. As that third point is captured and we're moving on to the final point, there's a brief sort of sight line in that transitory period where you, you, you have this sort of long line between the third point and if you look from the third point straight down into that little room that has the small health pack um, that just before that the cart sort of turns to the right and slopes down that big long ramp to the last point area um, and sometimes you, you do often see sniper duels there and while you are sort of contending for this area it is a good place for both snipers Though it's a bit close for comfort, it would be nice to have a little more range. It is nice that if you're a defensive sniper, you can hide all the way back in that room with that small health pack and kind of be obscured by the shadows uh, and a little less obvious to see. But as we clear through that area, because usually you do not hold there for too long, um, we, we make it to that last point where now we have a lot of sniper sight lines. Um, more advantageous, I would say, as a red sniper than a blue sniper. And as a, as a red sniper, um, two really obvious sight lines we have. Both are with eyes on choke. One is from the left spawn up top, and one is from the right spawn up top. I think the right spawn up top is a little better, um, only because uh, you're really only at threat of people shooting you from map room, because you probably have your eyes on choke, and... and Anyone who's in choke and peeking choke is already having trouble from all of your own team spamming the choke and, and being on the ramp and such. So you're really only at risk of a sniper or something coming from map room. Um, the left side area is is okay. I don't like it as much because you're at risk of getting flanked from somebody jumping up there from map room. You know, c coming from map room, a soldier jumping up, wrapping around to you, killing you. Even a scout jumping out the window and killing you. Um... You are watching the choke, but you're also vulnerable to that little window spot, that high up window spot, just to the right and above of the choke where somebody could be shooting you from. So it takes a little bit of energy to keep your eyes on both. And you don't really have a great angle compared to that right sniper spot. If you have a lot of opponents peeking on the blue team, it's probably a good spot. If there's lots of people peeking from tires, you do have more of a vantage point, but you don't have quite as much of an angle going deep into choke, whereas you have a little more of that coming from that right top spawn sniper area. And of course, uh, if you're peeking as the blue sniper, um, you, you do have both of those positions to be careful about um, if you're peeking the choke. Choke is, is, is definitely dangerous to peek as a blue sniper there because basically the moment you're finally able to have people to shoot, um, you potentially have two snipers gunning you down. You have all the people on choke gunning you down. So it's really only good to kind of move into that choke area and have all of that open space um, to shoot once your team's pushed through a bit. So the better sniper spots being uh, uh, offensively on blue, to my knowledge, uh, map room is, is, is a big winner spot as a sniper because, again, pushing through choke, a, a bit tricky. Not much to do in tires, especially if your team already has tires. Where are you going to aim? Um, map room is where, is where we think. There is this... Um, that connected building in tires, that the highest building in tires where you do have that little window you can shoot out of. It does give you a good vantage point against uh, that left spawn area 
to the sniper that might be there or anyone spawning from there. Um, I don't know if it gives you a very great vantage point otherwise. I like that from map room, you can shoot potentially um, both the snipers on the red team from both their positions. Uh, you can shoot uh, people spawning from the bottom spawn. You can shoot a lot of people in that bottom floor area. Potentially shoot people in that uh, left under sort of bunker garage area. Granted, the sentry is not on you, even though maybe you can peek it enough to kill a dispenser or an engineer or a medic or somebody that is hiding down there. The only threat to you really, besides being seen by a sniper, which is always a threat, um, is that uh, uh, somebody comes from the red entrance to map room and, and you know, starts killing you. Um, but that's just the risk you, you have in map room, and map room is important to control. But those are those are all the main uh, nice sightlines I think of when I think of playing sniper on bad water. It is uh, worth considering now. Uh, is it a lot better to be on blue team or to be on red team in this case? And I think hands down, it is better to be a red sniper now. Uh, it might not be that much better, because I think no matter what, if you're on Sniper and you're owning, uh, you're going to have a good time. And if you're if you're consistently winning the Sniper v. Sniper, I think you'll have a great time, no matter whether you're on Red Team or Blue Team, because it just gives you these huge sight lines where you have total area denial. And sometimes, even if you have area denial, people have to pass through. If you think about that, that area right after the second point, um, where people from the Red Team, when they spawn, they have to cross that... Uh, that long sight line uh, to get to the rooftop, right? They have to. It, it doesn't matter how much you're symbolically denying the area. They literally have to go over there if they want to keep their hold. So you just have this constant stream of people passing by your reticle. A really awesome, you know, fun sight line in that way uh, is that there are some chokes where there's only one way through, and that's awesome for you as a sniper shooting people. Uh... I did say, you know, the red team seems a little easier, a little more fun. And why is that? It's because you don't have to be uh, offensive, right? You can actually be defensive. You can let people come into your territory to hurt them, you know? Whereas if we think of something like the third point, I think on the third point especially, it's probably going to be more fun playing on defense because all the areas you're going to try to push and find a line as a sniper... Um, you're basically at risk of constantly getting bombed, right? Whereas we, when we think of, like, some of these other long sight lines, you're mainly at risk of being headshot, you know? And so, in that same way, when we think of the last point, um, even if I'm holding in map room, or if I'm trying to push, if I'm trying to get a line and choke, um, there's a lot of things that can be killing me. Whereas, if I'm a defensive sniper on the last point, where am I? I'm probably on the top left area or the top right area by the top spawn and who do i have to worry about literally only the sniper and maybe the spy which gets me to the, the next important point about uh sniper which is really i don't see why you wouldn't be using uh razorback or jirati on this map that being said i, I am a, a total fan of the smg i love the smg as someone who probably can't hit as many headshots as they can spraying uh pistol type bullets at people, but uh, the, the the Razorback is going to be so strong, so beneficial for you on PL Badwater. This is a very strong spy map. It's a map that as a spy, you really want to be taking out snipers um, and, and trying your best to uh, to consistently take them out. Even if they have a Razorback, you're going to be trying to gun them down because I, you know, I just went, went on and on about how important D you know, keeping that sightline for your team is, and once the other sniper is down, it gives your team sniper full reign. It's a very important pick. You know, if the, if, if the snipers are down in Highlander and even in a pub environment, taking down those snipers can be very beneficial to your team. So a, a Razorback, I would say, you know, especially like imagine your your sniper on red on Badwater on the last point defending, and you're in one of those two up top spots that I talk about. Why would you not have a Razorback? You're never going to use an SMG where you are. You're so far away from everyone. Like, the only reason you would use an SMG there is if, um, maybe if you're getting bombed by a soldier, in which case you're fucked anyway, in those positions. If you're getting attacked by a spy, in which case they would have just backstabbed you. So, you really still need the Razorback. Um, the only counter I see in most of this map, instead of using a Razorback, is using the Jurati. 
I think in terms of sniper bad water strategy, there are some really good spots where you can Jirati a ton of the enemy team on these chokes while they're on the cart, and it really helps your team getting those mini crits. Um, or crits, I, I can't quite remember. Whoops. Um, but I don't even know if it's always worth the trade-off. Um, I think I think if you know in a situation where you don't have to worry about the spy and you're not getting backstabbed, uh, something like this, maybe you're around the combo and there's a pyro constantly blowing flames around you or something like this, uh, then it would make sense to use the Jirati, but it's definitely worth in investing in an anti-spy a strategy here as sniper because what else is going to get in your way in a lot of these situations it's really the other sniper to worry about and if you've got that handled um it's just going to be a spy trying to take you out and so and a lot of times you're going to be in weird off situations like i'm you know away from the rest of your team like i had mentioned holding that last point where you're not going to be in the choke with your teammates you know uh, you're not going to be in tires, and, and you're going to be alone. And, and so you, you do want that kind of insurance that, hey, you know, if a sniper, if a spy comes by, I at least have a shot. Because um, even if you say, well, yeah, they'd shoot me with a gun anyway, it's a lot more effort for them to shoot you with a gun, first of all. There is a chance you can maybe win the 1v1 um, in, in that situation. They're going to be, uh, you know, pretty close by. Uh, you could potentially melee them successfully, you know, you could, you, maybe you can headshot them or body shot them in conjunction with the melee. It is winnable. Your team will become aware of it, you know, it might take a moment, but certainly a spy shooting at one of your snipers is much more attention than, oh, he's dead because he was backstabbed instantly. And how can you react to that as a teammate? You can't. Um, so yes, I, th I think, I think red team is more fun for sniper, but not by too much, and that really the amount of fun you're probably having on Sniper just has to do with if you're winning those Sniper v Sniper duels. And, and maybe this is just TF2 game theory in general, that on most maps, if you if you can control the sight lines, kill the other Sniper, then you have a very open game um, that's beneficial to you. And again, if you're just actually chilling in those sight lines, I, th I think a mistake a lot of players will make on Sniper on Badwater is in fear of the sniper v sniper they will avoid it um and the problem with this is that you just end up in a lot of positions where you are now much more likely to lose and, and be picked off by random flank players because you're not in your zone you're in their zone you're in the flank you know versus being in a sniper side lane they don't want to hang out there that much that you know they everyone has a healthy apprehension about the sniper sight lines um and so, equally so, you should have a, a healthy apprehension about the flanks and and the chokes or, or whatever parts of the map are are uh, are not your super strong points as sniper on on payload bad water. So before I move on to the ninth and final class spy and sp how spy fares on bad water and all of the kind of spy strategy and whether or not spy is more fun in offense or defense and what items are viable and what sort of routes and areas are good as spy. I do just want to do a bit of a recap and, and think about everything we've learned about Badwater because it is a very interesting map and, and how it can tell us a lot about the classes and the ways that we should be playing them. I think, just as I mentioned, that uh, if there was a map that rewarded uh, battle medicking, it's probably not a very good map. I, I think in that same way, um, there are certain core aspects of classes that if they are brought out on Badwater, it is a testament to Badwater's effective, you know, uh, inspiring and rousing a certain kind of playstyle from all the players that is uh, the ideal playstyle for that class, right? So while it might be unfortunate from one person's perspective that Vaccinator is not so viable on Badwater, it's actually a sign that Badwater is a good map. Um, because a vaccinator is um, only really going to be useful in, in gimmicky situations. And uh, and if, if it was a map that uh, gave players benefits in gimmicky situations, I think it would be seen more as an unfair map. Um, the fact that you can expect where snipers are going to be, the fact that you can expect where engineers are going to be, I think I think this sort of things, these sort of fundamentals are necessary in a good map, and it, it can be easy to want to resist and uh, and rebel against the ways of tradition and say, no, what if we had a map where 
it was not clear where the sniper should be or what, what if we because that would be interesting right isn't it uninteresting that these these maps uh it's so obvious where a certain class should be um and i think this is just sort of you know deconstructionism and uh the, the brain having a little too much play time and i understand where the instinct comes from it's it's reasonable to some extent um, the reason I'm going to say it's not very reasonable in this situation is because it doesn't actually lend itself to better gameplay. It, the the funny thing is that the better maps are actually the maps where you have an obvious role for what you should be doing with your class. Um, this idea of, well, wouldn't it be nice if the map sort of catered to all play styles and was very egalitarian and, and gave everyone options so you never knew what was going to happen because it was... It was such a such an even playing field that it could be totally unexpected what kind of play style would be viable and uh, where one should be positioned. And the thing is, if you design that map, it's actually just not as fun. Um, there is something nice about structure. Structure gives way to enjoyment and also allows us to express ourselves within it. Some limits are necessary. And all maps, in some sense, are intrinsically built of limits. That is what makes them maps, you know, and not uh, constantly uh, m metamorphosizing uh, ambiguous, uh, you know, impossible constructs. And so, you know, when we think about the shutter door that leads from the red spawn uh, to to the front lines on that first point, and, and when that shutter door is, is finally sealed shut after the first two points, it, you know, these kind of limits... Um, you, you, you must see their utility on bad water as, as well as seeing um, it, it's easy to see the frustration of it of oh now I have to walk longer right 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 just in the same way that there's frustration and now I have to wait to respawn and I have to wait to respawn longer because I'm on defense instead of offense and now I have to use the Razorback as sniper because I'm at high risk of spies and I'm a high priority target yes 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 but it speaks to the importance of the limits, the importance of the configuration of what's going on, and that even though you are limited, it's uh, it's actually for the best on Badwater. So, does Badwater elicit more fun on offense or defense when you are playing Spy? This is the final piece of the equation. I think it is tricky to say because Spy, in general, the way that you play Spy is quite different from all the other classes in the game. You know, assuming you're not going for the sort of brash, unrefined play style of a Spicicle Dead Ringer and just, you know, being a gun spy, revolver heavy, or I don't know if people still use the Ambassador, but Ambassador heavy maybe back in the day or Enforcer or, or whatever. Diamondback, I guess, is pretty brutal as well nowadays if we're not doing spy like that if we're doing sort of the core classic spy experience of going invisible um, or even I guess you could try to be subtle and sneaky too with the dead ringer it is possible um, but typically the emphasis is on using invisibility to your advantage not being seen by the enemy as often as you can um, and uh, using the environment to position around them in a way that is advantageous to you. And in general, as Spy, because of that synopsis that I just gave about how, how they are played, Badwater is a, a good map for Spy, certainly because it has lots of uh, environmental options, lots, lots of different paths you can take to get through a single area, which is actually quite necessary as Spy, because... Even though you can manage okay, even with an invis watch trying to get through a choke, it can be done. And sure enough, when you play pub maps, when you play maps like Gold Rush um, on invis, if you're courageous like I am, uh, you gotta, you know, just risk your luck a lot and walk through chokes and and maneuver tightly right around people while you're invisible and hope for the best. And you can still do a bit of that in Bad Water, but there's so many great flank routes on bad water that mean that you don't have to do that which is really nice and part of the the beauty of bad water as well is all of the variation in elevation you've got in, in most parts of the map you have a low ground and a high ground and maybe some in between middle grounds um, 
and stairwells and all, all kinds of things that you can go up and down in. Elevation is really great for Spy for a number of reasons. One is just positional uh, advantage, positional, um, yeah, really advantage is the, is the term of, of being able to retreat to a high ground, watch people from high ground. Um, you can cloak and then disappear if you're discovered on the high ground to a variety of places, right? Versus being caught out on the low ground as Spy um, is pretty difficult to deal with. Something that's nice too is you can often drop down from the high ground to the low ground to quickly get a pick. Um, people can be checking the low ground, but if you're watching from the high ground and you suddenly, you know, jump down and stab someone, it's very hard to detect. Um, which is nice because it sort of makes Spy more intelligent than just um, walking up right behind someone and backstabbing them. Which is not as rewarding, right? And then also, uh, you have a better shot in a certain way too that, that feels more fair because when you are on a map that's totally flat and choky and your only chance is just to walk up to someone and backstab them, it's not very uh, rewarding when you're just killed by random adjacent spam because you had to walk in this crazy area to get to them, you know? It doesn't feel like, oh, well, I really got God. It's like, no, it was just hectic as hell. And I got caught in the crossfire because how else was I going to approach a kill? There was nowhere else to go, right? Versus being able to sort of chill out on uh, some sort of elevated area, some sort of high ground, and then quickly swoop down, do your business, and leave, you know? Uh, which is really the way you want to want to play Spy, getting in and out as quick as you can. There are, there are a lot of ammo packs on PL Badwater, which are now quite useful to Spy. I did mention earlier that... A long time ago, when Bad Water was released, the Spy actually could not replenish their cloak with ammo boxes. So despite the, the plethora of uh, luxuriously placed ammo that was on Bad Water, um, it was still a, a decent Spy map, which should tell you something as well, that um, the, the fun of Spy is not directly correlated to ammo. And I know we do think of that because we think of how 5CP maps are kind of... Uh, less fun probably for spy certainly than payload i think most spy mains would agree on average and uh you would you would obviously think that has to do with the ammo and the absence of ammo on 5cp now there's tends to be more small and medium packs instead of medium and large ones like on payload maps but it 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 could actually have more to do with the the flow of the map itself the the difference in flow of of 5cp versus payload um, as well as the shape and size and the the flows of traffic within the map itself, um, which Badwater does very well. I think, uh, despite there being what seem like similar payload maps, like I would say, uh, I would say Hoodoo can can sort of seem similar from a, a vague sense. Um, and Upward too, I, I think, it is a, is a decent spy map. Um, all payload maps, you can do some good stuff as Spy, but it's hard to argue against Badwater being an OG. Um, maybe I'm biased here in thinking this, but there there is a reason that uh, there's some stabby video called Badwater I Love You and not a stabby video called Upward I Love You, right? Just Just think about that one, digest that one. What does that mean? Hmm. Is Badwater more lovable than Upward? I mean, I don't want to sound crazy, but maybe. And, uh, at least if you're a spy main, that should make sense. Upward, one of the nice things that it did have, probably over Badwater, is that it has, in general, way more sight lines. Um, there's a lot of places on the map where you don't have this dichotomy of upper and lower areas. Like, if you think of um, Badwater first compared to Upward first. Um, on Badwater first, you have a tunnel, and then you have the whole area above it. Um, but on Upward, there's it's just really just one big area on that first point. And there's little hills um, here and there, but th there's no uh, there's not a really a, a lot of places where you can actually sneak through um, without going noticed. And that's not to say a spy, but to say even as other classes, you don't. 
in my opinion, it is a little less complex of a first point, but what that does mean is everyone is going to be more underneath the reticle of your crosshair. Um, and I think Upward especially was like a cool ambassador map, just as it has to be a very cool sniper map for that reason. Um, and I would I would say on the contrary that uh, a bad water is... Uh, yeah, it's not as exploitable for the ambassador and the sniper <laughs> probably as Upward is. But it's... Uh, I think it's better in terms of uh, its other stuff, just moving around the map, trying to get kills. I, th I think the fact that there's lots of places to escape to, like you can use Badwater much more environmentally to your advantage, whereas I think it's it's really easy to get caught and know where people are going and upward. It's just not as, it doesn't feel as big to me. The upward feels very long, but it doesn't feel as wide or complex as Badwater. Like, that huge second flank area you have on, on bad water behind the roof um, has a lot of charm to it, is very special. So if we're comparing the, the gameplay of, of Spy on the blue and red team on bad water, I would like to mention that uh, in general, uh, red Spy, like some of the other classes I did mention before, seems like it will have the better experience only because the the red team kind of has to play off of the blue team pushing forward, whereas the, the blue team um, doesn't expect the red team to come into them. If anything, they need to be the one to make the moves, which means they're going to be focusing forward. Um, they, don't, they don't really have the luxury to sort of stay put and hold their ground as much, um, which staying put and holding your ground gives you more time to be spy aware. Um, and so because they don't have that privilege, they will be less spy aware by default. And just and by the fact they have to worry about this objective of pushing the cart, there's lots of ways to get kills by pushing the cart uh, if you are in blue, but it's also a way to be killed because you are distracted um, by trying to work on this objective and you're probably looking forward to the people who are shooting at you to get off the cart which uh, opens up a lot of opportunities for Spy on defense. So, by default, I will say that, but something cool to, to give credit to Spy and the Spy experience on blue on Badwater, on offense on Badwater, is you get to take out sentries, you get to take out dispensers, um, you get to fuck with engineers probably a lot more when you're a blue Spy, because the red team is, is the one that's going to be stacking the engineers. So you do have an important job in that way that you don't necessarily have on the other team, uh, which which can be really nice. And overall, too, even, even though I mentioned that as defense you have a little advantage and that you have time to think about and look for spies and have awareness, or that, you, you, you also, to some extent, are going to have the same issue that blue team has, which is that there are going to be a lot of times where you're very focused looking ahead of you, where... The enemy team is pushing in, trying to take your sentry, you're trying to defend it, right? As an engineer, too, in general, um, barring the rescue ranger to, to heal your sentry, you're going to have to be looking at it, and you're probably going to be wanting to, wanting to be looking ahead of you to see what incoming damage is, is, uh, is threatening your sentry, which makes your back exposed to spies. So, sentries and, um, and carts, kind of in both ways, are very useful to spy on both teams because it's this it's this thing that people care about and get invested into in their little fights that make it easier for you to you know it makes them tunnel vision each other harder which makes it easier for you on either team to uh exploit that their uh lack of awareness for what's behind them and instantly kill them with with a knife that is the uh the meta of spy um there are so many great inclines and corners on bad water um, when it comes to doing high technical expensive trick stab maneuvers um, I think when I, I mentioned subtle art earlier one of the first sort of spy youtubers um, who I think was credited with inventing the stair stab you, go go fact check me on that you can probably find some game banana threads from 2008 disputing that or whatever 
But subtle art, uh, definitely, I'm, sh I'm sure a lot of that happens on Badwater because there are so many damn staircases and so many damn first to second floor connections. Um, and long staircases, too. I think that's the important thing. Is that, uh, you know, Gold Rush, there's lots of little staircases up to, like, these kind of, like, you know, a couple feet off the ground um, second levels, you know? Um, like, like there is height difference in general on Gold Rush or even on Upward, but there's not, uh, I don't think there's quite as much of these really big height changes where, like, you're going from the second point on Badwater to the roof on Badwater where you have to go up this big staircase. Or you have to go up, um, you know, from the first point to the, the second point roof, you know, and you take that staircase. Or you, you go to that medium health pack room um, to the left of the first point after you cap, after you go through those doors offensively, there's a big staircase up to that pack, right? And to get from the first point up to the cliff where you, where you hold that high ground and usually put a sentry on the first point, you have to walk up, uh, you know, a couple staircases. There's a lot of quick elevation right there. Um, and all this elevation, you know, it is cool for flashy stair steps, but really the thing it's cool for is spy in general... Uh, does well with that height because it, I kind of mentioned it before, it gives you opportunities to suddenly drop down and uh, and kill people, which is very useful and not be in their way in the chaos before you do so. It lets you perform trick stabs. It also just gives you space once you are caught out because you can go invisible and they're left thinking because you had all these options, did the spy stay on the high ground? Did the spy, is the spy right by me? sort of on these stairs, did the spy retreat entirely to the middle ground, are they under me now, are they somewhere very far away? With um, with these big height changes, like, or, or any, you know, if you think of yourself being on the, on the cliff of first point where people usually put sentries that like watches over the exit of the tunnel, if you're staying there as spy and someone sees you, you can cloak and you can stay up there on the cliff, that can be your escape route. Um, you can jump down like a half level to, to that sort of flat area where there's that medium health pack. You can jump all the way down to the, uh, to the floor where the tunnel is. You can jump down just to the lip of the tunnel and kind of hang in between those two elevations, between that flat area with the medium health pack and the, the floor of the tunnel. Um, if, if you jump far enough to you, you can even land on those rocks, um, right by the, uh, on the right side exiting that tunnel from uh, from blue team's POV. Um, you could try to sort of hug the wall on your way down to the tunnel and maybe not get all the way down to the ground immediately. So there's, you can already see that like just from that one spot that you're standing, you have maybe four or five different options of where to go where you are separated by elevation, which is very useful because it means that any splash damage, um, and even to some extent any, any fire damage, they're going to have a hard time uh, making you visible because um, those are actually five different places they have to choose to shoot a rocket um, to hope that it reveals, you know, it bumps your cloak and exposes you, right? Whereas if you're in a totally flat area, they, they just have to shoot down. They just have to shoot kind of anywhere around them, and they've got a much higher odd of... Of finding you because it's just one place that you could be rather than five places right so this that's that's i think the the cool thing about bad water and why it's going to be so fun for spies that they're from all these high ground areas there's so many different places that you can have numerous numerous getaways you know and and uh create really cool illusions with the invisible watches um which are fun to uh I mean that's the that's the lifeblood of spy in my opinion is there's the fun psychology involved with that you know it's not just about the kills but it's about how you maneuver around the enemy how you create paranoia how you keep yourself safe for a long time by using those uh, short periods of invisibility to uh, to really uh, set the enemy off of your scent to throw them off the trail right so. When we talk about uh, the last point of Badwater, it's it's nice that it has so many different paths for Spy. Um, you can 
try willing things right through the choke. You can go through map room. <laughs> and then through map room, you have lots of nice options because you can drop all the way down. You can sort of half drop down to that staircase leading up to the right spawn. Um, do some spawn camping. You can you can spawn camp any of these spawns as spy. Um, it's easy to get back and, and try to kill snipers. It's 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 uh you'll it's clever now. You'll see the balance of bad one and the way it's designed. That uh, it probably seems sort of unfair that the uh, or it seems weak that the sentry positions that are meta that make sense for NGs on last are underneath. They're the low ground because this whole time. We've mentioned so often about how important high ground is on, on bad water and how there is this cool uh, dichotomy between the different elevations and, uh, and and what their use will be for your team, and, and especially in regards to uh, taking out the enemy team and uh, making an advance on them or, or keeping them suppressed and not pushing forward. Yet we have this, this unique case where on last, you, you actually tend to want your sentry in a low ground position. And why is that? And I will argue part of the reason that a low ground sentry position is nice is that it's a bad position uh, for a spy to try to take out, right? Because if, if a sentry position is in a very high spot, the spy has all those luxuries that I talked about before, which is uh, if they need to get away, if they fuck up taking it out, if they just want to sap it and leave and then come back and harass later. When you're starting on the top of the mountain as spy, you have so many different options of where to escape to, and and the enemy is going to be left having to guess between a lot of options, right? If you're on the low ground as spy, you, you can't suddenly jump up to the three or four places of higher elevation, right? It only works one way. If you're on the high ground, you have all the options of places to go. If you're on the low ground, you don't have any options. And so, as a spy, the fact that you have to go into those really low bunkers which are probably like the the worst place for you to be it's very easy for them to constantly be spy checking for any spam damage to just uh you know reveal you and where you are if, if somebody's shooting pipes or whatever it is and uh at the same time it's going to be hard not to bump into a lot of players down there because it is a kind of dense area and so this is this is where you'll see too how this this the things that we've been talking about sort of reign true um, and continue to reign true as universal principles of how you want to, on how you want to play spy on bad water and on any map which is that in those low ground situations where you're dealing with that sentry as spy which is not a good place for you what tends to be the best move is getting on the dispenser right that's a that's a great place to hide and prepare to make your move um, or even jumping on the sentry if you can uh, get away with it. It's it's difficult to do that while cloaked because if you're on the front half of the sentry, you're at high risk that the rockets are gonna shoot you, even though you are invisible. Once it's been activated, just because your hitbox is right on it. So, so even in those situations, you're gonna want to be taking advantage of a dispenser to try to have that little tiniest bit of high ground because it's very helpful in in uh, in playing spy and having getaways, and being able to to start doing things without being so obvious right you can uncloak on top of the dispenser and uh, start sapping their stuff instead of uncloaking anywhere on that level ground where it's going to be much easier for them to see you right another cool thing about bad water that uh, I've come to realize is part of its uh, incredible utility is that when you have a map that's so good you start to do like mental gymnastics to continue justifying the glory and greatness of bad water of said really great map and you start to question if if bad water is so great because it really is or if it's so great in part because you need it to be so great you need you need something to be realer than real you need something to be hyper real you need it to be uh, an ideal you need it to live up to an ideal that can't really exist because if you knew that it couldn't really exist it would destroy you and your spirit so there is some strange uh, pathology in keeping bad water alive as a perfect deity as a 
a a recipient of worship that is always justified and is always deserving of its praise even even when we realize that our arguments that keep it afloat are our justifications for why it is so good and so much better are sometimes real but sometimes uh, rationalizations and uh, our own excuses and mental gymnastics to keep that dream alive that bad water can exist that a perfect map can exist and that we can play it and uh, live in some sort of perfect dream world some sort of perfect heaven where the problems of normal maps the the problems of not having fun um, can be blamed on everything except for the map right it's not the it's not bad water that's uh to blame if you were to have any absence of joy on bad water in this uh in this situation we would instead entertain to blame ourselves for failing to appreciate bad water more and so for me i've probably spent most of my time on bad water as spy and soldier Soldier certainly in the last five years, spy probably certainly in the prior five. And something I really enjoy about uh, Badwater on Spy, um, and this is something I would say that you're able to enjoy on either team. Again, we're sort of seeing that blue and red spy are actually more similar than, than many of the other classes fare between being on offense or defense. I think playing spy is just as good on both teams, and I'm just going to say that outright. There's something really great about being a spy and getting ready for a, a backstab and, you know, being around the central cart area and actually being able to pull off a chain stab because you can just kind of hold down forward, right? You're in the enemy line, about to backstab someone, some, about to backstab someone, walking forward, hopefully back into your allied team's line. So just on your path to that allied team line, it's like, how many kills can you get? And uh, because there is such a clear, linear, uh, front-to-back um, sort of, uh, yeah, uh, traffic, a economy of violence in a, in a payload match, it's, uh, it's very doable for you to just run right through and... Uh, take whatever you can get on your way out back to your homie's base. I love that a lot about playing Spy on Bad Water. It's interesting, because of the availability of, uh, of ammo on Bad Water, it's really hard to see why you would pick um, the Cloak and Dagger. And the Cloak and Dagger is a tricky item, and we can talk ab about it to a great extent and how it fares in, in Team Fortress as an entirety. Uh, however, especially on Battlewater, especially on most payload maps, on most maps where there is abundant ammo, it is not very useful to use the Cloak and Dagger because you just spend too much time being invisible. It's nice in maps where there's not a very, a super clear uh, direction a uh, 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 traffic economy of violence visually, you know, where it's clear, okay, we're shooting in this direction and people are shooting back through us and we're fighting in this choke point, you know, we're fighting in this narrow little area b between first and second point on bad water, um, where it's very easy to deadlock focus in front of you and then be backstabbed by people, right? Um, but in maps where there's a little uh, less, like, stick-like economy of violence, right? If you think of a King of the Hill map where there's more of a, a, a pebble-shaped economy of violence, right? A circular emanating violence in all directions. There's still a general, we're on this side and you're on that side, but it's way less streamlined, right? Where it might be more beneficial to use the cloak and dagger because uh, people might, you know, be coming from all kinds of directions. And uh, there also might not be as many ammo packs, which is a, a, a good reason why Badwater is so spy and engineer friendly is there is a lot of ammo packs and it it makes you wonder what they were I, I I think I think in a way Payload maps for them when they made gold rush when they made uh, When they made Badwater, I think they started putting a lot more ammo packs on the map 
compared to if you think of the the six six maps that Valve launched the game with, there's all of a sudden a lot more ammo on the map. And I think in part that has to be to benefit the engineer because I mean, being expected on a 5 CP map to build, uh, you know, a anything competent as an engineer without a mini sentry too back in those days using uh, maybe two medium ammo packs on mid and a couple small ones, right? It's just not doable. And so the abundance of ammo is, is nice because it's difficult for anyone to complain about because it's fair game to everyone, just like abundance of health packs. It's fair game to everyone, and uh, it is. It does make the spy and engineer experience a lot more enjoyable, and it, it's enjoyable in a passive way too. Because the advantage that you get as a spy with having more ammo on a map like Battleborn and having more cloak time um, shouldn't really be seen as an issue for the enemy team. Because uh, in a certain way, yes, the more time you spend invisible. The more time you, uh, the, the, the more sort of power you have to stay unknown to the enemy team, but at that same time, it renders you useless, right? So it's kind of a win-win for both teams when you are invisible, right? Because invisibility without using it as a means to, to cause chaos, right, or to kill people is pointless. So um, barring, again, being able to give communication uh, give it give spy intel to your team, which is uh, somewhat useful in Highlander almost never going to be useful in a pub uh, so, so giving the spy more more ammo on the map is like what's the problem with this and It is again of note that when they did add bad water to the game spy was not able to pick up the ammo packs for a cloak um, So it is nice that the amount of ammo they put on there still did translate well to spy once they gave him that huge buff, you know? Um, and, and I think even if you look back to those old subtle art videos where he's playing Spy on Badwater, it does speak very well to the power of Badwater in that uh, you are able to have an incredible time even with low amounts of ammo on the field. So when I think of sort of my favorite spots to play Spy on Badwater, it's certainly all about these areas with very complex um, vertical uh, architecture, right? Um, and, and specifically these areas where we have lots of rocks because the, that first point with all of those, that, that insane amount of rocks that everywhere is, each rock has maybe two or three different points, points that you can stand on it, that you can perch on it. And as we mentioned before, the, the importance of vertical options cannot be understated as spy because when you're sneaking around, when you're being invisible, it forces the enemy to actually have to choose a certain place to shoot you, and there might be a risk that they can't find you versus you being on flat ground and there's just one place where they pretty much know where you are. You know, it's just a matter of whether you're left or right, right? The horizontal space, but the vertical space is all handled because you can't fly a spy. So I love these areas with all these really complex organic architecture, like all these rock formations that we we see on Battle that you don't see on a lot of other maps where it is more of a non-desert Mesa-y environment, you know, where you have you have props, you have crates and stuff like that, but it's nowhere near as uh, organic and complex as some of these weird, uh, you know, rocks that have a, 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 a great number more polygons than a little box, uh, you know, a, a cube essentially would have, right? putting putting cubes somewhere so the with that in mind um the second point um is probably a little less fun for spy but still fun because there's so many corridors and there's lots of little railings and there's lots of little um little pathways and tons of flanks that you can take in the back route there's a million ways for a spy to get behind on that second point which makes it very nice to play Third point, I would I would think is one of the the less fun places as spy, only because you have to travel through that sort of central choke where you have to take you either have to leave through bridge room, through boiler room, or through that underpass area. The underpass area probably being the most safe for you, because assuming no one is there baiting you, it shouldn't be taking constant spam, right? You should be able to just sort of walk under and through there from either side onto the other side. 
Um, but it is more restricted than that. There is a lot more flat ground, and there's usually only a couple of high ground areas, uh, and they're guarded by staircases, which uh, is, is tough because you've got the odds that you're going to bump into people going up the staircases. It's not like you have a ton of options to how you want to get up to a high ground or watch over people, and then once you do, uh, you kind of need some breathing room because chances are other people are going to be there too compared to like the first point or even in some ways the second point where there's just so many routes and so many different types of high ground where uh, you're going to naturally have a little more breathing room and it's not going to be so so difficult and potentially luck-based in whether you bump into people or not, right? And the, the last point for Spy uh, is a little bit of a hybrid of these, these two things because you do have uh, high ground options. You, you do have you know, map room is, is a high ground to the low ground. You have the, the railing in map room. You have um, the whole top area above the underneath bunkers where the engineer is set up. Um, and you do have, you know, in, in tires, there, there's a little high ground standing on the tires. And, uh, you know, even in that uh, the sniper tower room, there, there's enough sort of creative props and stuff going on there that you can use some weird height stuff to your advantage if need be, let alone all of the the staircases and of course it can be very nice to leave through the stairwell as spy on defense because it gets you to the enemy team uh, the enemy team's lines and where they will be potentially uh, extremely quickly which is great the thing though about spy is that you cannot play them very much in 6v6 and I know what you're thinking yes casual but 6v6 is not often played if ever in Highlander which is something that we should uh, we should really talk about and address. It's no secret that in the very early days of competitive TF2, in the very early days of trying out the 6v6 format, they did play Gold Rush when the map was released. They did try out Gold Rush. I do not know how long Gold Rush lasted. I do know I do know at some point, obviously, that it was deemed unsuccessful and did not stand as a uh, a, a sixes map that would continue to be played. Uh, that being said, I would like to see Badwater considered for Six's gameplay. You have seen Badwater played uh, time and time again as a Highlander map, of course. You even did see Badwater um, being added to the quote-unquote competitive map pool that Valve runs in their competitive matchmaking servers, which of course are not really used or played by the majority of the TF2 player base, especially competitive players. It's sort of a, a flop of a, com of, a, of a queuing system, right? Um, a, a, fa a failure to uh, create a competitive matchmaking system because it's, it is, uh, for reasons like this, it, it would play maps like PL Badwater that um, were never considered sixes maps by the, uh, the competitive community. Um, uh, Badwater obviously embraced it as a Highlander map, but not so much a sixes map. And so I would like to go through and, and think about uh, why Bad Water 6 is, is not uh, considered viable. Why is it not taken seriously as a 6s map? Is it because there is a payload card that you have to push? It could very well be. Um, it, does, it does offer a slight advantage for one team, right? And it, if we imagine a hard-locked 6v6 team where both teams are not off-classing and they're using two scouts, two soldiers, one medic, and one demo man on payload bad water. It is an advantage that the blue team has that constant healing and that cart to kind of hide behind, which is uh, excellent. I love hiding behind uh, the cart and using it for heals if I'm on the blue team. So this is part of it, but I, I think another important part to consider are the long spawns, the long walk times. Uh, you see, you can walk uh, from the, the blue spawn to the, the first point very easily. And don't get me wrong, there is a lot of walking that goes on in real 6v6 on 5CP maps, you know? Spawning from your midpoint spawn uh, to, to go to the enemy team's last. It, it is a hefty walk. It, it is no joke, you know? Um, but the thing is, the, the cool thing about 6s is, is you do have high mobility classes. Scouts get there pretty quickly. Soldiers and demo men can jump very quickly. Um, you could create some sort of a rollout, you know. Uh, if you're working with your, your medic, you can definitely get there very quickly. So I think this teleporter thing that we think, oh, yeah, well, it's the map's too big. Um, I don't think it's as much of an issue as you may think. I think 
it is an issue pushing that third point, but I, I like to imagine that you can have the option to set up teleporters if you want. I think, however, it would be pretty hard to keep teleporters up, and it's e even questionable if it's worth uh, trying to keep them up on a map like Badwater. Um, there's something to be said for, uh, inevitably, if Badwater was really taken seriously as a 6v6 map, if they added it to the RGL 6v6 map pool, you have to start uh, imagining a 6s world where someone is full-time playing Engineer. If not on blue team, on red team. And if this is not true, I would like to see it played out. I would like to see the, the sixes meta on PL Badwater naturally evolve, right? Because uh, I'm seeing I'm seeing two soldiers and two demo man being quite useful. Sorry, two soldiers and one demo man being quite useful on all of Badwater, on blue or red. I'm seeing uh, at least one scout always being useful, um, especially for pushing the payload. Potentially both scouts are useful. I would expect, if we saw Badwater um, played in the Sixes RGL map pool, I would expect to start seeing a lot of Engineer off-classes on defense, potentially for Sentry, and maybe even more useful than that, I, ex I expect possibly to see a lot of uh, uh, Sniper off-classing. We've talked about all the great sight lines. It could possibly be a thing where both teams are forced to run Snipers, um, which could make it a very unfun map. I, I, I it could that could be a problem. I think in general, I, I tend to prefer playing sixes maps that don't uh, heavily encourage sniping because uh, if you are playing Viaduct and now you're just running two snipers, it makes the game slower. That's that's the reason that I don't like having two snipers in sixes. And so you're realizing that all the off classes that people would use on Badwater in sixes do make the game slower, right? A sniper, a heavy an engineer the problem now is if we say well we don't want to make the game slower on bad water on 6v6 and so if we say okay we're not going to do those off classes for the sake of some sort of experimental pug where we we test the viability of sixes bad water now the issue you run into is even though we're trying to not have the game be slowed down by these off classes the game is kind of inherently slowed down by the rate of pushing the cart you know because on a Six is five CP map. The rate of flow of the game can be very quick. You can capture, you know, all the way to last in a minute if you're fast and you're really dominating the other team. You can play off of frags to win the objective very quick. In payload, your how quick you get an advantage off of the objective is is much slower, right? Uh, it's. You know, you, you wipe the other team on first point as soon as the gates open. On, on blue, you wipe the red team. You're probably, on, you know, barely going to reach the first point by the time they're already spawned and back there again. Uh, and you have to do that with a number of points. So, in this way, there's something inherently slow about payload because you're limited by this three times cap speed on the payload cart on Badwater. So this does have you wonder, well, if we if we saw Payload Badwater played competitively in sixes, perhaps we should remove this cap time from the cart. That, this could be one solution to have a greatly increased uh, cap time, right? So it's proportionate to the, the players on it, right? So a times 10 cap time is actually that much faster, you know, if you can afford to have two scouts and, a, you know, a pain train demo and a pain train soldier and your, your other soldier and a med, right, all on that cart, you'd have time times 10 or something like this. That's one option, but it does create this problem where we're modifying the stock game again, uh, which creates, you know, powerful rifts between the competitive and casual community, which is a complex thing that we already have done to some degree, but it's questionable if we want to keep going in that direction or if we want to stay still rooted in the stock game in what the developers intended to some extent, right? Some sort of some sort of compromise could be a healthy way to continue playing the game. So the the next place we should consider in terms of making uh, this 6v6 bad water more fun and and uh, worrying about this this fast paceness and the whole and being stopped by the car and being stopped by engineers or heavies and snipers is uh we we have to really question what what is the point of of playing sixes what is the point of having these fights and 
on a a map like Bad Water on Six is imagine I can see two ways in which things go down. One is that there's sort of an independent fight that happens between the teams, between the combos, to play for frags. And then you push the cart when you have an advantage, right? An alternative is that you always sort of play around the cart and uh, and constantly are sacking on it and, and use it for heals and, and use it to uh, keep you alive. And I think the, the problem with this, with this style of gameplay is that it it forces you to be um, it forces you to to really uh, w when you're when you're always having to be around the cart it limits is, it limits the places that you can go on bad water it keeps you very fixed down to a certain point which you could argue the same happens with 5 CP but the difference is that 5 CP you know pulls you down and chains you down to five specific points on the map only. It's like you only have to really hang out on the checkpoints of a payload map. But on this payload map, Badwater, you have to stay on this track the whole time. So someone, even if it's just, there's just one or two people you force to push the cart the whole time, kind of have to be stuck to this route where they don't really have much of a unique choice. So the funny thing is, is that the faster payload gets, um, the faster the game gets, actually, the, the more... Uh, the less fun payload tends to be because you spend more time waiting around on the cart, right? So if you are constantly supplied with enemies that you have to fight, you can't really afford to spend a bunch of time on the cart, um, which means you're going to push the cart slower, but it also means you're going to be more engaged in sort of the core TF2 conflict, which is just fighting, you know? Um, and so, the ironically, the, the problem with... Uh, 6v6 bad water is that you don't have enough players on the field to kind of constantly be fighting someone so that there is all this idle time that you have to spend on the cart. So I have two solutions to this. One is, is an ex extreme solution that really is a modification of, of the game of bad water to some extent. And the other solution is a, um, is a, is a modification of the Sixes game mode to compensate Battle Order, which is probably also not uh, very good. Um, but hear me out on this first one. The first idea is to make the payload uh, something that you can either team can push. So the blue team wants to get it to the red base, the red spawn. The red team wants to get it to the blue spawn, the blue base, that payload cart in Badwater. And maybe the cart will start somewhere in between. So there is now still a semblance of the mid fight where both teams roll out. Um, and again, now you're, you, you, you are dealing with this problem where it's an asymmetrical map. Is it unfair to roll out on the certain team? Maybe they have to swap sides every time you cap. Or maybe you have to do some sort of mirrored version of the map, which, which is a little less fun in my opinion i i think you know maybe we should give asymmetrical 5 cp a, a shot you know or the spirit of that here with this bad water sort of uh mode where you either team can push the cart um in, in the other direction so that's one solution i think would be good because it gives both teams something to do um, there's, it's, it's a little brutish and unsatisfying, kind of like the attack defense mode. Perhaps why Gravel Pit is not super, super popular in, in sixes anymore is that once you defend the point, once you defend the payload, all you really have to do is wait around it. You kill the whole team, you just wait. Kind of like King of the Hill as well, which, um, because you are a lot of times defending, you are a lot of times just burning out time. But I guess in King of the Hill, again, both teams can capture the point and then the same argument we would say on 5 CP when you're defending you know you're 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 doing the same thing again where you're just trying to waste time and and lower the clock or you know wait till you can make an offensive push again uh, but that's the difference right is that in payload bad water uh, by default if you have a successful defense you can't wait to push again all you can do is defend more you can't you don't have a choice in pushing the cart backwards so if we made the mode so that Either team could push the cart, and the cart started in the center. I think that would make it uh, pretty interesting. I think that, that would be my good solution for payload, bad water, and maybe have the spawns change depending on whether you hit certain checkpoints. So 
it, it almost makes it more like a 5 CP map, right? So, um, instead we would have four checkpoints, uh, or, or actually, let me think about this. It is, it would be like a 5 CP map. So the second point would become the middle capture. First point is like the second of blue team. The, the blue base is like their last. Third point is like the second of red team and, uh, the last point uh, is like red's last. And so it, the cart spawns on the second cap and then both teams go to fight for it and push it forward as much as they can. And if they do reach a checkpoint, they get a forward spawn. Their spawn changes like it would if you got a capture point on 5 CP. This would, uh, I think this would be a cool version of Badwater or, or a version that you could start experimenting with. And maybe this could be part of the, the Badwater update is they could call it like CPL bad water, which is like capture payload, you know, a, 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 a hodgepodge mix of the 5 CP game mode and the payload game mode. Uh, bad water being the first map that is uh, used as a demonstration of this style. And we do it, we do have the, the issue of asymmetry, which we can talk about more later. We can find solutions to who knows, it might even be balanced. I don't know, it's probably not true. You probably need to extend certain parts of the map so there is more area they have to push or less area they have to push because I don't know if that area from second to red last is as equal as it is from second to to blue last I don't think it is because I think that distance between Badwater first and second point is very short compared to the, the distances between second and third and third and fourth right so there is a slight blue team advantage by default but again you could sort of stretch out the map or, or, or do some things to try to make it as balanced as possible um because I do think it would be fun to still have it be asymmetrical and balanced. And, and maybe you can have some thing where you switch switch sides or something like this. You know, I, I think that would be cool. And maybe that can be built in into the CPL game mode is that it's 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 the uh, maybe the 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 best of three or something or best of two and uh, with a deciding match. But but make sure everybody has a fair chance to play on each side, defend from each side and you know start from each side. Something like this. My other solution to 5 CP Badwater, sorry, Payload Badwater, which might not be, uh, yeah, six is Payload Competitive Badwater, which which might not be perfect, is to just put more uh, more players on the field, or to um, physically scale the map down. So um, th this could be interesting. PL Badwater Miniature, uh, perhaps keeping the 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 cart size the same, so it's not like goofily small, but scaling down the rest of the map sort of in proportion. Um, so that now the you know the cart is just relatively bigger and the the whole map is smaller. This could this could solve some of those speed issues, right? And the problem of not always having enough people to shoot while you're up. Um, you could lower respawn times in, in that case as well. Just sort of fairly for everyone respawn. You know, have it be instant respawn for blue, and then you know however much time you cut off the blue respawn time, cut that off of the red respawn time as well. So there's still. A longer respawn on red on PL Badwater 6 is competitive mode, but it's less than it would be because everybody has less respawn time because we want to keep players alive because the player fights are more interesting than the uh, than the payload pushing. It, it is interesting. Um, so that uh, it, it could also be fun to do a, a double sixes match, two sixes teams. Uh, against each other on payload, but you now do run the problem where you're basically playing uh, 12v12 pub or something starting to weirdly perversely resemble Highlander where you just have way more players on the field. Which does speak to the fact that P Badwater was designed as a 12v12 map. It was designed to have 24 players in a server, not 12. Which is really the biggest roadblock that uh, payload has going for it. The funny thing is that when Valve makes payload maps for 24 people and they are really fucking fun for 24 people, they're not as fun for 12 people. They're not as fun for sixes. And in that same light, when Valve makes 5 CP maps and they're kind of fun for 24 people, um, I think I think 5 CP maps have can sometimes just be the worst to play in pubs. They just don't play out well. It's either extremely stalemate or it's a huge roll and nobody knows where they're going, it seems to be. Um, 
So they make that for 24 people, it's not really a great success. But then with 12 people, and in competitive, it's really fun, right? So you have this weird thing where they're always designing the game for 24 people. When it's really fun, it's good for pubs, probably not so good for competitive. When it's not so fun, it might not be good for pubs, and might actually be very good for competitive. So you have this weird inverse correlation. Now, um, as part of the Badwater update that I proposed earlier, it would be excellent to see, uh, you know... Uh, re reinterpretations of Badwater, perhaps a very different version of the map that is um, created for 6v6. Um, so has those same iconic geographic elements and, and sort of favorite spots of Badwater, but in a much more approachable size, like payload maps designed for a really small number of players. I, th I think that could be a, a, cool, a cool move and a, a cool way to see a version of the map that is PL underscore Badwater 6s, you know, a 6s compatible uh, Six's designed, Six's intended version of PL Badwater. Please put that on your Christmas wish list this year. It sure will be on mine. So, uh, something that I have thought about a good amount of time and wondered is, will Badwater be a lost map? Because it's a payload map. Um, we just talked a lot about sort of the limits of Badwater being a payload map and of probably payload maps in general and their translation to competitive modes, for example. Um, but when we think of uh, Dust Bowl and, uh, and Two Fort, I think, I think Two Fort got lucky, really, in its translation I, I, from Team Fortress Classic to Team Fortress 2. I think, I think for whatever reason, it, it, it's probably the only reason that Capture the Flag exists in TF2. I think if they... I think if they tested... CTF, I think if they tested all the game modes in TF2 really rigorously um, and, and TF2 had been out for a while in some sort of beta, I don't think they would have gone with CTF as a game mode at all really, especially if 2 Fort didn't exist, but I think because there was this really obvious classic Capture the Flag style map from their previous, the predecessor, the spiritual predecessor game of Team Fortress 2, it makes sense that 2 Fort was added. and. Uh, was not forgotten, right? We're thinking about the legacy of maps and living their potential to live across games. And so I'm I'm gunning for and really pl placing my bets on Badwater somehow being ported to the spiritual predecessor of Team Fortress 2. Um, whether that be an, a, a new Valve game, whether that be a, a new game by a different studio, um, I, I don't know the legality behind that, or whether it being a pro mod made by the community that... Uh, sort of replaces Team Fortress 2. I want to see Badwater uh, continue on in some shape and form, and so I'm a little worried about it because uh, it's not a... Uh, it's a payload map, which is which is my main concern. Will Badwater being a payload map make it uh, lost uh, in, in transferring over to the next game, the sequel of Team Fortress 2, spiritually or literally, right? Because Dust Bowl was transferred from Team Fortress Classic, it, it was a it was a capture point game mode, and I think I think if we know anything about the sequel to Team Fortress 2, again, whether literally sequel or spiritually sequel, made by someone else or or just in the same uh, kind of feeling that Team Fortress 2 has, there will be capture points, no doubt. I would be very surprised to have a payload based game mode where that's sort of the main element. It was sort of interesting slash weird to see. Uh, Overwatch by Blizzard have payload carts as such an obvious inspiration and part of the game, right? Um, but I, I think, may, you know, maybe people can agree with this or not agree with this, but that, um, and maybe they balanced it better in Overwatch, but I, th I think capture points are where it's at. And, uh, I, you know, for better or worse, capture points are the most universal part of TF2. There's a lot of good pub maps that have capture points. There's a lot of good Highlander maps, good Sixes maps, Ulti Duo, a 2v2 game mode is built around a capture point, right? There's this sense that you can uh, have any number of players on the field, and as long as capture points are the means to get the objective, it's still very fun, right? Um, you can play capture points with two versus two players, right? And 12 versus 12 players, but you can't play payload with two versus two players. It just doesn't work. It falls apart. Um, the same maybe can be said for capture the flag, right? Which is why it's, it might not be an excellent mode. Um, you can play King of the Hill with 2v2 players because it is a capture point mode 
uh, fundamentally, you know, attack, defend, king of the hill, 5 CP, these are all capture point game modes at, at their very core. And because of that, they are, to some degree, you know, uh, modes that are more compatible with uh, any variety of players, which is important because uh, unless you're going to lock the game down like Overwatch to the, there's only, you know, less people on the field, um, to make it a game like TF2 that has that element that you can play 2v2, you can play 6v6, you can play 9v9, you can play 12v12, you can play 16 versus 16, right? To have all of those things as options to you, which I would say are important options in an essential aspect of what makes Team Fortress 2 fun, you want game modes that you can, uh, that support all of those different levels, right? And maybe this means too, that there, 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 there would need to be an alternative um, to payload that is more, you know, like a small version of payload that's more 6v6 friendly. Because now I'm thinking of ulti duo maps and how they're generally smaller to support two versus two players, but there's still a capture point, right? You could still potentially get away with doing King of the Hill 2v2. It's, there's just a lot of negative space time and going, where's the enemy? But it works. I, I think uh, better than, than Payload does, and I love Payload. Payload's my favorite pub game mode. Badwater is my favorite map. I will endorse Badwater relentlessly and pathologically and irrationally for a very long time, I, I believe. Um, which is why I'm worried that it being a Payload map is going to interfere with it uh, passing its genes on to the next game, you know? There being uh, something analogous to how 2 Ford and Dust Bowl uh, are really the children of maps that existed on Team Fortress Classic. So, I'm wondering if Badwater has, you know, uh, uh, has a, a reason to be transformed into other game modes, which I think could certainly help its longevity. I think that would be a good move. Um, I it, We've seen Valve do it with other maps. Why haven't we seen them do it with Badwater? There's CP Badlands, there's Koth Badlands, there's Arena Badlands, there's CTF Sawmill and Koth Sawmill and Arena Sawmill. And why is there no uh, different versions of Badwater, you know? We we got the reskins, they have Bloodwater, and there's Badwater Rainy and Badwater Snowy. But where is CTF Badwater? Where is CP Badwater? Where's this new CPL game mode I'm talking about? A 5 CP version of Payload, which... Uh, I think would solve those problems I'm talking about. Would would make Badwater a fun game, even if there's only four people in the server. Even though you don't want four people in the server, but it would definitely make it a fun game if there's six versus six people in the server, which is something I have been focusing on here in this part of the discussion, wanting to make Badwater a viable game mode for competitive six v six, and maybe even four v four. It could have viability, assuming the spawn times are correct. Because the good thing about even a five CP map is that. Uh, because of the way the spawns change, uh, you, it lowers the amount of time that you have to walk every time you cap a point. And that is true with Payload, but I would say the, the walks are longer with Payload and it only works in the favor of one team, right? So when you first spawn on the red team, there's a very long walk you have to take. And there's pretty much always a very long walk you have to take as red team. That's, that's what's going on on Badwater. And Badwater's been around for a really long time. It's pretty crazy to sit and admire its age and how well it's done for itself, you know? Badwater came out in 2008. It's been 13 years, almost. We're, we're getting there in a, in, a, in a couple months. It will have been 13 years that Badwater's been alive. It'll, be, it'll become a teenager, right? There are people playing the game that are younger than Badwater. There are people that will play Badwater that are younger than Badwater, which is remarkable. It's uh, it's pretty rare that a map lasts so long, you know? We only see it in these, uh, these really long lasting franchises. Like, you know, I could, I, I think about Dust and Counter-Strike, right? Dust Bowl, Two Fort, and these maps have been around so long because they were adopted from other games. And it's sort of bizarre and miraculous that Team Fortress 2 has lasted as long as it has. Uh, 
in, in, in its amount of longevity, right, um, if you compare it to Counter-Strike Source, which came out just a bit before it, um, in, in, the, in the grand scheme of things, Counter-Strike Source feels so aged uh, compared to it if you play it today. And, you know, what was eventually replaced by Counter-Strike Global Offensive, um, which I guess we're now looking at a similar age for some of those maps where we're, we're, everything's approaching that 10-year mark. So on one hand, we are in this strange world where due to computer technology and the video game maps that we play, they can last a very long time because the 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 game world that we play in the simulation can be upgraded in a variety of ways but a place quintessentially um doesn't necessarily need to be upgraded it it uh we can increase the resolution of its textures and uh the details of its props right but it's still the same place it's still and, and, and the place itself doesn't need to evolve, you know? We're not at a point, at a point culturally where we need an architectural revolution, you know? The, the types of buildings and structures you see in Badwater um, are not aged, just as, you know, the Empire State Building is not aged. And most, uh, you know... Most buildings, probably, if, if you're living in a city, are not very aged in their sense of style. They may be aged physically, but even even sort of a classical Roman architecture with arches and coliseums and such, it's still a very captivating place to be and is the center of tremendous tourism because even though its style is perhaps obviously old, it's not... Um, necessarily perceived as lower quality it's just sort of a style that um has gone out of fashion in some ways or was of particularly more fashion in the times and so i think we can really say the same for any of badwater's uh style because uh likely the style that it is going for is a, a style of maybe the the 60s or 70s or 50s or something like this judging from all of the uh, the commercialist artwork, the the brand posters you see across the map, um, and the style of machinery you see around, uh, the train that you see around. There's there's a sense of early computers, early primitive technology, um, but certainly not laptops, right? Certainly not slim computer screens or anything like this seen in Badwater yet. So, even in spite of that, it's. Uh, it's still cool, you know? Badwater can be cool forever because it was always meant to have that style. It wasn't going for futuristic, right? And it's it's often the depictions of, of futurism that will become dated, right? If we think about the 80s or even the, the sort of sci-fi futurism ob obsessions of the 2000s, of The Matrix, of System Shock and Deus Ex and... Uh, uh, you know, Blade Runner, these types of things, they are the ones that will ironically seem more dated in the future for their attempt to predict a, uh, a, a future which is not what the future will be like, inevitably. You know, nobody's that good at predicting it. And that being said, some of that futurist stuff, the more accurate it is, the, the better it will be because it is inevitably going to be compared to how the future actually turns out. Cough, cough, deus ex. Uh... So Badwater being an homage to the past is timeless because it will never have that same sense of inaccuracy. A prediction of the future um, can seem silly once the future arrives, but an homage to the past um, will always stay as holy because the past will continue to be in the past and far away. So in this way, it is very... There is a reverent aspect to Badwater being set in a time period that has already passed that should allow it to remain a formidable force in the, the 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 battle of ideas the battle of maps that we uh will experience in this modern day gaming environment uh, speaking in terms of bad water and the bad water update i would i'm always a big fan of the idea of uh different game entities different uh 
you know, different franchises collaborating together. I would love to see um, an Apex Legends uh, Team Fortress 2 crossover update. I would love to see a Smash Bros Team Fortress 2 crossover update. But I think in terms of feasibility, well, uh, why could we not see a Counter-Strike Go TF2 crossover update? And in that update, I would like to see PL Badwater adopted in some way to be a Counter-Strike map. And uh, conversely, I would like to see a famous Counter-Strike map, perhaps Mirage, let's say, um, added to uh, the Team Fortress 2 pool. Um, and obviously, you, you do what you do to make those maps fit within the different game. But I think that would be a very cool collab and uh, breaking the walls of the universe because you can do it, especially when you own both games. And even if you don't, um, I think you should add the Spy to Smash Bros. Uh, why not? I don't see the problem with this. And uh, the Apex Legends ones, uh, okay, I understand. It's a little more far-fetched. Maybe Fortnite would be okay with it because I know they're, uh, they're very keen to put anything in their game that makes them money. And it, the meme power of Team Fortress 2 is strong when harnessed. It, it has yet to be harnessed with considerable uh, financial leverage, and I think the results of that will be deadly. Um, Badwater being a powerful tool that can be at the front end of that, uh, that uh, you know, spiky, thorny, needle-fronted uh, truck from hell killing machine that would be... Um, Team Fortress 2 finally having its, its ultimate uprising and uh, annihilation, conglomeration, and uh, subsumation of the mainstream culture. So, Badwater, despite having four points, uh, which can be separated into, into four sort of distinct sub-maps, really does feel like one cohesive experience. If you're not able to play all four points, it feels that you've missed out, right? To join into a capture point map halfway through can be slightly frustrating in that uh, you won't you won't have been able to experience the mid fight. Uh, but the thing is, once the round restarts, there'll be another mid fight, you know. And there's there's more of an aspect to a 5 CP map of it being something that repeats, right? It's not normal to think of a 5 CP map like well, you run through it once and then that's it. Whereas on on Badwater, that is more normal. Uh, you do have this exception that you want to run through it once on offense, and you want to run through it once on defense, but there is this idea on Badwater that I run through it once, it's it's that's pretty much over. I'm, I'm getting what I'm getting. It's a story. It's a front-to-back experience. It's not a single that you repeat five times, you know? And so, uh, you've I've heard it before, about, uh, Payload being praised for its sort of storytelling aspect in this, um, but the the thing I like about it is just that you get uh, really different areas, but that you get time to focus on each one of them. Because in a, in a 5 CP map, which might be much more fast-paced, there is this sort of slow molasses level push throughout a payload map, or recession, uh, receding back into a payload map if you're on the red team, right? Due to the, you know, the rate of the cap... Uh, the times three limit on the cart and all of the players and the amount of distance you have to push the cart uh, It can only go on for so long and that aspect of it is actually quite quite nice because it gives you time to really Absorb and start strategizing each part of the map because when you're constantly being pushed around a 5 CP map You don't necessarily have as much time to think about uh, And really absorb and 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 have numerous lives to keep trying taking Approaching the same area again and again until you chip through that and then you keep chipping at the next area until you get through that And then you chip at that again, and uh, there's something quite satisfying about that because you, you There's more it feels like there's a lot more weight to getting through each point, you know compared to a, uh, a 5 CP map, I would say uh, It to go the distance all the way to reaching the next capture point and then get it there's a lot more investment involved than just running to the capture point and standing on it for five seconds or ten seconds or however long it takes, depending on what your capture rate is. And I think the investment that you feel is all all the type of thing that makes the, the win or loss much more satisfying on Badwater. But of course, as we get into this sort of discussion where it seems that I'm really just 
explaining away the, the payload game mode in comparison to 5CP, you have to wonder, okay, but what sets Badwater apart from the other payload maps? And the, only, the, the answer is, well, what, what makes uh, Badwater similar to the other payload maps? What's similar about it? That's what I want to know. You're asking me what's different? What's similar? And I'll tell you, it's not a lot. It's the, it's the track. It's that you have a payload that you push. I can already tell you it's very different from Gold Rush and Thunder Mountain because those have three stages. That's, that's a huge difference. It's, di it's different to a lot of the payload maps because only uh, Hoodoo and Gold Rush and Rest in Peace Cactus Canyon have a similar aesthetic, a similar environmental art style as Badwater. I would say that uh, there, there are certain point parts of Badwater that are extremely unique, that there isn't a place like that on any other map. You have this big long tunnel that I think is very unique. You do have a tunnel to some extent that goes under on upward, but it's uh, nowhere near as narrow and claustrophobic, uh, which is, you know, a perk. And, and you do have, uh, you know, narrow and claustrophobic areas on junction, but never such an obvious, wow, that's a long ass damn tunnel. And you got that on Badwater. You have this uh, really complex behind the uh, behind the second point roof flank area uh, with with all these crates and boxes and and these different rooms you can jump between and this sort of big open space that's really auxiliary to the main point and I can't think of any other payload map that has such a big again quote unquote auxiliary flank area that you don't really need to deal with but you have the option to deal with like it's such a it's such a huge space back there just sort of connected to the side of the second point. Like, you really don't need to spend your time in most of that area, even if you're just trying to take the roof, right? But you, you do have the freedom, and so I think that area is extremely distinct. Um, when it comes to the, the Badwater last, I think this is one of the most iconic areas for a new player on Badwater. You know, the first time that you play Badwater, I think one of the things that you might remember the most is this sort of final area in this big ramp uphill to where the track is or downhill depending on, wh on which team you know which side you're looking from and into this big bomb site that's sort of like this big recessed part of of the map like the whole thing is sort of sunken in you know and uh you do have s similar areas in some payload maps but i think the uh the the sort of Coliseum like vibe that you have there is quite interesting where you have that center area where the the payload bomb falls down but then it's sort of surrounded by upper uh, upper scaffolding upper uh, sort of terrace railway areas and uh, the map room and the spawn rooms and all these all these different high ground places um, where it's it's uh, it's low ground but it's uh it's not so obviously disadvantageous, which is um, a, a definitely a special type of area that I, I can't think of anything too similar in any of the other payload maps. I uh, I like the the height of the skybox. I think you I think upward has a similarly high skybox, but I don't think upward has as many f fun wall surfaces to jump off of. If you think of that huge ass slab of concrete. That is just that big building around the first and second point. Um, right by the first capture point, all that big concrete high wall. And between the first and second point, that um, long choke with that huge concrete wall. Leaving first, sp leaving spawn as a blue player and just hugging that right wall and having that huge wall. There's so many nice big, big walls to use for jumping. Uh, which again, you have open space. And, uh, and, and jumping potential and high skyboxes on a map like Upward, but I don't think the walls are anywhere near as nice or compatible for crazy rocket jumping pogos and, and such. I really like that about it. I think uh, even comparing it to something like, uh, like Thunder Mountain and Gold Rush, I like that instead of it being one of many... Uh, stages you just have one sort of big experience um, because I think it's actually it, it's to the map's detriment having multiple stages because 
it can be difficult for, for people to, to distinguish between them and to uh, explain to their friends which part of Thunder Mountain they're talking about or which stage because even the stages are not super clearly stated as oh stage one stage two stage three most people don't know these I don't know these and I've played the game a tremendous amount of time so I think that's a a big downside for the celebrity factor of a map like Thunder Mountain or like Gold Rush and if we compare it to a map like Barn Blitz for instance which I would say maybe is, is spiritually closer to Badwater than Upward is I think uh, I think Barn Blitz is just a bit too small and too cramped I I do like that there is this big house area by the third point with lots of a huge variation in elevation you know with lots of different levels lots of stairwells to go up um, certainly inspired by Badwater I would say Upward certainly inspired by Badwater as well because Badwater did uh, come before both of those maps However, uh, the, the secret sauce of Badwater is, is just slightly better, and maybe we won't even know how to explain it, but I think it has a lot to do with the net experience of all the classes on it. Um, whereas I can think of a lot of classes that are, are less fun to play, or more fun to play on Upward, I think because there's so many areas where you can fall off the map on Upward, where as there are none on Badwater, it's going to immediately benefit Pyro, benefit classes with explosive capabilities that can push you off with their projectiles They're gonna not benefit everyone else who can fall right I think it's uh, I think it's uh, very sniper advantageous which is um, not so good for non sniper players and I I, I think uh, when you finally take into account all these things I think that the last is harder to push it's it's stronger with the engineers on the high ground um, it, it can be almost impossible to push sometimes. Um, and I think not not for as fun a reason as Badwater is impossible to push. Whereas Badwater has more to do with coordination and the amount of areas that you're controlling. I feel like on Upward it just has to do with the fact that I'm trying to shoot, shoot sentries above me across the map. You know, it, um, whereas with, with competency the sentries on, um, on Badwater should be e easy to deal with. And it is something to be said that uh, even when you take down the sentries on Badwater, it doesn't necessarily guarantee a win that you're going to take it all the way to the end. Um, and I think uh, I think Badwater maybe has more in common with Upper than we consider. Maybe a lot of its goodness is just the similarity between Badwater and Upward, and that they're they're definitely both. Uh, you know, favorites of the community to some extent. They're both played pretty religiously in Highlander. They both have um, a, a good amount of complex uh, elevation differences and, and side paths and tunnels. And uh, I, th I think r realistically one of the... Uh, like, I, I think Badwater you can almost put on a spectrum in between Upward and Gold Rush, where... Gold Rush is very focused on tight spaces, probably a little too much, and Upward is very focused on open spaces um, and ledges and no railing a little too much. Um, and, and I think they're both really fun. I love Gold Rush and I, I love Upward, but um, I think Badwater has this sort of sweet spot of both where you have some really open areas, but then you have some, some good building area to navigate in between um, as well. And... Uh, and there's always enough enough flank options, enough paths that you can take as well, I think, that keep it very uh, interesting and engaging. Badwater, surviving so many years and still being played day in, day out by Team Fortress 2 players is just absolutely a testament to its uh, its genius, you know, in its design, that the, the, the initial brains behind Badwater we're being very careful with what they did. I will remind you that another map that came out in that same update that had PL Badwater released, the heavy update in 2008, was, interestingly enough, in, in, in that August, was CP Steel, which is a very complex map um, in terms of capture points and attacking and defending. Probably the most, uh, you know, absolutely the most complex attack and defend style map and a really complex, ornate map in general. And the reason I bring that up is because I think this was the most uh, the most technical phase of Valve's development, 
where the maps they were making, they were aiming for complexity and attention to detail and scale, I think, were all things that they were focused on. They were very ambitious. You saw some of this ambition before with maps like CP Well, which was shipped with the game's launch, where it's, it is very large and um, sort of epic in that way, but it, th a lot of its uh, detail is sort of blank and geometric and uninteresting. It, it doesn't feel very high resolution despite being so large in comparison to a map like Badwater, which I think has that same epicness, that same grandiosity, that same sense of scale that uh, that CP map uh, well would have but it manages to be much more uh, complex, much more complex physically, because when you just have a big flat open area, it's not only gonna uh, create a huge advantage for some classes, it's just less fun for everyone. I talked a lot about uh, Spy on Badwater and the Spy's advantages of having multiple elevations that they can jump down to if they are on high ground, which is a, an awesome option to have. It's a great option for Spy because Spy can go invisible and switch to one of those positions. But it's equally as good an option for all of the other classes on Battlewater because you can go invisible and... Uh, no, I'm sorry. You can only go invisible as Spy on Battlewater, which they should be patched. But as the other classes, you don't need to go invisible. There's still enough time to confuse someone with, hey, am I jumping down uh, all the way down or am I jumping down to this ledge slightly below me or am I jumping down to this little cliff, this little, you know, uh, down slope where I'm going to try to hug the wall and slowly go down. Badwater gives you many different uh, positional choices, which are going to be useful as any class, which is always going to be more fun than fighting on a flat ground, no matter who, which class you are. Because even though a flat ground is more fun to fight on, or I should say more beneficial to fight on as a soldier, you're going to kick ass with a flat ground as a soldier, it's actually just not as fun in how you position yourself against your opponents. Um, which I think is the thing that Badwater really picked up on when the Valve developers learned their mistakes from Gold Rush, is that, okay, a choke point is, is fun and necessary, um, but the, the problem with it is that when it's the only place you can go, it doesn't feel like when you're being killed, it's very deliberate. And this is not a very rewarding experience as a player. And so when you give more options, when you give more routes, more paths that people can take, more elevation choices, right? These, these aren't even paths, but when you, when you have a, a, a map like laid out the way that Badwater First is, where there's all these rocks that you can climb up on, it feels more deliberate when people are killing you. Um, if you are up on those rocks, it also makes harder for people to kill you if they are just sort of playing undeliberately themselves, right? You are protecting yourself from the vulnerability of, of splash damage in these chokes if you are using the environment creatively to your advantage rather than just being... You, you can still kind of be in the area but be on some rocks or be on the payload cart or be on this little ledge. All of these excellent details that are uh, s sprinkled throughout bad water in a plentiful amount can be utilized to make sure that you can be in a high action zone um, but not being punished and killed by people who are just randomly spamming into that area which I, I think is, is certainly one of the largest complaints and frustrations with a place like Gold Rush. Now when I think of Badwater I often wonder what kind of famous TF2 celebrities uh, would have to say and think and how much they enjoy Badwater. I think the biggest question here w really would be who likes the Badwater least out of uh, famous TF2 players. I'm pretty sure, uh, you know, the oldest school, if we go back to Star and Germa, I, I really think they would both appreciate Badwater. I think one of the uh, Star and Germa is mad. Part 7, Germa gets shot with Huntsman. Uh, from Blind Angles by Elite Gamer Star is set on Badwater, which uh, does tell you that uh, it's a it's a great place for action and for comedy. One of my videos, Team Fortress Deluxe, which if you've if you've been listening to me this long, I urge you to go check out if you have not seen already. I promise it won't take you as long as this has. Team Fortress Deluxe 
uh, was sort of a machinima video that I created on Bad Water Rainy. And Bad Water Rainy was an extremely inspiring map. Um, I didn't even really have to make the video. I just showed up and it felt like I was possessed by some kind of spirit. The Perhaps the, the deities behind Badwater were speaking through me, using the map and my skills as a video creator to, uh, to, to say some things that they needed to say to the general population and the general Team Fortress 2 community. That would be my uh, impression from what happened on that video, Team Fortress Deluxe, which was set on PL Badwater Rainy. If we move on to sort of the what I consider the new gen of TF2 YouTubers, they're probably the old school now to whatever the newest new gen is. And we think about people like uh, like Funk and Uncle Dane and uh, Muselk. Um, I assume all these players enjoy Badwater. Um, and the thing about Stabby too, even if we just consider their mains, because Badwater is such a great map that you can really think about almost half the classes at least and be like, oh, well, if you main that class, of course you like Badwater. Are you Muselk? Are you a soldier player? Of course you like Badwater. Do you like rocket jumping? Of course you like Badwater. There's so many great places that you can rocket jump. I, I know the third point and fourth point can be a, a little tougher, but the first and second point are like jumping paradise, you know, and, and having that really excessive flank area in the second point behind the rooftop is super jumper friendly for people to be going way too far behind. And I think just having a big map in general is very jumper friendly because you can get way behind the lines and just come back at your own leisure you know you can use all that all that space the huge size of the map to buy yourself t some time before the next fight happens let yourself recuperate uh, strategize again just have some some steam off you before you jump back in and try to go for a market garden kill or, wh or whatever it is you're trying to do maybe land some pipes on a sentry as a uh, more jumping oriented player and uh, Uncle Dane, an engineer player, of course, there's so much to do on Bad Water. Um, specifically, as a defensive player, I believe Bad Water uh, has been a home to an Uncle Dane video as well, where Uncle Dane talks about some of his favorite sentry spots and his sort of. He gives a map review of the engineer metas and how one can play Bad Water as an engineer. Because it is a, a plentiful Bad Water map. It, is a, it, it has so many options of where you can put your sentry, um, your teleporter as well, and your dispenser. And I think it's important, um, an engineer really is a backbone of the team on Badwater in that if your engineer is underperforming, if they are inefficient, um, not getting their buildings up as quick as they can, it is absolutely affecting their team's performance because sentries are, are so critical to holding the flow of the game and it is on the allies of your players on Badwater to protect your sentry you know and, and play around uh, where your team has positional advantages to sustain them right and to play off of when people are distracted by your sentry to pick them off right it's protecting your sentry and it's also helping you get the pick the fact that the sentry's there as this great distraction and on the other hand, if you're on the enemy team, it's uh, it's certainly in your in your uh, best interest to be taking out the engineer. So the engineer is a very like pivotal part of this game um, that that we call Team Fortress 2, and very 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 specifically on Badwater. And I, and I think the the sentry positions as well are, are in general um, more game impacting, at least in the first half of the map, than on upward. Let's say. I think Upward is this weird map where, like, sentry positions, um, for the most part, are, are pretty easy to deal with until the last point. Because if you think about the meta places people put their sentry on the first point, on the second point, on the third point, they're almost all in these places where... It's only a problem if you just like completely peek the corner, but they're almost always around a corner where you can just continue peeking it, spam rockets, and it's done, right? Or even from high ground, you can kill it. Um, if you think about the meta spot to kind of put it underneath that little shack on first point by the medium health pack, just jump up to the top of the shack as a soldier and just shoot rockets below you. You don't have to take any damage. It's really easy to take out, right? If we think about it on that, uh, that second point, where they're going to build it kind of right by where they leave the spawn area. 
you can go up into that upper room that looks down below it and just shoot rockets down on it. It's it's pretty pretty easy. So the and then you have this sort of fucked up last on upward, but it the engineer is definitely more important on um, on Badwater for holding first and second. I think I think for holding second it's so important, whereas just the nature of upward being so uh, having to go upward so much, right? If you think about between the first and second point on upward, so much of the difficulty is pushing a cart up a hill where people can just shoot down on you, and. Uh, it's not about the centuries being difficult. It's it's about the the more the the geography of the map itself than it is where the centuries um, can be used advantageously. So I would definitely think Uncle Dane prefers playing Badwater Engineer uh, to Upward Engineer. That's just my fan theory, Matt Pat game theory fan favorite opinion. Um, you can repeat that in the comments. You can leave comments on Uncle Dane's videos. And I wouldn't stop you. If we move on to think about uh, Funk, I don't really know what class Funk mains. I've, I have seen Funk videos. I, I don't really know what class he mains. I'm going to assume they're like a soldier or a scout player because I feel like that's kind of the, the default. 50% of all TF2 players are a soldier or scout main, right? Maybe 60%. I hope so. Ooh, shots fired. Ah. Uh, the regardless i mean the guy he makes long videos about tf2 and who would make a long video about tf2 if they didn't like bad water and i know what you're thinking casual that's a very unsubstantiated claim um but i would consider you to reconsider your consideration about it being unsubstantiated because why would i make that claim um you know maybe maybe we are in a universe where the people who are uh compelled to make very long videos like very long like you know over an hour like maybe even i don't know like 10 or 12 hours long would uh be interested in bad water i it's possible that evidence will come out in in positive correlation with that i'm just going to say it now i know I, as i'm recording this there there is no evidence for that yet but i have a strong hunch about it and i think that that uh information is very compelling if if uh if the evidence did come out it would make you reconsider how unsubstantiated my opinion is that Funk would like Badwater because they make long videos about TF2. Uh, I'm sure Lazy Purple loves Badwater as well. Um, because you know that Lazy Purple thinks that TF2 is a timeless masterpiece. And what's one of the most timeless parts about uh, TF2 is definitely Badwater. You could say it's Dust Bowl and Two for it as well. Um... But uh, Lazy Purple, being a student of the game and someone who studies and plays all of the classes except for Medic, I'm sure he realizes that uh, Team Fortress 2 is, you know, it's uh, like the bad water is the map for all the classes to have a good time. I'm sure he realizes that, and I bet if you watch all of his How It Feels videos, I'm sure every one of those videos references uh, bad water. I just have a feeling about it. I don't know for sure, but... Sometimes you get a feeling, you get optimistic. Maybe, you know how sometimes people get a little silly when they, like, drink alcohol or take drugs? I think I get a little silly when I take bad water and, uh, and I play on it and I think about it. That's what makes me get a little silly. So if I say anything that sounds a little weird, remember, it's, it's not me talking, it's the, it's the bad water. Um... If Badwater could talk, I do wonder what it would say, what some sort of sentient AI built off of the, the essence of Badwater would be, right? Um, the ruminations of a map like Payload Badwater, I'm sure would be very uh, centrally focused on the nervous system of the map, which is, of course, the payload cart, right? This long spine that uh, trajects itself through the entire map and is a source of life. Um, and you could say, um, because Badwater probably does not have a circulatory system or a pulmonary system, uh, pulmonary is probably not the term I was looking for, it, uh, it breathes life into people through the payload card. It's kind of like an all-in-one, like the payload card is like a nervous system and a respiratory system and a circulatory system. Because it's just sort of like a simple organism, you know, it's rudimentary. Probably also we could say um, it only needs a nervous system because it's a computer. Badwater is a is a robot, you know, in terms of like is Badwater a rock or a, a plant or meat? 
or, or, or person. It is certainly more on the cybernetic side of things. And Bad Water's, uh, you know, because it, it, it is sort of mechanistic and it is a robot, it is, it is a computer game, like it was coded on computers, Bad Water only exists in the computer world so far, and maybe we'll, we'll touch on that later so far, help, uh, you know, help fund my projects and we'll be uh, aiming towards the common goal of a real-life PL Badwater uh, theme park, a Team Fortress 2 based theme park based on Badwater. Um, it's a big idea I would really like to help come into fruition, get together with the guys from Valve and, and uh, make a real fun place everyone can go hang out in uh, Bellevue, Washington right after they view uh, Valve headquarters. Anyhow, uh, we might have to relocate that idea anywhere to somewhere closer to Badwater Basin. Um, just because it would be themed, and uh, maybe actually it's more likely to be in Arizona, because I think even though they called it Badwater Basin, I, I think Death Valley is actually extremely flat, um, which may not uh, r resemble. You know, it's not a it's not good for gameplay, as we discussed earlier when we talked about all the nice rock formations on Badwater. And uh, we we do want to make sure that the 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 gameplay on Badwater is, is optimal for translating it to a real life environment. We could play real life laser tag on my uh, my real life version of Badwater I'm going to build with the Valve developers. I think it could be fun. We could play paintball as well. Um, yeah, lasers are more futuristic, I suppose, but less painful. But we can in the future we'll have neural link, and you know we'll have all these ways to 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 get zapped and feel the pain from being shot by a uh, by a laser. Um, you know, a laser tag laser. It will it will hit your sensors and send a little seismic pulse through your body to show that you were backstabbed on PL Badwater, right, or whatever, or you were shot at the scattergun. Um, and it's important to mention that because Badwater is, you know, more cybernetic than it is flesh, as I've mentioned. Uh, because it is in, in a computer game and it was made on computers and all of these types of things, and so I, I do think its thoughts would be quite cold and inhumane um, if we were able to hear them or if it were able to uh, generate thoughts at all. Um, n not to say that this is a problem, because uh, what what is our attachment to humanity but an idea, right? Um, on on some level, we believe we are human, but what does it really mean to be human? And I know for some, this is quite a deep idea, but to me, it's actually quite shallow because um, h human, like anything else, is just a uh, is just a, a concept, and of course, it means something to be a human and to be male and to be uh, short and to be intelligent and to be creative and to uh, be a father and to have purpose and to be a son. All of these things have different meanings and they are real in some sense, yes, but on a bigger sense, um, the murkiness and, and confusing aspect of existing and whatever quote-unquote consciousness is, right, which is really just another way to describe quote-unquote existing and the fact that you're experiencing whatever the hell you're experiencing at all right now. Um, it's uh, the fact that you are experiencing that, you know, is has nothing to do with human, you know, the because you don't, it's uh, it's hard to, you know, what is for it for it to be distinctly human? You have to have something, an experience of yours distinctly non-human. You can compare it to, and you've only experienced all that you've ever known, right? So what's to say this is human or not human? You know, when you have nothing to compare it to. Uh, otherwise, to speculate what other people experience. It's easy to understand externally what might seem human or not human. But this is, alas, a subjective experience of reality. And so, uh, for all we know, Badwater may be just as human as we are. And I suppose what I've slowly done is uh, unpacked, unrolled, and picked apart and burned my previous point. That uh, to say Badwater's thoughts would be inhumane or humane either way is equally irrelevant. Um, because uh, the, the the quality of, of its feelings and thoughts could really, we could only fairly judge them if we were able to experience them as our own, which may be possible by playing Badwater. And I would urge you to continue playing Badwater, and and in hopes that its its spirit will be channeled through you, and that you, you as, as a sort of a extension of its consciousness you will feed off of it and understand it. You know, this idea that you are, you are really an antenna 
um, that that's you know your body is a receiver of uh, electromagnetic information among other types of information and that just by being in the same room with somebody you are picking up on certain information unconsciously and that there are invisible vibrations going on in the air that you you cannot see and that there are there are invisible waves you know literally uh, communicating information from device to device all around you and that um, there are many layers to reality which cannot be seen I should warn you and Badwater, um, w when we play it, um, it changes our reality. And so there's something to be said that it may be interfering and shaping and maybe even being the source of our reality in some weird way. And that all we are doing is being a conduit, something that, uh, something that channels and expresses a greater archetype, a greater idea, a more divine core concept. This definitely gets into God territory. But it's all fair game on Badwater, is it not? Um, if anything, I believe Badwater would be a place to restore faith, then uh, a place to diminish it. Um, as we understand that uh, it does remind us that there is, there is good that has been created in this world that perhaps is greater than we understand. And I'm sure, as anyone would understand, who's made something they feel is very good, there is a strange um, sort of uh, valid spiritual Stockholm syndrome that one must undergo of, uh, sorry, imposter syndrome that one must undergo in being in disbelief that they were able to make this thing. Because for as much as their intention may be in the right place, the, the greatest genius that emerges from a creation is almost always not intended. Um, there is the genius that is intended, there is the intention that, that goes into creating something, and then there is almost always an unexpected outcome of creating that. You, you set off on your journey um, to yeah, cut, cut the head off the serpent or whatever and uh, return home, right? But uh, you don't you, you go out outside, you go out on your adventure knowing that you want to take on evil and you, and you want to, uh, you know, reclaim your sanity by taking on responsibility and proving your worth and the word and being challenged and, and stretched to your full potential. But you do not know what your full potential is. You do not know. That is the thing. And if you did know it, it would not, it would no longer be your full potential. It would still be at, that would be that would be still too low a ceiling that you have imagined, too low a, a point in the sky from which you are aiming your view and looking at. So in that very same sense, um, I'm, I'm using this to describe that bad water, as many divine creations are, is reaching something that we do not quite understand. And um, we can experience its greatness, um, but to break it down to science is naive it's naive it's it's assuming it's assuming that it can be recreated with science as well because um it it, it will be proven time and time again too that when we try to redo things by recreate greatness by taking the same steps we did before it will not reach the same greatness that we did before because it's not about the literal steps that you take it's about the intention behind the steps that you take the reasons the spiritual intention the 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 choice behind what you are doing the meaning behind what you're doing it is it is one thing to configure your hands in a certain way and 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 use them to craft something or it is one thing to configure um, your mind in a certain way to uh, to focus on something or, or, or literally spend your time doing something that the literal technique of something and then there is the entire other element which is your the the meaning that goes on behind it why you are doing it what are you what you are hoping to achieve where it is going for you and and without that second that shadow of of subjectivity of of uh, the the human experience and what is going on for you personally that is Sort of the shadow of, of your entire day-to-day -day of all of your productivity without that um, without that being in the correct place um, your technique is meaningless your ability to 
to create a perfect map and hammer it is meaningless. And this is why um, oftentimes you cannot recreate the same perfection because the, the premises necessary for its initial creation um, were, need to be those premises. The, the premises of recreation are already a different premise than the, than the premise of making Badwater for the first time. So I would urge anyone who is going to be involved in the Badwater map making contest that I suggested Valve put on and, and heavily endorse and prize pool fund and pad as part of their Badwater update, which I think would be a, a great release to have this year. Or any year soon, I'm, I'm patient for the Bad Water update, but I do think it's a, it's a good idea. I would encourage anyone taking the Bad Water map making challenge in the Bad Water update, this challenge to make Bad Water 2, um, to, to use the, uh, the prompt of Bad Water 2 of a Bad Water inspired sequel map of, of another map in the essence of Bad Water, not as uh, the destination, but as a limitation for a new vision. Um, the, let those let that be the framework let that be the limits um the the rule set from which you will operate but do not let it be the meaning of what you are creating you need to be uh lo looking for something new a and you you're using an old palette an old tool just as just in the same way that any team fortress 2 map would be a a sort of limit a structure around what you're doing just put it through one more filter, which is the guise of it being in the PL Badwater extended universe. In, so, in some way or another, and again, this is this is fortunately up to the interpretation of, of the map makers. We would like to see, I would expect to see a lot of the PL Badwater fan made Badwater 2 maps to be in a uh, similar art style uh, as the original Badwater, but at the same time, I wouldn't hold, the, hold them to that. I, I do grant them the liberty to uh, perhaps create it in uh, a, a new style and to maybe say no the essence of this map that is bad water is not the is not the visual identity rather it is blank right i, I want to grant people that freedom um and and, and i support i expect and ex support that some people will be using that freedom when they make their pl bad water to their bad water to their bad water inspired map for the bad wire themed map making contest as part of the bad water update but i do i urge people um to use those limits of, of it to not recreate bad water. That's, this is not the point. The point is to use use bad water, use this as a start for something great, right? See it as a, a remix, a recontextualization, a, 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 reme a remediation, right? Uh, as something I, I would have covered and went over in my analysis of Stabby in uh, my Stabby Why Spy video where I talk about his, uh, what I believe is his... Uh, academic work where he talks about remediation you're wanting to uh to to create a remix you know you're, you're using this as as the inspiration as the base let Badwater be the instrument that you play but do not do not try to create another instrument from an instrument right this is uh it, it it's good maybe for the means of creating another thing that can be played but but to Create an, the, the task is to play. The, 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 the task is to create. I need I need music from you. I need this map to sing, right? That should be the, the final result. And and so I I think uh, I think it's cool that Badwater can inspire such a uh, important discussion on the nature of creation and uh, intention and what we are where we are aiming with what we are making and how those aims are so important and how I'm sure if I could, uh, which I would graciously love to, if I could interview that initial development team of Badwater, I'm sure you would hear their, um, where their intentions lined up with the outcome and where their expectations were not prepared for what happened, where, um, where certain aspects of the map proved more useful than they realized in time, right? That places they put special attention to that they thought would matter very much so may not have mattered so much. And in contrast, places that were thrown together quite quickly or things that they didn't think were very important parts of the map would then potentially become quite important because there is a... Uh, the, the, the insane amount of complexity to a Team Fortress 2 map can seriously not be understated. The, the insane complexity of a Team Fortress 2 map cannot in any way be understated. Because the amount of the, 
the sheer unfathomable infinite amount of interactions that can happen on all of the different points of the map, between all of the different classes, between all of the different arrangements of different classes, of having two scouts and a soldier fight, a demo man and a medic in this part of the the tunnel underneath first point. There's there's too many permutations. And so in, in making a map, you, you can hope that you will create certain situations, but you you cannot you simply cannot test or prepare for the sheer myriad of infinite situations that will play out. So you're you're really making a predictive effort that uh, what you what you create will be fun, because um, un until real players are actually testing and out playing it, and and it's more or less released to the wild. Because I would say there's even an issue in play testing a map because there's so much focus on um, the elements of the map and if this map is good, right? Um, it, the, the real test is just having it actually be played um, where people aren't even consciously thinking about the, the merit of the map or the objective at all, perhaps, right? There, there's something to be said for the uh, a, a, a map like Badwater really getting its, uh, its, its, uh, its levers and gears and axles uh, lubricated by the oil of players uh, fucking around on it by not having to even think about the objective. If a map is quite fun in both procuring the advancement of the objective and um, forgetting about the objective entirely and just doing whatever the player wants, I think you are coming on to something magical. And to say that Badwater does not meet those two requirements would simply be false. We have maps like Hightower where... Um, is probably more slanted, where I think players in general have more fun not playing for the objective or even thinking about it and letting it cross their minds. Um, it can be fun, but I don't think it's as fun playing for the objective on Hightower, right? On Badwater, we could say equally so to have both on our minds. And as we could say in, in other maps too, maybe in 5CP, um, it may be less so to be playing not focused on all on the objective. In part because the time will disappear, because they will cap and the game will restart. The, the, the game ends too quickly if you're not focused on the objective, right? Payload, Badwater, there's a nice space, there's a nice amount of time that things are going to keep going. And, and you're going to be able to sort of sit and absorb and enjoy the timelessness, the, and enjoy the, the, the sensation of, of using time, of spending time, of time going by, which is quite um, a different experience to be using time than to be critical and thinking and aware of time and to be brought out of the moment by the fact that the timer has run out, which happens uh, if you stop thinking about the objective on a 5CP map, which may not happen nearly as fast on a payload map like Badwater when you stop thinking about the objective. So I, I think I've discussed a lot of the uh, sort of practical aspects of Badwater, the points, how they are laid out, the cart, how the cart moves across the map, what it feels like to play offense on bad water, what it feels like to play defense on bad water, what it's gonna be like to be the scout, or the soldier, or the pyro, or the demo man, or the heavy, or the engineer, or the medic, or the sniper, or the spy, or even sort of a subclass play style, a, a, a trolger, a Demo Knight, a Battle Medic, I've, I've mentioned all of these things at some point, and I think these are the core aspects of Badwater that you have to talk about. They're, they're essential in a full analysis, in a full uh, biopic, in really getting in, getting dirty, getting down to the brass tacks of Badwater. Uh, probably has more to do with talking about it in some of some more unpractical, impractical, as they would say, circumstances. Some circumstances that may even be considered impossible. So, um, a question that I've actually had sent in here by a fan, um, unrelated, I don't know how they knew I was making this video. Uh, they asked me, uh, Dear Casual TF2, do you think that PL Badwater would be a good place for a romantic date? And then sincerely, uh, your fan. It, it, it doesn't say from who. It was an anonymous note. And 
Uh, this is an idea I would like to explore um, because uh, PL Badwater would be an, a strange place for a date. Uh, I'm going to interpret this in two ways. One is that you are e-dating a girl and um, you ask her to meet on PL Badwater and uh, maybe you guys both go on an empty server and voice chat with each other using the in-game voice chat in TF2. Um, which I think is kind of cool. I think that's, I don't know, sort of, I don't know, sort of, there's some, there's some swagger to it. Uh, it would make for a very fun, unique experience. I think if, if, uh, you and your TF2 loved one, um, or prospective loved one, both loved TF2, um, it could be a good way to, uh, have, like, an early date, you know, um, without... Uh, you know, rather than just voice chatting with them, you'd be like, hey, let's hop into Badwater. And, uh, you know, just alone, you and I will hop in our own server. It would be really romantic, too. You could rent your own server or set up a private server with a password. And just hang out, the two of you, and talk using the in-game voice chat. And just sort of hang out. Maybe you could heal each other or you could build some sentries. Um, you probably have to play in the same team, you know? Uh... And maybe you could just push the cart together, like on blue team, and, and, and just talk about things like you would on a date. Um, that could be pretty cool. My uh, my second interpretation, interpretation number two of this question, uh, which I think actually might lend itself to more interesting uh, ideas and discussion, is using PL Badwater as a real location to have a romantic date. And... The things that would be interesting about this is that it it resembles a hike, perhaps in some ways, but otherwise seems to be completely um, completely disconnected from the usual place that you would go for a date. Right? There are um, there are uh, bombs. There's a box of TNT, a few boxes of TNT on Badwater. There's lots of abandoned. Um, industrial equipment, which I don't think of as being particularly romantic, um, just in terms of general mood and feeling. Not to say that you could not have a romantic experience by or even inside of some of this um, industrial equipment. I do think it would be... Uh, there, there is some nice area to walk around and through. I think it, it's, it might feel a bit like urban exploring. Um, I, I think uh, there, there's definitely a good handful of areas that would be nice to sort of chill out and sit down, enjoy the view, maybe make some lunch, um, or sorry, eat some lunch if you brought some with you and just talk to your date. I think uh, I think on top of Badwater first, the sort of upper high cliff area, the high ground, this would be a nice area. Um, this, it's nice being on the high ground, you have this big sort of rock wall behind you, which is slightly comforting. You, you can kind of get close to the edge if you want to really peer over and look down towards the tunnel. Kind of exciting. Uh, other locations that could be good for this date. Hmm. I suppose uh, it depends if there's a lot of other people there with you, you know? Like, I was sort of assuming it was just you and your, uh, your date romantic interest there alone. But let's say that this is at the official uh, casual TF2 X Valve. Um, PL Badwater theme park, right? The real life creation of, of Badwater. And um, let's say that uh, there's a lot of people there because it's a theme park and everyone wants to check out and experience Badwater in person. I like the idea of them giving you creative freedom, of, of them letting you go to any part of Badwater you want. Like all the parts that you really can go to Badwater um, in the real map, you should be able to go to in in the in the real life version of it. You know, like there shouldn't be anything fenced off, like it's a museum or something. I think they should really let people be allowed to explore and go anywhere they want. You know, make them sign waivers or whatever beforehand. You know, so that nobody, you know, if somebody falls off one of these uh, one of these cliffs, right, that don't have railing or whatever, it's 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 on them. You know, um, but let them have the full honest experience of Badwater, right? And maybe maybe it could be made more of a private tour thing that you pay a very high price to have, 
you know, an hour to yourself on bad water or, or something like this. Um, but I'm sure there'd be a lot of really fun areas. Like once you're in bad water in real life, but I bet there'd be a lot of really fun areas to hang out. I think, uh, I think the rooftop by, by the second point would be very, uh, stimulating. I think it would be, uh, it would be really cool to see that sun behind you, um, by the, uh, excuse me, by the, uh, by all that flank area behind the point. I think that would be cool to look back at, and I think it would be lo cool to look down onto the point. I think, uh, I think that would, it would feel pretty kind of a little nerve-wracking. You know, I've got a pretty normal fear of heights, I would say, but normal to moderate, and, uh, to look down onto that, uh, that main area would be very cool in that way. Uh, give me one second, I'm gonna blow my nose. And, you know, you might have wondered why I, I kept that part in, and it's, it's because, um, blowing your nose is actually something that would happen a lot at the real-life version of Badwater, and you would want to be careful about, uh, how windy it is when you're there, because I do get the sense that there are a lot of, like, sand, dust particles that might, you might... It might get blown into your eyes and in your nose. You might breathe it in, and that could be, um, that would be extremely frustrating, and probably, I, I think that's considered bad air quality to some degree. I don't, I don't know if that's a real safety hazard. Um, so maybe there, there's something to be said for, depending on the, the wind at bad water, when you're on your date there, you might actually want to hang out more of an, in an in indoor area. And I think you'd want to choose an area which has um, still a little bit of a view of the outside or some kind of window. Uh, I, I think bridge room has a nice big window. Because um, like map room has open windows, but they're, uh, they're like a little too like just big gaping holes, you know? I guess, I guess towards Battle of the Last in map room, you're probably not at risk of a lot of s s sand or dust blowing into the windows from where you are and, and getting in your face, you know? So map room could be cool. I just I just don't quite love the vibe in map room. I think it'd be cool to look out of the windows in map room. Um, I'm trying to think of the optimal place, though. Uh, I guess I guess part of the fun of being with your date on Battle is you can just sort of walk around everywhere and just chill and talk. And uh, there's some 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 areas are, are more fun than others, like... Uh, I guess I guess there's an intimate quality to to some more than others, right? I think uh, uh, to share an intimate moment in the stairwell um, by Badwater Last makes a lot of sense because it's probably the most one of the most private areas. I know you can argue that the big health pack on Badwater Last is somewhat intimate, but it, it still has like an open a big open door, and it's just a little tight, you know. Whereas, uh, like, if you think about the stairwell, some uh, I think there's definitely like some nice areas that you could lie down in the stairwell. Um, perhaps in in the sniper tower could be nice. I just don't like that the view's not too excellent. Like the view's only really good in the sniper tower from the window if you look down. Like, and I don't know, it's just sort of awkward. Like it's it's nice to have a view that just naturally looks great right in front of you. And. Uh, you know, it, yeah, it is nice to have places with a good view when you're hanging out with your date. But probably, you know, the I think uh, I think if we compare Bad Water, this real life version of Bad Water, to uh, some some more typical romantic date locations like um, like a restaurant or a movie theater or maybe like an ice rink, uh, you know, to to go ice skating or um, I'm trying to think of another athletic one, maybe like a, a, a hiking trail, a walking path. Uh, the bad water might be a little more, uh, confusing. I think, um, I think it's frustrating that there are so many signs in promotion of food on bad water and, uh, there's no food stand. There's no clear place to buy or sell food. Um, I guess if we're taking the question very literally, you know, just real, like, bad water, just in real life, no, no gimmicks, no extra fluff, um, there wouldn't be any, like, snack shacks, you know, or, like, little vending stands with, with, with goods and food, but I would like to think in the real life version of, 
uh, Badwater, you know, the, the theme park made by Valve and, and myself. Uh, that, that there, you know, there would definitely be some snack shacks. There would need to be some places to have food while you're there. Um, it would just be uh, an essential part of the experience, in my opinion. And uh, so, yeah, that's what I think of that. Uh, I, I think uh, compared to like a movie theater, I like that it's it, it's a little more like a hike. It gives you a little more things to do to look around and... Um, and, and to, to talk with each other, and I think it's it's sort of it's such an interesting environment. It's it's unlike any home, you know, or any real life physical location. That's uh, you know, it's not it's part nature, I guess, on on a few parts of the map, but it's mostly man made and has this cool like crazy industrial labyrinth type vibe. Um, without anything being scary, I really don't feel like anywhere on Badwater is scary. Maybe at nighttime it would be kind of scary. Um, yeah, I yeah. So I, it's probably best if it was you know, like the time that Badwater is actually set. Which I know we're not sure if it's if that sun is uh if the sun has arisen to the morning position or it's the setting position because it's we can't tell where which direction the sun has been moving in on Badwater when we when we look up to the sun on Badwater. Uh, if I compare it to uh to a hike or something. I like that there still is a, a good amount of ground that you can cover. Like, I think a basic romantic date hike you could do on Badwater is be like, all right, let's let's uh, let's just follow the railroad tracks, you know? And um, I feel like at a reasonable walking pace, that would take you five minutes, ten minutes, maybe? Um, it, I feel like it would feel a lot bigger in real life and that, you know... Because all the all the characters in TF2 are are, are kind of like running or something close to that. Yeah, it'd probably be closer to like a heavy pace, maybe. But maybe even that's a little fast. I guess. Uh, yeah, you gotta. It really depends what scale they're they're making this bad water. I mean, you want it to be accurate, but I have the weird sense that it would feel kind of big in real life. I don't know if that's a a fair prediction of mine or not. But uh. But let's say that uh. You know, it, it's it's five minutes walk from one end to the other, or maybe ten minutes walk. Um, it's kind of a it's it's a little quick of a hike. You kind of need a little more time to pad it. Like a nice walk is like 25, 30 minutes. I think that's sort of the perfect length. You can put a a rest on one end of that and then walk back. You know, or, or cut it in half and put a rest there or, or something like that. And uh, so, so there'd probably have to be numerous paths that you take, and you'd probably have to have, like, a game plan. You know, like, especially if you're the guy and you're gonna, like, take the lead on this date, and you gotta... You gotta think about where you're going, you know, am I gonna, am I gonna walk them up the rails, you know? Are we gonna do the whole rails route with my romantic date? And then, uh... And then go up the, uh... You know, go up the stairs and hang out on the roof a little while. Um, do we wanna hang out in that sort of flank area behind the second roof point? does seem kind of dangerous and weird there's also fences around there's a lot of fences in that area i don't know if fences are very appealing romantically i feel like it's a little less idyllic a little less cool like wow isn't this area awesome it's like yeah there's some fences like i don't know it kind of feels like prison um that's that's me role playing as your romantic date and um so overall i would say bad water is like a five out of ten for like a romantic date spot i don't think it's the uh, it's probably not the best spot. There's probably a lot more beautiful hikes um, you can go to. It'd probably be a little confusing for your date, especially if they don't know what Badwater is. Um, they'd be like, what is this strange, like, environment? Like, where where am I? What is this, you know? Um, but yeah, that's... Uh, so those are my thoughts on that. Let me think now... Um, I, I have another thought that I, I connected in relation to this of whether... Badwater is a good place for a date, which is my question of is Badwater a good place um, to uh, to be friendly on, you know, um, and, and what are the ethics, um, what, what, what is the cost, you know, the expense benefit, cost benefit analysis of, uh, of being a friendly player on PL Badwater. And the thing is, I would say in general, it's probably not a very good place to be a friendly player because um, 
compared to a map like Two Fort or High Tower, and this is interesting because Two Fort and High Tower are, are also pretty damn fucking classic maps. You're used to seeing friendly players a little more, and you're used to seeing shenanigans, just in general, kind of gimmicky, silly stuff on Two Fort and High Tower because Two Fort and High Tower, you really just are much more disconnected from the ob objective. You can go the whole point sitting on the sniper roof never thinking about the intel on 2 Fort. And in that same regard, you can do the same thing on High Tower and just hang out never thinking about the cart. And Badwater is different. Badwater is better. You're going to be thinking... You're always a little bit thinking about the cart, you know? And uh, so because of this, it's... You're, you're not really used to seeing silly, super gimmicky stuff, friendly players. And if you do, I think you're... Uh, I think you're either eager to kill them on purpose or by accident because um, they're gonna they're not gonna stick out super easily you know it's not an environment where you're just kinda hanging out and walking around and uh, you know there, there's a clear focus to a payload map and to Badwater specifically and I think it speaks well to the legacy of Badwater uh, that it probably is not a great map to be a friendly player on now that being said um, you can sort of go against the grain here and actually, you know, in spite of what I said, still try to be a friendly player on PL Badwater. Um, and of course, when I say a friendly player, this is this is some sort of uh, sort of perversion of uh, of the game by uh, refusing to attack the opponent um, and, and being a sort of pacifist neutral player, despite still being on the color of your team kind of in hopes that the other team will respect you as a pacifist and not kill you and sort of see you as a non-game player. And uh, being friendly can be uh, a sort of humorous thing to see who, w who will pass the test and who will let you live, who will, who will not kill you. Um, but the... Oftentimes... The game is so intense and chaotic that even if somebody wants to be friendly, it just kind of might be too much to have to rationalize, okay, don't kill enemy players sometimes. Because there's just a lot of action going on, a lot of bodies flooding the point, you know? And you want to keep shutting down the enemy, and especially if you want to win, it's going to be very tempting. And, and uh, you, you know, if you want to win outright, you're probably like me, and you're just going to kill friendly players with no hesitation. Um, but I do understand and sympathize with friendly players who want to be friendly on Badwater, not because of its viability as a map for friendly players, but because it is a great map and they also happen to like being a friendly player. Um, I understand that, in that even though they may have, um, let go of the ways of taking the game seriously and they just want to goof around, and uh, be a pacifist and win over other uh, pacifist friendly people. Uh, they still, they don't want to do that on a trash map like Two Fort. You know, they have some self-respect. They have a sen they have standards. They have, uh, they live by principles. And so I do, I do respect and admire the friendly players who will try to stick it out and be friendly on Badwater as opposed to being friendly on High Tower or Two Fort, which are really like the low-hanging fruit of friendly maps. It's uh, it's to be expected, and I don't think it's going to impress me very much that they're, uh, you know, it, it's uh, it it I, I would prefer too if I were a friendly player to to still experience a map that is really fun, even if the map was only fun when you do shoot people. You know, it's a little bit like having one foot in each world. So. I, I think it is quite rare I see a friendly player on Badwater and I still will probably kill them because in most cases I will kill friendly players because I love killing people in Team Fortress 2. I love doing lots of damage. I love getting lots of kills. I love padding my stats. These are some of the best things I can experience in Team Fortress 2. And so if there is a friendly player, they, I'm sure they'll go down um, by my blade. And... Uh, Regardless, though, my point is I do want to say I'm I'm more empathetic to their cause than on other maps, even though I don't, I can't support their friendly gaming habits, and I wouldn't encourage it. You know, if I had a little brother, I would uh, I would not I would not encourage them to be a friendly player. 
I would encourage them to be a rock star in Team Fortress 2, you know? Have them doing a Scout MG every morning for 30 minutes before they go to school. Um, you know, assuming it was, uh, you know, they they were with the program on becoming the, the next gen of uh, Master Race TF2 players. So, Badwater has so many interesting facets to it. And another facet that I do want to address is the sense of time and how it passes when we're playing a map. So, you may have experienced a game where you think, wow, this has taken a long time or this has taken not long at all. And the funny thing that I think you will experience is that the games that feel like they um, were much uh, faster than they actually are. <coughs> Excuse me. Ah, I'm, I'm sneezing from all that sand that blows around on on bad water. Uh, yeah, so, like, if you play three hours of Turbine, it might actually feel a lot less, like a lot less time than three hours than if you played three hours of uh, different maps. Like, if you played eight different maps in those three hours, it would probably feel like a lot longer of a three hours than three hours on turbine and this has to do with the way that our brain encodes and saves information um you know if you if you take a break halfway between a gaming session uh you know you play for an hour and then take five minutes off and then play for 55 minutes to your brain you had two gaming sessions even though you, you played the same amount of time you would that if you played for one hour um and in your brain two is a bigger number than one so your brain has this weird um, and, and weird but very smart way of saving and encoding information where um, the more you get kind of stuck in a long string of nothingness um, the less your brain probably has to remember it and save it because it's becoming very familiar right and um, and, and why would your brain have to save it as, as to as level of a detail right because um, if you go to five new places, your survival brain needs to map all of five of those places in case you're at any of those places again. But if you only go to one place, um, y your, your brain can chill out a little bit because you have a lot of time to absorb it, you know? Um, or, or I shouldn't even say that, but in its encoding, it won't prioritize it as much because it, it has a, an approach of kind of want to have it all bases covered and all situations accounted for. So... Um, even if it takes the same amount of time, if you introduce more experiences, more maps, more diversity of the structure of an experience in reality, it's going to want to uh, remember and account for more variations on the structure of reality in the case that you have to return to that same structure again. Um, whereas if you're spending all your time in one structure, you can relax. Your brain thinks you are winning. You know, when, when you are in familiar territory, your brain thinks you are winning. Your brain does not need to function as fast, does not to need to learn as much when you are in safe, familiar shit all the time. That's that's an indication that survival is going well, right? Um, a, a lack of safety is indicated often by a, an intense diversity of, uh, of anything. You know, sleeping in a different place every night is, is uh, your body's not going to internalize that as, as good survival. So it's going to remember more of it. Isn't that janky and weird um so in that light uh bad water i do think and and you can say this of payload maps in general but i do think that bad water will give you more bang for your buck and how much time it feels like you've spent compared to other game modes because it does really feel like there's like distinct portions of bad water that are their own map you spend you know, four minutes on the first point, you spend four minutes on the second point, you spend four minutes on the third point, you spend four minutes on the last point. You know, and you spend a good amount of time spawning from the same room over and over again. And because it's in this manner and it's not shuffled around like on a 5CP map where, yes, you are focusing on different points of the map, and yes, you are spawning from different points, but it's constantly, it's hap the shift's happening too quick. You don't have enough time to go, okay, I'm just working on this one part of the puzzle right now for a while. It's like, you're always switching between pieces of the puzzle and and, and uh, you can always go back to the previous piece you know in, in 5cp and i think because of that it feels a bit more like a blur 
and uh, it doesn't feel as much like distinct specific parts of the map. Whereas on Badwater, on a payload map, I think you, because you have more time to invest on these little different parts of the map, uh, it does feel like the experience overall is longer. And I, I found um, here making this video, recording gameplay, playing Badwater, I found again and again that I was surprised at how little time had passed. Um, that I maybe would play Badwater for only 20 minutes, and it felt like a decently long time because in those 20 minutes I might have focused on four different points sort of you know there was you know two and a half or three minutes of me working on each different point first from offense and then from defense and, and it gives your brain just enough time to really soak in and think about that place i think it's that nice sweet spot of i want to be here for a bit but at the same time i don't want to be here forever i don't want to play ctf turbine for three hours where my brain just remembers it as this big hodgepodge of uh of this of sameness that just went on for three hours right um, even though you're doing different actions, it's like it's not a very big map. There's only the same handful of places. And uh, you, you don't typically s spend, you know, it, it would be different if on Turbine you go, okay, I'm going to camp by the intel for five minutes, and now I'm going to camp by the center area for five minutes, and now I'm going to camp by their intel for five minutes. You could do that with extreme discipline, but most people tend to play uh, a more organic mix of all of the places that are available to them on a map. And in the case of Badwater, the places that are available to you are, are limited by which part of the map you are on, right? If you're spawning from the second spawn in blue, you're just you're not going to go back to the part of the map behind you. There's nothing going on, right? So even though it's an option to you, you're never going to go back there during these next four or five minutes where you're pushing last. And uh, and that means you will be focused on last, which, which does, in a way, make it a different experience from that first half of Badwater that you had. So... I think I think Badwater is great in terms of its value in that way, and that you can play for a long time, and it's gonna feel like a really long time, you know. And, and I think uh, I, th I think with every rotation too of switching teams, um, you can really recall a pretty long set of actions getting you to that point when when the map finally resets, when you finally switch from the blue team to red team. And I've said it before, and I'll say it again. I love that they're is the setup time because the setup time is very practically useful at a bare minimum you know the first 10 seconds or 20 seconds for getting all your players on the red team to the front lines um, and then it's most practically useful for uh, the engineer formerly for the medic there was a point in time where the medic did not build uber charge super fast before the uh, before the round began um, there was a point where they really needed to use those 40 seconds and uh, 40 seconds it takes to build Uber. Obviously, you have you have more time to uh, to wait, and so the engineer really needs that setup time. But I love that everyone else who maybe doesn't need that setup time as much gets to enjoy it. Is forced to enjoy the setup time. Is forced to reflect on the fact that a map has ended and now they're they're going on to the next thing. You don't really uh, you don't really see setup time in a lot of the other game modes. You know, 5 CP, which I would say is arguably the most popular game mode behind Payload or next to Payload overall when we consider the cultural impact of competitive TF2 and things like this. Uh, 5CP, there is no setup time. You know, there you have like two seconds. Right, that's, that's an exaggeration. Maybe you have five seconds after someone has captured the last point until the next round starts. You don't have a lot of time to reflect and think about and for your mind to separate the events, you know? Um, I talked about earlier how when you take a break in between an activity, it actually, if you take a long enough break, it cuts it into two activities that your brain will encode rather than it just being one activity. And it actually can feel like a longer time. And so with that same concept in mind, when you play Badwater and you cut it in half and you have a setup time for one minute where you have to kind of not play the game for a minute and maybe you do get distracted with something, which is fine because it is fulfilling this purpose of, of sort of resetting your memory and re having a break to come back and go, okay, now we're playing Bad Order again. You know, rather than, I'm playing Bad Order, playing Bad Order, playing Bad Order, and then you stop, right? They're playing Bad Order, playing Bad Order, playing Bad Order, taking a break, doing it again, playing Bad Order, playing Bad Order, playing Bad taking a break for a minute, <gasps> doing it again, playing Bad Order, playing Bad Order, right? You have these nice little periods of gestation where you're able to just sit and, uh, 
and absorb and distinctualize and separate the difference between these different rounds that you were playing. And uh, I think all for the better. I think if you took away setup time, even if you made engineers be able to set up instantly and all this stuff, it would not be as fun. We need the rest. We need some patience. And now I'll be very critical of a lot of the other bullshit time when things are going on. I, I hate a lot of setup time in games like Rainbow Six Siege, um, even Counter-Strike. There can It just feels like there's a lot of waiting sometimes for rounds to start and buying items and all these types of things. Um, but I will tell you, uh, you know, while there are a lot of systems that I would say cut, 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 cut all of the excess waiting time from, and even in the, the way that Valve does their 5 CP maps, I don't like how uh, they kind of add in an extra 5 seconds before the, the, ma the map starts where you can't even open the gate early. There's, there's all this weird extra padding of time they added. I don't like that. That's wasting time because it's just not enough time to actually reflect, but I like... I like that there's this long setup time with a purpose, a real practical purpose for some of the some of the players, and it also it encourages a a mode of thinking that is strategic. Um, it it's almost it almost would be very beneficial for players to have, you know, especially in casual environments, to have a minute um, before the round starts on on a CP map to maybe look at the map somehow. And not, you know, have a sense of, okay, well, the round's going to start in a minute. Where do I want to go? Where do I want to, where do I want to push starting on? Where, where do I think it would be fun? Because um, even if it's something simple and it's just, oh, well, I'm going to go up the cliff. Or I'm going to go through the tunnel. It's nice that Badwater gives you all this time, you know, like a lot of time to look through those four different gates. There's a lot of different gates. You can look through all of them. Kind of see what's going on and think, huh, okay, I see what's going on over there. Um... Like, even if you haven't played that map yet, you, you play it for the first time, you get to sit in the spawn for a minute. You get to ref think a little and see what's going on before you actually play it. It's super useful as a new player and super useful as a veteran player as well to, um, to, to have a moment to chill. And maybe, you know, especially if you just played a round before, you can be thinking, okay, well, I really want to get that sentry down. That was such a problem for us before. Or I really want to shut the sniper down. Or I really want to jump behind their spawn and, 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 and go, uh, or jump behind their line and go to their spawn and camp their spawn and kill their teleporters and, and things like this. Or maybe you'll decide, you know, you're a medic and you're thinking who you want to heal or where you want to Uber, um, what your plan is, what your plan of action is. And the same gets to happen for defense. You have a little bit of time to kind of set up and think, okay, rather than this just being a mid fight and I just sort of hope I'm running to the, the best spot on mid and uh, the action's crazy when it gets here and who the fuck knows when we'll, we'll battle it out and see what happens. You're instead of having this experience where you prepare yourself and you, you, you get some time to evaluate all the options. Do I want to defend here from this cliff? Do I want to defend really close to the spawn gates? Do I want to look inside the spawn gates and see what kind of classes they're running? Which is its own sort of interesting like, hey we get a moment to kind of like check each other out through the through the cage before the the gladiator battle begins you know and the beast is unleashed into the coliseum and we we get to duke it out and i think that's a really fun element because being able to sort of interact getting close to the gate looking at the opponents adds some exciting tension it adds some uh some intelligence some information i mean you you can even deduce some useful things too from the blue spawn from looking out sometimes you can you can see a sentry if it's very aggressive. You can see where a sniper is holding. It gives you a chance to know, okay, I don't want to push from that door. That's where a sniper is. That's where this is, you know. I like that. And there's even strategy, too, to being a defensive player on the red team and saying, hmm, do I want them to be able to see me, you know? Do I want them to be... Uh, do, I, do I want to peek at the last minute for where my sniper spot is like or do i want to spoil it from right away like hey i'm gonna be watching this spot you know and there's uh there's interesting psychology to this there's you you have a nice sense of free will of being able to potentially impact the other team before the round even starts right if they see you have a ton of snipers or a ton of heavies or or you're setting down crit stickies on on the uh on the gates of the door it's like oh that's an indication i'm gonna go pyro or whatever but there's all sorts of ways to influence that round before the round has started, which I really like, you know, you can, 
if you're a spy, do you want to kind of hide and, and not be visible inside the blue spawn so that they don't know you're playing spy yet or, you know, don't disguise yet or maybe disguise as a heavy, a friendly character to, to throw them off the scent of what's really going on. Uh, the setup time is, is so useful and it, it just speaks to the utility of negative space and, and Badwater knows this well because there are lots of great negative space areas physically on Badwater. The, the setup time is talking about negative space um, from a temporal perspective, right? But if we think about it from a spatial perspective, there are lots of good negative spaces too on Badwater where it's like, you know, there's the, the stairwell on last and the big health room on, you know, the big health little closet thing, I should say. On last by the bomb site, there is, you know, uh, sort of uh, the, the deck area in the room connecting to map room, right? Which is, maybe you can spend time there, but it is really weird negative space. But the thing is, you, all the players, all the classes benefit from using this negative space um, because it gives them something uh, in contrast to the, the Yang space. It gives them, um, the, the thing is, you know everybody, you know when there is going to be action, and you know when there isn't going to be action, right? This is the utility of a setup time, is that it, it tells you, okay, I know when there's going to be action, I know right now there's not action. And, and so you can start strat strategizing and, and thinking about your approach. And in that same way, spatially, you can think about, okay, this is a good place to be if I want action. And at the same time, if I'm looking to get out, if I'm looking to escape, if I'm looking to have some time to sneak around them, I can go to the, the negative spaces where I know... You know, psychologically, I, I have the, the I'm, it's implied that this is an area um, where there isn't a lot of action going on. You know, this is a, this is a side area, this is a secret area, this is a flank area. This is not where the action is going on. And because I know that, because I know it is a negative space, I can use it in my own gameplay to sort of pad in between the times when I am in the, in the positive space. Um, and I can also rely on it in knowing that this is... Um, gonna be a road less traveled, which uh, is nice to have the option of, even if people don't use it very often. I, I think that's sort of the, some of the maturity that came into creating Payload Badwater is that you have some of these areas behind the rooftop of Second Point, or even the, a lot of the areas underneath it, right? When you enter that gate that opens up, you capture that first point on Badwater. You have the stairs, which are probably the most positive space, the sort of obvious place to go. But then you have this little room in front of you, which is slightly obvious what's going on, not super obvious. You have the uh, the room to your left side, um, which is also sort of a road less traveled. And then all of the area where the shipping crates are, and it's all very, um, you know, very, you don't need to be here, but you can be. And there's maturity in putting these places in the map when we compare it to... The, Valve's first experiment with uh, with a payload creation, which was Gold Rush, where you can have uh, a, a fun experience just with a very singular channel of action. Um, but the point of adding another space, a, a negative space, a, a flank, a, a less traveled, a less used area, is not necessarily just so people will use it. It can be have to for people who want to use something that is not being used, right? Um, for as many classes that do benefit from being in the high intensity zone, right? Heavy, demo man, sniper, um, soldier, let's say, that, that do want to be looking down big chokes with bi millions of people. There are actually classes too that want to get away from some of the action, right? And, and want to have better odds for themselves in a less occupied zone you know they are the 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 introverts of the game in a way where uh, uh you you put the the introverts in an extroverted environment like gold rush and they will they will do their best of course um but the but the environment is a little more uh designed for extroverts to thrive in right you need a place where the introverts can go and have some time to their own where they can branch off where they can use that negative space because the the cool balance of it is that uh both are necessary there's inspiration to be drawn from the positive space the yang 
as much as there is inspiration to be drawn from the negative space and the yin and the um, the downtime, the the absence of clutter, the absence of intensity, which can uh, it can be hard to realize too because the game, you know, games in general, life is a game like Team Fortress 2, like Badwater. It's very focused on the the stuff, the yang, the positive, the the winning, the getting the money, the getting the job, the doing the career, the having the family, making stuff, being productive, being useful, capturing the point, right? Life's about capturing the point. Bad water is about capturing the point. But sometimes, in order to capture the point, you need to be, you need some time away from the, from the objective. You need some time away um, to clutter, to declutter your mind. And while there are some people, those more extroverted people who can, who have the will to kind of stay on the cart the whole game, um, it's not for everyone to to need to be able to stay on the cart for the whole game. And in fact, some people can contribute to the team. Okay, so think about that. Contribute to the culture, contribute to the society, contribute to their family, their friends, contribute to their own lives without being um, on on the front and center stage, without playing an obvious role, but, but in playing a more subtle and underhanded role, right? Maybe not even uh, killing people in the game of Badwater, right? But maybe... Uh, supporting in, in different ways and, and creating illusions and distractions or supporting people and 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 enabling their great plays right and and this is a lot of the the beauty of of the synergy that happens in team fortress 2 and unfortunately what can be i would say is more of the misunderstandings we can have in life and that um maybe misunderstanding is not the most appropriate word but that we really as a society, do not acknowledge the the labor of of yin, um, the the labor of the negative space, the labor of resting, the utility of resting, the utility of reflection, the utility of getting away from the chaos, the utility of having time to strategize, to to decide, to choose, to observe, um, and also of uh, the glory of not necessarily being. Uh, the Michael Jordan of the team, right? But being a, an equally valid part of the team that plays a much less flashy role, a, a role that is integral to the success of the team and to that uh, enables Michael Jordan. And it's not it's not about a contest really, because even if even if we say that the Michael Jordan is still less interchangeable than someone else, uh, you know, who's more of a support role. They, the, the support role is still necessary, right? To be interchangeable is not a bad thing. Um, most, most humans in all capacities are, are interchangeable, and that's not to say that um, you are doing bad or, or not enough. It, you don't need to be interchangeable to be... Uh, sorry, you don't need to be uh, uninterchangeable to be valuable. Certainly not. If anything, being interchangeable to some extent even speaks to your value because you need... Um, if, if you fill a role that someone else can fill or you can fill a role that someone else is already filling, it just speaks to, yeah, you work in a system somehow. It's really nice to appreciate that Bad Water was ooh, from that time of the game, from that time of the game's development where there was all this nice little appreciation for mucking up the map with all these pretty details. I love all of the, the signs across Bad Water. There's some real charm in you can tell that somebody had the had a lot of uh, uh, you know con good constructive thoughts and an and overarching vision for the art direction of Team Fortress 2. I I know that there's been hundreds of video essays done on the genius of TF2's art style in the way that uh, it not only came out as very aesthetically pleasing, but that um, a lot of the aesthetic choices were actually also gameplay choices and um, things that would affect the quality of the game and. For as many of those as there are, and we can see this very much so in the map design, right? When we see items that are props, that are, uh, I would say, compared to other games, perhaps, perhaps comparing it to, uh, I don't know, to something like Counter-Strike, where you still have lots of props on the map and things you can jump on. It's just not as integral to the quality of the game in Counter-Strike as it is integral to the quality of the game in Team Fortress 2 in Badwater. Um, because you have all of these different classes who uh, 
uh, function very differently depending on the abundance of props that they're able to jump on and off of or depending on their ability to, to use air or to use splash damage, right? All these things that don't actually really exist in a game like Counter-Strike where peeking corners at five miles an hour is the bee's knees. Uh, so Badwater has this, this really nice level of care going on of, of all these, these small, intricate little touches that were put on it by the developers to make it um, a more homey experience. And, and you do feel um, this sort of really cohesive design in most of uh, Valve's maps that they've made. I think uh, you can argue maybe that the map quality started to dwindle uh, and, and, and diminish with the output of Valve diminishing and dwindling um, as they slowly progressively got less interested in making maps, in making uh, more content for Team Fortress 2. I mean, Badwater came out in a time where they were still driving sales of the game. They still wanted people to go out and buy TF2 for 20 bucks or whatever it, whatever it cost at the time. Um, and, and the funny thing is there's probably more incentive now to get people to play TF2 with all of the in-game item transactions, which I think... Uh, you know, a, a real lifelong TF2 player is actually going to spend a lot more on the game than $20, even though it's free-to-play, which speaks to the success of their free-to-play and, uh, you know, in-game economy model, whether they intended that very much, but the in-game purchases, um, the loot crate shit, and the uh, selling stuff on the market, all, all this sort of things. But Badwater is what ties it all together, because without Badwater the economic uh, side effects and benefits of a, a hat simulation game are largely pointless. And, and yes, you, I think you would always have the, the cult of Mario Kart players and um, idle server players, people who love the no man's land, who love the hell custom worlds that TF2 has to offer and just want to stand in the corner and taunt with their unusual and, and hang out in trade servers all days. I understand, okay? Um, that can have a real cozy, campy, creepy, fucked up, cool, internet type vibe to it. Uh, but I think for the rest of us, for the, the other half of the player base, the other majority of the player base, we need bad water for, for us to be involved in the, in the petty stuff, for us to care about hats, because really... Without cool battles to be had, without cool maps to be experienced like Battlewater, why are we going to bother with that sort of effort? And so, another thing that I, I want to consider in relation to this are the aesthetics of hats and how they um, are going to look on Badwater. So, in general, I think, um, you know, any, any very aesthetically concerned person who even thinks about how their hats are going to look on a particular map as compared to how it might look on another map... Uh, certainly won't be involving themselves in any sort of extreme, uh, tasteless paints like the lime green and the, the bright pink. Um, there, there's a lot of very extreme paints that probably don't fit artistically with any map in TF2. I think the, the, the base sort of color palette of Badwater works a lot with subtle tones if any color a very muted pastel tone i'm thinking the particularly drab tincture is a nice color to have on on bad water here a sort of sort of beige uh focused um aesthetic to have perhaps uh when i think it's conager brown they call it or, or something like this definitely more of the uh the brown scale tones maybe an aged mustache gray um, a team spirit always looks appropriate uh, of some kind. You know, one of the value of teamwork, uh, a waterlogged lab coat could look pretty classy on, on bad water. But when it comes to the particular items themselves, uh, you can definitely see some that are more fitting on this mask. So, for instance, when I see um, a medic wearing a Yushanka on bad water, it just takes me out of the immersion because why would you wear a... Uh, such a, a hat that is designed for clearly cold weather on a map that is so warm. I mean, I, I think there should almost be stats um, so that if you are using a hat like that on bad water, uh, it increases your internal body temperature and you overheat and there's some sort of slowness cost or, or thirst you need to go get water or something like that. 
um, to encourage people to choose more appropriate attire, right? Uh, if you see people wearing some big sort of luxurious uh, Santa Claus jacket cosmetic, I don't even know what the name of that would be on Badwater, uh, th there should be some intrinsic punishment to using it besides violating the uh, visual sanctity of Badwater, which is its own sin, for sure not to be underrated. Uh, and so, in contrast to that, there are items that work quite well. So obviously, um, the engineer is, uh, I think it's Texas Slim Dome, it's called, um, Shining Slim Dome, whatever it is. The, the hat that makes engineer bald, I think, is a really appropriate item because it seems pretty hot on Badwater. If you look up at that sun, it's, it's kind of scolding. There's cacti. For there to be cacti, it, I, I think it has to be a pretty warm climate and pretty warm and dry. And for them to be working under that beating sun all day, particularly a, a character like Engineer, who uh, has such a, a physical job and a work-intensive job. You know, other classes get to run around and shoot guns. And the Engineer has to, you know, be, be concerned with uh, real mechanics. Like, they really are the blue-collar um, player of, of uh, Team Fortress 2, you know, even when they're on the red team, which is something to consider. That they're... Uh, their work is the most labor intensive and that they probably are underpaid for for their labor uh, though it's possible they are treated more like a you know a skilled uh a skilled laborer somebody that would go to trade school to like learn to lay bricks you know um this is the kind of level engineers on though i suppose they have more of a, a genius inventor quality to them as well so so maybe the, i'm underestimating their pay grade but um he would not want to wear his construction cap i think i think he would not want to wear his construction cap when hanging out on bad water it's definitely pretty hot i think uh i think i i would want to take it off and reveal my bald head to the world and uh let that absorb some vitamin d um maybe too he's just concerned of maximum vitamin d absorption which i think makes sense uh now thinking of a class like the pyro who's obviously already very hot it makes more sense for them to kind of make extravagant uh fashion choices because uh they're already in this big you know latex whatever the hell uh hazmat suit thing so i'm sure they're they're hot as hell anyway melting away in the sun um and you admire their extreme dedication let alone the, the heat of fire is constantly heating them up perhaps if there was a an ice cube themed or an air conditioning fan themed hat that would make sense for the pyro to wear um though i i do sort of lack faith those hats would be added to the game um, honoring the initial art style of Team Fortress 2, and, as well as the art style of Badwater uh, to an appropriate theme, because, I don't know, bad, ice cubes on Badwater seems a little out of place to me. Um, when I think of a, a character like the Scout, I think it's really cool that he can use the Mad Milk. I think milk would be very refreshing on a map like Badwater, particularly... Um, being able to throw it on the opponents, I, I can see... How it makes sense, uh, Gerardi as well. I, I, on one hand, I kind of don't like the idea of these items. I think it's a little too crude and and uh, too organic, too fleshy compared to the sort of initial mechanical intelligence of all of the weapons in Team Fortress 2. Um, but I, I, I can't forgive them, and I think they would be refreshing on Badwater, considering its uh, its assumed high heat and and dryness as well. Uh, if, if I think about uh, maybe a class like the Engineer, he has an item that uh, are shorts. And I, I can see, again, the Engineer maybe wanting to put on uh, the shorts and to take his hat off to be bald. I think that would be a, a more comfortable circumstance. Um, you know, any, any of the items that sort of remove the stock hat from the class and make them wear something less severe, I, I can understand the appeal of. Certainly sunglasses. There's a lot of classes that have uh, sunglass-themed items, not like the the picturesque shades or whatever, the the achievement item from Poker Night from the inventory for uh, Demo Man. I think those are very impractical, and those would actually kind of hurt your eyes, but Demo Man is a, is a party fiend, so who am I to say? He probably uh, He's probably blasted and doesn't mind at all. But yeah, sunglass uh, items make sense to me. Uh, you, you know, some people want to, like, protect their eyes or something like this and they've got light sensitivity i mean i guess i get it you know i used to be like that until i learned to start embracing the sun and uh 
receive its powerful primal energy that uh, permits all life to exist. But uh, sunglasses get a check from me. I think there's a few classes have some uh, some like heavy duty shoes, um, which I can see because uh, it is sandy. Even though it, it would be uh, pretty hot and get sweaty in your shoes, I think it makes more sense than like a, a flip flops uh, sandal type item, which I think uh, I think Scout has. There's a I think heavy, maybe a few other items have like a, a towel that wraps around their neck. I think I think this is also pretty practical. Probably sweating a lot out there. A big guy like Heavy is going to be sweating a lot on bad water. Surely wants to wipe off some of the sweat. I don't really get the appeal to um, wiping off sweat when you are sweaty. But maybe that's because I've only reached like level 5 sweat. And um, you know, if I were built like the Heavy in a, on a place like Peel Bad Water, I would probably experience like level 10 sweat where it's like... It's it's like uh, there's too there's too much liquid or like you're slippery or something I I don't know it's uh maybe like the I, I I don't know I think I think most people just sort of pathologically hate sweat but it's not really a big deal like I don't know it's cool um and the heavy is entitled to have his rag and wipe it off his sweat it's it's totally fine by me maybe it helps his visibility too and maybe you have the issue uh, of the parts of bad water where it's shady. Um, like underneath a uh, tunnel underneath the bridge between second and third point you're at risk of the sweat kind of getting wet and uh, cold you know because sweat I guess part of the reason it happens allegedly is to cool the body down so I could see that uh, for that reason it might be something you want to wipe away when you round the corner and now you're in a shady area or now you're spending a lot of time in map room and it's not quite as hot because you don't have that direct sunlight on you and you just don't want to be, uh, you know, getting cold now, you know, like, that would be bad, like, I mean, I guess it wouldn't be that bad, but I, I feel like getting cold in general is not, not the kind of mindset you want to be in when you're at war and you're fighting people, I think you do want to get hot, which I would say is, like, the reason why Bad Water is probably a pretty good map, I think, I think, uh, Scout has an advantage, um, to some degree on, on, uh, Bad Water, because he has this tape that's wrapped around his hands, and I think when everybody's hands start to get sweaty because of the heat of bad water, he, it's probably easier for him, you know, in the Team Fortress 2 universe to hold on to his gun really firmly. Um, I think Heavy 2 has, has fingerless gloves. I don't, I don't think those are a stock item. Maybe they are. This cringe. Am I not a TF2 fan? Regardless of whether those are stock or not, fingerless gloves, good to put on if you don't have them on bad water. I'll say that much. Help you grip your... Grip your equipment nice and, uh, nice and, oh, nice and seriously. I think that's a good choice. Now, in, in terms of, uh, overall cosmetics on, on bad water, I, I can appreciate, um, you know, a, a full set if you have, uh, you know, three items that are desert related or somehow themed with, uh, bad water, you know, and bombs and, and stuff like that. Uh, but I forgive you as well if you're not. I, I think, uh, you know, to some degree, the, the art style has gone so far and so perverse and the cosmetic item section, it's, it's difficult to guarantee that some, you know, someone's going to look really aesthetic and, and highlight um, bad water. That being said, I think if you use some of the oldest hats added to the game, it's pretty guaranteed that you're going to obey the original art style of TF2. You're going to, you know, wear a, a ye old baker boy, which I think is, you know, totally appropriate. Nothing, nothing too crass and extreme. You could be wearing uh, the Pyro's Cone, um, which is silly, but not out of place because it, this is a very industrial environment, and I can imagine the Pyro picking up a cone and putting it on its head because the Pyro is sort of insane, and uh, we accept this as part of, the, part of the storytelling, part of the lore on Bad Water in Team Fortress 2. Something I would like to uh, say is I wish there was more... Um, promotional content on PL Badwater. I, I I can't exactly recall um, the, the perfect order of the videos. I know that some videos like Meet the Soldier definitely came out before Badwater was a map. Um, but there's also a handful of Meet the Blank videos. I think Meet the Medic. I think Meet the Pyro. Uh, that did come out after Badwater's released. And I, and I wonder why. Uh, there, there isn't more promo footage of Bad Water, or just it being used as a, as a basis for those, uh, 
for those scenes because I think it has a great iconic aesthetic that really encapsulates a lot of the, the great things that TF2 has to offer. So another aspect that's uh, interesting to talk about is the the word bad being used in a TF2 map. So we have bad water, of course. We also have bad lands. And I think both of these these maps are, are considerably classic to some extent. I think the Badlands probably more held to be a classic map uh, by the Sixes community, but still some degree of, of classicness nonetheless. Badwater probably more heralded as a classic um, by the TF2 community at large and, uh, you know, by anyone who enjoys the, the pub gameplay of Team Fortress 2 to some extent. And the interesting thing is this irony to calling, putting the word bad in the title of a map, right? Because it is uh, uh, hopefully not bad. You, you, you would want the map to not be bad. And so by naming it bad is sort of this ironic um, oxymoron where, uh, you know, in, in both cases they are related to real life locations, which have terms like bad water basin and bad lands. Um, these both referring to, you know, a specific geographic space, but there's still a, a superstitious part of me that questions um, why you would want to put the name bad in something, you know? Um, there's the, you know, classic Malcolm Gladwell type example where, uh, the you know, the father names one of their kids winner and the other one loser. I don't know how much of this is just complete urban folklore at this point. Um, but I like to, you know, I, I, I think it's credible. I think it makes sense, you know, theoretically, that uh, the kid named Winner uh, had a lot of problems growing up, and the kid named Loser kind of ended up being successful. Um, and I don't, I think, I feel like this has to be a, a wives' tale or whatever, or some, uh, some crazy old shenanigans. Because uh, who the hell would name their kid Winner and Loser? But I guess some people are really really autistic, you know, and uh, have no problem uh, n using their children as uh, test experiments. So, with that in mind, uh, there is something to be said for naming, you know, if you named Badwater Goodwater, I think it would just immediately set people off on the wrong trail, because modern day people are so contrarian, you know, they, uh, they want to be bad, you know, in, in as many ways as possible. Um, you know, it's cool to be edgy, it's cool to be contrarian against the system, to be negative, you know, it's not cool to be positive, it's not cool to be for things, it's, um, and it's much more, uh, you know, visible and exciting to be against things, to be, you know, sparking drama and tearing people down than it is to be promoting people, you know, hey, come listen to my lecture where I, uh, shit on this guy and, uh, debate them or whatever, right? Versus, oh, come to this lecture, I'm going to really praise this guy and, uh, and uh, promote his wisdom, you know? It's just less sexy. And so I think, and, and, you know, unfortunately that is the way the world is. Uh, it's not idealistic. It's not, uh, it's not I think, our, our greatest potential. But because it is that way, we do have to play by those rules. And it, it is good marketing, it is good strategy to name the map you know, bad lands and bad water and good, not good lands or good water and, and not be afraid of, um, you know, and in fact, embrace the fact that we're putting the word bad in the map title. Um, you know, there's, there's something to be said for people like an underdog, people like somebody who is called a loser, people like somebody who uh, has low self-esteem for, for some degree. There's this weird thing where like, you know, on one hand, really narcissistic people who have a, uh, you know, a very pristine view of themselves as being a good person, um, they are really good at attracting people who uphold those beliefs and do things for them and feed their entitlement. Uh, but at the same time, there's this weird irony where uh, we tend to also... Um, if that's being too obvious, we also tend to punish that, and we tend to reward people who are uh, are sort of uh, self-pitying and uh, uh, what would the term be? Victim, self-victimizing, you know, and and sort of woe is me, and 
you know, people who are really uh, complaining about life and, and feeling like they're on the, the bad end of the odds. We tend to give them more benefit of the doubt and, and relate more to them because I think there's something safe, you know, in a natural competitive human aspect uh, to rooting for people who, um, or I should say rooting against people who are getting ahead of you and rooting for people who are going nowhere because um, it's, it's basically good for you, you know, and it's also good for you, like, if you're going nowhere to be, um, to make sure everyone else is going nowhere and in that same, uh, same vein, if, uh, if you're going nowhere to yeah, to, to hold people back who are trying to go somewhere because they are getting ahead and it, it just just by the nature of you two existing, it sort of shines a light on your incompetence to go somewhere, right? Um, this is the interesting effect that uh, has, that, I don't know, that just exists with, with uh, the way things work. You put a very calm, non-reactive person in a room with a very reactive and um, and let's say drama creating person the uh, if you give them enough time to interact sometimes what can happen is that the the drama <laughs> hungry highly reactive person um, will start to uh, feel um, threatened by this person and and rightly so because when you when when there's when the when the drama starting reactive person is able to create um, conflict with other people around them or they're able to rouse up these sort of feelings with other people it's very uh it's very effective and in that they're not so obviously the source of it right um but contrastingly if you put that very calm person next to them who's not reactive there's this very clear contrast where it goes oh Wow, now I look very reactive because I'm finally by someone who's putting a good moral standard up, right? And so, uh, yeah, that's that was my that was my point. It is connected to bad water because if you put bad water next to a bad map or just an okay map, you really start to see where it shines. Um, go play Hoodoo, then play bad water, you know. Play fast lane, whatever. I love all these maps. I really do love all the maps that are put in the game by default. But, but Badwater in particular, is uh, its excellence is is something that shines particularly uh, once you put it right up against something else, because you see all the ways in which it does not punish where other maps do, in which it does where other maps should, etc., etc. So as you can see, this is where the cart begins here on Payload Badwater. I just want to point out some nice details that we're seeing here in the map. I like the uh, the high bush here, quite highly placed. This, this sort of bush location you tend to expect on maps. Um, but I like that Badwater, perhaps symbolic of its complex elevation throughout the entire map, right? Utilizing low ground, high ground, middle ground, big ramps. Uh, constant rock formations, which which give you all kinds of sense of uh, elevation differences, right? At, at any of these any of these rocks, you could be standing on and doing incredible things with, using that elevation to your advantage. And in that same way, uh, there's a bush up here on the high ground. Um, perhaps this is an ode to uh, Star Wars: Revenge of the Sith and the duel between um, Anakin and uh, the other guy. Here's, uh, there's some nice signage as well. People with low graphics will not be aware of this, but they did indicate gate one, gate two, gate three, and gate four. So there are technical calls for these gates. I've never heard them used. I've never heard people, um, mentioning the gates, but I, I think it would be a good thing to, uh, add to the public vernacular about Badwater. Let's take a look to it. This nice area up here, it's very rare that you're going to spend time up there because you literally can't because they block you, but let's say you're hanging out here on a rock, you can really enjoy it as part of the nice scenery. You know, this nice, uh, I, I believe this was a, technically a Joshua tree, very common in the southwest of the United States. Um, here we have a, a locomotive, a train, seems to be carrying some sort, of, some sort of coal or something like that, and you do have to really wonder where this, uh, where this train is coming from 
because if you if you clip in here, you'll see that the it's it's actually coming out of nothing. Um, so it's it's either a defunct train, um, which is possible because we we have seen moving trains on many of the maps in Team Fortress 2, but here on Badwater the train is not moving. Um, you also do not see a conductor, uh, nor any lights. Uh, the lights are, are off. It, it does seem that the indication here is that the train is off. It is a defunct train. The capacity for trains in this area, though, is is quite inspiring. I would say so. Uh, I love the the blue sign. It's, uh, it's classy, and I like that it's lit up with two light bulbs. Not very useful now in the daytime, but I like to imagine that at some point... Uh, it would be necessary. Maybe a, a nighttime version of Badwater. Again, very cool to see in the official PL Badwater update by Valve, which I would like to see soon. The speed limit um, is listed as 15, which um, I think I would have to call in a, a, a pro YouTuber like Shonik to uh, prove that uh, this uh, payload cart, even at times 3 speed, does not pass 15 miles per hour. And so the speed limit is healthily obeyed here on PL Badwater. Quite a sparse tunnel. Uh, I, I like these sort of hidden, subtle lights, right? That that don't hit your eyes directly, but they they splash light down onto the ground. It's a uh, innovative lighting solution that you you have these nice contrast areas, right? Of light and dark, and light and dark. And I, I do wonder what that area would look like at at the nighttime. It is quite cool. We do see a mysterious uh, 06 here on the wall next to what appears to be a spawn door. I, I have not seen um, enough fan theories to know what could be behind that spawn door. Perhaps uh, the aliens from Man vs. Machine. Uh, as it does say, it is a restricted area for authorized personnel only. So I believe that would not be me. There's some more details here that we don't really get much time to appreciate while we're playing the map itself because they are a bit out of the way you have this very cool coal type uh, treadmill um, that it seems would be leading into this building and uh, connecting to the the coal train here uh, there is definitely certainly some sort of a mining factory town vibe going on here in uh, and as you see red valley mining an emphasis on the word mining there uh, and this is being defended by the reds as indicated by red valley here's another keep out door there's it seems that this entire building is a place that you're not supposed to go into it's interesting how much of the the tf2 fight happens in the exterior area a lot less of what happens here on badwater is going to be inside these these restricted areas in these buildings um Again, maybe that could be the cool thing that we see expanded upon in the Badwater update. I would love to see a re-release of Badwater. Um, it could be even the fan version of Badwater where uh, the restricted area is actually this outside area. And you are inside this building. And uh, you have views through these windows outside and you can see that it is Badwater but you cannot access it. I do think that would be a quite interesting, quite nice interpretation of Badwater here. A B sign, these these we can pretty standardly expect on all maps to have nice signs by the points. Again, another gate here that is closed. This is actually utilized in Badwater Pro, this uh, this this area right here, uh, to connect this spawn. I, it's a controversial move because I don't know how necessary it is. It saves you uh, two seconds walking instead of having to go this way. Um, was it necessary? Did, does it really balance the game that much better? I don't know. Another uh, area I would like to point out here that I like quite a lot is I like this little uh, water tower silo type thing because I like that there is a little walkway up here that sort of uh, spirals around and connects to this coal area. What a different uh, world it could be if you could uh, sit up here. It would be cool to see uh, in Badwater version 2 this is a, as a sight line. That would be very cool. Maybe I should uh, spawn up onto Sniper to show you guys what I'm talking about. Um, but we'll save that for later. I'm just going to make sure I'm going to keep pushing the cart here. You do see uh, Christmas lights here. I don't know if this is the original implementation implementation of the map, that these were always Christmas lights. Or uh, if they were originally some sort of uh, non-religious imagery. Um, 
here here we have another area that is closed another shutter gate that looks like it could be opened this must be very confusing for new players i would imagine the amount of gates that uh don't do anything the amount of doors that are tricks that are illusions we're seeing more obtuse numbers here nine nine one nine four one makes the area feel certainly quite industrial in addition to this hazard area sign you see this uh this blue sign rise up very nicely out of the ground as we push this blue cart into the third point here on Badwater. Um, again, another nice little warning, unsafe uh, structure. Don't go in this whole area. I would like to see this room explored in a new rendition of Badwater. I think that would be quite interesting. Here we have a, another coal train. Uh, these sort of uh, train cars full of coal or some other sort of uh, mineral perhaps. Uh, feldspar, uh, one of the most common resources to mine. Maintenance room, I think you go in there, you turn off the lights, not very useful yet. We have electrical boxes and uh, things regarding utilities in that area. Again, it says Red Valley Mining. If you weren't sure about the lore of Badwater, it does seem that the red team is here mining something. Uh, this is a blue sign that says General Industries Co., which is kind of foreboding. How'd they get some of their propaganda in here? I think, I think, I guess we can suspend our disbelief that once the card is captured, this area becomes slightly bluer. Keep area clear at all times. Gotta love that because we are not keeping this area clear when we play on Badwater. The Crummy's Burger sign, uh, very cool. We love, we love that there's some, uh, some vaporwave vibes in the original Badwater from 2008 map, Old Geezer Draft Beer. Some good old-fashioned 70s commercialism or whatever the, the era is of Badwater, truly. Brown Nugget Prospecting. Very cool. This is, a, this is a nice spot to take a gander at. I think it is, it is done impeccably well. There are a lot of areas on maps where you don't have a chance to sort of look around and, and see the, the distant scenery. And I think that it's such a good job here at making it coherent. It doesn't... I don't feel like the map's going to end anywhere, you know? I, I, I don't feel like I'm just in this small environment encapsulated by a skybox, right? Because I see those nice rocks over there, this truck, and this area, all of this nice landscape, this whole complex area over here. There's like a bridge over there. Why don't we go check that out? Oh, and we can't check it out. At least, at least it seems I can't. Here, checking out a secret area on PL Badwater. And look at this. How interesting is this? There's a a small little set of miniature model trains, perhaps the Scout's Toys here on PL Badwater. Um, Scout toy train set in this hidden area on PL Badwater. Quite interesting. Quite interesting that we can only see these areas when we are inside of them, once we leave them, it's difficult to see. We've got one more area amidst this darkness that it seems we can access. We're going to head down into quite far away from the main areas. We have the core Badwater map and then a Scout's toy train set hidden secret area in Badwater. And now we're coming down to this secret. Oh, look, look at this. It appears to be the, the setting for Meet Your Match cutscenes where somebody wins. I believe this portion of the map um, possibly was added to all uh, all maps in the game so that there was a cutscene for when you win competitive on, uh, on Badwater because of course they did add competitive to the Meet Your Match 66 map pool. Interesting uh, that the red team here has won by default possibly symbolic in some way. I guess it is reds to defend, so it is also reds to lose. Nice Easter egg, if you didn't know, Badwater fans. There has been uh, un unnoted conniving and tampering going on with the maps that you love in these sort of secret areas. I'm going to uh, investigate the cart area once more here. We have a nice cracky pop sign. Soda pop, considered healthy for you at some point, I'm sure. Imperial mining, interesting. Now we, we've went from Red Valley mining to Imperial mining. We've seen a few other uh, companies' names, perhaps. 
They are associated, contracting one another. Another closed door that you cannot enter. Very confusing. Though they do do an impressive job of making it clear which doors will be important. Here you have a big red resupply, friendly text, and a security camera letting you know that this door is accessible. Unlike a door like this, which also has a little slip of paper on it. And you can see these doors which are accessible do not have slips of paper on them. This door, which once was accessible, now has a red you shall not pass sign, which is uh, quite helpful, of course. We're seeing some mysterious particles here. The dandruff of bad water. Can this be explained? I'm not, I'm not sure I understand exactly what I'm seeing. Very interesting. A map room. The reason it is called map room is because there's a map of the world. What do these dots indicate? is an important topic that should be reserved really for an entire new video of this length because you'll notice they are quite unusually placed not at population epicenters as you might expect in all cases right as you do see here if we look at uh at england so <laughs> you see uh, a little dot on uh inverness and on uh brighton which are certainly not the most populous cities uh in, a, in, a, in the United States of America here, we're seeing uh, what appears to be uh, uh, Corvallis, Oregon, or Eugene, Oregon, or something of the sorts being highlighted. Not, not, a, not an usual pick for population density. I do wonder what the logic was in creating the dots on Map Room. Here, seeing some computers as well. Uh, this would be a exciting place to work, in my opinion. I like the idea of working in an open office. Again, no tight, tightly compacted cubicles, but you actually, you have a little sort of cozy area under this deck. You have a nice view of this whole room. No doors, no doors and big wide openings, a very sort of uh, compelling, open, friendly workplace arch architecture. Uh, you've got big wide open windows. It's basically like you're outside. There's no, nothing to shelter you from mother nature, which we will actually uh, go into in a minute here, how mother nature can have a play and uh, affect things on P.L. Badwater. A nice death sign by this tire in the restricted area of the map that you cannot access under normal circumstances. This is the famous stairwell that I've mentioned so many times so far. I do like that there is a stairwell like this that feels as if it has been designed in a useful way. It is a uh, advantageous for the red team to use and advantageous for the blue team to use and I, I like that that it's also not uh it, it still feels like an alternative path because there there is a risk associated with either team finding each other you know two players from the opposite teams going up inside or going down inside this uh large atrium which happens to be a stairwell because you are now engaged in essentially a life or death 1v1, there's lots of places to do splash damage if you're explosive classes, making it certainly a more vulnerable place to be as a hit scan character. Another nice sign, industrial, trust the best. Lots of great, just blank, brandless, communist imagery. Very cool. Some nice touches like this hose, some barrels. You, you can definitely imagine this, this being a nice workplace. At some point in time, another Crummy's Burgers poster. The love for the burgers does not end. Another uh, door you cannot enter, which uh, I would like to know what's behind this door. Oh, wait, it's the red spawn. Good luck explaining that one, Valve. It's kind of strange. There's this little small purgatory space where it's almost as if there were a, a room in there. It'd just be a little closet, a little shed. Here we have a... Uh, some some paperwork indicating when people arrive to the workplace with a, a clock to punch in, a, a machine which notarizes that you have arrived. We do have warheads here. I'm, I'm not entirely sure what that's about or what that this uh, strange, powerful aura is that I'm seeing. This is I guess this is a, a sign that you're not supposed to be in this room as a mortal. I'm having some sort of psychedelic experience perhaps here 
in the warhead room behind Badwater spawn. And this is, you could think why they're so coveted, perhaps. This is because of the, uh, the radiation um, from being so close to these weapons that possibly are, are charged by very unstable elements. And uh, they're defeating my sanity, as you see right here. I'm losing my sanity by being near these warheads. So I'll return to the safe spawn room where we have this thick, uh, I'm sure numerous inch thick glass protecting me from the radiation. A top secret room I cannot enter as well. And it seems that we have, uh, the time has expired here on blue on this portion of Badwater, fear not. And I do, I mean, I'm enjoying these, these pipes and air conditioning units. We'll wait here for the round to start. An area I certainly have not given much attention to just yet that I think is a very nice portion of this map is the area behind the B point here. Interesting enough that it says entrance. It does let you know, hey, there's things going on over here. Though I can't say it's so obvious what the entrance would be to, right? Um, this feels more like an entrance to the real part of the map, but it's it's not covered with a arch, which makes it a clear portal. Again, another room you cannot enter, which has been signified by paperwork, a closed sign. Another dud door, another dud door. Lots of nice details. We're seeing some boxes of dynamite. Clearly not not a, not an issue for the Team Fortress 2 characters, as it's rare that I've ever seen these explode. Let me just check my settings here. I'm going to make sure no clip is on. Interesting that we see this. Another secret room, perhaps. A, a spawn to... What is this? This whole area. A blue spawn here as well. Could this be... Could this be a clue to Badwater 2? The highly anticipated map, we see a nice, uh, a very nice, perhaps, gas tank prop here. Some signage, no dumping allowed. Interesting, interesting. Is there anything in this room? No, there is not. Only mystery, secrets, and speculation in that room that we can know for sure. And of course, these iconic shipping crates, you have some blue, you have some red, as we must, uh, there's always some kind of representation for the two teams on Badwater. Very nice to see. There are some really nice uh, areas you can hang on to. Little ledgy things here that they, the developers have so kindly put in the map that I quite appreciate. I'm going to turn off no clip now to take advantage of them. So for one, we have this little area here. Isn't this nice? I don't know when I would ever use this, but you do have the option. I'm going to show you another area now up here. This is a, a quite simple one. I, I wouldn't even consider this one actually a, a sneaky spot, but rather an essential spot that all Badwater players should know. But this can be very useful when fighting someone. You have a lot of cover, and they'll probably just be shocked that you haven't fallen off yet that you're, that you're using this. We have this spot as well, which is very, very nice. And if you are able to, I believe you can get up there. I don't know if I will be able to as scout. Let me attempt this slowly with my good frame jitter here. And look at this. Badwater loves to give you high ground options. Isn't that right? That option is fantastic. So now I would like to uh, talk about a, a different map, which uh, is actually the same map, which is Badwater Snowy. And so, my reason in highlighting Badwater Snowy is it helps us experience Badwater in a new light, quite literally, um, a different season, right? So, we can imagine that uh, Badwater it is a real place, and so like any real place, there would be numerous seasons that occur throughout the year in that place. And I will demonstrate this to you now some of the unique differences between Badwater Snowy and the official version of Badwater. And even though this was community created, I do consider this an appropriate uh, extension of the original Badwater universe. Is Badwater S Snowy technically canon? I think technically the answer is no, but at this point, what parts of TF2 really are canon and are not, considering how much of the game has been created by the community, even if implemented and added to the game finally by a developer. 
I will now turn on no clip to give you a better view and perspective. Something I really like about this map is the weather particles. It would be something to affect your frame rate in a negative way. However, sometimes we have to sacrifice for beauty and bad water. Snowy is, is certainly teaching me that. You'll, you'll see here it says two red team babies from blue team. Don't run. It's just ham. A very cheeky message on the payload card. Something I could see being added by Valve themselves. They do like this, this sort of cheeky humor. Mission. Speaking of being added by Valve themselves, this uh, highly saturated uh, bundle of gifts, I could, I, I should not see this being implemented by Valve. Uh, unfortunately, uh, knowing their current design choices, I could see it happening. But the tree here definitely fits. Some of these... Uh, these boxes, I want to say, are, are far too flamboyant. Look at these damn colors. The candy cane, a nice subdued red. Nothing too extreme. I like it. We have one box inside here representing uh, a gift. I'm perhaps okay with that. This one as well. It might be a little a little pink. What Which mercenary is out there giving pink gifts? I don't know. And... As you'll see, most of the landscape is similar, but they have replaced the cacti with these nice coniferous trees, which are growing up top. We still have this this bush has been maintained. It's just now snow dusted, the second bush. And uh, it, it gives a nice snow scene. It does seem like it would be a place where you could sn snowboard. I did mention earlier that these lights would look nice at nighttime, and sure enough, now it is nighttime on Badwater. These, these lanterns in the wall being made much more apparent on Badwater Snowy, a certainly uh, beautiful version of this map. You'll see here that this, this area is protected by the snow and the tunnel, which actually seems quite practical. Uh, seems quite practical that the tunnel could be used as a shelter from ab abnormal weather conditions. I do like that aspect of Badwater Snowy. I am not a fan of these... Um, silly props. However, to replace the health and ammo packs, I understand the motivation behind putting them there, but I think Battlewater Snowy could be a serious place and not a, not a, uh, you know, Sinterklaas, silly, uh, you know, let's all play with the family around the tree place. You know, it can have that same serious tone that the original TF2 maps have. There's, there's a goofiness to the core, uh, writing and, uh, sort of, I guess, the, the, the vibe of the universe of Team Fortress 2, but it is not a, a visually silly place at its core, the, the game that Valve released, besides the, you know, the, the cartoonish gore and, and the way the characters look. But it's not silly, I wouldn't say. It's, uh, it's retro, it's, it's slightly cartoon-esque compared to many games, but the, the environment, the weapons, it, it actually has quite a mature visual tone to it, which uh, these ammo boxes, I think, do not do a, a great job of honoring here on Badwater Snowy. It is uh, quite quite easy to pick up on certain details here that you might not have noticed before due to the sort of extreme lighting here on Badwater Snowy. Of course, some of the rooms not really being changed at all. Map room here largely resembling itself in its original form. I should add that map room before these first two points are captured the shutters are closed here and i do think this has this was a, a a design choice by valve more to do with uh trying to not mislead new players to the map um you know making sure they don't get lost or they have a good sense of where they should and shouldn't be at this point in time than it does with actually restricting access that being said it does restrict access i'm not i'm not totally sure that this was done as a balance choice if it was i think that's equally valid for valve to say hey look we're worried about blue team spawn camping or whoever putting a teleporter in map room i don't know i don't know why um it, it does at times feel frustrating though that there is no access to map room even through these windows which i think would be quite a cheeky way to enter it uh making it only available to classes with great jumping mobility uh, this sign as well, dropping down when the second point captures, this door becoming no longer accessible. Quite uh, interesting features of that first and second point 
all of the signs that do change and move and gates like this one that will open. This area in the back here, quite beautiful. We're, we're seeing some, some props that are slightly different than what we saw on the original version of Badwater, mostly the same. However, we do have this nice snowman, which I would say is very much so in theme. A very nicely modeled snowman here on PL Badwater Snowy, a great alternative to the famous and beloved map PL Badwater. Again, all of the original signage has been honored here on this reskin adaptation of PL Badwater Snowy. And that will uh, take us to one more iteration of PL Badwater, which is uh, has been mentioned before. Of course, PL Badwater Rainy. And PL Badwater Rainy, I, I'm not sure if it came before PL Badwater Snowy, but I would say it is the most iconic Badwater reskin likely due to its absurdity. Um, I, and I will be going over some of those design choices, uh, certainly as we play through it, and, and I'll address whether it, they were good decisions to make for the map. Uh, you could, uh, I suppose, if you're strictly following the lore of Team Fortress 2 here, blame the, uh, the blue team, or, or the red team, I suppose, whoever engineered and constructed and architected this uh, this map, PL Badwater, within the Team Fortress 2 universe for making it so uh, vulnerable to floods. It would make sense then that this tunnel was actually cleared out as a flood channel, perhaps something to create more volume, more surface area, more space to put the water so that there is no, uh, there's a, the, a lower sea level rise, perhaps a, an interesting uh, approach that could be utilized uh, by scientists uh, today in uh, places like Miami and uh, in Los Angeles to prevent sea level rise, to bore giant tunnels through the earth underneath them that could be uh, utilized. I do wonder if that would be interesting and, and if that would be useful. Let me uh, just turn on SV Cheats, as I believe that will help the smoothness here of our movement. And... Uh, so the, the most apparent thing you'll notice about Badwater Rainy is visually it's quite similar to Badwater Snowy, but instead of being sort of uh, covered in snow and uh, having all of these foliage be snow-kissed, it's actually uh, perhaps springtime, fall, summer, and you are seeing this nice, uh, this nice greenery. It does resemble a perhaps more... Uh, more moody climate with forests, um, something akin to the northwest of uh, the United States or perhaps northern Europe during the summer. Um, I will turn my HUD off here so you can actually see more of the, of the screen here, more of bad water, rainy. Um, the, the classic uh, coal-carrying train here still out of service, as it is on all renditions of bad water. So a, I would say a big design issue with Badwater Rainy is um, the amount of water on, uh, I guess, most of the map. I think the, the problem here is that uh, you're at great risk of drowning as a blue player. I think it makes fighting very difficult in these areas where the, the cart has to be underwater, um, which if I, if I check here might actually be the entire uh, area. Yes, it does seem that the entire length of the cart track is underwater, which uh, lends itself to lots of drowning. Uh, while it does look quite cool underwater, I, I do think Valve did a good job of how they made the the game look underwater. It's not a the 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 movement uh, does not translate very well. I'll show you what it's like to move underwater without no clip. You're a bit sluggish, a lot slower than you are on land. You have some almost as if you have. Uh, some sort of acceleration or ramp up each time you want to move into a new direction. And of course, that constant risk of drowning. Um, you can stay on the surface like this. However, it is uh, it, it does leave you with that bobbing motion, which I would say is not uh, not very optimal for aiming in general. You do see some of these nice, perhaps dandelion flowers blossoming. All across the ground here on Badwater Rainy, clearly a, a place of a 
create diversity, having lots of different, uh, a very diverse ecosystem. Um, we're seeing plant life that you don't normally see on, on bad water. The stock version, it, which is normally quite deserty, and here it's clearly we're in some sort of forest environment, as you can see by this this part of the, the skybox, this, the way we're surrounded by this sort of vague uh, forestry. I would say, due to this overwhelming flooding, it's harder to appreciate this this back end of the map. All the design that has been done here, could, because of the water, all you can really see are these rafters, uh, these walls, that sort of and the actual map, and then these parts of the skybox, which I think are a lot less convincing in terms of its feeling like a real-world environment compared to the original Bad Water. Um, but I, I suppose you can blame that more on the addition of the amount of water here we have on Bad Water Rainy. Um, perhaps a, a tongue-in-cheek ode to the developers um, to show them, hey, why didn't you put water on Bad Water? and compensating for the amount of water that is not in bad water to a stupendous and tremendous and uh, exaggerative degree. Here we have one of the few nice areas of the map where uh, you have just a very low level of water. There is still water here, but it is not too much that it is uh, it, something that inf affects your movement very much. You still have a, an overall land-esque movement. And of course there are some of these high ground areas where you can completely get away from the water, which can be quite a nice advantage. This last point being incredibly difficult to set up in or hold because you are now really at constant risk of drowning due to how deep a lot of these waters are. Uh, a lot of times in video games we forget what it's like to be in these environments in real life, but I want you to imagine here on Badwater Rainy, how long you would have to hold your breath and how scary this kind of swimming maneuver would be like this. That sniper. So first, first. Oh, so, so first off, um, uh, sniper swims extremely fast, you'll, you'll notice, on Badwater Rainy. Um, if any character were to swim that fast, that is, that is like Michael Phelps level swimming. That is a very fast swim, because if you, if you notice, this is probably going 20 or 30 feet underwater. Um, certainly not an easy task for a layman. And now, I actually do want to check out this area again. You'll notice that uh, it does not seem that they have patched this... Uh, this strange uh, psychedelic affected by the uranium from the warheads area of Badwater. Um, it still seems to be a problem here on Badwater Rainy, um, but maybe not a problem. Maybe it's actually a solution. Again, letting us know that there are secrets worth coveting for that team. Like we've done on other versions of the map, I want to uh, take, a, take a moment to actually leave the main map and check out uh, Scout's Scout's toy train set, if we can find it here, uh, assuming it has not been removed. Yes, so uh, in keeping with the original bad water, ooh, perhaps some uranium as well over here. We do have the original Scout's toy train set portion of the map here, having, of course, Scout's toy train set here on bad water rainy. Um, and the, the developer did do a good job to retexture all of these to resemble the overall uh, foliage of the uh, reskin Badwater Rainy, which we very much appreciate. And you'll notice there is some, uh, some strange sort of invisible props here hanging around that we're not able to see. Uh, but just a nice Easter egg in Badwater Rainy. It's nice that it's been honored in that same way that it exists on the original version of Badwater. So we're going to, uh, to head back to the original version of Badwater, and I want to talk about some of the... Uh, parts of the map and some suggestions for what they could be called. I think that while there are certain terms that we expect as typical uh, callouts for bad water, of course we have roof, we have map room, you could say lots of uh, over, under, left, right calls, we have tunnel, um, behind roof, flank, uh, boiler room, etc., bridge room I like to say. 
But I, even, even if you look up on uh, comp.tf the official calls for a lot of these areas on Badwater, I think some of them are, are still not popularized. And even some of them, I think there's room to innovate. So I'm going to offer some of my opinions on what would be good calls to have here on Badwater. Good callouts, new locations that can be uh, made more real to us by acknowledging them in Badwater and saying, hmm, what, you know, this is an actual place. This is more than just some neutral room, right? This has a identity, this place, and so, thus we will give it a name, right? Uh, so, so this room is uh, easy enough to describe. I would describe this room as the spawn room. I think this is a, uh, a fair term. Not going to cause any confusion here to be in, in spawn room. Um, this area I would call the sticks uh, because it's you really shouldn't be hanging out there very much, um, which would make it, uh, it, I mean, it makes sense. This is the sticks in the spawn room. Um, the only situation in, in which I would, I would say that sort of call is useful is if uh, perhaps one of your teammates is uh, sort of messing around and you would say, Benjamin, what do you... Get the fuck out of the sticks. What? Come, we gotta push the cart, man. You know, I, I could see that being a uh, a situation in which that is useful. We have these nice uh, gate one through four signs I mentioned earlier above each of the uh, doorways here, leaving the blue spawn. I think these should be utilized more, much like process having uh, door one, two, three. I, I like this kind of. Uh, numerical organization i think it's coherent again going from left to right uh depending on you know which side you are on i suppose it is right to left uh depending on which side you are on this sort of opening area right around the spawn usually doesn't have a, a call out i think i think there should be more um calls related to the the rails and the cart um it's uh, it's no accident that the the rails are only on part of the map. So, for instance, this area could be called uh, rail start. Rail start. Rail start. There's a scout rail start. Of course, you can also say on the cart. But the problem with a call like cart, um, or even being left to oh, they're by where the tracks are by the left spawn. See, that takes a lot more time than just saying rail start. Rail start. You know, because imagine the cart's all the way over here now, and I'm fighting a pyro, and I need to communicate with my team or my buddies, and I say, Oh, pyro's one health rail start. One health rail start. Right? They're, they're like right there. Okay? These, this area... So these are rocks. But the problem is that if I say, Oh, yeah, I need help by rocks. There's a lot of rocks on PL Badwater. So, something I have... Theorize is actually a uh, numerical uh, division of the rocks. You you would have it be rocks one, rocks two, rocks three, rocks four, rocks five, excuse me, rock six, and rock seven. So it's slightly slightly organized by uh, height. Um, but really, what I realized after sort of beta testing out those callouts was it was it was a little difficult to coordinate with my team. So. The, the, the thing that makes these rocks unique is that they are um, on the ground here on this ground level and really isolated like little islands. So I like to call those ground rocks. So you've got start rail and then ground rocks. Two sort of important call outs. You have, um, th this could be the walkway up to cliff. This, we definitely consider a cliff here, a big edge drop off if you fall off that cliff. And this all sort of being cliff side. It's all slightly cliff-like. It is the high ground. You can also just call this high ground. Um, that seems like an appropriate call out to me. And of course, this is this area will still be tunnel. I think tunnel is a uh, appropriate call to have, certainly. Um, so I want you to remember those those key terms we have. We have floor rocks. We have uh, we have uh, spawn rail, <laughs> start rail, rail start. <laughs> Spawn rail, again, sort of interchangeably, these terms can be used. Just in the same way you might call it map room, you might call it um, 
map study hall. You might call it um, topography room, right? All the same idea. And the important thing is that you're on the same page with your teammates and that they know what you're talking about. Um, this should certainly be called bunker. Um, at, at least you can call it first bunker. When you're on first, you know that if someone says bunker, they're talking about this area, not the area way back there. Um, this whole this whole little uh, area right here definitely deserves a name. Um, and, and a sort of easy term for it is uh, paradise. Uh, this, is a, this is a term that I would like to suggest. It's because you... Um, there is a light at the end of the tunnel, and um, if you if you make it, if you discover that the way out is through, you will find yourself in paradise, right? So this would be certainly paradise, would be the call for this location. I, I think it's a useful location. Again, what if there's somebody on, what, what, can't we just say on cart? No, what if the cart is way back there and there's somebody here in paradise? Spies sneaking through paradise, right? Bunker, and then these uh these two packs if we use the location of the sun here and uh the thing is we're slightly dependent on whether it is daytime or nighttime here on bad water so if it is almost sunset we can assume that this sun is setting in the west but if it is sunrise we would assume that then the sun is rising in the east uh, my impression is that it is the uh it is the afternoon. Um, I, this is an un unsubstantiated claim as to what time it is on Badwater. Um, yes, a lot of war does take place early in the morning. Um, but I, I, considering the fact that we are in a, uh, a deserty environment, I feel like the desert environment is more often associated with uh, sunsets than it is sunrises. Just in general, in pop culture, maybe this is like a 10% positive hunch I have, right? I'm 10% sure that bad water, this is actually the sun setting in the west. So if we imagine that, if the sun is setting in the west here, this would be the north pack and this would be the south pack. Problem is if it is rising, um, those, those packs would, positions would switch. So this would be east, this would be north, and this would be south. So... Either way, I, I do like calling these just general areas, um, North Pack, South Pack, North Pack, South Pack. Again, you need to talk. Um, I would I would set this up with your team beforehand and, and kind of have a powwow about what time do you guys think it is on Battlewater? Do you think this is like, you know, do you think this is like 3 p.m.? Or do you think this is, uh, you know, 10 a.m.? And, and uh I guess it's important to note, too, where the sun is. Um, it is not directly overhead. Um, it, it, it could be, if you consider, uh, for instance, that the full day, the, the arc of the sun was like this. Right? In that case, the sun um, would be directly overhead the, the entire time, which would imply that we are closer to the equator. However, seeing as this is certainly a reference at least to uh california which is is something closer to uh 30 degrees north if i am uh if i am correct uh we would be more likely to think that the uh, the arc the the sun um does not necessarily go directly overhead of course it does depend on which time of the year we are in which season uh, which equinox or solstice we are closest to whether or not the sun is traveling directly overhead but unfortunately with the information that we have here um, there's no stars visible on this version of Badwater. It is very hard to tell what the trajectory of the sun is in this isolated position. Um, so, in in conclusion there, I, th I think whether this is North Pack or South Pack, you're going to have to uh, talk it out with your team. Um, for me, again, I, I've said that this is not a sun rising in the, in the east, but this is a sun setting in the west. And we know that this if this sun is setting in the west, this is North Pack and this is South Pack. Um... That's my official statement. Now moving on, this area certainly can just be called choke. I think it's it's the most obvious choke. I don't think anything else here really is a perfect thing to call as a choke. This is a choke. Uh, the cart is here. Rails, rail choke could be a more specific term we could use if we want. Um, this little room, I think, could have a call, but it also seems a little 
useless to give it nomenclature because I can't imagine it ever being useful. Perhaps if an engineer was sitting up here, which would be kind of a bad spot. Um, maybe if there, there's a 1v1 and someone was hurt there, but why would anyone ever really stay here? Um, so for that reason alone, we're not going to give this place a call. I, I just can't see there ever being a situation where you really, really, really need to call it. So this is the second point. We have rooftop up there, of course. This area, um, you can you can call this uh, second spawn. Um, it, it, we call it second spawn because it is the second spawn for the blue team. Um, defense, of course, really only has one spawn. So this is really the only second spawn on the stock version of the map. So we would call this second spawn. That's uh, something to note. Now, uh, let's get to these flank areas. So here we have uh, a staircase. Um, you could just call this stairs. It's the most obvious set of stairs. It depends which, t which team you're on. If I'm on blue team, these are stairs for sure. This, is, um, this would be called energy room because it says conserve energy. There's a sink in here. Um, I would also accept the term sink room. I'm in sink room or sink. Oh, no, I'm fighting a soldier in sink. I'm fighting a soldier in energy. I think old school players would prefer energy because it's a bit more tongue in cheek. And it mentions the, the sign here. But new school players tend to have FPS configs and they have a lot of these sparkly details turned off. The sink would still be here, however, so they would call this sink room for sure. Why is that cart not moving? We come over here. Um, this. I would call flank room. This is this is flank room. It's very out of the way. Um, certainly part of this big flank, the most obvious room, because that is the sink room. Um, there's the stairs over there, and then this is flank room. And here we get to the, the sort of behind area. I'm in favor of calling this something like train yard or shipping yard or crates or trash yard. Um, those are all good terms. I think uh, shipping related terms especially this, this whole area does re remind me slightly of Train Yard MGE, or I should say Train Yard MGE reminds me a lot of this part of PL Badwater. Um, but crates is a, a safe term to use. The only risk is that if you do say crates, it might sound like they are literally on top of these two crates. Um, yep, there's the, the pack in, uh, in Shipping Yard. Or even more loosely, you could use the term yard, because nowhere else should really be called a yard on Badwater. This is rooftop, of course. Rooftop, AC unit, behind the AC unit, sentry behind AC unit, in front of AC unit. Staircase. So, if I'm on the blue team, these, these are going to be called the, uh, the back stairs. And if I'm on the red team, these will be called our stairs, right? Our staircase, or back staircase very very useful staircases um to be aware of certainly this is the boiler room because of this big boiling unit again just one of those names that sticks well done this could just be called rails main choke all these things are uh i would say appropriate probably less of a choke point here more of like a main or a rails area but it is quite easy to distinctualize because you've got rails You've got boiler room and you've got bridge room. I don't know if a lot of people like calling this bridge room. It bridges over from one side to the other. And it bridges over the, the cart. Um, I'm going to call it bridge room. I think it's a good term for it. I would like to hear other terms. But I think bridge room is the most coherent. Because it of course is bridging over from one side onto the other. This whole area under is really the only term you need. Under. I think the, the only part you might want to speculate is if they're, or, or uh, stipulate I should say, is if they're by the pack here, maybe under by pack, or if they're in this little weird area, which I would call this the, uh, the stump, you know? This is, this is stump, because there's a little slight increase in elevation in it. There's a stump. Somebody might be hiding there. A teleporter might be hiding there. It's very interesting that you have this vertical cover here in stump, so that uh, perhaps someone could jump over you and you could sneak into them if for some reason you were hiding there. Very interesting and unusual place to be. So again, we have bridge room, we have boiler room, we have underneath, we have stump, we have uh, underneath by pack. And now we're getting to the more complicated third point here. This is C. Nobody's going to call it C. We'll call it third. It's easier to understand. Letters, we don't count things in letters. We don't say I have B. I want to buy... Uh, 
uh, B apples and C apples, so then I'll have F apples. It's like, no, we don't do that. That's crazy. Casual shafting company. Very cool. A, a nice detail for sure. So, we, uh, we need a good nomenclature for this whole building and whole area because it's, it's quite confusing, right? This part of the map is a little easier to understand, and I'll knock that out really quick. We have this uh, pre-map room. Map room itself. Again, I think pre-map is, 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 is a perfectly fine uh, term for this. Or you could say map room purgatory. You could also say deck room. I think deck room perhaps could be the best term for this sort of room. The room that connects to map room, of course. This room, I don't know if it actually needs a name. We have the uh, left of spawn area and uh, the right of spawn area if you're on defense. But I would argue that these terms need a more, uh, the, you know, they need to be better because if you're on blue team and you're calling there's a sniper here or there, you'd say sniper left spawn, right? Or you'd say sniper right spawn, which is okay. But um, could it be the left down spawn? It's a little confusing. And also, does that mean they're right here, you know? Does that mean they're behind these little boxes? How can you know? I guess you could say right spawn boxes, right? This area, um, I, I think, should just be called platform. Because it's this weird elevated platform, and why would you be here? Platform, I think, I think is a good term. That's my nomination for what to call this. This area, this whole upper right side, does need some terms. And the safe term for all this is top. This is top. This is top, and then this is top platform, perhaps, but does that confuse you with this platform? It confuses me. So, uh, I, I think, I think bird nest is my new, uh, suggestion for this, this location, bird nest, just cause it's kind of the highest high ground we have in this area on top bird nest. You could also say, uh, top bird, bird top, top eagle. I think all terms I would understand if somebody said, Bro, there's a fucking engineer in Top Eagle. I would say, all right, I got it. I got it unlock. Um, coming over here, we have the sniper room. That's that's what you're just going to call that sniper tower. You have the stairwell. You know what stairwell that is. You have tires, of course, tires. Tires, sniper room, sniper tower. Also, tower is an appropriate term. And this room's a little tricky because I think of it, I'm sure lots of people think of it as entrance to tires. Um, an easy way to describe it as well is flank. But we need to be more specific. How do we describe this little area and make it different from this area, right? Because you could have a pyro on that side or on this side. You need you need to make the accurate call. Sure, it's in the area that connects to tires, but where? Because if, if I'm going to round this corner and there's a dude right there it's a lot different than a dude right there i feel like i've got i can see this guy you know but if they're oh they're right there you can have a huge high ground advantage over me so this whole room i'm going to call connection or connector and then this is going to be big and this is going to be little because this is the little little room the little hall the little platform and this is the big big hall big platform with the health pack right so i would say oh there's a soldier and connector big or soldier and connector small so people let's go through small let's go through small right and you say small everybody knows what you mean because it, it's weird i don't know why you'd have to go through small instead of big but maybe you want to coordinate that maybe there's people in here you say no 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 let's go through small right nice what a good calm let's go through small let's go into tower let's go back to tires I'm going to check out stairwell. I'm going to top. And then we do need a room for this. Uh, or, or we need a name for this room. Um, it does really feel like a little basement-y room. It's underneath tower. Um, so the, the, the perfect term to call this is under tower. Under tower. Under tower. Under tower. But maybe it's not the perfect term. I'm open to suggestions. Please please leave your comments and suggestions for a better term for this room. Um, it could just be called box. I like the idea of box or or uh, floorboards. I'm in floorboards because you'll see there's uh, there's not as many floorboards in some of these other areas. There are floorboards here, but we know this is big. We know this is small, right? 
hanging out over here in floorboards. Probably not so uh, coherent. Um, I'll have to think of an intro. Maybe something involving the strange slanted triangle. I, I like I like the idea of, of thinking about that. Maybe uh, maybe slant room, slant room, slant room, light bulb room. I, I'm open to lots of different ideas here. And of course, this is the red spawn. Basically, you've got spawn, and then you've got the lower spawn, upper spawn or lower spawn. Simple enough. If you're on the red team, you've got the bomb site. We've got the big pack. Big pack. They're by big pack. They're by the big pack. They're by, they're by mega pack. The super pack. Slant room. I like slant room. And now, this is, this is the beast that we need to conquer. This whole thing. So this, uh, this whole big hall is going to be called hall. Or side hall. Hall, very easy to understand. Where else is there a hall on Badwater? This is the hall we're talking about. This is the side hall. The side hall. Okay? And now we get into this room. We call this recess. Why do we call this recess? Because there's a recessed part of the ground, right? And you know specifically that... Maybe if I'm talking about recess, I'm saying there's a telling in recess. You know where it is. It's right there. Someone's hiding in recess. Probably hiding up there. Probably hiding in there. If I'm here in Hall and I, I get a call, yo, casual, there's uh, there's some tough guys in uh, recess. And I go, pow, 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 right? And I, I murder them. So we got we got an important half of it covered recess in a hall. This room, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna loosely call perch. This is a perch right here. This is the nice perch that you have watching bridge room and boiler room. This is, this is perch. Gotta love Perch. Um, where there's the unsafe little hallway here. There's a little pack by Perch. This is just going to be called Deck. Because there's just a nice little deck here. You can watch that side of the team. And then you have these stairs, which we will call Sea Stairs. I know I know, I said the people prefer the third. But this is more of a term than a description of... It's not like there's B stairs and A stairs as well. These are just C stairs. And that's uh, that's got most of your stuff covered, right? Nice. This whole area, I guess we can call railing. Hanging out and railing. And it just means somebody's anywhere up here. Should be enough of a call, because you, I'm, I'm over here in perch, and somebody goes, Oh, sniper railing! I go... Target locked on. <laughs> right? Easy enough to understand. So the I, I think I hope my calls are started starting to be used now by professionals on Badwater and your friends and yourself. Because as much as Badwater is um, what it is in, in its most raw form, the experience of it, right? Um, our sensation. Our, our our eyes, our our, uh, our our you know our vision, our hearing, our touch, and, and deeper than that, this sort of sense of consciousness, this sense of being, the sense of experiencing, the sense of time passing, all all of these aspects of our sensory experience are what give us the information that decides what bad water is and and uh, ultimately make it what it is. But we can't forget that. Bad water is as much um, that it's real sensory experience as much as you know it, it, it is that as much as bad water is about what we call it and what we say about it and what we believe about it and the terms that we use about it and this is why I I spent so much time addressing the call outs on bad water and the terms that we use to describe different parts of the map because I believe by um, by hey you know expressing this part of bad water by you know after the third point, when you go forward and go to the left to this connecting room to tires, we should call the connect the little hall, you know, the, the room, the door that connects it with the stairs on the right side, with the small health pack, we should call that big. And we should call the path to the left of that, that's a little more narrow, we should call that small. And by calling it big and small, um, I think big and small become a bit bigger in our brain, uh, in, in our perception of what bad water is, in our not even just our perception, because perception creates reality, right, and influences reality, but what bad water is now in our brain and, and how we will play bad water in the future. Um, 
is affected by our nomenclature for this map and and for our interpretations of the of this map and our analysis and you know um, this is where law of attraction stuff kind of comes from is that by focusing on certain parts of the map those parts of the map become more real by 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 focusing on you know bridge room in bad water or the the roof on bad water your brain allocates more space to it and it, it it gets more attention. It's more in your random access memory. It's it's more likely that you are going to do anything related to that. It's just going to be more on your mind. You're going to be more conscious. Imagine what it's like to play a map for the first time, and then how differently you play that map once you've played it a hundred times, right? So this sort of process of of, of uh, your behavior being affected by your knowledge and awareness for where you are, and and uh, your awareness for where you where you are extending in a number of different ways, right? There's the literal um, physical awareness and then for your ideas and notions surrounding a certain place right so you might not um, jump up to map room from below be, um, because of certain experiences and associations you connect with map room so it's important to remember that it's bad water but it's also what's in our brain about bad water and of course at some point here i want to express gratitude for the fact that bad water has led me to the place where i am right now speaking and recording and talking about it for the sake of this video and that perhaps in another universe where bad water does not exist i would be making a similar video talking about another beloved team fortress 2 map for 12 hours however that's only speculation and i cannot know for sure as this is the universe i am in there's something to be said for very small changes very small differences between outcomes and between the way things go, that can ripple effect far into the future in ways that we don't expect. A, a very small change of footing early on can lead to a very drastic change in, uh, in destination uh, far later on. You know, that's what they say about investing. Um, you know, if you save the same amount at age 20 versus uh, age 30, put it away and don't touch it till you're 65. It's actually uh, a lot more if you put it away when you were 20 than it is if you only put it away when you're 30. There are exponential gains, and uh, as time goes on, things can become exponentially far away from where they started. And so, on one hand, I do feel very grateful that bad water exists and has led me to this point, and perhaps my reverence to it is a sign of greater things. I can, I can only speculate and imagine what my life would be like uh, without bad water. And to a larger extent, if my, the gravity of TF2 would have been as strong as it actually ended up being, um, I, I'm sure I would like to imagine that it would have been, because Team Fortress 2 is something that I, I really did come to enjoy, but uh, I could also have seen things going very differently because my case is probably unusual to other people and that I was not a gamer at all before playing TF2 and there was even a year and a half period um, after I'd been playing the game for about three years three or four years I should say three and a half to be precise where I stopped playing TF2 I stopped I stopped playing any video games I, I didn't touch a, a first person shooter I didn't I didn't touch a game for a year and a half, and uh, I think that's a lot more time away from TF2 and probably gaming at large than most people can experience, especially to experience and then come back to TF2 and put in another thousand hours over the next handful of years. And it only occurred to me in that after that second half of my uh, TF2 career, after that long year and a half where I didn't play games, it only occurred to me after that break somewhere along the line of like wait realizing yo bad water's really good <laughs> like i should try to play more bad water i should try to queue for that more um because you have a vague sense of like yeah tf2 is good and, and i'm enjoying playing it but then you realize like wait no like if i go play bad water it's like pretty much always a guaranteed good time and it's maybe even more than a good time it's like you know you're gonna get sucked into this little mini adventure with a, a pretty high guaranteed rate that that's going to happen compared to other maps. You know, I might play uh, any other map that the game has, right? Hoodoo, 
I've mentioned Hoodoo a lot, but let's say Barn Blitz, let's say Viaduct, let's say Process, right? I think all these are good maps, but there are there's just a weird way that the numbers fall that for every uh, every good game I have on Barn Blitz, there's, there are some bad games, and, and on Viaduct, and on most TF2 maps, every map has this ratio. It just so happens that Bad Water, the ratio is the best that there can be, it, it felt like. And it, it really occurred to me that it, it would be a, a waste not to spend more of my my final hours in the game presumably enjoying bad water and enjoying what really strikes me as perfect fantastic amazing incredible um, I have so many memories attached to bad water um, even though there's no special reason it should be so uh, such you know held in such fond regard in my nostalgia because Gold Rush was the first map I ever played on Team Fortress 2. That's the map I should have the nostalgia for. You know, I remember my first time playing TF2 on Gold Rush. I remember my first time playing competitive TF2 on uh, CP Badlands. I remember my first time uh, playing on, you know, a Highlander team for real, for real, and and uh, and and scrimming CP Granary for a month on a Highlander. You know, and I loved it. And all those things are great memories, and I love them all. But I don't yearn for Granary. I don't yearn for uh, for Gold Rush. I, I yearn for Bad Water. I, I feel like it's a place I've gotten so much out of, and I can I know I can keep playing it and getting more and more out of. And I don't I don't feel that way with other maps, which is interesting. There's this sense that I can I can go and get on Battle. I can play Soldier. I can play Spy. I can play Demo Man. I can play any of my favorite classes, even Scout and. Uh, I know that there's there's a unique adventure to be had. I can put on an album and just enjoy the experience that is Badwater because games, you know, like a, a game like TF2 is defined by so many things. It's defined by its weapons. It's defined by its classes. It's defined by its players, right? What they choose to do with the classes and weapons. And it's also uh, defined so much by its maps because if, if you were to, to select TF2 by its, uh, let's say, its worst maps that are officially in the game, it's almost incomparable how much worse that experience is than playing only the best maps in TF2. And if I compare, you know, my best experience in TF2 to my worst experience uh, on a public server, it's very remarkable that distance. But I want to think of that distance now in terms of specific maps, because if I think of my best experience, my worst experience on Bad Water compared to my best experience and worst experience on, let's say, Two Fort or Dust Bowl or Gold Rush or Upward or any of the, these other really big classic TF2 maps. The thing is, when I say my best and worst experiences, I don't mean in terms of my personal performance, but I mean in terms of my enjoyment. You know, when I might have even lost, you know, but when did I really enjoy the game? When did I feel like, wow, that was so fantastic and engaging? and fun, and I got lost in something that was, uh, you know, realer than, realer than real. And then, for my worst experiences in, in playing uh, a map, whether it be Badwater or Two Fort or Dust Bowl, again, those ones that I mentioned, the kind of classic ones, you know, how painful was it? How much did I want it to end? How, how frustrating and annoying was it? Um, how awkward and dull and lifeless and dead and numb and unsatisfying and uh, and empty did it feel and I can think of some really not great times that I had on on two fort um, probably on Dust Bowl certainly on upward on gold rush on, on plenty of the less popular maps as well those ones are a lot easier to have a, a lackluster lukewarm experience on and then on bad water man you know, I, I remember a few times where I probably really wanted to win and couldn't win, but I don't remember having any, you know, hardly any. I can't think of any times where I was, I was really not enjoying the game on Badwater, and I've been rolled. I've been totally rolled. And, it, and overall, it, it still was always good. So this is probably the main criteria which led me to my focus on PL Badwater is 
it having this uh, this this characteristic of being you know very high highs and a sort of uh, you know uh, uh, putting a life vest around me in terms of negative experiences because uh, you know even some other maps that I really do love I do love uh, you know Dust Bowl for instance but the highs are high and the lows are lows man there's some times where Dust Bowl is just it's ugly you know what I mean and and bad water I've I've never seen bad water you know looking ugly I really haven't and uh, I've played I've played a lot I've seen a lot of bad water I I would I would assume it's one of my most played maps of all time which really should have the odds go against it you know I think a high tower too high tower such a fun pub map really so excellent I've had I've had such great times on it I can remember you know, sometime when I, it seemed like the round went on for, for two hours and I got like 300 points on Soldier or something like this. Maybe it wasn't even that long. It was like an hour. And uh, using the original and just, like, I don't usually use the original and it was a crazy experience. Like, But there's so many times where you also just join a server in Hightower and it just, the magic's not there, you know? Because when I say, when I say a, a map, kind of just sucks sometimes I mean the magic's not there that's what I mean it's really about the soul of the game the, sp the spirit of Team Fortress 2 and the spirit of the map and how there's some maps I feel like I have to create my fun a little more on I have to create my aesthetic pleasure I have to create my explorative adventure um, enjoyment that I get from it and then I think there's maps where I don't have to give as much. There's maps that seem to give more of those things to me. And I sure feel grateful and lucky that Badwater has given what it has given to me over the years. Uh, it's funny because Badwater seems like a simple payload map. It seems like, you know, if, if you really write it down on paper, it's like, what is Badwater? It's you're you're working with your team to push a bomb into a bomb site into a cart uh, or or into a I don't know what you'd call it a big dugout you're pushing a bomb on a on a cart with rails it's like uh, in Minecraft the 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 mine cart with TNT in it you're pushing it to the edge and uh, the other team's trying to stop you that's the whole premise and that's the premise of of every payload map too and it's funny how true it is and also how true it isn't because at the core this is the this is the central feature of bad water that everything else depends on you know the at some point you got to wake up from your fantasy and and your being in your own world and, and the, the joy of exploring and, and and you know making the world your own on bad water you got to snap out of it at some point because the clock's going to run down and you realize, oh, I've got to worry about the cart, right? Or in the case of defense, you got to snap out of it and say, hey, I can't let them cap because it's going to end the round, you know? Um, or it's going to change my spawn or, or something like this. Um, but it's amazing how long you can kind of live in the fantasy, how long you can stay in that honeymoon phase that... Um, that romantic world that's uh, not really connected to what Badwater is about, you know? And it's just using the environment, using the game to create your own experience. And I don't mean your own experience is pushing the cart, but I mean your own experience is, you know, backstabbing an engineer or uh, Wrangler jumping up to a weird spot or uh, Sticky jumping past their spawn or deploying a clutch uber charge, or sh hitting a, a Crusader's crossbow arrow into their spawn from, you know, almost across the map. And uh, having a, a long, c confusing battle with a scout way behind the second point rooftop by the crates, you know? And uh, some of those very personal moments you have off in your own in some weird nook and cranny in some weird corner, um, those are the moments that uh, feel the most bad water to me in spite of them being completely auxiliary and completely disconnected from the core of the map. And 
it, it's this beautiful balance because if you took away that core aspect of the map, if you took away the cart, if you took away the payload, if you took away that the you know the central focus of this map objectively, you know to to push the bomb all the way on the on the tracks to the enemy base. I don't think it would make it a more fun map. That's the that's the funny thing is that for how little it can matter at times, I don't think DM underscore Badwater is is the answer. I don't think that is. Um, I don't think that's what we actually want, even though we think we do. We, you know, all this hubbub about sentries and choke points and, you know, it, that is the fun stuff. But we need the payload cart to make believe and to convince ourselves into doing that because you don't really do those things. You don't really have those specific kind of pleasures on a 5CP map. You don't, you don't have those uh, playing sixes because you, you took this thing away, you know, you, 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 you realize it is just kind of playing pretend that, uh, sentries have to matter and, uh, all these, all these things we put in place to stop people from pushing the cart, right? Um, because we're, we're placing value on this object that really is not fun. It's not, it's not the, you know, there's nothing intrinsically enjoyable about pushing a payload cart. And and just like there's nothing, there should be nothing intrinsically enjoyable about standing on a capture point. Um, because, and we know this is true because if TF2 was a single player game and you just boot up the game, play alone, and push the cart to the end, or capture the points alone, and that's it, it's not fun. There's no, you're missing everything. And in a similar degree, the reason the card is important is because of this collective meaning that we all place on it. And uh, you, you could argue this to a larger extent on the purpose of winning um, and the, on the value of staying alive, right? Is it, It's really only there because we all buy into it, right? And that's kind of what lets games and, and fighting to kill each other and staying alive um, useful. And of course, some... Uh, some beliefs are a lot harder to deprogram than others, right? Because this, uh, the importance of staying alive is a, is a pretty classic belief that's uh, very deep in our DNA, very deep in our souls, um, and for obvious reasons, right? And despite these, you know, these long-held traditions, we, we're still able to make new beliefs. And, uh, and I think... We, it, we're dependent entirely on these beliefs to to enjoy bad water, to experience bad water to its fullest. Because the, the thing that you can tell an AI, the thing that you can tell a computer program, the thing that you can tell a machine learning algorithm, is you can tell it to do its best, push the cart, and get it from the first point to the last point as quickly as possible and you can tell the AI on the on the red team to stop them from pushing the cart to getting to the last point um, as as ruthlessly and effectively as they can right and they will get very good at that and as you will see the final result of that is a a very um, successful perhaps approach to to achieving that objective but a very soulless experience and a experience of bad water that we would not want to engage in an experience of bad water that we would not want to partake in and the experience that we so often do actually really enjoy is a, a sort of frivolous meaningless expression of our own desires and beliefs real time on the battlefield you know of wanting of desiring of, of choosing what we actually want, right? In, in every moment, in real time, there's these small choices we can make, you know? Do we want to die for this kill? Sometimes we do, and sometimes we don't. Do we want to leave and fight another day? Sometimes we do, and sometimes we don't. Do we want to, you know, push the cart as quickly as we can? Do we want to uh, make space on the rooftop? Do we want to... Uh, just hang out in this one area because it's 
feels right. You know, you you like sniping down this one spot. You know, it's you like that. You you want to spend time there. It's it's appealing. There's there's a gravity. There's an effect. A pull that this location has on you, right? Or similarly, so with a a weapon. Or maybe you feel that way towards a certain class. Where is it really? You know, the most optimal to kill snipers or to kill pyros or whatever it is but maybe that's just what you really want that's where you place your value that's where you 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 exert your will in the game and that these are the things that you like to do these are the things you want to do and for what reason we can we can rationalize everything you know almost all these things to somehow lead to yeah this is good for the objective you know i'm killing pyros it's good to kill anyone for the objective I'm hanging out on this point, watching this choke, and it's good to deny any area for the objective. It's good to die for this 1v1, maybe, you know, because I'm psychologically torturing the opponent. There, right, there, you, can, you can rationalize forever about how pretty much anything you do, because you wanted to do it, was good for the team. Um, but really, it's fantastic that uh, we do this, and it's fantastic that um, it's kind of bullshit, you know? It's, because the the truth, the real, you know, what would really be useful to the team at all times and uh, what would really be the most fun, uh, sorry, not most fun, but most useful to finishing the objective it, it is not the most fun. And this is the funny thing I, I have often experienced is that when I, th when I think of Highlander Badwater, I think of, I think of playing soldier and spy and I think of those classes being pretty fun on uh, on Badwater Highlander. And then I think of playing classes like Engineer and Heavy and Medic. And those classes I've had really good times playing too in Highlander, on, on Badwater specifically. But the funny thing is that, again, I praised Badwater earlier for the difference between its highest highs and its lowest lows being so much shorter than a lot of other maps. There's great highs. And not a lot of lows, and certainly no very deep lows, from my experience. And so when I talk about these classes and how they play on Badwater and Highlander, I can see a very clear difference between them in terms of this kind of enjoyment and uh, displeasure and the distance between them in, in their most extremes. And that a soldier and spy, even if you're getting really shut down as spy, I think there's still something fun to it. There's there's something very free in, in what's going on. And I think Spy, you'll see how this connects later, but Spy becomes unfun on Badwater Highlander when your priority becomes uncreative. When your priority becomes so sort of tunnel vision obsessed when it becomes, I have to kill the sniper. That's my only role right now. I need to kill the sniper. My team is begging me to kill the sniper. Nothing else matters except for killing the sniper. Because a lot of the fun that happens is the unplanned action of the game. And so, and, and not to say that there is not fun to be had in planned action, but my, my point in bringing this up is that I, I think now about Engineer and Heavy and Medic and Demo and playing these classes on Highlander. And this is my, this is my feeling too, uh, kind of about sixes and playing pocket roles, is that it honestly can be uh, less fun. I think the lows... I think the highs on pocket roles and on sort of structure-based, objective, more objective-based roles um, where you're, you know, I, I don't really have this room to fuck around much on heavy, right? On soldier or spy, I, I'm kind of auxiliary in a way. I can, I can sack, I can bomb, I can make bold decisions on the fly, right? And don't get me wrong, there is still some of this if I'm playing heavy on Badwater, Highlander, competitive, but... There's not quite as much. I, I have more. I have a little more responsibility to a stricter mission, and uh, you know, feel free to argue with me. But that that is my opinion about about the way that competitive Highlander plays. And um, like I said, I feel this way with you know more structure, uh, combo based classes and playing them in sixes. Is that the highs are high, but the lows I think are much lower than. Like I was saying, Highlander, Soldier, or Spy would be on Badwater. I think, I think the devastation of uh, and pain of being so obsessed with something so narrow-minded and and binary of me capping this point or not um, can be very it, like the lows of that are terrible, 
And and so the thing I like about bad water is actually that it's easier to get a little distracted from that. You know, there's so many of these. You're playing all of these uh, these meta games in a way where you are, you know, the objective is to push the cart on payload on bad water, now, on competitive in, in Highlander on bad water, but you spend so much of your time not actually pushing the cart right that's the whole point of the game that's the whole objective or defending the card if you're on a team that's the whole point and you don't you actually spend most of your time doing other things for the sake of that thing right and so you know when you're focused on taking down a sentry or or winning a dm fight or or trying to force their uber uh, nameless things trying to headshot someone all of these tasks, you know, even in a competitive environment, even in a pub environment, they're they're all tied together somehow under this guise of of the the overarching goal of the payload, you know, and 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 the objective. But it's so easy to get distracted because it is so meta, you know. You your goal is to be pushing the cart literally, but then when you're fighting a sentry, you're, you're not thinking about the cart you're thinking about fighting the sentry and so in in your mind you can get lost in in these side quests that's the way i like to think of it and um a lot of times suboptimally too and this is what i argue is good about wa bad bad water is is the map sort of lending itself to distractions lending itself to side quests because i think these are um really important to enhancing the experience i i like that you know comparing bad water to a handful of other maps i like the amount of distractions i like the amount of side quests built into the geography and and, and the the way that the architecture of the map encourages you uh perhaps to to really get caught in stuff that might not be so <laughs> might be very removed from this this core thing and uh i think when we become very reductionistic when we become very uh breaking everything down to its smallest component and going okay what is this all really for and we optimize the shit out of everything to realize yes 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 but is, if it's not 100 percent efficient for our goal of pushing the cart then it's not a good thing to do i think i think when we get to this hyper reductionistic um place it uh that is a place of despair you know you need to kind of there's there's some peace there's some fun in being removed from things it doesn't mean we have to be disassociated in fact i would encourage you not to be disassociated and to not be shy of responsibility but also don't be so reductionistic to re to think that bad water is only about pushing the cart you know do you, you, do you see my analogy right in, in what ways are you you know are we capable of i don't know if you're doing this right now if you're if you ever have been guilty of this but we are capable as people of in the same way that someone could look at bad water and say well you know the the it's just about pushing the cart like that's the point like that's the map you you, you push the cart in, into the end like and everything else is just a means to that end and, and that's it that's all that matters Someone can, we, that sort of perspective, we can have towards life in general, right? In some sort of accidentally screwed up way, you know? Uh, there's lots of ways we can do this. We can, we, can, uh, we can do it with money. We can make life all about money, where everything is a means to ends to money. And the, you know, and money is this thing that's connected to everything and every action. Um, and the thing is, you can make that argument. Like, maybe that's just, like, probably true, you know? Just just like I would say, is it is it true on paper that bad water is, uh, is just about uh, pushing the card? It's like, on paper, yeah, that's the point. The objective is to push the payload from start to finish. However, the, the fun is, <laughs> is not in that. That's not what makes life worth living. That's not what makes bad water worth playing you know it's it's you can make a really credible argument you know uh evolutionary psychology type of type of statement that uh you know everything that we do um you know specifically as males is uh for sexual selection you know 
that uh you know all of our creative urges all of our desires to to do cool shit to innovate to make the world better um to accumulate wealth to be successful to accumulate talent to accumulate knowledge you can make the argument that all of that at the end of the day is for uh the sake of uh you know getting a better partner to lay with and to pass on better genes and there's a compelling argument for that but when you if you actually just agree to that and like it's one thing to say like yeah 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 that's probably true and it's one thing to use that as like a cornerstone of an I- of your ideology you know and, and and make it your philosophy to life because it's not it's not going to be fun that's not you know that's uh that's 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 uh, as they would say in the business a black pill um because you know even though we we it could be true that all things come to that it doesn't it, it shouldn't uh it shouldn't uh distract you from uh you know the the illusion that you've been living under this whole time right because um even if you try to accept this now you've managed to live your 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 whole life before that you know not really acting like you believe that you know there's moments I'm, i'm sure where you have acted in a way that does suggest that the only thing that matters is elevation for sexual selection you know but i'm sure there's lots of things that you've done just for the fuck of it just just for fun you know just because you wanted to and uh or at least it sure felt like that right because this you can get gaslighted like crazy right because i can tell you you can tell me everything you want to do on Badwater to have fun and and I can tell you that you being unfriendly on Badwater is really still an underhanded psychological subconscious manipulation for you to win Badwater, right? I I can make that argument. This is the this is the fun um, fuckery of uh, of linguistics, of argument, of uh, perverted, autistic, insane pursuit of truth. Is that everything can be argued for? Um, you can make a, a compelling argument for everything. So don't. Don't give credence to every single argument you hear because guess what you can you can uh, you can monkey with typewriter generate every single argument uh, that could ever exist and some of them are pretty damn good for not so compelling points you know um, you know there's some damn good arguments for you to uh, you know sit on a banana peel and, uh, and and I don't know you know just sit on the banana peel all day that's that's you know I guess that's my shitty example. <laughs> But, but think about, you know, how important the auxiliary stuff is, how important the irrational stuff is. And, and bad water, my, you know, my, I'm sure everyone's favorite parts about bad water, if they think about it, it's all the irrational stuff. It's all the stuff that's, um, and what I mean by that is, is it is very disconnected, uh, from what the the core purpose is yet we still need that core purpose you know to, to make things happen right you can we can say that okay you know everything that humans do maybe guys do more specifically is for elevating your status for sexual selection right i say it guys only because you know evolutionary psychologists would argue that you know women are the sexual selectors right not necessarily the ones who to build up the assets to be selected by someone else you know there's a there's two different roles and the even if we if you if you accept that that okay all all actions are done because of that the the thing is is that we still need that for all the bullshit (laughs) like if that is true because then it's like well if that didn't exist would we have will to do anything you know like if and that's a really compelling case because i mean i I don't want to get all like you know what's the deal with creationism and you know where the hell do we come from and what's uh, why do why does why does life or humans exist right that's a that's a big one but um, it does seem like uh the design of nature the design of animals of humans in some ways is that um of course we want to reproduce because it seems like if we stop reproducing we don't exist so for us to exist thus we must desire to reproduce right and uh, there's all sorts of consequences attached to that desire to reproduce and so in a similar light um for us to to build a century on the rooftop of 
uh, Bad Water Second, which may, may be more fun than uh, anything else, maybe more fun than pushing the cart, maybe more fun than having sex, right? Is only there. It only happens for the sake of this this base biological game that exists, right? The base biological game of having to push the cart into the next control point, right? If there was no faith in that system, if 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 uh, if, if if the TF2 spirit did not lust for reproduction the way that humanity does, right? Uh, the and, and we did not buy into this as a uh, as a collective consciousness playing TF2. It would be impossible. The, the the joy of of fighting that sentry gun on top of roof would be impossible. You know, roof is out of the way. <laughs> and, 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 and like, just think about that as a concept that, um, in, in a in a in a total vacuum space, uh, everything besides the the cart and the rails are pointless on bad water. I, you know, imagine the rest of that map just completely disappearing from existence. That all of that is is uh, is a justification for the cart. You know. The cart, the cart was always there. the The cart of bad water is is the is the core. It is the it is the the lifeblood, right? Um, but you know, it's not just about the lifeblood. It, it's about what it gives way to. It's about the the things that we are capable with, right? Life alone is not holy, but it is uh, what life is capable of, and what what life will create what life um will express what life will experience that is important that is what gives it value not its existence alone you know it is the all of those other things that i probably just mentioned better than i could mention them again now and for bad water to make me realize this uh bad water must be a pretty good map put it in your uh put it in your brain again in case you haven't gotten the memo yet in a way, Team Fortress 2, well, you don't have to hear me say this, Team Fortress 2 is the Team Fortress 2 of games. And um, if you don't know what I mean, you, you just don't know what I mean. But if you know what I mean, you get it, you know? TF2 is the TF2 of games. And in that same way, consider this, Badwater is the TF2 of TF2 maps, okay? So just as TF2 is to gaming, Badwater is to TF2, right? And so I don't just mean to say it's the best, you know, because there's lots of things I like in gaming. And I think, I'm sure you do too. And I don't think there, you know, you need to make an argument that uh, TF2 is better than StarCraft or, or uh, I don't know, better than Smash Bros or some very different game, right? Uh, but I just want to say that the, the shape, the we, we, we talk about uh, square shapes going through round holes and these types of things. The shape of bad water, the shape, if you were synesthetic and you saw a shape when you thought of bad water that was different from the shape you saw when you saw barn blitz, I bet the bad water shape would be similar to the shape that you see when you see Team Fortress 2 and in your synesthetic mind and the shape that you see when you see barn blitz might be more like uh, the shape you see when you think of League of Legends or something. And uh, uh, please don't take that as shade on barn blitz. This is just uh, explaining... Uh, you know, how the synesthetic uh, user would experience bad water in a context of their own reference points. So there's a, it's the shape, it's the essence. It's, it's not so much its goodness, but maybe it is, right? We, we get lost in the details of knowing why we really love something, why we really care about something, because at some point you don't love it at the beginning, you start to experience it, you start to understand it, you start to observe it, you start to uh, to want to spend more time with it. And, and at some point along those lines, this love does develop. And you start to see, um, or I should say you start to, to see the feelings you have for bad water increasingly stronger and, and more so you see them than bad water itself, right? The... The importance of your childhood home um, is entirely yours. It's not the home itself, of course. And it's it's funny because in any case, it's completely irrational to argue that anything is the best. Um, 
and and what I mean by this is is uh, when we say the word best um, in the way that we would when we say that a, a TF2 map is the best, okay? Because you know, if if I say that uh, you know Novak Djokovic is the best tennis player in the world, even this is controversial, right? But if I say something like you know some person has the best um, you know the fastest best um, you know uh, 100 meter dash or whatever like they are the best they are the fastest um, this is very measurable and, and I understand it you know it's like to be because the criteria the implication of being the best is simple it's like well what is being the best at the 100 meter dash it's like that's being the fastest you know and uh, what is the best at tennis so I bet you ask some, a, a variety of professional tennis players, and a lot of them will tell you it's being at the top. It's being at the top of the league. It's winning the championships. And I bet some people will tell you that it's not only about that. I bet some people will tell you uh, that being the best is more complicated than that. And so when we say in Team Fortress 2, this is the best map, Badwater is the best map, what is the implication behind that? What does that really mean? It's, it's not so simple. It's not a measurement of, oh, yes, the best map is the map that is finished the quick the quickest the map that you get done the quickest the map that has the the lowest square hammer units right there is no simple metric for what makes it the best just in the same way that um, what makes the the childhood home so important to you and yes uh, you know in one hand it's so obvious it is all of the memories and experiences you've had there which is what I want to point to in that um, on some level we start out you know, coming from a rational basis for why we will argue that a TF2 map is the best. And and I have certainly done so in this video in arguing that Badwater is the best, but, you know, the further you pedal along this this trail, and if you really self-observe um, yourself, you know, your, your own um, train of logic in, in trying to explain and justify it, um, you see that so much of its best quality, its 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 ness that you enjoy, is actually your love for it, and and not the thing itself. Which is so funny because your where did your love come from? You know, it seems like well, of course my love for it would not exist if it had not existed. If if it had not existed in its essence, in its in its bestness, in the way that it was, right? And I'm sure this is true to some extent you know there's a there's a reason i will i will fall in love and say that bad water is the best and that i won't say that cp junction is the best it, it you you can point to a lot of reasons why it makes sense why anyone would would have the experience and the the love for bad water that they don't have for junction that i just explained we can we can rationalize it in so many ways but at what point after that does it stop being about that difference between junction and bad water because it's, it's. N I don't. I don't think it's the best, just because it's better than Junction. It. It's almost not enough of a reason to think it's the best, because that would be, uh, a sort of weak, dispassionate, um, ranking. I. That would not be enough to compel me to talk about it for 12 hours. You see, it. It would. It, it could only be in a situation where it is this completely irrational um, and like Ouroboros feeding back into itself strange loop of, uh, of, of my love for it and the thing that it is itself um, for me to care about it being the best because that's, that is its own Im important uh, matter of the equation as well is that for Badwater to be the best I, you have to care about a map being the best. Which is quite strange. Because, um, for instance, in, in this AI simulation that I would talk about where, you know, machine, machine learning algorithms play Badwater, they find the quote-unquote best path. Um, because that is their that is the criteria from which they are created that they that they need to discover. Um, but if you ask them to play numerous maps, and then you ask them what is the best, they can't they cannot decide. They cannot know. A computer cannot care 
fundamentally is the problem. A computer cannot care which is the best. It can care the the data. It can care which one is discernibly completable faster, which one it has a more efficient uh, progression rate at, and it may say that that one is the best map for them, right? But it is lacking... It is lacking love. It is lacking passion. You see? And passion and love um, are not logical, and they are not connected to to sense, you know? Um, but at the same time, they are essential for us to care what is the best TF2 map. They're essential for us to care about anything. Because for me to want to state that Badwater is the TF2 map, I'm already placing so much value on things, on, on Badwater, and on Upward, and on <laughs> Uh, Team Fortress 2. And so what is the point of me putting value on these things, right? Ah, ha, 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 I see you in the back. You can say that uh, me putting the importance of me putting value on these things is, uh, you know, it all ties back to sexual selection, right? And uh, that uh, for some reason, I, I, you know, things that I enjoy or whatever, or, right? Somehow all connects back to sexual selection. You can you can make this argument. Is That's the reason I'm bringing it up and, and talking back to the psychological evolution point is that you can go back and make that point that that is why I care that's why I place value on things because what is there is no value I mean the if I think about it logically if I'm very rational if, if we want to be very rational about reality uh, it, it's that the best um, having best in a sentence is pointless and in fact anything uh, at all is, is quite pointless any any discussion um, any collection of data, any operation, there's nothing to be talked about if we if we really assess and say that objectively really there's nothing to be valuable. Because the problem with saying there is nothing that is valuable, there is nothing, um, there is no point in thinking about what is the best, is that this in itself is a contradiction. You see? This in itself is placing a value on no value. It is, it is stating, um, a, a statement at all is a proposition. A statement at all is a proposition of care. You see? At least from our conscious mind, you know? And, and you can make strange arguments that the unconscious world acts without care, right? Without purpose. It just does. The rain just falls. You just breathe, right? Without care. But the conscious... The conscious, what separates us from rocks, that is care. That is placing value on anything. And that is unique, and that is and that is why we play Badwater. That is why you ought to play Badwater. That is why I love Badwater. <laughs> and so the the funny part about the the bottom of the uh the bad water rabbit hole is that you realize um, you don't need to talk about it for 12 hours and that's why you do it <laughs> you do it because you do not need to that is precisely why